when a young woman begins to experience horrific visions, daymares, during her waking life, she will seek help from her parents. Believing the matter to be spiritual, they consult a priest who tries to drive multiple demons out of her body. However, ultimately, the exorcisms would fail. The result of which has created one of the most compelling and yet controversial cases of the 20th century and possibly ever. Today, we will be examining the life and death of a young woman named Annalise and the six demons that supposedly took her. This is the untold story of the exorcism of Annalise Michelle, and what a terrible and truly horrifying story. It is. Before I begin this dark and extensive story, there's a few things that I would like to say. Whether this is a true case of demonic possession or the result of malpractice due to religious extremism is not up for me to decide. I will simply present the case as chronologically accurate and full of details I can, and ultimately, the conclusion is up to you. So let us first start at the beginning. Joseph Michel, who had served in the military during the war, was thankful to have returned to his family's small village following his imprisonment by the Americans and sequential release in late 1945. Having seen the horrors and ravages of combat, he thanked God that his small village of approximately 3,000 souls hadn't been attacked during foreign army occupation or the devastating air raids that leveled most major cities in Germany. He would be reunited with his family and would assume a job within his family's business. And during this time, he would meet a woman named Anna, a local girl. And within two years, the couple would be married. Born as Anna Elizabeth Michelle on September 21st of 1952 in Leipzig, Bavaria, West Germany. Anna was a very shy and somewhat sickly child as she grew up. Michelle was raised along with her three sisters as very religious and as a family they would all attend mass twice a week. And although frequently sick, she was known for being very sweet but also very shy, usually keeping to herself and her studies while at school. All was going well for Anna, who had become known by the name of Annalise, a combination of her first and middle names. This was until she turned 16 years old. Shortly after her birthday, Annalise had a moment where she fainted in front of her younger sister, and upon her sister calling her name and poking her in the arm. When she came to, she believed that she was just exhausted from studying too much and decided to lay down for the night. But that night, little did she know that her torment would begin. As she slept in her bed, shortly after the clock had struck midnight, Annalise would awaken in a panic as a giant force, as she would later describe it, was holding her down. She felt the area around her indent as if a very large person or creature was sitting on top of her. This entity then began to press on her stomach, which caused her to urinate. Panicking and unable to breathe, the poor woman called out to God in a desperate attempt to stave off whatever this thing was. Convinced that she was dying, she pleaded to be freed. However, upon the nearby church clock tower sounding the quarter hour, it was all over. All pressure had ceased, as if it was blown away by a wind. Whimpering in terror now, Michelle changed her linens and would barely sleep that night. She would inform her mother the following morning that she felt very ill and was exhausted. And who can blame her? So her mother allowed her to stay home from school. 
nearly one year later, during the day of August 24th of 1969, whatever it was, decided to strike again. Just as what had happened before, she had blacked out earlier in the day, and later that night, right after midnight, yet again, she felt the familiar but terrifying large force begin to hold her captive yet again. She was unable to breathe and unable to call for help. Again, she would be freed by the tolling of the church clock bell tower. Upon informing her mother of this second incident, her mother was unsure of what was happening to her poor daughter, so she decided to take her into the family physician, a man named Dr. Vogt. At the recommendation of Dr. Vogt, they would board a train to Aufschenberg to meet with a neurologist by the name of Dr. Siegfried Luthi. Dr. Luthi that day would run a variety of tests, all which would come back negative. And unsure of the results, he asked them to return on August 27th for a follow-up appointment and more tests. One of the tests ran upon their return in August was an EEG, which recorded normal alpha-type brain activity. Coming up yet again empty-handed, the doctor still had to account for the convulsive episode that his patient said she was experiencing. So he diagnosed her with temporal lobe epilepsy. And from here, she'd be placed on a drug known as Zintrapil, an anticonvulsant. And this worked for a time, but as 1969 would progress, she would become very sick. In December, she would contract pneumonia, which would be further complicated by a tuberculosis infection. She became too ill to further attend her studies and was forced to drop out of school at that time. She would remain back at home in her bed until January of 1970, at which point her condition still hadn't improved. So as a result of this, she was transferred to the hospital in February. From here, she was placed in a sanatorium in Middleburg, one that specialized in bronchial and lung disease. She made some improvement there, but would also have other issues diagnosed. When spring came, she longed to go home, to see the beautiful lush hills of her village, instead of the jagged and ominously gray mountains that surrounded her. Unfortunately for her sake, she was not yet permitted to leave. Due to her condition still needing to improve, as well as new diagnoses of cardiovascular circulatory problems. Although sad, Michelle understood what was happening. However, this all too persistent and familiar force that had come to plague her would visit her yet again on June the 3rd of 1970. The same massive, paralyzing entity would grip her with ice cold and unseen hands. This time, however, Annalise tried everything she could to free herself, and in her desperate attempts, a lone scream would finally manage to tear loose from her lips. And this scream was heard by the night nurse, as well as the young doctor that was on duty that night, both of which rushed to her aid. As the two entered the room, the specter released its grip on Michelle. By this point, all of the commotion had woken up the other girls in the wing of the sanatorium that she was in. Michelle would be assisted with changing her pajamas and bedding and tried to sleep under nurse supervision that night. The following morning, the girls' gossip had reached a fever pitch. They began to speculate if Annalise had previously had a head injury or if she had water on the brain. Annalise herself, however, didn't pay much attention to them. She was becoming withdrawn and was still weak from the previous night's episode. She was more concerned with what was going on with her health. As the day progressed and dust settled on the horizon, while the other girls were headed to the cafeteria, Annalise opted to stay in her room, stare out her window, and say her evening rosary. As she prayed, the voices of the returning girls seemed louder than usual. However, what once appeared as massive and foreboding mountains appeared more beautiful this time. Their peaks glistened with pink and violet as the sun hit them. One of the girls would approach her as she was admiring and praying and would ask if she was alright. 
She then would comment on her blue eyes being black. Annalise, unsure of what to make of this, shook off the girl's remarks. She would go on to finish her rosary. The following day, she would be sent to another specialist who would attempt to figure out just what was going on inside of her head. After a day's worth of tests, including EEGs yet again, they would find no evidence of anything being wrong. However, with her now documented history of epileptic seizures, the doctor, Dr. Keller, would recommend a new anticonvulsive drug be prescribed to her. Upon returning to the sanatorium, Annalise would begin to experience a new and terrifying manifestation. In her normal waking life, she would begin to see horrible, demonic-looking creatures that were seemingly stalking her from the shadows. They would appear in the mountains, in her corridors, and even in her room. Upon seeing their gnarled faces, she would often fall to her knees and beg the Virgin Mary for grace to make these terrible visions go away. After six more weeks at the sanatorium, she would be examined once again by a physician and again have more tests ran and yet again she would be found to have no abnormalities in her brain scans. With this conclusion, she would finally be allowed to return home to her family. Her return home was happy at first, being back in her own bed, surrounded by familiar faces. But yet Michelle found herself soon worrying about going back to school and readjusting, and of course, about her persistent health problems. However, she would end up returning to school to finish. This time, of course, she would be visited by multiple doctors all throughout the year to monitor her health. She would have several more seizures, although seemingly not as severe as the ones previously experienced. And although those had seemed to be pretty minor, she was still experiencing horrific, disfigured visions. She began to share this with her mother, and after time and time again of the doctors not finding anything abnormal about her, Anna began to think that something supernatural was taking place. One evening, the two parents discussed this matter in particular. Anna tried to convince her husband that what was plaguing their daughter was of the devil. She told him that Annalise had been seeing horrible and twisted faces all throughout the day and night, sometimes in the mirror or looking out a window, or even through the faces of other people. One vision in particular that Annalise had relayed to her mother disturbed her so much that she had to share it with her husband, Joseph. Annalise had told her that upon seeing the statue of the Virgin Mary in their living room on their mantle, that her eyes turned black. A hideous grin appeared on her face, and her small, delicate hands began to twitch and then morph into thick, grotesque claws. Seeing the sincerity in his wife's eyes, Joseph, although silent for a few minutes, decided that the family should ask for guidance through prayer. With school finally finished for Annalise before university, a summer trip was in order. After consulting with the doctors about his daughter's condition and discovering her depressive thoughts that she had shared with them, Joseph decided to take his daughter to the shrine of San Damiano in Italy in hopes of not only aiding her spiritually, but hopefully mentally as well. The shrine had been created by a woman named Rosa Quattrini, who over time experienced multiple miracles and received messages from the Virgin Mary, including to have the shrine built. Later becoming known as Mama Rosa, she would work alongside Padre Pio for many years. So in due time, with the assistance of a teacher, they organized a trip to the shrine and were on a bus headed through the Italian countryside. Upon their arrival and exiting of the bus, amidst the beautiful vineyards, that surrounded the location of the garden in which the shrine was located in, a dark presence would envelop Annalise. Surrounding the shrine was an open space which allowed for pilgrims to kneel and pray. A small crowd was present as Annalise approached the shrine at the insistence of her father. However, she seemed like she couldn't approach the Holy Mother. She began to walk around the shrine in a wide arc, and to her, her feet began to burn, as if she was walking on hot coals 
and each person she glanced at, although in the praying position, were gnashing their teeth, and their faces were distorted and awful. This is where she began to really first display her aversion to holy objects, such as medals of saints, statues, and insignia that represented Jesus Christ. Those present couldn't help but notice how strange the young woman was behaving, and upon heading back onto the bus, she was then being asked by the teacher, a woman named Frau Hein, about what was going on with her. She expressed that her will was not her own, and that someone else was manipulating her. Almost as soon as those words left Michelle's mouth, her personality would completely change. In a voice that sounded like a man's, Annalise began to belittle Frau Hein, making fun of her for being unsure of herself. She then snatched a blessed medal off of her neck. Simultaneously, Frau, Joseph, and others present on the trip began to smell a stench exuding from Annalise, unlike anything they had ever experienced before. The smell was that of fecal matter and something burning and it permeated the entire bus. She would eventually calm down, and the occupants would return back to their native Germany. After their visit to San Damiano, Annalise seemed to feel quite well despite what had taken place, but this would only last for about two weeks. She was set to attend college for the first time in several weeks' time, but felt that she was in no condition to do so, and she complained to her mother that she was horribly depressed and constantly plagued by these horrible faces. Believing it to be a result of her daughter's seizures, Anna would make an appointment with Dr. Luthi. Several days later, Annalise would troop to that very appointment. It would be determined that she had been seizure-free in between their appointments together, and another EEG would determine that her brain was indeed normal. However, Dr. Luthi, who was non-religious, would essentially belittle Annalise for telling him that she was seeing these horrible visions on a daily basis now. He believed, personally, that she was an overly superstitious Catholic girl. And with this, he would clear Annalise to go to university. This would be the last time that she would see Dr. Luthi, and the last time she would mention the demons to any medical professional. Becoming more depressed and withdrawn, her mother would finally confront Annalise, telling her that her whole life She's wanted to be a teacher, and now that the opportunity is here, she's not taking it. Annalise would explain that she was depressed, empty, and tired, that the drugs were not helping her, and that the demons and their manifestations were only getting worse. Still considering her daughter's issues to possibly be spiritual in nature, Anna would arrange for her to begin meeting with priests in an effort to aid her. The two priests that would begin to receive letters from both Anna and Annalise were Father Herman and Father Alt. After reading the letters, their interest not only piqued by the descriptions of what poor Annalise was experiencing, but Father Alt began to feel very ill, seemingly out of nowhere. After this happened, he would retire back to his dormitory room for the night and would try to sleep it off. Shortly after the clock struck midnight, Father Alt would awake soaked and in a cold sweat, a storm reached outside. Lightning illuminated the room around him. As he laid in his bed, feeling awful, he began to pray. But as he prayed, he would feel someone or something press on his bed as if they had walked onto it. This deeply frightened the father as he jumped off his bed, began to pray out loud. As the words left his mouth, a horrendous, burning smell began to fill his room. Alt then rushed out of his door and into the hallway. His vision began to narrow and his color perception was changing as he rushed down the stairs and headed toward the exit door of the building. Within the shadows cascading on the walls and the stained glass that surrounded him, horrible, distorted faces began to reveal themselves. Father Alt now knew that what he was dealing with was indeed very real, evil forces. He would run outside and into the rain, falling to his knees and gripping his rosary as he attempted to catch his breath. He would eventually return back to his room once he felt that the force had passed 
However, the scent of burning fecal matter still filled the entire parish. Even the following day, it was still there and would be experienced by all of the priests and staff. This event would further the interest in Annalise's case and further motivate the priests to act quickly, fearing that the young woman was indeed being affected by the demonic. Father Alt would begin to meet with Annalise when he could and it would accommodate her school schedule. At this particular point, she seemed to be doing fairly good despite still seeing the manifestations most days. She would begin classes on November 1st of 1973, going to lectures day in and day out, and seeking various churches and chapels to relax and pray in as she remained a diligent student. And her life, despite these awful visions that bothered her still, was about to change. At the end of November, Annalise would meet a fellow student by the name of Peter. He was somewhat like herself, he was very shy and friendly, but was outgoing when you got to know him. The two shared many classes together and would soon fall in love. Several weeks into their relationship, however, Annalise would tell Peter to stop seeing her, fearing that when the demons came back, he wouldn't want her anyways. But despite what his new girlfriend was telling him, Peter denied this and still refused to leave her side. Soon after this, Annalise would go in for a checkup evaluation, where she would have an EEG yet again, except this time, the doctor administering the EEG, a woman named Dr. Schleip, would find patterns of epilepsy. This is significant because this is the first time out of all of the other times that any patterns of epilepsy had ever been found. As a result of this, Dr. Schleip would change Annalise's medication to yet another anticonvulsant drug known as Delontin, in hopes that it would improve her condition. Following this appointment, Peter and Annalise would continue their relationship, in which Annalise would confide in Peter, more so about what she was experiencing with the demonic figures and faces that still plagued her. Peter had also become aware of the awful stench that seemed to follow her, especially when she was experiencing these supposed hallucinations. And as their relationship progressed, he wanted her to join him in meeting his family and friends, but Annalise refused, worrying that they may not be as understanding as Peter. Michelle would ultimately express that she did have moments of clarity where she did feel like herself, but every so often, those devils would reappear. And despite taking her medication daily, rigorously, the faces would remain. And soon coupled with the faces, she would begin to experience debilitating headaches. Father Alt, checking in on her with the local bishop there on campus, would discuss that her complaints and ailments continued to be the same, despite her taking her medication every single day. He would arrange to have Annalise meet him in a nearby town for the two to pray together. Peter would ultimately take Annalise to this appointment and would be surprised at how quickly she seemed relieved after the two began praying. Although very skeptical, Peter began to believe that possibly this could be a spiritual problem. I did want to take a moment here and say that there's so much information about what happened to Annalise in her life, and I've been pretty thorough up to this point, but I'm going to do a few briefer sections leading up to the paranormal manifestations that worsened her life. Just because if I sat here on every painstaking detail, we'd be here all day. Following the meeting with Father Alt, Annalise's depression would return. She told Peter that the clanking of knives and forks sickened her, that the demons wouldn't let her eat. Coupled with her losing weight and becoming ever more reclusive, other witnesses to the strange behavior she exhibited began to grow as well. One incident in particular, a mutual friend of both Annalise and Peter named Anna Leipert witnessed something that she would never forget. In July of 1975, with Anna, Annalise, and Peter sitting in Annalise's dorm room, having a casual conversation, suddenly, out of nowhere, Annalise's face contracted and contorted into something demonic in appearance. Her entire body then went stiff as a board, as if she was entering a catatonic state. Obviously freaked out by this, Anna asked Peter what was happening, and Peter simply replied, It's the demons. She's under possession. 
Not knowing what else to do, the two prayed with Michelle, and it would take an hour and a half for this episode to be over. Following this happening, it became clear that Annalise could no longer be by herself and attend school. The two would reach out to her parents, and several days later, they would move the young woman back to Klingenberg. Upon arriving, Annalise was able to start eating again, but her other problems continued unabated. If anything, they worsened greatly in a very short period of time. During a phone call between Father Alt and Michelle's mother, the two would be interrupted frequently by the horrendous screams of Annalise in her room, screaming obscenities and overall acting abhorrent. Father Alt would ask a fellow priest closer to Annalise to assist him in aiding her spiritual battle, a man named Father Roth. Upon reaching out to the family to arrange his meeting with them, Father Roth was surprised when Annalise's mother answered the phone and said, Father Roth? The two had never met before, nor had she been previously informed that Father Roth was going to call. Bewildered, he said, Yes, that's me. He was then informed that Annalise had told her that he was going to phone. That right there to the priest was an indication of the demonic, knowledge of the unknown. He would arrive a week later, and upon entering the house, he could hear the girl scream from her room above. A horrible stench, like something burning, like dung and sulfur filled the room that he and Mrs. Michelle chatted in, the main living room of the house. Trying to find the source of the scent, he checked all the other rooms. He checked outside, in the kitchen, everything that he could think of, and yet he could find no explainable origin for this horrible smell. Mrs. Michelle would inform him that Annalise had been in the living room roughly 20 minutes before his arrival. Stepping outside to avoid the scent, the two would chat further, and Father Roth would be informed of Annalise's outbursts of rage and all around her bizarre behavior. The family would beg him to pray over her, to which he agreed. Reluctantly walking upstairs to Annalise's room for the first time, he couldn't help but notice the abnormal amount of dead bugs that lined the hallway. Upon opening the door, he would be besieged by the girl. She began cursing at him, screaming at the top of her lungs, telling him to not dare take the crucifix out of his pocket, which he had not told anyone that he was carrying. She ran out of the bed and up to his face, suddenly stopping an inch or two away, as if she was frozen. Her eyes blackened, and she said, O oh, priest, you may try. She then collapsed to the floor in a catatonic state. This was more than enough for Father Roth to rush to arrange a meeting with Father Alt to discuss what exactly had taken place. Within two days, they would meet in person, to which Father Roth would explain that he had no doubts that the girl was being troubled by demons, that he had no doubt that it was indeed the real deal. Therefore, the two together would seek to move forward with a formal permission to begin the exorcism process. During the wait for the final set approval, the course of the next year would weave a web of disgust and horror as her family, Peter, and the priests would experience a plethora of horrendous manifestations at the hands of Annalise. Following Father Roth's initial visit, Annalise had become extremely restless. At most, she was only sleeping one, maybe two hours a night. She would run through the house on all fours, barking and screaming like an animal. She would visibly be forcibly moved by something that she couldn't see. During her prayers, which were constant at this point, she would do knee busters, standing up and kneeling down at the expense of her knees. No matter how awfully she injured them, they were becoming swollen and ulcerated. She would nonetheless continue to do this. She would scream constantly. The incessant yelling echoed all throughout the walls day and night, rising and falling like waves against a rocky shore. She would tremble and twitch, becoming rigid and catatonic, having to be moved back into her bed by Peter and her family. 
Alongside the ever-worsening madness, weighing a hundred pounds at most at this point, she began to exhibit superhuman strength. Peter would watch her crush an apple with one frail hand and throw her sister, Rosvitha, across the room like a rag doll. She also began to smash her face into walls and floors, leading to her mother placing pillows all around in an effort to stop her from injuring herself. With the Michelle family's world turning upside down, Annalise stopped eating and drinking altogether. Normal food, that is. She began to stuff the overabundance of insects into her mouth, eating roaches, hordes of flies, and spiders. Further, her behavior became more unhinged. She began to chew on coal and rocks, which ultimately broke several of her teeth. Among the chaos, her family began to experience what can only be described as paranormal manifestations themselves. Clouds of flies would appear and disappear at random all over their home, and in the dead of winter, they began to see shadowy figures that would be running all throughout their home and watching them around every corner and out of the corner of their eyes. This, of course, would deeply frighten them. As Annalise raged on, her family and Peter took to alternating two-hour shifts in order to take care of her to the best of their ability in an attempt to prevent her from inflicting more wounds upon herself. Joseph knew things, given how awful they were, could not continue the way that they were going. So he soon, out of desperation, phoned Father Alt and began begging for his assistance. Father Alt, who had been in touch with his superiors at the church, would inform him that he believed Annalise should be admitted to a psychiatric hospital for evaluation. However, upon sharing the slew of details that were shared with him by Joseph, at the dramatic worsening of Annalise's behavior and overall condition with a fellow priest by the name of Father Rodvik. Father Rodvik agreed to go and see the girl for himself. Upon entering the Michelle house, he would be introduced to Annalise through her father, who had walked her into the living room by himself on account that she had become very violent towards herself and family members by this point. Sitting down beside her, Father Rodvik asked her, What is your name? Her response, in a very low, altered voice that was not her own, was Judas. Over the course of the next several hours, the father was able to have a normal conversation with Annalise as she went from being under an outside influence to herself, having no recollection of the latter. Then, towards the end of the meeting, she would slap the father across the face and then stand up, walk towards the piano, and begin playing it as if nothing had ever happened. Father Rodvik informed the family that he would indeed help her and support them, and that he ultimately believed Annalise to be possessed and would seek action immediately. After much deliberation, the church finally came around. A priest by the name of Father Renz, an experienced exorcist, would be tasked with the ritual, and on a cold and rainy day, it would begin. September 24th, 1975, he would arrive at the Michelle residence. After discussing the plan with her family, he would proceed up the stairs and walk into the viper's den that was Annalise's room. He would be joined by Joseph, Peter, and a volunteer from their local congregation who wanted to assist. At first, all was quiet, even silent. Annalise, or rather the demons, were not engaging Father Renz, but when he began the ritual, he sprinkled holy water on Annalise, and she began to shake and scream. She started to bite the men who were holding her, lunging at the priest. She attempted to attack him. It would take all three additional men to hold her down. We draw what we know what happened from an entry in Father Renz's diary. He would go on to say that she would sound like a man, speak Latin, and eventually be reduced to a catatonic state, following an all-too-familiar pattern from what we already know. Knowing that he had a long battle ahead of him, the priest was saddened that the first ritual had not been successful. He would leave for the night, but would ultimately return four days later on September the 28th in the evening. He then brought with him a recorder 
in hopes of providing a record for future study within the church. Due to this decision by Father Renz, we now have some of the most disturbing audio I've maybe ever heard, and I've heard a lot of, of crazy stuff. This is just a portion of what he recorded. Annalise would again repeat the chaotic behavior that was exhibited within the first exorcism, and the devil that resided within her began to rebuttal the priest in Latin, as well as her native tongue of German. Although being familiar with the Latin language, Annalise was not fluent, let alone fluent enough to have been able to rebuttal a priest in real time who spoke the language fluently. As the priest inquired as to why the girl was being tormented, it, whatever it was, replied with, she was cursed before she was born by a woman, a neighbor of her mother. Annalise's parents and Peter would later check this story out, but the woman had since passed away, so they weren't able to come up with anything conclusive. This second exorcism would last for hours and would end with a haunting sentence from Annalise herself. She would say, damned for all eternity. She would then curl back up into a catatonic state, like a statue. Now, we only have some details here and there based on the diary entries, interviews, and audio recordings, but this would ultimately continue for months. Annalise would undergo 67 exorcisms in total. She would reveal that she was possessed by five demons, and their names were Cain, Judas, Nero, Fleischmann, and Lucifer the devil in the flesh. There is one more demon, but it's a name that I feel like if I say it on YouTube, I will probably get demonetized. You can look it up for yourself. Just simply go to her Wikipedia page, which I will also be linking down in the comments below. Cain, known from the Bible as the first murderer, the originator of violence. Judas, as in Judas Iscariot, the man who betrayed Christ. Nero, the crazed Roman emperor who tortured Christians for his own sick enjoyment. Fleischmann, who was a disgraced priest local to the land. And finally Lucifer, the prince of darkness himself. Her physical decline due to not being able to eat, self-inflicted injuries, and psychosis due to lack of sleep would finally take their toll. She would inform Father Rince on June 30th at the end of what would be their final exorcism, that she had spoken with the Virgin Mary and that she had agreed to stay on earth and suffer through the demons to prove to people who didn't believe in God that the devil was very real. She would then ask for absolution in which Father Rince would grant her. That night, she would go silent for the first time since all of these horrifying episodes had began. In the following morning, Around 7 a.m. on July the 1st of 1976, she would be found dead in her bed. All of the exorcisms and attempts to drive the demons out had failed, and upon her death, she only weighed roughly 85 pounds. Annalise had gone from a shy but happy girl with her whole life ahead of her to an emaciated shell of herself. Just how did we get here? Was it malpractice? Was she mentally ill? Or was it truly the hands of the demonic that snuffed her out? After multiple calls had been made by her grieving family, 
a man named Dr. Keller would perform the post-mortem examination. And it's important to note the following details because honestly, it's really intriguing. Her death was determined to be caused by starvation and possibly aggravated and tremendous physical exertion in the final weeks of her life. He would find that her inner organs surprisingly were healthy and not damaged, as well as her brain, which showed no signs of epilepsy, not even on a microscopic level. Curiously still, no bruising, bed sores, or ulcerations were found on her skin. In the ensuing aftermath, the priests were arrested and charged with negligent homicide, as well as Joseph and Anna. The trial and case overall would become a highly debated issue among the German people of the time, with some being convinced that she died at the hands of Satan himself, and others that it was the fault of malpractice on behalf of the priests and her parents. The trial would last for months, with doctors weighing in with their opinions, lawyers, witnesses, and just the whole works. And although I have those details here, there is so much to it, just the trial itself, that honestly, I would probably have to make a whole other video in total just to cover it. The verdict, however, in my opinion, is the important part of what followed her death. After a much heated debate, ultimately, Michelle's parents and the priests involved would be charged with negligent homicide and would be sentenced to six months in prison. The six months, ultimately, would be reduced to three years of probation, as well as a fine, given the unique circumstances of the case. The church would draw a ton of heat as a result of what happened. They would ultimately retract the confirmation that Annalise Michelle was indeed possessed. Michelle had been buried under hurried circumstances, and as a result of this, as well as multiple religious people sharing that they had visions of her body untouched by decay, she would be exhumed almost two years later, with the intention being to have her buried in a nicer coffin. Her family and friends were discouraged from viewing her remains because they were consistent with the decay of a corpse of that age. In the end, her case would go on to achieve worldwide notoriety and would force the Catholic Church to all but never issue sanctioned exorcisms. And on June 6th of 2013, the home in which her exorcisms took place in mysteriously caught fire and would burn to the ground. The police suspected arson, but never ultimately proved it, but many locals believed that it was a result of what had taken place there. And really, it's hard telling. Decades after her death, her story would go on to inspire multiple films and books, including The Exorcism of Emily Rose, being the most popular and honestly fairly accurate with some liberties to the original story. And of many of those books, the best and most utilized resource of them, for me, has been The Exorcism of Annalise Michelle by Felicitas D. Goodman. All, and I mean all details you could ever want about the entire case, are available in this book, and I would highly recommend it. In conclusion, Annalise's case remains a terrifying and mysterious one. Was she demonically possessed or incredibly mentally ill? Did her priests and parents genuinely help her and being freed from Satan's grasp? Or did they contribute to the end of her life accidentally? Really, the final conclusion is yours to make. But regardless of the cause, I'm glad that her suffering is over. And I pray now that she can hopefully rest in peace. Thank you guys so much for watching this new video. If you enjoyed it, please give it a like, subscribe with notifications on, and if you're already subscribed, Go ahead and turn notifications on. Uh, it helps me out a ton. Please also leave a comment letting me know what you thought of the story. Uh, your thoughts on basically the new, a newer format I'm trying out. I'm trying to do kind of like a half and half thing. I'm trying to find ways where I can speed up making content for you guys and just try and find a happy medium and uh, get you guys more content and better content. So let me know what you think for sure. And I highly appreciate your feedback. This case took a really long time. I mean, like probably like two, three weeks to research. And I really hope that I did Annalise's story justice. And I hope you guys learned some stuff that maybe you wouldn't have known before or otherwise. 
Anyways, I appreciate you guys. I love you guys. And I will see you next time. This has been Cody here at Mystery Archives. Remember to stay safe out there. And take care. Could an item, if given enough energy, devotion, and focus, begin to take on a life of its own? Could it begin to exhibit human-like characteristics, as if it has been imbued with or contains some kind of soul or entity inside of it? This act of magic has been practiced by multiple religions and cults throughout the ages. This is just one very strange example that it could indeed be possible. After a gracious gift was placed into the arms of a little girl, tragedy would strike, and what follows would continue to haunt the family, the citizens of the village, and would soon cross far beyond the barriers of land and sea. This is the untold story of Akiku, the haunted Japanese doll, and the bizarre paranormal force that possessed it. Japan is a very mystical and spiritual place, a place where the souls of the past seem to interact with the living. Such places where this spiritual energy seems to be most visible is throughout many of Japan's spiritual temples. Home to many religions, the two main ones being Buddhism and Shintoism, thousands of temples exist all over the country but one in particular houses a spiritual artifact that has a tragic backstory and an even more terrifying story that continues to be written to this day. Located in Hokkaido, Japan, at the Meninji Buddhist Temple, is a doll with a bizarre and tragic backstory indeed. Although there are several origin stories of how the doll came to be and how the temple became its final living space, so to speak, all of them have most of the main details in common. Therefore, I'll be telling the most agreed upon origin story to try and be as true to the legend as I can. The year is 1918 in Hokkaido, Japan, and a 17-year-old boy by the name of Ikigi Suzuki is in search of a gift for his little sister's birthday. As he pursues the different vendors and small shops something soon catches his attention. In one of the store windows, he spots a small, childlike doll wearing a traditional Japanese kimono. Knowing that he had finally found something his sister will love, Ikiki quickly purchases the doll and makes his way back home through the countryside. As the family celebrates their little girl's birthday, Okiku is presented with the doll and almost immediately as soon as her eyes meet hers, she falls in love with him. The two from this point become inseparable. Wherever Okiku is, her doll is right by her side. She combs her hair, bathes her, dresses her, and treats her as if she was her little sister. The two even share meals and sleep side by side. The joy that the doll brought Okiku must have filled Ekiki's heart with such happiness, but soon that happiness would change to tragedy. One hot day, as the little girl played outside with her doll, she was bitten by a mosquito. This benign insect bite would soon manifest itself into a horrible case of malaria. Although the family did everything they could possibly do, Okiku would pass away scared and gasping for air as she clutched her special doll all the way until the moment she took her last breath. Devastated, the Suzuki's planned to have their little girl buried with the doll since she loved it so much, but unfortunately, due to either governmental or religious oversight at the time, this wasn't an option. Instead, after they had laid Akiku to rest, the doll would be placed on a small family shrine located within the living quarters of their home as a tribute of sorts to their late daughter and their love for her. But shortly after the doll was placed on the shrine, very strange things began to happen. Ikiki, upon walking past the shrine one day, 
noticed that the doll's hair seemed significantly longer than what it had been when it was placed there. The hair, which was originally shoulder's length on the doll itself, and black, was now overgrown, with differing shades of brown hair also coming through and splitting at the ends. Finding this bizarre to say the least, he brought the discovery to his parents' attention, and unsure of what else to do, they trimmed the doll's hair. As the days came and went, the family began to have distressing dreams at night of their departed Okiku. Sometimes she would be scared and alone in the darkness, calling out to them, only being recognized by her voice. Other times, she would blame them for what happened to her. Each member of the family at differing times had these dreams, and they would soon lead all of them to believe that Akiku's soul wasn't peacefully resting. These disturbing dreams soon became all the stranger when the doll, which they began to refer to as Akiku in their daughter's honor, would appear by their bedsides following these nightmares. One such incident involved the father of the family waking up in a cold sweat, only to be met face to face with the blank and lifeless stare of the doll. Unsure of what was taking place, the Suzukis turned to their faith. After contacting a local Buddhist priest and having a cleansing ritual be performed on their home and the doll, the activity seemed to grow and become stronger. Accompanying their ever-frequent nightmares and random movements of the doll, the chilling events grew into full-blown spiritual manifestations. During their waking life, they soon began to hear banging noises all throughout the house and the whispers of a little girl. Strange disembodied voices, varying from high-pitched, like those of a child, to the low groans of something unexplainable, began to be heard. Their lights began to flicker on and off, and the paranormal activity seemed to happen more frequently as the calendar ticked closer to the birth and death dates of Akiku. These strange and terrifying happenings would continue over the course of the next 20 years, with multiple religious priests and shamans being contacted, and all coming to the same conclusion that after the cleansings failed time and time again, that the restless spirit of Akiku now inhabited the doll she once loved so much. Finally, needing a major change and unable to deal with the ever-intensifying spiritual presence that seemed to haunt their home, the Suzukis relocated to a different district. Believing the doll to be the source of their various ailments and emotional torture that they had endured over the last two decades, they had no desire to take it with them. The family had reached the conclusion that if their daughter's soul wasn't at peace, what could perhaps be helping to fuel Okiku's power or magic was the close proximity of her grave to their home where the doll resided. So in order to distance the doll from the grave, the family approached the Meninji Buddhist temple in Hokkaido, and over the years, the doll's reputation for being haunted had spread throughout the community and indeed the majority of the country. This was more than likely due to the various interactions between the spiritual community and the Suzuki family. Finding the doll to be mesmerizing and possibly a unique opportunity to commute and interact with the dead if the stories were true, the leaders and priests of the Meninji Temple agreed to home Okiku permanently. As with many legends, we find lots of details to be exaggerated over time and perhaps some of the details to not be true at all. And this is what the priests were originally thinking, that perhaps due to grief, the family was dealing with other spiritual ailments, perhaps unrelated to the doll, or causing the doll to be a vessel of sorts for restless spirits. However, as the years came and went, as Akiku now called the temple her home, they began to slowly but surely experienced the same strangeness the Suzuki's had for all of those years. Okiku's hair continued to grow, and this baffled the priests. They would eventually have the hair trimmed and tested, and the hair was said to belong to a little girl. 
They found that the entity seemed to be appeased when her hair was trimmed and combed, and this led to less activity for a time. But the same activity, the knocking, banging, and disembodied voices, would soon plague the temple as well. Nokiku's power only seemed to grow. Any priest who seemed skeptical of the doll or attempted to cleanse it themselves soon had their dreams haunted as well, turning their sleep into restless fits. Their homes and rooms soon also began to manifest the very same activity that the temple was now exhibiting. With no remedy seeming to work, the leaders turned to appeasement instead, hoping that gestures of goodwill would keep the entity at bay. As years turned to decades, and as we've come into the 21st century, the priests of multiple generations now have overseen and cared for the doll known as Akiku. And though some of the more violent activity has faded, the general consensus is that she is now just as powerful as she was, or is perhaps more powerful as she's continued to age. It seems like as the more her fame and notoriety grows, the more visitors she has, the stronger she becomes. She continues to invade the dreams of those who come to visit her, and her hair is growing faster and more frayed. She is said to drive tourists mad who doubt her, with many people even reporting that besides seeing her strange hair and feeling a malevolent presence when visiting her, they've also had her stalk and appear in their dreams. Some more disturbing and recent reports have even suggested that her mouth is slowly opening and that if you dare to peer inside of it, you may just catch a glimpse of baby-like teeth sprouting from her porcelain gums, as if whoever or whatever she is is slowly turning to flesh and bone. The paranormal displays of her power continue to occur as well. Her permanent home located within the Menijing Temple is her own private shrine where she sits in a small wooden box on display. It is here that she watches and waits for anyone and everyone who dares to play with fire and invoke the power of the entity known as Okiku. But what are your thoughts? Was Okiku the girl trapped inside of the doll? In my opinion, Although her spirit would be much older now, at the time of her death, she was either close to or was three years old, and no person at that age is capable of true malice, to the point to where she would become aware enough to begin to blame her parents and then torment them for decades to come. As children, our parents or our family are our entire world, so I find it incredibly difficult to think that these bizarre happenings were the result of her soul being restless and imbuing the doll. What I find more likely, and all the more interesting really, is the thought of invocation or the imbuing of the doll, like a conduit or a vessel of sorts. Akiku the girl was, as they said, inseparable from this doll. She fed it, bathed it, took naps with it, and everything else a small child would do with that wonderful imagination that they have. But could all of this dedication and focus, accompanied with the tragedy that took place, allow for a portal to open for an entity, whether non-human or restless human spirit, to inhabit the doll? And by non-human, I mean a demon. This would make sense to me. Something that enjoys and grows more powerful off of pain and misfortune, or the emotional torment of others. As it causes the pain, it feeds off of it and grows ever stronger. This would not only explain the malevolent manifestations of whatever entity is present, but would also explain the still present force and the alleged ever growing power of it. And depending on the entity's strength, it could also explain why the cleansings thus far have failed. However, if you find yourself taking a trip to Japan anytime soon, or you happen to call Japan home, if you find yourself in Hokkaido, you may want to steer clear of the Menijin Temple, because if you don't, the entity that inhabits the doll known as Okiku may just use you as its next feeding source, where it'll begin to plague your dreams, making you twist 
and turn, sweat and fear as it grows ever stronger and attempts to cross from its world into ours, making our plane of existence its permanent residence. Many homes have been given the title of Demon House, many of which I have covered here on this channel, but this house, out of all of them, has truly earned the moniker. From the time the soil was dug up during the Victorian era, a curse seemed to be placed upon the land, and when you combine terrible happenings with occult rituals, it's truly a recipe for disaster, the results of which have produced a cornucopia of paranormal activity within this now infamous Indiana home. This is the untold story of the frightening Monroe Demon House. Join me as I attempt to uncover its supernatural secrets. With the ever-changing algorithmic favor of YouTube, please, if you enjoy my content, leave a like, a comment, and subscribe. Thank you all. Information available on this property is scarce at best, but I have done my best to find out as much as I could to try and provide you with the most cohesive picture possible. Hartford City, Indiana, what was started as a small log cabin settlement, continued to grow and eventually hit the big time in the late 1880s, where itself and its neighbors entered a natural gas boom resulting in many factories being created during industrialization. Factories that produce textiles, glass, and other goods. But although natural resources were widely abundant within the ground there, something else seemed to inhabit the soil. Our story begins at the construction site of a rather unsuspecting looking Victorian home. The year is 1892 and the Berger family who emigrated to the area from Belgium, had been successful in their business endeavors, and thus thought a new home in their new country would be the ultimate earthly reward. However, the family's newfound happiness would be all but short-lived. From the time the earth was dug up and the new home erected, within months, John Berger, the patriarch of the family, would die from tuberculosis within its walls. Mourning his death, this would be far from the last tragedy his family would endure moving forward. Shortly after John's death, a fire would mysteriously start in the upstairs level of the house, in time destroying a large portion of the property, and the majority of the Berger family would meet a truly gruesome and terrible fate. Following the horrific fire that torched what little happiness the Berger family had left, the widow of the family and one surviving child desperately needed a source of income. So the widowed Mrs. Berger decided to start renting out rooms in order to make it. There would be various tenants, but the most prominent were the Myers family. The head of the household, a man named Ulysses Myers, was a well-known respected member of the community. He was known for his kindness, compassion, and for being an all-around amazing family man. But this reputation would soon fade. Shortly after moving into the home, Ulysses slowly began to change. Those who knew him believed that he had done a complete shift in his entire personality, all just within months. So much so that he became unrecognizable, not only to his close friends, but to his family as well. His kindness, compassion, and care all seemed to have been buried, and someone new now greeted them each day behind the eyes of Ulysses. He quickly became prone to fits of rage and insanity. This led him to become abusive towards his once beloved family verbally, 
as well as physically. These new bursts of rage, however, weren't reserved strictly for his family. He soon turned on friends and colleagues, too. This sudden heel turn for Myers led him to losing his job after an altercation at his workplace. And shortly after this, despite how much he had cherished his family before, he stole what was left of his family's money and abandoned his wife and children by skipping town with a newfound mistress. All of which was the polar opposite of the man that they thought they knew. Shattered beyond repair, the Myers family were left with open wounds upon their hearts and confusion in their minds. The only differing factor from their life before to what it was now was the fact that they had moved into this house. Now with the home claiming the destruction of two families, rumors quickly began to spread locally throughout Hartford City that the house contained some kind of curse. Whether it was upon the property or the land was uncertain. The Myers family soon moved out and due to the rumors, Mrs. Berger was unable to keep tenants to help support her and her surviving child. Thus, she was forced to sell the property at a fire sale rate in order to start somewhere new. What happened to the Bergers is unknown. With this sale, a revolving door of tenants and owners would begin. As soon as one family would move in, they would almost immediately move out. Again and again, this cycle would continue. It would go from being lived in by a family to being rented out and built onto, eventually creating its triplex design that we know today. Those who had moved in and out often reported experiencing bizarre activity, and others simply just didn't say anything, possibly not wanting to come to grips with the reality of what they had been through. This ever-changing list of tenants would continue for decades. Along with this revolving door of people came a revolving door of peculiar behaviors and practices. Rumors began to circulate in the late 1980s and into the early 1990s that tenants during this time frame were performing occult rituals and ceremonies within the home, particularly within the basement. Black magic rituals and ceremonies. Those conducting them attempted to harness the negative energy that dwelled there, to conjure a demon to do their bidding. Although information is limited, one could assume that perhaps their efforts were successful. From the mid-90s onward, the strangeness that surrounds the house on Monroe Street only intensified, with new stories coming from new tenants and neighbors alike. Stories that this old, Victorian home housed a dark and malevolent force. These stories soon began to spread like wildfire. Those who would move into the house typically would only last in the home a year or less. They often fled in the middle of the night with nothing but the clothes upon their backs, only continuing to solidify that something evil dwelled within the house. Things in fact got so bad that even when the home was abandoned for a time, the windows would be blacked out in order to keep people from looking inside. But not because of vandalism problems, but due to so many neighbors and passerbys calling the police, claiming that they kept seeing shadowy figures walk around the interior of the Monroe house. With the home providing a plethora of paranormal evidence, and experiences. This soon drew the attention of paranormal scholars and investigation groups from all over the country. This is just some of the activity said to have been experienced by various groups over the years. People have reported a vast amount of supernatural happenings, many of which have been caught on film, photo, or digital audio recording. These range from aggressive and insulting EVPs or electronic voice phenomena 
to full-bodied apparitions, shadow figures, and possibly in human manifestations. Mysterious sounds like knocking, banging, and footsteps are common. Doors and cabinets slamming shut with incredible amounts of force. And most of the activity seems to be centered around the basement as well as the top floor. And the top floor is speculated to be the place where the fire had started that engulfed the Berger family. The basement, of course, is where the alleged black magic rituals took place. In both of these locations, an eerie shadowy specter of an old malicious woman is said to attack people. But just who could this entity be? Someone who had previously lived there? Or something inhuman cloaking itself in some kind of familiar skin? Stories of groups panicking and fleeing, too, have become commonplace. One paranormal group, which wishes to remain anonymous, in 2014 had such a disturbing experience that they fled the home in fear for their lives. They arrived on site at the Monroe House amidst a strong thunderstorm, unpacking their vehicle, attempting to keep their equipment dry and safe. They made their way inside, and in due time began documenting whatever they could find there. As they investigated, asking questions, provoking interaction, and recording level by level, the more activity they began to experience. Shadows moved out of the corner of their eyes. Bangs, knocking, and cabinets slamming shut could be discerned from the reverb of the thunder outside. But it's when they decided to go down to the basement that their lives would be altered forever. As they descended the stairs, an eerie cold began to overtake them. As they asked their questions, attempting to catch any activity they could, their flashlights and devices failed. Left with only the enveloping darkness, with the occasional flash of lightning coming through the basement windows, something appeared to them that caused them to flee immediately. But just what, or who, was this apparition? This cannot be confirmed. Whatever it was terrified them so much that they fled into the torrential downpour and refused to ever return. Later, when asked for details, even separately, the members of the group thus far have refused to discuss the incident further. Whether this is out of fear for whatever this thing is or was, re-entering their lives, or the mere thought is so reality-shattering, one cannot be sure. This incident and its aftermath truly makes you wonder just what they could have saw within the dilapidated, damp basement that accursed night. Investigations will continue with multiple groups coming in and out, until a very peculiar discovery took place in 2016, and this discovery would lead to much speculation as to what could have happened within the house. While conducting an investigation for their show Paranormal Lockdown, Nick Groff and Katrina Weirdman found themselves in the basement and were slowly being drawn to the crawl space of the house. As they traversed the damp darkness, what they would find would alter the story forever. Located within the crawl space were human remains, bones, buried in a shallow grave. This freaked the entire crew out and prompted them to stop filming and to call the police immediately. From here, a full-scale investigation would be conducted and the remains excavated and sent to a local coroner there in Indiana for further examination. The bones were indeed confirmed to be human and were, quote, at least a hundred years old possibly older. Following the coroner, they were sent to Indiana University for further testing to determine the age 
and identification of the person. At this point, the final outcome has not yet been reported, such as the age of the individual found, or their identity, or potential cause of death. The presumed investigation is still underway. This put a brief pause on people being allowed to enter the now privately owned home that pause has since been lifted, with many more investigations taking place over the years since. And with these investigations, even more paranormal activity and aggressive activity at that has been reported. These investigations also range from amateur to professional, from the average Joe to YouTubers and famous paranormal teams. Those who have entered the walls of the Monroe Demon House have experienced, in addition to previously mentioned activity, strange sights, smells, and feelings, demonic snarls, growls, and even full-blown attacks have happened, and these have involved scratching, biting, and being shoved. Oftentimes, these more intense manifestations are accompanied with aggressive and commanding EVPs, where people's names are often used. Windows slamming shut with so much force that they shatter, leaving fragments of glass all over the floor, just like the fragments left of the lives of the families who once dwelled there has also happened. One previous owner of the home allegedly even jumped out a window on the top floor upon being attacked by a demonic apparition. Imagine that for a moment. You're so terrified that you would rather risk diving through a window at the top of your house, breaking it ultimately, let alone falling however far and injuring yourself out of pure fear and fight or flight instead of dealing with whatever this thing was that was attacking you, rushing towards you. That to me is bone chilling. Others who have stayed more recently have also reported puddles of strange liquid throughout the house at varying times and with seemingly no origin. Horrific nightmares if they manage to sleep and why you would ever choose to sleep there is beyond me. And even strange footprints or paw prints such as this one, have also been discovered multiple times. So with all of these high strangeness manifestations, we must ask ourselves, just what is it that lurks within the Monroe Demon House? Could it have been a curse placed upon the land, something that predated the building of the house? It's certainly possible, in my opinion, to somewhat back up that claim. Native American artifacts, such as arrowheads, have been found around the property, but nothing significant that would indicate some kind of a curse. No burial grounds or mounds, from what I could find. What if it was a generational or family curse? Again, it's possible, but seems somewhat unlikely from what I've seen. The Berger family up until the home was built had great success in their endeavors, and for all intents and purposes, seemed happy and thriving, until, of course, they weren't. Then there's the enigma of the Myers family. Did Ulysses Myers lose his mind due to the home? One could certainly make that connection, considering his complete shift in personality. But what was it in particular that caused him to change so drastically? This question, and more, we may never truly be able to answer. All we can do is speculate. Then, the numerous owners and tenants over the decades since the days of the Bergers and Myers, many of them reporting odd and often scary paranormal or poltergeist activity. Was this activity also taking place when the older families lived there? Or did it start after their departure? If this was the case, if it started afterwards, was it the result of negative events attracting something dark? Or was one of the families or family members 
involved in the occult. And speaking of occult, just who or what were those people in the late 80s and to the early 90s doing? What kind of black magic or rituals were conducted? And were they responsible for conjuring some kind of entity into the home? Or... Did their practices just make the entire situation much worse? And did it have anything to do with the human remains that were found in the basement? And if not the black mages closer to modern times? Someone in the early 1900s had to have known just who this person was and what happened to them. And of course, will the identity and cause of death ever be determined for the poor soul? whose remains were found within the basement. As you ponder all of these questions and attempt to draw your own conclusions, I want to leave you with several final questions. Will the activity ever cease? And will the origin ever truly be determined? All of these questions honestly may not have answers. Perhaps they're out of our scope of understanding, or perhaps the answers have just simply been lost to the sands of time. But one thing I can say for certain is this. Given how many people have experienced dark and spine-tingling paranormal activity within this house, and taking into account how long it has been occurring, this is one home that has truly earned the name The Demon House. Because a demon is precisely what may just be lurking within its depths. Thank you guys so much for watching this new video. I've decided that I'm going to show my face um, on occasion or do that style of format every so often. Uh, I don't want it to be my entire format. I kind of wanted to get back to my roots with this video and all around, I just want to make the content that you guys have grown to love and enjoy. So there will most definitely still be all narration style content and I will still do the newer format every so often as well. Speaking of which, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe with notifications on, and please comment and share this video around. Again, YouTube has been awful the last couple months, but we're still fighting the good fight. So if you could do that for me, I would greatly appreciate it. This topic was highly requested for months and months, and I finally uh, got the drive to dive into it and uh, to try and do my best to research the history and various stories surrounding it. So hopefully I did those stories and the topic overall justice. If you would like a particular topic or location covered, please also let me know down in the comments below. Uh, all around, I have several new videos in the works, and I want to give you guys the content that you enjoy as often as I can. And speaking of things that I'm playing catch up on, uh, the signed Mystery Archives poster from the Ammons Family video. Uh, I think I'm going to do a live video doing the drawing for that, and probably, I don't know, just catch up with you guys here pretty soon. So please keep an eye out for that. Uh, I'll go ahead and schedule it in the community tab, and then that way we can all hopefully get, funnel in as much as possible, and I will do a live drawing for that and uh, get a lucky person a pretty cool poster with my signature on it. So as always, guys, this has been Cody here at Mystery Archives. Thank you all again for supporting me, and please remember to stay safe out there and take care. Vampirism, the actions or existence of vampires. A vampire, which is considered to be a mythical creature, one that subsists upon feeding on the vital essence of living beings, their blood. But what if I told you that there have been many of vampire legends over the centuries and all over the world? Would you entertain the possibility that perhaps out of all of them, one or several could indeed be the real deal. Today we will be discussing a very strange and honestly not very well known vampire case, one that took place back in Europe in the 1700s. The amount of witnesses and said duration of vampiric activity 
might just make you think. This is the terrifying vampire legend of the monster of Medvita of Serbia. And this story is truly an interesting one, indeed. Before we begin, I did just want to say I've been sick the last three days, so if my voice sounds a little scratchy, uh, that's why. I'm on a bunch of Robitussin and some vitamin C right now, so we're slowly but surely getting over it. But if I don't sound like my normal self, I sound a little stuffy. That's why. The information about the case provided comes from a pretty scarce variety of sources, Given the age of this story, I've done my best to provide you with the most accurate and detail-oriented retelling of it as I could. So, I hope you enjoy the content. Legends of vampires have existed for millennia. Cultures such as the Mesopotamians, Hebrews, ancient Greeks, and even the Romans had tales of demonic entities and blood-drinking spirits, which are considered precursors to modern vampires. Despite the occurrence of vampire-like creatures in these ancient civilizations, the folklore for the entity known today as the vampire originates almost exclusively from early 18th century southeastern Europe, particularly the region that is now known as Transylvania, as verbal traditions of many ethnic groups from the region were recorded and published over the generations. With the Treaty of Pasorovitz, the Habsburg monarchy annexed most of Serbia and the northern part of Bosnia, territories which had been part of the Ottoman Empire. These remained in Austrian control until the Treaty of Belgrade in 1739, when the Austrians were forced to cede them back to the Turks. During this 20-year period, these newly conquered boundary districts were subject to direct military rule from Vienna for strategic, fiscal, and other reasons. As a result of the devastation brought about by previous Austrian-Ottoman wars, these areas were in poor condition, with scarce and partially nomadic development. And to attract German-speaking Serbian settlers to the new territories, many of the Serbs, especially those who had emigrated from Ottoman-held areas, were recruited as militiamen, also known as Hajduks. These high dukes were for the peacetime protection of the borders and for regular military service at war in exchange for unalienable lots of land. It was in these communities that the earliest well-documented vampire tax occurred. But with that, could there have been any credence to these legends? In the year 1726, a man named Arnold Paoli had just returned from a military tour in Greece. He was a high duke, and this was a type of infantry soldier, as I previously mentioned, that was part of militaries from the late 16th to the mid 19th centuries. They had reputations from being bandits to freedom fighters, depending on the time frame and the enemies that they had at the time. Upon returning home from his tour of duty, he had a wound upon his neck. This is one of the first things that Paoli's wife Melisa noticed upon seeing him. As she asked what happened, she was shocked to hear what his explanation was. During a patrol, several soldiers, including himself, had been attacked by what they described as a vampire. The creature had ambushed them as they traversed a thick forest during the night. The creature which he described had pale skin, wings, and fangs. It had killed several of the soldiers, moving with insane speed and feasting upon the men's blood by biting into them. Arnold would be just one of the two men that would survive the attack. But being bitten, his fear began to grow. The common belief during that time is that if you were bitten by a vampire, you had to find its grave and burn it in order to prevent the curse from spreading. So given this information, this is what Arnold set off to do. Over the course of several weeks, as he felt more and more ill, he spoke with locals and travelers alike to try to discover just what or who this creature was and where he could find it. 
Gathering his strength, he set out to fight the beast. However, upon arriving at its grave, the creature was nowhere to be found. Instead, Arnold ended up defacing its grave and ultimately setting it aflame. Believing that he had stopped the creature for good and stopped the curse from spreading within his own veins, Arnold felt victorious in his own mind. However, he still felt ill. His cold sweats, now coupled with bizarre cravings, persisted. Several weeks after these events, Arnold would be sent home and was now speaking with his wife in his native village of Medvita. Given all that her husband had discussed with her, Mrs. Paoli was frightened to say the least. But her husband had reassured her that all would be well, that he had followed instructions to the letter to ensure his safety, as well as hers and the neighbors around them. The two would go to bed that night for what would be the final time. The following morning, Arnold would be found unresponsive by his wife, and within hours, he was confirmed to be dead. Shocked at Arnold's untimely death and her own transformation into a grieving widow, Melisa would have Arnold buried and would try to grieve him in due time, hoping that her late husband would find eternal peace. However, Arnold apparently did not. Almost as soon as his body was placed in a wooden coffin in what should have been his eternal resting place, and as dirt was sprinkled over him, Arnold seemed to rise from the grave, or so according to multiple people. Within ten days of his burial, four people complained to the city council that Arnold Paoli had visited them, and they all, interestingly enough, had the same exact story. They all had received a knock on their door in the dead of night. Upon answering it, they would meet face to face with the departed Arnold. Although having seen him dead and buried, he was nonetheless there, pale, but alive and in the flesh. Arnold would then ask to come inside their home. As they spoke to him, they acknowledged that something seemed very off about him. Any time they brought up his burial or his death, he would completely not acknowledge it whatsoever and would just move right past it as if nothing had ever happened. He also had an air about him. Something hypnotic sat behind his eyes. He would ask for a drink, and as they fetched an ale for him, upon looking around their home and calling his name, they all then reported being attacked and bitten by him, only for him to then rush out of their homes and into the foggy night. This bewildered the village council members at first. They weren't sure of what to make of the reports, and things became all the stranger when all four of the people who had made the initial reports passed away. And they passed away just as Arnold had, which was bizarre to say the least. With multiple corpses on their hands, the council would then order an investigation. They would speak with local military officials and would be surprised to hear that they had heard of this kind of thing before. And ten days later, following the ultimate deaths of the four, and approximately a month after Arnold's burial, the villagers advised by their hand knack or their local military leader banded together and would head to Arnold Paoli's grave. They would arrive at the graveyard on a cold and misty night. Upon surveying, it appeared that the dirt above his casket had recently been tampered with. Biting the bullet, they dug deep into the earth and would make contact with the coffin after just a few minutes of labor. Upon opening the casket, they would reveal Arnold Paoli and would note some very interesting details about his body. His corpse wasn't decomposed, and his veins were full of blood. Fresh, warm blood flowed from his eyes and mouth. They also found that his skin, hair, and nails had seemingly fallen off and filled the coffin around him, and that new skin, hair, and nails had taken their place. According to their beliefs, they believed Arnold had developed into an arch-vampire, a vampire of considerable strength, 
and they believed that he indeed had been exiting his grave and feeding, that the curse had spread to him. In order to combat this, after concluding that Paoli was indeed a vampire, they drove a large wooden stake through his heart, and upon piercing his chest, he let out a loud, blood-curdling shriek, and his eyes shot wide open and glanced at those around him. They said that his eyes were blood-red, like the devil himself. Deeply frightened but further motivated to ensure that he couldn't harm anyone else, they would cut off his head, dismember his body, and then would ultimately burn his entire body. They then proceeded to go grave to grave to all of Paoli's supposed victims and do the exact same procedure to ensure that they wouldn't turn into vampires themselves. Although disturbing, the villagers believed that they had ensured their safety and had successfully cleansed their land of the plague of vampirism. However, this happiness would be all too short-lived. Roughly five years later, in the winter of 1731, amid the snowdrifts, livestock began to be feasted upon by an unknown creature. The creature left two fang marks upon the necks of goats and sheep, the very lifeblood of the village, their food source. Following this bizarre discovery, as people began to eat the livestock to survive the harsh cold of the winter, a new epidemic was sinking its teeth into the village. People soon became ill after eating the animals, and they quickly complained of stabs in their sides and pains in their chests, prolonged fever, and jerking of the limbs. They typically would only last three days after contracting the sickness, and the age of the newly deceased varied greatly, from the very young to the very old. In total, 13 people would pass of this mystery disease in just six weeks. Disturbingly, a newborn infant had contracted the illness through their mother, through breastfeeding, and upon its passing, it was buried, only to be dug up and drained of all of its blood within hours of its burial. The villagers, concerned and scared, would report this information to their local military leaders, and the responsibility would ultimately fall upon a lieutenant colonel with the last name of Schneza. Schneza, fearing the pestilence, sent for the Imperial Contagion's medical team, roughly their version of an infectious disease containment team that resided just one village over. While waiting for their arrival, he began his investigation. Malnutrition was common in the area due to Eastern Orthodox fasting practices. However, the villagers were not malnourished. And as he continued to look into the matter, other reports began to trickle in of new deaths, violent deaths at the hands of this unknown creature. Two more people would pass away. Fear soon overtook the entire village and families began staying with one another at night. Often two to three families to a home. They would watch over each other in shifts in order to stave off whatever this creature was. After several of his own men were attacked on patrol, Schneza began to believe the rumors that this creature could possibly be a vampire. Those who were familiar with the legend of them would inform him that the illness and deaths would only cease if the vampire or vampires were found and slain. Fearing that the citizens would abandon the village if nothing was done, and upon the arrival of the disease control group, a new commission was formed, and this commission included a military surgeon and two other high-ranking officers, and the investigation would be furthered with new intensity. On January the 7th of 1732, the commission, along with village elders and military officials, would exhume the graves of the now 18 people who had passed, and what they would find would shock them. Six of the corpses were decayed, and this was normal given the time frame of death, but 12 out of the 18, however, were not. Their veins, again, were filled with fresh blood, 
They appeared as if they were sleeping. Some had a pale complexion, and others a light red complexion instead. Their skin, hair, and nails appeared to have fallen off, and new hair, skin, and nails had taken their place. Fearing the worst, believing those twelve to be exhibiting signs of vampirism, they would begin the cleansing, the age-old practice of staking the hearts, dismembering the bodies, burning them, and then disposing of the ashes. As they went grave by grave and staked each person, almost every single one of them screamed and opened their eyes, revealing blood-red orbs staring back at them before fading away. Following this event, a report would be made and would be submitted further up the military chain of command, and it bared the signature of five officers in total. The report would spur much interest in what was taking place and come to find out six other villages in the area were dealing with the exact same thing. So the investigation would grow from one village to a region-wide one involving numerous military officials and elders of the time. Over months of searching and investigating for the root cause of the supposed vampirism, it would be concluded ultimately that the now deceased Arnold Paoli had not only killed the four persons of whom he had contacted, but he had also feasted upon several oxen. The new vampires who were created not only fed upon the villagers, but their livestock as well, once they had turned. However, they had believed that they had tracked down all those affected by the vampirism as they rested in their graves, waiting for their next feedings and had ended their ungodly existences, ensuring the safety of themselves and furthermore, the region. The results of this report would ultimately help inform and train future regiments of how to deal with the plague of vampirism if they should ever come across it. This case to me is so interesting because not only is it scary given the descriptions and the actions of the supposed vampires, but the fact that so many people and people of prestigious status within the military of the time were involved, and they were the ones who made the ultimate conclusions in the report. It's also interesting that it almost describes vampirism as a type of disease, one that transfers from bites and eating the flesh of animals that had been bitten, with some people dying of its effects, and others dying but turning into vampires themselves. It also describes the hierarchy of vampires in a sense, that some are more powerful than others. Now, but is it true? I mean, according to those of the time, it's absolutely true. Now, we know that superstition and lack of education in regards to the human body and decomposition are things during this time, for sure, that trapped air, body fluids, etc., can and will exit a body upon death, especially over time. And we do know that hair, nails, and sometimes skin retract, given the appearance of growth on a corpse over time. But if what they said was true, we do know the dead bodies don't grow new hair, skin, or nails, and that their eyes wouldn't open and glance as if they were alive. I also have to say that the pale appearance and the light red skin on some is interesting because we don't usually picture vampires as having red skin. Usually they are portrayed as uh, being pale. At least that's where my mind tends to go. And maybe that's just a pop culture thing. It's hard telling. And the descriptions of their eyes being blood red like the devil himself is just creepy and terrifying to me. Like it just, it gives me the chills. I mean, imagine something like that staring you down. Like, no, no thanks. So was it real or was it the imagination of the people of the time and the age in which it took place in? Ultimately, that conclusion is yours to make. But I do have to say, it's made for one hell of an interesting story. That's for sure. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Uh, I hope you're liking the addition of the new cryptid stories alongside our usual paranormal cases. And uh, let me know if you're liking the new format. I'm trying to kind of find ways where I can deliver content to you a little bit faster. And um, I don't know. I just feel like I'm, I'm talking more directly to you guys now that you can kind of see me face to face. And I don't know. It just feels cool. I hope you guys like it.
like all around it's gotten me out of my comfort zone which sometimes can be a good thing and I'm, I'm quite liking where it's going and I'm sure I'll improve over time. I'll probably add some cooler stuff in the background so it doesn't look as boring. <laughs> uh, with that guys, don't forget to like the video, subscribe if you're new here, and if you're not new here, turn notifications on because apparently YouTube doesn't like to promote my content anymore, which kind of sucks. But anyways, I don't have enough time or energy to be able to spam you. Not that I would anyways. <laughs> And of course, please share this bad boy around so that some new people can enjoy the content as well. Other than that, guys, I'm throwing a lot of info at you, but if you have a particular story that you would like me to cover, whether it's a cryptid story, paranormal, or otherwise, go ahead and let me know down in the comments below as well. And as always, this has been Cody here at Mystery Archives. Remember to please stay safe out there, especially from vampires. And take care. I'll see you next time. An unsuspecting family finds what they believe to be the perfect home, but underneath the facade of this charming farmhouse, there is a sinister force, dark as the abyss. Lying underneath a heavy fog upon the land, there lies generations of graves. These graves could hold the key to solving their paranormal nightmare. This is the untold story of the old Arnold estate also known as the Conjuring House, and the demonic forces that dwell within it. Harrisville, Rhode Island, a small town located on America's east coast, with just a population of an estimated 1,800 people. Like many towns across the country, you could easily overlook this one at face value. But it's when we take a deeper look, we discover that this little town has a dark history. Its story is filled with death, from murders to drownings and much more. With all these unfortunate happenings in mind, it makes one beg the question, could there be something evil that stalks this place? Something that feeds upon suffering and misery? Perhaps there is. And perhaps that is what contributed to the creation of the following story. It all starts in Central Falls, Rhode Island in 1970, where the Perone family, which consisted of Mother Carolyn, Father Roger, and their five daughters, Andrea, Nancy, Christine, Cynthia, and April were all living a relatively normal life. Among things like school, work, and outdoor play, nothing seemed quite out of the ordinary, yet. The children had been gifted a puppy with an exceptionally unique personality, and out of the ether, a name came to mind when they were naming her, Bathsheba. A unique dog with a unique name. She was fond of all the children, but especially Andrea. Now 10 years old, she would often take Bathsheba for walks around their suburban neighborhood. However, on one of those walks, tragedy would strike and would seemingly set in motion a snowball effect that would follow the family for years to come. While Andrea had the puppy out in the neighborhood, her sisters had come up from playing outside and decided to make the walk a group activity. All seemed fine until a car full of teenagers drove by at an incredibly high rate of speed. They seemed to be yelling something in unison and had brightly colored tassels hanging out of their windows. Bathsheba was an obedient dog, but the flailing and bright colored streamers caught her attention. And in an instant, she broke loose from Andrea and bolted towards the vehicle. The shocked girls then watched the car miss her by mere inches as she made her way safely across the road. But being the good dog that she was, upon hearing Andrea call out to her again, she began to run back to them. And in the blink of an eye, she was struck by another vehicle. 
an elderly couple that never even saw her. Her leash had gotten caught around one of the wheels of their car when they hit her, and she was suffering immensely. A nearby neighbor called the police, and upon removing the children from the scene, they were traumatized further as they heard the gunshot that ended the poor animal's life. The entire family now held a deep despair at the tragedy that had taken place. She wasn't just a pet, she was a member of the family, and there was now an unspoken pain that haunted them. The family had planned a vacation months prior and hoped that a break from their normal routine would help everyone. So they went. And soon, some of their sadness turned to joy as the family experienced hotel swimming pools, ice cream, and shopping. But this joy would too be short-lived. The family also had four cats, and upon returning to their home with this newfound sense of well-being, they would endure even more trauma. They would discover that almost all of their cats had been viciously killed by neighborhood kids while they were gone. Several had every bone in their bodies broken with a baseball bat. Upon this horrific discovery, their father Roger rushed inside the house to call the police, only to find their home absolutely ransacked as well. Furniture was upside down, mirrors and windows broken. All of their provisions left to spoil from their tipped over fridge, and their carpet was doused in motor oil. It would later be discovered that two of their cats were killed by the group of the kids. One would never be seen again, and the other had been seriously beaten, but would survive. Although the neighborhood was known for angsty teenagers and rough housing kids, the family wondered. How could these kids conduct such evil? Did the devil's foot soldiers know no bounds? A police report was filed, and it was shortly uncovered that the demon seed who had led these awful actions was their 12-year-old neighbor. The young man was seemingly a born criminal. Upon being confronted, the boy's mother covered for her son, and despite their best efforts, due to lack of evidence, Nothing much would come of the report with the police, but Andrea would have her revenge. She had yet to come to terms with her precious Bathsheba's death, and now this, the rage inside of her built. After some thorough planning, she attacked the boy who was responsible, beating him ferociously, breaking his nose, blackening his eyes, until she was pried off by a nearby neighbor and told to go home. All this wouldn't bring her animals back, but it felt justified to the young girl, given what the boy had done. But these antics of sadness, hostility, and rage would soon manifest into something much darker. Ever since their home was ransacked, Carolyn had wanted to move, but knowing they weren't in a financial state to do so, they had little to no choice other than to stay. So she kept an ever watchful eye on her children, letting them out of the house rarely and mostly under her supervision given the prior events. She wanted them raised by wild nature, not wild beasts. Shortly after this time, Roger had prepared to depart for a business trip, which was to last several days. Even amidst the turmoil of the current events, he still had to provide for his large family. And while his family was just waking up that morning, as he and his wife Carolyn enjoyed their morning cup of coffee, they were suddenly startled by the sound of a large explosion in their front yard, like someone had fired a cannon towards their house. Alarmed, they raced outside to discover what had happened. Shortly after purchasing their humble home, Carolyn had built a rock garden of sorts at the entrance of their driveway. Her friends often teased her that its centerpiece resembled a tombstone without the inscription of the dearly departed. Well, to the family shock, their neighbor from across the street had started his truck that morning and had suffered a major heart attack and had died at the wheel. 
his foot pressing down on the gas, causing the truck to barrel directly at the parents' home to smash right into that large rock. It was almost like something was following them, like a living, breathing organism feeding upon it. After this horrible event, people began to refer to the rock garden as the graveyard. Mrs. Curtis, the wife of the neighbor who had passed away, upon being greeted and offered condolences by the family, actually blamed them for what had happened, declaring that Carolyn never liked them anyway and was a witch. That was enough for her. Again, she begged Roger to move, but they were seemingly stuck. Given the awful circumstances, the man still had to work, so he departed for his business trip. While her husband was gone, it was up to Carolyn to take care of their five children. This meant taking them to and from school, as well as music lessons, and much more. While attending her daughter Andrea's music lessons, she had forgotten to bring a book to help her pass the time, so Carolyn went and purchased a paper as a substitute. Before too long, she found herself daydreaming and looking through the various ads and real estate available, wanting and wishing that she could change their current predicament, when strangely enough, the universe seemed to glance back at her. Hidden among many other homes was a nine-bedroom farmhouse with a barn, lots of land, and seclusion. Its beautiful design and elegance soon had Carolyn imagining her children playing and being raised in nature as she wanted, and she could allow them to do so without the fear of other children attempting to harm them. She almost immediately became obsessed with the idea of purchasing the house, and although the family really couldn't afford it at the time, without seeking Roger's permission, she made a call and went to look at the old Arnold estate the following day. The owner was a very nice old lady, and although she didn't have much, Carolyn asked how much she would have to put down to hold the home so she could purchase it once her husband had returned. An agreement of $500 as a good faith payment was made, and shortly after Roger arrived back home several days later, he was sideswiped by his wife's decision. Although his anger would soon turn to understanding. After all, a happy wife makes for a happy life, as most would say. Even though he didn't know exactly how they would make it work, he decided to placate his wife and allow them to purchase the home. It took some time, but before too long, they found themselves packing and coming into possession of the keys to their future although they couldn't foresee just how dark of a future it was to be. The Perrin family, having seemingly found the home of their dreams, located on a large swath of land outside of the town of Harrisville, Rhode Island, what would become known as the Old Arnold Estate almost seemed too perfect, like an answer to their desperate prayers. It's a large farmhouse which has nine bedrooms, a barn, and plenty of land which they can envision their children playing on and having a wonderful time. Although it's winter, they go ahead and begin to move into their new house. There's a massive snowstorm taking place while they're moving in, but this doesn't deter the large family from getting settled in to what they believe is going to be a charming, nice, and new home for all of them. Given everything they've been through, I would have hoped for the same, and for the first three months, things are charming, nice, and normal. Their rustic farmhouse has its challenges with it being fairly old, such as being very cold that winter, but it's nothing they can't deal with, or so they think. All around the feeling is a happy one for the family, but this happy mood would soon change. Upon meeting their nearest neighbors, they seemed rather strange. They offered one piece of advice to Roger and Carolyn. For the love of your family, keep the lights on at night. Originally written off by the couple, 
these words would seem to be rather fitting foreshadowing for the events to come. When the frozen land of the farm began to thaw, it seemed like something thawed along with it and began to plague them once again. One night, when the daughters Nancy and Andrea were asleep in their shared room, they were suddenly woken up by the sound of their door slam open and closed. Open and closed. Petrified by the noise of the door smacking the wall, and it also being their only way out of the room, they ran towards the door to try and escape, when suddenly it stopped moving and just stayed open, still creaking from being moved. Catching their breath and trying to come to terms with what had just happened, thinking by this point maybe one of their other sisters was trying to play a prank on them, the two girls looked down the hall and eventually made their way to their other sister's rooms, where they found them asleep. Needless to say, they wouldn't sleep for the rest of the night. They would bring this to the attention of their parents the following morning, but were quickly dismissed, as is often the case, and told that they had overactive imaginations. From here, things started small but became very noticeable as they mushroomed into much bigger experiences. At first, whatever spirits they believed could be in the house seemed benevolent, almost good-natured, with some of the younger siblings later stating that they would even be tucked into bed by the spirit of a woman on occasion, but that was all too short-lived. Items soon began to go missing. Car keys weren't where they had been hung. Daily items such as mugs, toys, and utensils were soon disappearing as well. Carolyn would hear the scraping of a broom upon the floor or the knocking of a kettle in the kitchen when no one else was home but her. With this, upon cleaning the floors, she would also find piles of dirt that would appear out of nowhere, making her feel as if she was going crazy. But these small happenings, too, would soon become larger. The children would often play a game called Hide and Clap, a version of Hide and Go Seek. And this time, Andrea was the seeker and her sisters went off hiding throughout the estate. Cindy made her way into the woodshed and found a small box just big enough for her to get inside. Being determined to win, she climbed into the box and slid the small lid over the top, figuring this would be an excellent hiding place indeed. And after several minutes, she realized that no one was coming for her and went to remove the lid, except it wouldn't budge. Panicking, in utter darkness, she used all means necessary to try and remove the lid and free herself. After screaming and worrying that she'd suffocate inside this box, she was thankfully found by Andrea, who slid the lid off no problem and revealed her horribly distressed younger sister inside. It's important to note that this was a sliding cover. There was no locking mechanism. Along with this terrifying event, the children's rooms were often rearranged daily. They would leave their things one way in the morning and return to things either completely a mess, as if a small cyclone had hit their rooms, or all items would be smashed underneath their beds. And this happened to all of the girls at one point or another. These small whispers, bangings, and movements did indeed become larger. Andrea, being the oldest, would often be woken up by her younger siblings and would hold them as they sobbed their eyes out, terrified to return to their rooms. Cindy, in particular, began to hear a sinister voice call out to her almost every night. The voice would tell her that there were seven dead soldiers in the walls and would repeat it over and over and over again. The children now terrified, begged their parents to believe them. And although they too were beginning to experience things on their own, they didn't want to frighten the children, so they did what could be done to placate them. But soon, the entire family began to hear the wails of something inhuman calling out for its mother. 
This disturbing trend with no origin was followed by even more disturbing happenings. The beds of the girls would lift up and shake by an unseen force, almost always around 5.15 a.m., as if something was trying to send some kind of a message, although it was never clear just what that message was supposed to be. During the day, the apparitions of spirits began to manifest and stalk the halls of the old Arnold estate. These were soon coupled by the horrible stench of rotting flesh wafting throughout the house. Soon the girls weren't the only ones whose doors were slamming open and closed, and whose beds were lifting up on their own. Soon it was affecting their parents as well. One night, Carolyn woke up suddenly to the figure of an old woman over the foot of her bed. Her hair was like a sack of cobwebs, with little tendrils hanging off. The woman's head was also bent and hanging off to the side of her neck, as if it was horribly broken and mangled, her gnarled mouth screaming at her with an echoing voice. Get out, she shouted, over and over again, until she suddenly was no longer there. The Perrin family continued to endure a living nightmare as the traumatic paranormal activity persisted and continued to scale in intensity. How does one fight an enemy he can't see? Something he can't touch or feel? Attack or defend against? This question and more must have ran through the heads of Roger and Carolyn as they not only feared for themselves, but especially their children now. As their offspring's natural protectors, how anxiety-inducing must it have been to know that they were powerless to stop what was terrorizing all of them each and every night. In an effort to try and understand what was happening to them, Carolyn began to research the history of their house and was shocked by what she found. Over eight generations of the Arnold family had lived and died within the home, some by horrible means. According to the Black Book of Burlville, the town's former public records book, these included two suicides by hanging, one within the family barn, one by poison, the assault and murder of a young girl named Prudence Arnold by a farmhand, two drownings in the nearby creek, and four men who froze to death, among some of the notable deaths. One death that caught her eye in particular was that of a woman named Bathsheba Sherman. Her name was spelled exactly like their dog that they had previously owned, and her story was as interesting as it was disturbing. Born Bathsheba there in 1812, she married fellow Rhode Islander Judson Sherman in Thompson, Connecticut on March 10, 1844. According to available information from that time, the two had a son named Herbert, and for all intents and purposes, things seemed normal, but that couldn't be further from the truth. After losing three children before the age of seven, Bathsheba began to care for her neighbor's children perhaps to fill the void that such sorrow could create. And it's here where things take a strange turn. While caring for the infant of a nearby family, the infant suddenly passed away within Bathsheba's care. An investigation ensued, and it was found that the child had a puncture wound in its skull, as if someone had taken a large sewing needle and sent it through the child's head. Rumors of devil worship and witchcraft soon became rife. With many believing she had indeed sacrificed her children to Satan, robbing them of their young lives. Although Bathsheba was never punished for the child's death since there was never a trial, that didn't stop her behavior from becoming increasingly bizarre. She became incredibly reclusive, strange, and dark. Rumors say that she supposedly attempted to murder other children while confessing her love for Satan, 
before she then climbed atop the highest tree on the estate, cursing everyone before hanging herself. And although that would make for a much more fascinating story, it doesn't seem to be true. The rumors may indeed have been spread, and their evidence of multiple child deaths, including the infant via a needle-like object. But her tombstone reads her death date as May 25th, 1885. So odds are that she passed away as an old woman. But perhaps given the circumstances, she became more bitter with age. Another strange detail that was uncovered was one of the hanging deaths that took place within the barn on the estate. It was that of Catherine Arnold. She had seemingly out of the blue one day made her way from the house to the barn, gathered a rope, and hung herself from the rafters. She was frozen solid when she was later discovered. It seemed like whatever paranormal force that stalked the land tormented the matriarchs of the families that lived there and fed upon death itself. These supernatural occurrences that now plagued the Peron family were a daily occurrence, and they soon also began to physically touch the family as well. Poking soon turned to pushing, a hand on the shoulder soon turned to slapping, scratching, and more. One day, when Carolyn was reading a book in the living room, she felt a piercing pain in her calf. Upon further examination, she saw what appeared to be a puncture wound like that of a needle, with a small dribble of blood now coming out of her leg. And these attacks didn't stop here. Carolyn soon believed that it was Bathsheba who was causing the majority of her problems. The spirit seemed to hide her things daily, making her feel as if she was going insane, while simultaneously lusting after her husband. In later interviews, Roger would state that he never felt threatened by her spirit and that he only ever saw her sweeter side, such as comforting touches and the feeling of an embrace. To the contrary, his poor wife experienced much, much worse. Andrea Perrin also in later interviews said that the whole family believed it was the spirit of Bathsheba who was mostly tormenting Carolyn as if she saw herself as the matriarch or the mistress of the house, and that Carolyn was some kind of competition, an obstacle between her and Roger's affection. On the verge of losing her mind and being tortured daily, the family was barely holding things together. Most of all, Carolyn. She had vented to a friend of hers named Barbara about what she had been going through, and strangely enough, this friend just so happened to attend a lecture that was being given by renowned paranormal scholars and demonologists, Ed and Lorraine Warren. It was Barbara that actually told the Warrens about the parents and their struggles. Intrigued, they were put into mutual contact with one another, and before too long, the Warrens arrived at the front door of the old Arnold estate. Upon stepping into the home for the first time, Lorraine Warren noticed a heavy and malevolent presence. Upon further convening over the course of several weeks, the couple told the family that they indeed were being haunted by the spirit of Bathsheba, and that she had made a pact with Satan himself after sacrificing one of her children to him. She then hung herself on the property in order to haunt it forever. This is why the family was often seeing the mangled-necked apparition of the woman with wispy hair. This was apparently her. Over the course of several months, the Warrens would visit the old Arnold estate in order to try and assist the family with ridding themselves of the spirits, but it was all to no avail. All of these events seemed to culminate with a seance one stormy night. The Perrons, Roger, and Carolyn along with the Warrens, were joined by a priest and a fellow medium to conduct a seance to try and establish further contact with the entities within the home. 
to understand just why they were plaguing the family. The girls were confined to their rooms upstairs and were not allowed to partake in the ritual. The ritual was conducted in the basement, one of the alleged sources of the dark energy, according to Lorraine Warren. And in the middle of this ritual, Carol seemingly became possessed. As she exhibited violent behavior, she was restrained to a chair in order to prevent her from hurting herself and others. The entity that now inhabited her body claimed to be that of Bathsheba. And before everyone's eyes that was present, Carolyn began to not only speak a language that was unrecognizable, but in a voice that wasn't her own. She then began to levitate in the chair and flew across the room. Although they were forbid to witness the event, as curious children often do, Andrea along with her sister Cindy snuck open the basement door and watched the events unfold for themselves. Their testimonies are also where some of these details are sourced from. Carolyn was now mangled and distorted, her body twisted in an unnatural position. After several hours of attempting to cast the spirit out, she finally went limp and lay catatonic on the floor. After his wife had seemingly been freed, Roger called the entire thing off. He was not only concerned for his wife's well-being, but his children's as well. And although the Warrens were trying to help, things just seemed to get so much worse when they were there. So disregarding their advice, he threw them out and forbid them and their associates from ever investigating the hauntings at the old Arnold estate ever again. Later in life, a 77-year-old Roger would recall, she was possessed, her entire body was distorted, and it lasted several hours until they de-demonized her. Then I threw them out. I couldn't take it anymore. The family's torment would continue with varying intensity until 1980, when they were finally able to sell the old Arnold estate and move to Georgia in a bid to rebuild their lives. Finally, they were free of the horrible events that had plagued them for nearly a decade. But all those happenings, all those traumatic moments, would never be forgotten by any of them. They all realized that they were truly lucky to have escaped with their lives, as well as their sanity. Going back and not only reading various interviews, Andrea Perron's books, and watching interviews with the family, they not only seemed genuine, but really had nothing to gain by claiming to have experienced these things. They truly seemed like they had suffered. I mean, they threw out the Warrens, which is interesting in and of itself. But if I saw my wife twisted and exhibiting demonic behavior, I probably would be pretty freaked out as well. The story of the haunting of the old Arnold estate and the Perron family was used as the basis for the Conjuring movie, in which they were also used as consultants for accuracy's sake. And the film does of course take liberties, as most Hollywood films do, but it's a good one for sure. But having watched this video, you're now probably aware of what really happened. Since the selling of the home, reviews have been mixed by other residents, with one lady claiming that the home wasn't haunted at all, and even condemning and suing the Conjuring filmmakers for causing her distress through trespassers, and others stating that the home is still very well haunted indeed. More current owners, who we'll call Corey and Jennifer, welcomed the spirits and the history of the home when they moved in. Claiming to have only slept in the smaller wing of the estate for the first four months that they lived there, they didn't want to overstep their boundaries with whatever was haunting the property. When they finally opened up the door to the wing of the larger part of the house, the very same night, they both claimed to be woken up by a shadowy figure. Their couple would say that it was pitch black in color and peeking at them from behind the door frame. Although most people would be terrified at the prospect of dealing with a shadow figure of any sort, the couple understood that they were guests in this home, even though they had purchased it. 
and were just excited to have experienced anything. But they also admit that although they do continue to experience strange things from time to time, it's nothing like what the Perons say they experienced. Nothing quite as malevolent or evil by any means. Despite criticism and support, the Perones to this day remain adamant that their story is true. With Andrea saying in an interview with USA Today, both my mother and I would soon swallow our tongue than tell a lie. People are free to believe whatever they want, but we know what we've experienced. Prior to her death, when asked about the events of the haunting, Lorraine Warren claimed that she still felt traumatized all these years later about what had taken place that stormy night during the seance at the old Arnold estate, saying that the things that happened there were so incredibly frightening that it still affects me to talk about it to this day. She, of course, was reunited with Ed on April 18th of 2019. God rest her soul. These days, people who have visited the house, such as various paranormal groups, researchers, and fans of the Conjuring universe, have described feeling multiple things first stepping in the home. Some claiming to see shadow figures, others a feeling of a heavy presence to the point where it makes them nauseous. And regardless, there certainly does seem to be something there. All around, I think the haunting, given all the research I've done, is more than likely legitimate. There's too many sources backing up what took place, not to mention the family didn't gain anything from experiencing what they did, and surviving members still claim it's all true to this day. If you'd like to learn more, I'm listing the sources I used for research in the description below, as well as various links to Andrea Perone's books which tell the full story of her and her family. I, of course, am not affiliated with her or anyone else involved in any way. I just find them to be an interesting and very useful resource. So if you find yourself in hard times and are presented with what seems like a gift from the universe, just know that if it's too good to be true, it probably is. And the dream home that you can't wait to live in could be infested with generations of death and despair, demons which could still be lurking and stalking the property. So my advice, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. And please, research a home's history before you buy it, or you may be stuck with a decade of paranormal torment, or worse, you may become its newest permanent resident. Can death unleash something into this world that isn't supposed to be here? Could it act like a portal, allowing something sinister and dark to creep in, just before it closes, especially if the person passing is harboring dark and abhorrent secrets? When a young man begins to exhibit strange and demonic behavior, and the very laws of nature seem to bend to his will, can a reverend work to save his very soul? Documented by multiple law enforcement professionals as unexplained to this day, this is certainly not a story you will want to miss. This is the untold story of Don Decker, also known as the Rain Man of Pennsylvania. The date is February 24th, 1983. And on this cold, misty day, a family is mourning the loss of their loved one, a man by the name of James Kishaw. After battling alcoholism for many years, the bottle finally took its toll and caused cirrhosis of the liver, which became fatal. Among the pews of friends and family paying their respects sits a young man the grandson of James, 21-year-old Don Decker. Don had been granted furlough from his 4-12 to 12 month jail sentence for receiving stolen property in order to attend the funeral. But as he sat facing the body of his grandfather, as others paid their last respects and gave glowing speeches about the man, Don 
clenched his fists. Only he harbored a dark secret that no one else knew, and this secret is perhaps what contributed to his troubled adolescence. When it was his turn to walk up and say goodbye to James, as he stood over his body, the face of evil looked back at him with eyes closed for the first time. Dom would later say, It felt like good triumphing over evil that day, and I truly felt like everything was going to get better, like it was a turning point in my life. The secret that he had been holding on to for so long was that James, his very own grandfather, had abused him from the time he was seven years old until he was a teenager and no one else knew. All the years of pain and fear were caused by that man, the very same that now laid in the coffin, the very same that Don was now having to hear others praise and who he was publicly obligated to mourn. At the conclusion of the funeral, when James' casket was laid into its final resting place, he couldn't stand the way his parents had glorified the man's memory. But given the circumstances he was in, furloughed from jail and with emotions raw amongst everybody, he decided it would be for the best to go and stay the night with some family friends instead, before he was set to return to finish out his sentence. Bob and Jeannie Kiefer were longtime friends of the family, and were quite fond of Don, so they were more than happy to have him join them for the night. As the night progressed, the three of them were enjoying each other's company, but it seemed like all the feelings that had been stirred up from the memories of his grandfather's abuse at the funeral were coming back to haunt Don. He felt on edge and uneasy when suddenly the air around him vibrated with a bone-deep chill. Almost simultaneously after this occurred, water began to drip from the ceiling and down the living room walls. Don then fell into an eerie, trance-like state, staring at nothing and yet everything at the same time. The Kiefers were perplexed at what was happening and tried examining all reasonable possibilities. Thinking they had a leak, they contacted their landlord, a man named Ron Van Wy. Upon arriving, Ron too quickly became perplexed. The leak, or so they thought, was obvious, but what was strange to him was that there was no piping that ran through the front part of the house, certainly none that could spring a leak from the ceiling or the walls, none at all. On top of this strangeness, when observing the water's direction, Ron noticed that there was indeed no sense of direction. The water was not only coming from the top down, from the ceiling and the walls, but it was going from the floor and up the walls, in direct contradiction to the laws of gravity and to anything that he had ever seen. Shocked and needing multiple witnesses to assure himself that he wasn't crazy, Ron phoned his wife Romaine to come and take a look as well. Upon her arrival, she was just as perplexed and became scared at what was happening since it defied all logic and the leak, or so they thought, only became worse. So the landlords did the only thing that they could do. They called the police. Shortly after that call, a patrol car arrived with Officer John Bojan, who after briefly stepping inside the home became drenched in water, and also witnessed the bizarre, otherworldly activity to which he had no explanation for either. So to prove his sanity, and to back up a report, he called upon his partner, an officer named Richard Volbert. When Richard arrived, he wanted to be briefed on exactly what was going on, but Bojan didn't want to give him any sort of a preconceived notion and just told him to trust him on this one. After some back and forth, Richard finally conceded and followed John into the Kiefer residence. He would later describe the incident as so. I walked in the door. I couldn't have gotten two steps in the door, and I was pelted by water. As we were discussing a potential leak, 
and as we were being told that there were no pipes in that part of the house, as we stood just inside the house, a droplet of water was traveling horizontally and passed right between us and out into the next room. As I retell this story, I have a chill up my spine and the hair on my neck is standing up. John would go on to say, things were happening in this house that I couldn't have ever possibly dreamed of happening and there was no way to explain what was going on. Shocked by what they were witnessing, the two officers asked the family to step outside of the house and out of the water while they left to report the incident to the chief himself. The wise decided to stay at the property while the Kiefers and Don walked across the street to a local restaurant for something to eat. Within seconds of everyone departing, the water suddenly stopped within the house. And aside from the home being drenched, it was back to normal. No more dripping water and no more mist. This left Ron and his wife only to speculate that whatever was happening was coming from one of the three because when they left, so did it. Pam Scrofano, who owned the pizzeria opposite the Kiefer's house, where the three ended up in, was a friend of the Kiefer's, and knew Don as well. Upon greeting the three of them, she noticed that Don was distant, like he was looking at you, but looking through you. A deeply religious woman, she sensed something evil about him, like the devil was working through Don Decker and recommended that they contact someone at the church for help. Within mere seconds of mentioning this, droplets of water hit the table in front of them. And soon, the very same phenomena that was originally happening in the house was also now taking place inside the pizzeria. Sensing this evil, Pam ran to the cash register where she had an old cross necklace. She took it out and placed it around Don's neck. As soon as it touched his skin, he got burned. He began to scream and pulled the necklace off of him. It was charred black. As the trio departed the pizzeria and headed back to their home, the strange activity inside once again ceased. It's important to note that nothing like this had ever happened at the Kiefer residence or Pam's pizzeria. No plumbing issues, nothing that could be considered even remotely similar. Convening inside the home once again, they met Ron and his wife. Ron suspected that Don had something to do with what was happening, and after some discussion, an argument erupted among the group. This led to Jeannie screaming at Don, telling him that they knew it was him, and that he had to make all of this stop. After the words left her mouth, the pots and pans above the stove began to shake, and the lights around them began to flicker. Don Decker was no longer in control of his body. Everyone watched in horror as Don levitated multiple feet into the air and rotated several times. He was then thrown out of the kitchen where they were and into an entirely different room. Don himself would later recount the event like this. It wasn't like someone grabbing your hand or picking you up. I felt this force over my entire body. I'm a big man and I've always been assertive, but this, whatever this was, made me feel like a newborn child. I'm scared right now just thinking about it. Don now laid unconscious on the floor and the rain began again. The Wise and the Kiefers were in absolute shock and disbelief at what had just taken place. They knew it was tied to Dawn, but they had no idea just what it was, but they felt that it was evil. A few hours after the strange incident witnessed by the police officers, they arrived back at the residence alongside their very heated police chief. As he made his way into the home with the two officers behind him, he too was pelted with water just as they had been. And at first, probably feeling like he was on the spot and perhaps slightly embarrassed, he claimed that this wasn't even a police issue, but a plumbing issue. 
despite then being told that there were no pipes in that part of the house, and this was even confirmed by blueprints of the home. After taking a look around at the rest of the home, which was bone dry, the chief then angrily ordered the two officers to escort him back home. He would be the only officer that night to not admit to anything strange happening. He then directed officers John and Richard to not file a report and to not speak about the incident at all, but word would get out. The following morning, acting against the specific orders from their chief, the two officers returned to the residence, along with three veteran officers as well. They too would see and experience the bizarre rain inside the home, so they decided to try something to attempt to get to the bottom of what exactly was going on. They asked if they could place a paper bag over Don's head, to which Don agreed. This was so he would have no way of seeing anything. He'd have no preconceived notions of what could be placed on him or in his hands. They then placed a gold cross necklace from one of the officers into his hand. Lieutenant William Davies, one of the officers present who placed the cross into his hand, described the incident like this. As soon as the necklace touched his palm, he said it burnt him. He would have had no idea what it was. I saw what I believed to be smoke of some sort coming from the necklace or his hand. As he dropped the necklace, I picked it up, and it was hot. Not burning hot, but hot enough to concern me. Then, suddenly, with the force as if a bus hit him, he lifted up and was thrown across the room, hitting the back wall. Upon removing the bag from him, he was clearly dazed and had three bloody and fresh claw marks across his neck. I've been a cop for 40 years, and I've never ran into anything like this, ever. Never before, and never again after. There's always an explanation, but in this case, there was no explanation. The police would later leave again with no answers as to what was taking place, believing it to be a spiritual matter. Dom was placed on the couch in the living room, where the rain continued to go from mist to showers at random and varying times. After making multiple desperate calls to every Protestant and Catholic religious leader in Shroudsburg, only one didn't turn them down. Ron was able to convince an evangelical preacher who went by the name of Reverend Johnson to come over and pray with Dawn. As she arrived and began to pray, the rest of the group held hands in vigil and did what they could to support her. As the first words left her lips, Dawn began to convulse and shake. The rain intensified and his body began to twist into unnatural positions. But as she continued, he slowly but surely began to relax, and the rain seemed to stop. Although those present believed that a miracle had been performed, the results of that prayer session would only prove temporary, perhaps placing into hibernation whatever was inside Don Decker. Once his furlough was over, Don Decker returned back to jail to finish his sentence and within just a few days, the mysterious rain returned. Upon his return to jail, Dom was placed in a cell with another inmate and had the thought enter his mind that if he could make it rain in the cell, perhaps he could get to be alone. Almost as soon as he thought that, the rain began. It was materializing out of the concrete floor and flowing upward. The other inmate was horrified and screamed for the guards to let him out. Thinking they had some kind of plumbing issue, the guards opened the cell and removed that inmate as well as Decker. At first, he was accused of throwing water onto the walls from the sink or from the toilet by the guards, but upon these accusations, Don rebuttaled with, I can control it. This time, the feeling was different. This time, he felt powerful and in control. Upon hearing this, the guard laughed and said, if you can control this rain, 
make it rain in the warden's office, an offer that Don couldn't refuse. The warden would then describe what happened, and these are the words of Lieutenant Warden David Keenhold. I was in my office filling out paperwork with no one else around. It was approximately 8 p.m. in the evening. I didn't notice it at that time, but my shirt was dripping down. I heard a knock at the door, and little did I know that it was the same officer that was just with Don Decker. I wasn't aware of the situation at the time. He told me to look at my shirt, and there was no explanation as to where the water could have come from. The officer then became very frightened of what had happened, and after explaining the situation to me, I too became frightened. Shortly after the rain in the warden's office, a frantic call was placed to a local chaplain, a man named Reverend William Blackburn. He soon found himself shaking hands with the warden and several officers as he was escorted into the jail and into an empty cell. Within minutes, he came face to face with Don Decker, who by this time was beginning to fear the feeling he had inside of him, that powerful and evil feeling. He was now asking for the Reverend's help and freeing him of whatever this thing was. Blackburn wasn't convinced at first. He told Decker that his life would be much easier if he just stopped all this nonsense and attention seeking. He would go on later to describe the situation like this. Almost immediately after I accused him, Don's demeanor changed. A glazed look came over him and a horrible smell entered the room. Doctors, nurses, and medical personnel will tell you that when you walk into a room when there's someone dying of disease or of cancer, there's a smell to it. I smelled that smell, multiplied by at least five times. It was evil and foreboding. Don's glazed expression then switched to one of malice and calculation. He exclaimed, I have powers that you don't, and I can make it rain. He then raised his hand and rubbed his fingers together, and it started to rain inside that cell. It was like a devil's rain, a mist. I was in the presence of evil. I started opening my Bible to begin to pray, and Don said, I don't want you to pray for me, to which I decided to anyways. I started to read to him, and the strange thing is that even though I was soaked, the pages of my Bible never got wet and that was truly frightening. Although the session was short, upon uttering the words that he was now bound in the name of Jesus Christ, the rain stopped and a peace overtook Don. When he finally came to, he thanked the reverend with tears in his eyes, and the two hugged and prayed together. Again, in the words of Reverend Blackburn, there is no doubt in my mind that he was possessed no human being could do what he did in that room. There is no way that he did anything to fool me whatsoever. Whatever happened was spiritual, and it was not from God. I can guarantee you that it was not from God. From this moment forward, the rain has stopped, for now. Don Decker would later say that he takes things day by day, and that fortunately, the rain hasn't returned. As for his grandfather, he thinks whatever happened was related to him. He thinks that, considering where he thinks he ended up, maybe he was able to make a deal with someone and have yet another chance to abuse him. What makes this case so unique and interesting is that all the people involved are credible people. I mean, we have some family friends, sure, but they stated they had nothing take place in that house prior to Dawn's arrival that morning. We have the landlord of the family's home and his wife not only reaffirming that there weren't any prior issues, but that there were no pipes in that area of the house. We then have six police officers, including the chief over the case, experience the phenomena, and he was the only one that said that nothing took place. We have a business owner where the phenomena took place at her establishment as well, then several guards at the jail in which he goes back to finish serving his time witness things, and the warden of the jail himself. And the police officers, three of them were seasoned lieutenants, I might add, and anyone with a proper reputation, unless they really experienced something, would risk that 
in my opinion. So was it demonic infestation, possession, poltergeist activity, or something else entirely? When we have so many credible eyewitnesses recanting the same details, saying what they saw, experienced, and felt was a phenomena not of this world, it truly makes you wonder. And if it wasn't spiritual, could Don's childhood trauma have allowed him to break into a part of the mind that could somehow cause these kinds of things, allow him to manipulate the weather of his surroundings, move objects, and even cause harm to himself? We may never truly know the answers to this mystery in particular, and it very much still is a mystery to this day. As far as an update on Don Decker, Besides multiple show appearances and interviews to discuss his story over the years, the last known activity that I could find of him was that back in 2012, he was charged with arson of a local restaurant in the Poconos Mountains of Pennsylvania. It seems like perhaps he was paid to set fire to the establishment by the owner, maybe for insurance fraud. As far as the outcome of the case, I couldn't find additional details. Perhaps whatever evil that was inside Don got the best of him at this time. Or, you know, we're all human. We do make mistakes without otherworldly influence as well. Just a thought. Wherever he is, I do have to say that his story is an amazing and intriguing one, and I wish him nothing but the best. I'd also like to say thank you guys for watching this video. Without you guys, this channel is just me making videos that I find interesting at home, at my computer. And I really can't hammer home how much your support means to me. It seems like YouTube doesn't always want to promote my content, and that's been a big uphill battle over the last four years. So when you choose to watch Mystery Archives, just know it helps me out much more than you could ever know. Rob and Vicki Graves had found what appeared to be their dream home, looking to escape the big city life and take up a more rural one for themselves and their two teenage sons. They found Fox Hollow Farm and were shocked at how affordable it was for the sheer size and quality of the property. Sensing that it was too good to be true, they asked what could possibly be wrong with it, because at a passing glance, it seemed absolutely gorgeous. Then it came to Rob. He had remembered the name from a news broadcast many years ago. Unbeknownst to him and his wife, they were now standing on the very same grounds that were once owned by Herb Baumeister, the notorious serial killer. They immediately brought this up to the real estate agent who was showing them the property and were immediately told that that was indeed the case. That the private investor had indeed purchased the estate from the widow of Herb following the disturbing discovery of the bodies back in the 1990s, but that it had been completely remodeled from head to toe, removing any and all remnants of what it looked like when the murders had taken place all those years ago. But that's why it was indeed so affordable, because no one wanted to live there due to the history. After some further discussion among the couple, they ultimately decided to purchase the property. Within a couple weeks, the family moves in and falls in love with Fox Hollow Farm. The teenage sons soon make it a habit to play outside and then wash off in the pool in the basement, soon tracking dirt and gravel all throughout the home. One day, Vicky is vacuuming up the dirt that the boys had brought in from the outside around the pool, when suddenly her vacuum loses power. Believing that perhaps she had accidentally unplugged it from the outlet, she plugged it back in and continued her work. Within several more minutes, it happened again. Perplexed this time because she was even more aware and careful about the cord and the outlet, she knew she hadn't unplugged it. So she plugged it back in and triple checked that it wasn't just falling out of the outlet by pulling the cord. Ever more aware this time, she goes back to vacuuming, but keeping a present eye on the cord itself, and to her amazement, it pulls out on its own, as if someone had grabbed and pulled it out of the socket. Startled, she drops the vacuum and is beside herself. 
She doesn't know how to make sense of what had just happened. And this would just be the beginning of the strangeness that would occur. Rob worked at a car dealership, and one of his employees was a man named Joe. Joe had been a great employee, but had a problem of being chronically late most of the time. As he probed to figure out what was going on, Joe informed Rob that he lived over an hour away and really needed the job and would be willing to move closer if the opportunity presented itself. Well, Rob thought about it and ended up offering Joe a place to rent. Located on Fox Hollow Farm, they had a guest house that they were considering renting out as apartments for quite some time, and this seemed like the perfect opportunity to benefit everyone involved. Joe would indeed move in just a few days later. It takes several hours, but within that time frame, they're able to get everything inside and finish the move. Exhausted, Joe decides to retire for the night with his dog, Fred. As he lays down to sleep in his newly set up bed, he then finds himself in a horrific nightmare. He's being chased throughout Fox Hollow Farm by something he can't see. The dream is so intense that it causes him to sleepwalk, which wasn't something that he was known to do. He began to run while still dreaming and ran directly into the door frame as he tried to escape the guest house. Falling back, he knocked into a nearby glass of water, which fell and shattered, cutting his hands. The impact and cutting of his hands finally woke him up and he was forced to sit back and ponder just what had taken place. And things would only intensify from here. Another day soon after, Rob was painting the side of their home a different color. As he and his wife remarked on how nice the finished job will be, she spots something out of the corner of her eye. She had seen a man in a red shirt staring at them. As she broke away from her husband and began to approach the figure, it started to walk away from her and quickly disappeared as if it never existed. The couple then called out and checked the perimeter, but never found anyone. They dismissed the person as nothing more than a curious trespasser. I mean, after all, they did purchase a serial killer's home. They just had to accept that curious people may sneak up just to get a look at their home. Later that night, Joe is doing the dishes in his apartment when he suddenly gets a series of knocks on his front door. Telling the person it'll just be a minute as he dries his hands off to go and answer the door, the series of knocks begin to grow louder and more aggressive. Thinking it was extremely strange or extremely urgent concerning Vicky or Rob, he went and answered the door as it was still being knocked upon. However, as he opened the door, there was no one to be found. Automatically on guard, he peers outside. The knocking had been happening when he answered the door, so no person could have got very far while he answered mid-knock. He glanced around and yet saw and heard nothing. He stepped outside and began to examine the roof and the nearby areas, and still there was nothing. Thoroughly weirded out at this point, he made his way back inside and bolted the door locked behind him. He started to make his way back to the kitchen to finish doing his dishes, when he spotted a man standing in his bedroom, staring at him. Upon spotting the figure, his dog begins to growl and make sounds that he's never heard him make before, staring directly in the direction of the bedroom. Already on edge, he ran into the bedroom and flicked the light on, only to discover that there was again no one there. Searching the entire apartment, he again found nothing. Trying to rationalize and clear his mind, he decided to take his dog Fred for a walk to calm down and unwind for the evening. While on his walk around the property, he thought to check on Rob and Vicky's house to see if the lights were on. This would indicate to him that perhaps they were the ones who had knocked on his door, and therefore he could rest easy and figure out what it was about the following morning. However, upon arriving at their house, he found it completely blacked out. They had already gone to bed for the night. Fred, who was always a loyal and obedient dog, always walked with him without a leash and would always follow his commands. However, tonight would be a different story. 
Deciding to head back to his apartment, he motioned for Fred to join him, but the dog would not budge. He suddenly began to growl and then bolted into the nearby tree line. Instinctively, Joe ran after his dog, but not before seeing what his dog was running after. Before his eyes and the very same tree line was a man in a red shirt. Although he was absolutely terrified, Joe couldn't let anything happen to his beloved dog, so he continued to run towards this man, when suddenly, whoever or whatever this was disappeared before his eyes. Although slightly behind, he would quickly catch up to Fred and now noticed him not acting aggressive at all, but rather showing his belly in submission, staring in the direction of Joe. Joe, knowing his dog, knew that something very strange had to be up with him. He suddenly felt as if someone was staring directly at him. He slowly turned around to see the apparition of a man in a red shirt with a twisted face staring back at him just several feet away. Joe, as most of us would, ran out of there as fast as he could, his loyal companion following him. The two run as fast as they can back to the apartment where they rush inside, lock and deadbolt the door, and nervously watch out of the blinds for the rest of the night. The following morning, an even more exhausted Joe makes his way to Vicky and Rob's house to discuss the prior night's events. As he's telling both of them what happened, Vicky starts to become emotional. She too had seen the man in red just days earlier. She points to where she saw him, and lo and behold, it's the exact same spot that Joe had encountered the entity the night before. As the day progressed to night, Joe yet again found himself in his apartment, hoping to finally get some rest. But as he settled down in his bed, he was suddenly startled by knocking at his door. As he yelled out, who is it? As he made his way towards the door, he didn't receive an audible answer back just more aggressive knocking at the door. The door itself now is shaking. Facing his fear of the unknown, mid-knock, Joe throws the door open, only to meet face to face with nothing. As he frantically looks around the yard while holding the door, he notices that the door's knocking apparatus is sticking straight out as if someone is holding it. It then drops one last time, knocking the door. Absolutely petrified, Joe slams the door and locks it. As he tries to catch his breath and takes several steps backwards, he sees the doorknob begin to turn. Then, without warning, the door bursts open, shattering the lock. The open door yet again reveals no one. After a moment of frozen terror, Joe runs outside and into the front yard of his apartment screaming and searching all around for just who could be doing this. After several minutes, he stares back into the house through the open front door and sees a man dressed in all white standing there. He's soaked from head to toe in what appears to be water and is screaming in a muted voice as if he's being held underwater. He then bolts towards Joe and seemingly disappears into a mist. Frantically calling out to his dog Fred to accompany him, Joe frantically makes his way to Rob and Vicky's house on the property. He's so terrified that he's shaking now, and Rob and Vicky are just as scared. They now truly believe that they are dealing with something paranormal in nature. In order to rationalize the situation and make sense of what was taking place, they begin to believe that they're experiencing the results of the murders conducted by Herb Baumeister and that his victims are either trapped here somehow, or their energy is stuck in an endless loop, replaying their final and tragic moments over and over and over again. Refusing to return to his apartment, Rob and Vicky, being the supportive friends they were, agreed that Joe could stay the night with them, and together they would begin researching online to try and formulate some kind of a plan of action of what to do next. As they collectively scour the Baumeister case information, they find themselves looking at the list of identified victims. 
As they get deeper into the details, Joe is shocked. He stops them on a picture of a man in a white shirt. That was the man I saw in my apartment, who was soaked from head to toe and screaming. Although this information still scares them, it does help reassure them that they are indeed dealing with the victims of this horrendous tragedy. They are especially convinced, considering many of the remains have never been identified, so they continue to research the case. After several uneventful days, Joe finds himself almost compelled to walk around the property with his dog, except this time in broad daylight. So, apprehensively, he makes his way with Fred to the area where both he and Vicky had seen the man in red on separate occasions. Just past the tree line on the walking path, Joe is stopped by what looks to be a bone. He believes that it's impossible that such a bone could have been missed during the extensive searches over the years. But nonetheless, it was right here, right now, as if it had been placed there for him to discover. Quickly consulting and showing Rob and Vicky the discovery, they too believed that this could be a bone belonging to the mysterious man in red. They ended up contacting the lead detective on the Baumeister case and submitted the bone, which turned out to be a human femur bone, in as evidence and for analysis. They then requested if the investigator himself could come out to the property and explain to them just where things had taken place so they could have a better understanding of what had happened, to which he obliged. Several days passed, and Joe by this point had made his way back to his apartment to try and settle back in given the new information. While on his computer checking his emails, he began to hear a scraping, almost metallic-like sound originating from the kitchen. Upon further examination, he sees that all of his butcher knives from his knife block have been neatly arranged in his sink, placed in a row, equally spaced from one another. Glancing around the room, he spots fresh, deep cuts in the wood of the nearby counter cabinet. He believes that this could be a sign for one of the victims crying for help. He starts to try and figure out the mystery. He takes out his phone and begins recording, asking probing questions to whoever or whatever could be there in hopes of helping them in any way that he can. Prior to this, of course, he turned off any and all appliances that could interfere with the process. He begins by asking a series of questions and doesn't seem to get much of anything, at least not audibly. But then towards the end of his questions, Fred begins to growl, the same eerie growl he had any time they had experienced something previously. Taking this as confirmation that perhaps his companion could see or hear something that he couldn't, he quickly downloads the audio file and begins to listen to it on his computer. And to his shock, he did indeed receive a response. This is the clip of the actual EVP that was recorded. Who keeps walking in the kitchen? He believes he hears the married one. But in all of their research, all of the victims were young, single gay men. The only one who was married was one Herb Baumeister. This revelation is startling. He not only believes that the victims were trapped within the grounds of Fox Hollow Farm, but that perhaps the serial killer himself could too be trapped here. What would follow would be dozens of paranormal investigations and those investigations would lead the group to believe that they were not only dealing with the spirits of the victims haunting the grounds, but either a dark entity impersonating Baumeister or the killer himself. Several years after the events, the Graves family would end up selling Fox Hollow Farm, and it would continue to change hands over the years since then, leading to multiple new owners of the property. And although new information doesn't seem to be publicly available, it's still considered one of the most haunted places in Indiana, if not the world, given its unique and gruesome history. An independent film would go on to be made about it, called The Haunting of Fox Hollow Farm, and Robert Graves, along with another man named Richard Eastep, who led many paranormal investigations at Fox Hollow Farm, would co-write a book detailing the family's creepy experiences and what they believed to be ultimately happening. 
So in conclusion, we know that Herb Baumeister was mentally ill ultimately, but what makes this case so strange and so compelling to me is that he was an outstanding member of his community. For the longest time, he was the smiling neighbor, the charitable businessman, the happy family man, and overall, a pillar of normalcy. But behind closed doors, his psyche, his soul, contained a darkness that most of us will never be able to comprehend, yet alone unravel and understand. So could the murderous deeds of a twisted individual trap souls on a property and perhaps open some kind of a portal? Could the unleashing of such energy like what is expressed in a violent death contribute to something like this? If it wasn't what's known as an intelligent haunting, where the spirits are aware of what has happened to them and are indeed trapped there, which very well could still be the case, then perhaps it could be a residual haunting where the events are of such magnitude and strength that they play on a loop for all time, but the souls who were involved have long since moved on. These are questions that we may never have answers to, but all things that we should ponder. But one thing is for certain, the malicious calculation of Herb Baumeister and the horrendous things that he did to the suspected 25 victims at Fox Hollow Farms should never be forgotten. They are indeed still identifying and using updated technology to identify remains that are still being found on the grounds. This has happened as recent as November of 2022. So if you happen to be a family member of someone that you suspect could be connected to this case, just know that my heart truly does go out to you. And please contact the Hamilton County Coroner's Office at 317-770-44. One five. Besides remembering what happened, I also urge you to please respect the victims and their families, as well as the family of Herb Baumeister, if you should ever have anything to do with them. Throughout history, it has been speculated that many have been plagued by an ancient demonic force. From Mesopotamia to more modern times, this evil and terrifying entity has said to enter our world and wreak havoc upon those who dwell within it. When a seemingly normal family disregards the warnings and partakes in multiple Ouija board sessions, what happened next nearly destroyed them. This is the untold story of the demonic Zozo House of Oklahoma and the abhorrent creature that stalks its walls. Oklahoma City, a small but growing city in the heartland of America, known for blue collar work and brick and mortar shops, red dirt, and sports would soon become known for something much darker. A teenager by the name of Darren Evans was growing up here, a normal boy by all accounts, doing things that any teenagers would enjoy, hanging out with friends, shenanigans here and there, and dating girls. He began dating a girl named Brandy who attended school with him, and the two often found themselves visiting each other as often as they could, whether that was walking to and from school, in between classes, or visiting each other's homes. One day, while Brandy's home was having some plumbing work done on some pipes located underneath the house, the plumber doing the work would soon make a strange discovery. Located below the foundation of the home, covered in dirt, was an old Ouija board. The front letters were partially buried, and the back of the board was solid black in color. Off to the side of where the board was found was an aged planchette. What made this finding even more bizarre was that four old jars sat on the corners of the board 
speckled with dirt as well. Thinking perhaps the kids had stashed the board away and forgot about it, the worker told the young couple after his work was done about what he had found. And it's from here that things seemingly take a darker turn. Upon examining the discovery, they began to brush the dirt away from the jars. They were then shocked by what they found. Inside each one of the jars, sitting on the four corners of the board, were the decaying bodies of blackbirds, congealed blood and matter still present. Bewildered but intrigued, they sat the jars off to the side and picked up the board. As soon as his fingers made contact with the board, Darren seemed to have an instant connection with it. And with this, soon came a burning curiosity to examine it. And this curiosity would manifest into obsession. With this, the couple took the board inside the home where they spoke with Brandy's mother. She actively practiced the Wiccan religion, but had no idea who could have put the board there. Several days later, curious as most teenagers are, Darren was an avid music fan, and one night, after building up the courage to do it, he decided he was going to contact the deceased singer of the popular band ACDC, a man named Ronald Belford Scott, using the board. Scott had passed away from alcohol poisoning in 1980. After lighting several candles, laying the board with letters facing towards him, and placing the planchette upon the board, he began his session. At first, nothing seemed to happen, but Darren was still feeling this otherworldly connection to something within the board itself. After trying for half an hour, to his shock and amazement, the planchette began to move. Slowly at first, it then frantically began to move by itself, moving from Z to O, Z to O, over and over and over again, spelling out the name Zozo. Shocked and unsure of what or who he had contacted, Darren said goodbye in an attempt to end the session. Before his eyes, he saw the planchette spell out, see you in hell, and then it threw itself across the room. A now terrified and bewildered Darren ran out of his room and tried to make sense of what had just taken place. But this was just the beginning of what was to come. It started with horrible night terrors. He would wake up unable to move or speak and would hear whispering in his ears. These episodes at night were soon followed by banging and knocking throughout his house during the daytime, as well as a constant feeling as if he was being watched by something he couldn't see. But despite the presence he was feeling, Darren now sought answers to his ever-growing list of questions, just what exactly he had uncovered. So, he continued to hold sessions with the board, for better or for worse. Darren would later quote this, The sessions now were as intense and paranormal as anything I have ever witnessed. A deep and terrible moaning could be heard emanating through the walls after these sessions. I developed sleep paralysis and became reclusive to society in general. I was once again messing with Zozo and Ouija boards, despite the terrors of my earlier sessions, in which I had promised myself I would never do it again. But again and again, I did. When not in use, the board was kept in a purple silk cloth and stored in his bedroom closet. It would also often go missing, sometimes for days on end. When checking back where he had placed it in order to set up and initiate a new session, the board 
would seemingly vanish, only to reappear at random times, as if it was the one calling the shots of when it could be seen and used. The years came and went, and the sessions on the mystical Ouija board continued. Darren, by this time, started inviting his friends to partake in the sessions, and although their sessions with him would prove he's not insane, it's of little consolation considering the tragedy they would seemingly manifest later on. Darren's best friend was a man by the name of Randy. The two had bonded over their love for the band ACDC in high school and had been inseparable ever since. Randy's idol also being the late Bon Scott, whose lifestyle seemingly imprinted upon the youthful teens once upon a time, and perhaps would ultimately lead to the downfall of one of them. By now, Darren was living in his own apartment and working construction at a job site he was on, who would make a strange but familiar discovery. As he was digging down into the earth, he found what appeared to be a jar. Upon picking it up to discard it, he wiped away the dirt and debris, only to be shocked by its familiar contents. Lo and behold, within the jar was a congealed and rotting blackbird, extremely similar, if not identical, to the ones initially found alongside the Ouija board underneath his high school girlfriend's home all those years ago. It was particularly weird, not just because of this, but the fact that he had found it digging down deep into the earth. He wondered, what were the odds of this? And although he had no way of knowing for sure, his gut began to tell him that there was some kind of witchcraft or occult expertise at play here. Perhaps someone or a group of people were knowingly contacting this entity known as Zozo, but for what remained to be known. One evening in 1985, Darren and Randy were relaxing at Darren's apartment when they decided to host a session on the Ouija board. Randy, more than anything, wanted to try and make contact with his late idol, Bon Scott. While wearing a Highway to Hell ACDC shirt, Randy's intent was clear. The two dimmed the lights, lit a couple of candles, and began the session upon the board. They made contact within a few minutes. Once the planchette was moving, Randy exclaimed, We want to talk to Bon Scott of ACDC. With this sentence, the planchette seemingly obliged. It moved in circles, eventually spelling out A-Y-E-M-A-T-E. The two looked at each other in amazement. The entity was using Australian dialects. And for anyone who doesn't know, Bon Scott was Australian. After several more questions, both of the young men were convinced they were speaking with their idol. The spirit seemed to know every little detail to any question they asked. And during the session, the entity then made a strange request from the men. It asked them to light a cigarette and place it in the hole in the planchette. What proceeded to make both of them laugh also made them quite spooked as well. So they lit a couple cigarettes, one for each of them, and one for this entity. They took a few drags to keep it lit, and then placed it cherry side up in the planchette hole. The planchette then spelled out thanks, and they then watched in utter amazement as the cherry of the cigarette lit up, as if Bon himself was taking puffs off of it. But this amusement was short-lived. Once the cigarette had seemingly been smoked, the planchette began to spell something very different. It spelled, F you, Randy. I will have your soul, and I'll see you in hell. Z-O. Z-O. 
Terrified, the men quickly ended the session by saying goodbye and tossing the board outside the second story apartment balcony door. Clearly scared and upset, Randy also didn't take kindly to threats. He began cussing out Zozo with complete and utter rage. The board would later be returned by his downstairs neighbor. And after this session, a series of lows for both of the men seemed to manifest in the years to come. Influenced by the lifestyle of his idol, Randy fell victim to alcoholism. He soon would lose his wife to divorce and have split custody with his son. And although many opportunities presented themselves for Randy to better his life, for one reason or another, he was always just too far away to be able to grasp them. He often said to Darren, I feel like I'm in a prison, and I can't escape. For old time's sake, the two did one last Ouija board session together in 2005, in which Randy asked the board how he would die. The board responded, in a car, at night, alone. In 2007, after spending the evening with Darren, the last words he would say to him, or Darren, I will see you in hell. The next morning, Darren received a phone call from Randy's girlfriend, Alicia, saying that Randy never made it home after he left. Instead, he had passed away in a violent head-on collision, ultimately passing away in a car at night and alone. This devastating passing, along with the frequent contact with the entity known as Zozo over the years, led to a fascination and borderline obsession with a search for answers for Darren Evans. During the time before and after Randy's death, he had been living in a home in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, that would become synonymous with the demon's name. It was here that the worst afflictions brought on by the entity would take place to him and his family. Darren's fascination with the occult led him to hanging on to and possessing multiple Ouija boards and other various occult objects. It was here that he began to study on a much more in-depth and organized basis, just trying to figure out who or what Zozo was but this research would soon be interrupted. In this home lived himself, his wife Kathleen, and their young daughter at the time. During a session with his wife Kathleen one evening, while their daughter slept rooms away, Zozo would once again make itself present in their lives, but this time seemed to take possession of Darren. Kathleen trembled with fear and bated breath as something stared at her through Darren's eyes. Something that clearly wasn't human. He then turned violent, attempting to attack her. Fortunately for Kathleen, she was able to say goodbye and get away before any harm could be done to her. Several minutes later, Darren would come back to himself with no memory of what had taken place. After this session, things seemed to escalate in intensity. Sounds began to wrap throughout the entire home, from knocking to hissing, footsteps and banging, all seemingly with no explainable origin. The family got so terrified that they sectioned off a particular bedroom upstairs, calling it their safe room. One night, however, not everyone was within the safe room. Suddenly, an overwhelming sense of terror creeped upon Darren as he was trying to sleep. He rushed to the safe room to attempt to stop what he was feeling, but quickly realizing he couldn't leave his family behind, he rushed back out of the room in an attempt to gather them and bring them to safety as well. As he was heading towards the stairs, his daughter had heard his cries 
and was now at the foot of the stairs. It was here that Darren saw her being lifted by invisible hands into the air and carried away from him. Screaming for his child as she screamed for her father, Darren ran down the stairs as fast as he possibly could, but couldn't see her anywhere in sight. He then heard her muffled screams coming from the basement. At first, the door was locked and wouldn't open, but after adrenaline and brute force, Darren thankfully was able to open it. He then retrieved his hysterical child and brought her to the safety of the safe room. Once inside the room, the family huddled together in fear as they continued to hear movement and noises all throughout the house. After this abhorrent nightmare of a situation, the family knew they had to get out of the house. This situation and the many other paranormal experiences had led to a lifelong fascination for Darren Evans with the occult and finding out just exactly what Sozo is. But was it worth jeopardizing his family's safety? It took some time, but the family would soon relocate to another home. And once his family was safe, Darren was able to continue his deep dive into the unknown to try and track down and decipher just what this entity could be and where it came from. And although he knew the topic was vast, I think it went far deeper than he ever anticipated. Whilst trying to dig up more information, he posted his experiences to an old paranormal forum in 2009, and since then, many, many people have shared their experiences with the demonic force, many of which have been documented and compared by Darren himself on his website. But these experiences are not just a 21st or even 20th century phenomenon. They date back far older than that. Not every fine detail will be mentioned here, but I will do my best to list the most important details that I could find in regards to the origin of Zozo, according to Darren and other online sources. Zozo, in the old Bosque language, means blackbird or crow. The Zo people of Haiti practiced a form of voodoo whose rituals involve horrific scarification, as well as the intake and passing around of bodily fluids and bizarre rituals. Their witch doctors are called Zozo and wear demonic looking masks. As part of their death ritual, when someone is passing away, they lift up the mask at the moment of death to take in the person's final breath. This is apparently done to absorb the soul of the person, to gain more spiritual power. Zozo, also in the Malay language, is the same as it is in English, but it translates to wandering spirit, which is a spirit they believe to steal people's souls while they sleep, which is also bizarre because sleep is often considered the cousin of death. Zozo has been called the Minister of Deception. It is known to convince you that it is a deceased loved one, or friend, or even someone you've idolized, when in reality, it's not. Sessions typically start out friendly and inviting, but soon turn malevolent and dangerous. During his research over the years, Darren made contact with and spoke to famous demonologist John Zaffis, who shared with him that in his experience of over 40 years of studying the demonic and paranormal, the name Zozo and other pseudonyms of its name kept coming up in his investigations, which too led him to seek answers as to what it could be. And some of those investigations, when questioned, the demon stated that it was the son of Satan himself. But Zaphis thinks, perhaps as with many deities that seem to be lurking in the shadows, Zozo could be an entity that's existed far before the founding of Christianity. 
Besides evidence showing up in Africa and Egypt, there's also evidence found linking Zozo to ancient Mesopotamia as well. Other names Zozo has gone by throughout the ages have been Zuzu, Zaza, and Mama, among many others. The name Zuzu could refer to Puzuzu, the famed demon from the film The Exorcist, which in reality was a demonic entity from ancient Mesopotamian religion. It's incredibly strange to note the following as well. Zozo was replaced in the story of the exorcism of Roland Doe when Peter Blatty was using it as inspiration to write The Exorcist. He changed Zozo to Pazuzu. Zozo is believed to be the demon that possessed Roland. It was described as a terrifying form that first appeared in the Neo-Assyrian period, roughly around 934 to 610 BC. It had a monstrous head resembling a fierce lion or a dog with horns, and had an emaciated human body with clawed hands, a scorpion's tail, and two sets of wings. One translation reads, I am Pazuzu, the son of Hanbu, king of the Lilu demons. I have scaled the powerful mountains. They trembled. The contrary winds were headed west. One by one, I broke their wings. Pazuzu and other demons like it were held responsible for ailments like disease, fetal death, nightmares, and much more. Could it be that this ancient demonic force is what could be plaguing people all the way into modern times? The demon Zozo is also mentioned in the French demonic encyclopedia as one of the demons responsible for diabolical possession and corruption. The possession of a young girl in 1816 is noted as a documented case where Zozo, among several other demons, were present. Other noteworthy possession cases over the ages, ranging closer to modern times, that bear Zozo's name, other than the exorcism of Roland Doe in the 1950s, are the possession of Doris Blither in 1972 in Los Angeles, the Einfield poltergeist incident in 1977 in the UK, and as recent as 2012, where a possession incident led to an attempted murder. Other theories with how this entity could communicate with so many people so quickly and across the globe over the years besides supernatural ability of its own, would be that its own reach is perhaps being strengthened by an egregore or a collective group of thought form created by occultists for a certain purpose. However, this seems unlikely considering the entity doesn't seem to serve any human interest other than to destroy the person or people's lives it makes contact with. Egregores are typically formed to bring control over a summoned deity for the person or group's bidding. But perhaps instead there is a cult worshipping Zozo. I mean, that would make more sense to me. People who have made contact with the entity via a spirit or Ouija board have also been asked to chant or spell out phrases in Hebrew or Latin which has convinced many of the intelligence of the being that they are speaking with. What is also interesting is that the letter Z was actually removed from the original Latin alphabet because it was considered too evil when pronouncing it. It was said that one's face would make a death's grimace like that of a corpse, and that it mimicked the letter S like an evil twin. Perhaps the entity uses this name as some sort of mocking, whether to God or something else. One may also ask, despite the origin theories and historical details that could be linked to this ancient demonic force, how would one know if they encountered such a thing? These are what's known as Zozo's calling cards 
when it's being summoned using a Ouija board. The obvious is there that the planchette will begin to move on its own, but some less obvious signs are there as well and are as follows. The planchette will move in a rainbow pattern from side to side, spelling Z-O, Z-O, over and over again, also known as the rainbow effect. It can also move in repeating figure eight movements, like an infinity sign. The planchette will spell out various versions of the demon's name, like Zozo, Zoso, Zaza, Zuzu, or Mama. You may also begin to see shadows moving around the area where you are hosting the session. Like you're seeing through the thinnest sheet into a dark world that exists just behind your vision. And you and whoever you may be with may start to feel scared, uneasy, or upset, seemingly for no other reason before or after this takes place. When you tell this entity goodbye, typically the best way to close a session, it may not truly be goodbye, because oftentimes, depending on how long the session has been for, like an ever-widening door, the entity may have had just enough time to sneak in to begin to wreak havoc upon your life. And thus begins what many demonologists and religious leaders alike call demonic obsession, which is where the entity becomes aware of you and begins to crave you, which then leads to oppression, or begins to inflict various forms of torture upon you in an effort to break you down, whether that's physically, psychologically, or spiritually. It will also work to isolate you from others, especially those who care about you. And finally, if you're incredibly unlucky, possession, where the entity finally takes control of you as its vessel. All of which to me are absolutely terrifying in every imaginable way. Darren Evans to this day continues to research the Zozo phenomenon having been involved in a number of paranormal investigations, shows, and various other public and private events, as well as radio shows and podcasts, many of which he goes into various degrees of details regarding his encounters, other people's encounters, and other various historical details. He also in 2016 compiled his years worth of research and experiences into a book also titled The Zozo Phenomena, which you can read and learn more about the entity and the topic as a whole if you're interested. I'll link it below. I also pulled a lot of this information from various interviews, which I'll also be linking below, as well as an older website he runs that doesn't seem to have been updated in a while, but supplied me with much information to get the story as cohesive as I possibly could. I also sourced the photos of the apparitions from this site, some of which were taken by Evans himself over the years. So does this demon or ancient force truly exist? Is it some kind of elder god, a pre-Christian deity or being, or a manifestation of occult or Luciferian practices? Did Darren Evans just make it up? And did thousands of people find it interesting enough to make up their own stories and partake in a mass charade that has lasted years? All of these answers may never truly be known, but my opinion is this. I think, not only given the wide array of strange coincidences and details throughout history, from the origins to the stories of this creature existing in distant past to the present, to literally thousands of people, from casual interest in the occult, to more hardcore fanatics, religious scholars, demonologists, and more, claiming to have had experiences with this thing. With all of these details in mind, I certainly think it very well could be real. I do think there are things that exist in the shadows, things we can't see or touch 
that are there, watching and waiting to strike when and if the opportunity presents itself. So my advice to all of you to avoid any possibility of opening a door that you can't close and inviting evil into your life is this. Don't mess with Ouija boards. These things are not toys. And whether you believe it or not, these entities do exist and they believe in you. So keep away from them because you might just let something in that won't want to leave, even if you say goodbye. Lying dormant within the streets of suburbia, there is an unseen evil. Like a mouse falling into a pit of snakes, an unsuspecting family disturbed a slumbering force and became enshrouded in a fog of darkness. This is the untold story of the Bel Air House and the terrifying malevolent entities that dwell within its walls. Bel Air, Ohio, an area rich in history, was once known as Glass City, having once been a major glass production hub in the late 1800s, is now known as the All-American Town having been used in many Hollywood productions as a backdrop for lots of movies, some of which you've probably seen over the years. The town that epitomizes small America's daily life has long since moved past its industrial days and has become known for something else. On the outskirts of the town lies an old two-story Victorian home that has become famous over the recent years both among locals as well as across the country, with some saying it could be the most haunted place in the United States, if not the world. This is a bold statement to say the least, but the countless visitors to the house have reported strange, disturbing, and unexplainable encounters within its antique walls. But just how did the story begin? Where did the legend of the Belair House originate from? Let us first take a look at the home's dark history. Built in 1887 by a coal tycoon named Jacob Hetherington, the house sits adjacent from ancient Native American burial caves. It is also located where the scene of a massacre took place during the French and Indian War. It would sit on top of an active coal mine for years before. There was a major explosion that took place within the mine, killing multiple men working deep within the earth, directly underneath the house. Could the culmination of these tragic deaths have opened up a portal within the Bel Air house? A portal that allowed something to come through that wasn't supposed to be here. Shortly after this explosion is when the strange activity began. Jacob's son Alex moved into the home with his daughter Lyde, but was soon stricken with seizures and hallucinations. He would ultimately be committed to an insane asylum for the rest of his life, claiming that demons were trying to kill him. As time progressed, Lyde would take charge of the family business, being helped by her younger brother Edwin. Lyde would tragically and unexpectedly pass away one morning in the kitchen of the home. Edwin, now alone and grief-stricken, descended into mysticism and the occult in search of answers. He began to regularly host seances in the kitchen where his sister had passed away to attempt to make contact with her on the other side, and it is believed that contact was indeed made but with who or what is uncertain. In 2005, Kristen Lee and her family are desperate for a new home. Like a curse, for the second time in less than two years, a flash flood has destroyed their home and all of their possessions. Kristen, her two sons, Nicholas and Lane, along with their father, Hefe, have been fortunate enough to room with friends during this difficult time. 
Kristen has continued to try and get the family back on their feet and no longer wants to burden her friends with the boarding of her family. So she constantly checks the real estate listings, hoping to find a home that her and her family can finally settle down into. Given the circumstances, the family didn't have a big budget and would have to rebuild their lives from scratch. But soon, her determination seems to pay off. While at work, Kristen often browses real estate websites for new listings as well as foreclosures, and a new listing soon catches her eye. Recently foreclosed on, but now available for purchase, she lays eyes on the old Victorian home for the first time. Its four bedrooms and two bathroom setup, along with plenty of room, would be perfect for her family. The price seems almost too good to be true for her budget as well. And although the listing lacks more details, it's like her prayers had finally been answered. But by what? Not wanting to lose the property, Kristen arranges a showing of the home as soon as possible, and before too long finds herself on the front steps of the Belair house. She is immediately taken in by the beautiful craftsmanship of the woodwork. The wraparound porch facing the Ohio River soon has her imagining peaceful evenings watching the water flow. Upon entering the home, she continues to be impressed. Old marble and cherry wood ordain the interior of the home, and it seems almost too perfect, like something straight out of her dreams. The family also has a dog named Bella, and the large fenced-in backyard is perfect for her to run in and the boys to play in. Dumbfounded by her luck, Kristen puts in an offer on the house that evening, and it's accepted the following morning. After two years of chaos and uncertainty, the Lee family can finally breathe again and start living a normal life. But just as all seems quiet and settled, the family begins to discover that the house is anything but normal. At first, upon hearing odd noises in the night, the family wrote off the sounds as nothing more than anxiety in an old house. Being slightly scared or anxious upon moving into a new place, particularly following a very uncertain time in one's life, is not out of the ordinary, but these sounds soon become too much to dismiss. They soon begin to hear footsteps at all hours of the day and night. Kristen would later describe the activity as so. I would hear footsteps above and sometimes below me, even when there was no one else home but me, and I always felt as if there were thousands of eyes staring at me, at all times, watching my every move. Along with the strange noises, items soon begin to go missing from keys to towels to trinkets. One moment they would be there, and within seconds, they would vanish. And Kristen isn't the only one experiencing strange happenings within the Belair house. At the time, her 12-year-old son Nicholas begins to experience a malevolent force that seems to dwell within his bedroom. At first, he too begins to feel as if he's being watched at all times and it seems to get exponentially worse at night. He begins to have night terrors, feeling someone or something covering his mouth and nose, forcing him to suffocate. One night, he wakes up in a cold sweat. It's storming outside. Flashes of lightning occasionally light up the room. What he sees disturbs him to his core. In the corner of his room, towards his closet, as a burst of light fills the room, he sees a blackened figure staring at him and shaking profusely. The young boy is utterly terrified. Rushing out of his room as fast as he possibly can, he wakes up his mother and refuses to sleep there any longer. The boy is so hysterical, the only solution was to send him to his grandmother's house located 30 minutes away. What makes this case all the more compelling is that Kristen has a master's degree in psychology and works as a mental health physician. With this, 
Her professional opinion of what Nicholas had experienced was initially contributed to stress and fatigue, both common factors that tend to make the human mind see and experience things that aren't really there. And these probably could explain many similar situations, and most would agree. However, Kristen's view would soon undergo a radical change after one terrifying experience of her own. After months of strange happenings within the home, it was now winter and the Lee family, still tied on finances, was sleeping in the basement near the fireplace to save money on the gas bill. Hefe was asleep in a recliner and Lane as well as Kristen were asleep on the wraparound couch located in the corner of the room. All seemed normal until Kristen was woken up by the feeling of the couch cushion being pressed down near her legs. She then found herself face to face with a terrifying figure of a man staring directly at her. She would later describe the encounter as so. I woke up being face to face with this gray figure of a man. He was translucent, almost like a mist, but the mist had features like a person. The face was completely emotionless and had dark sunken in eyes. Kristen asked, who are you? What are you doing here? What do you want? But to no response, just a blank, lifeless stare. Within seconds, the apparition disappears. But before she can ponder what had just taken place, the silence is once again shattered. But by this time, it was the family dog, Bella, who was barking and running around the room. Kristen, attempting to keep her family asleep through the ordeal, tries to quiet the dog down and notices that she can see her breath in the air. And although it's cold outside, it's not nearly that cold near the fireplace. She then sees the figure materialize once more and silently move from one side of the room and through the wall on the other side, vanishing completely. No longer wanting to face whatever this was alone, she woke up her husband and told him what had just taken place. His response, however, was that she was too tired and needed to go back to sleep. Could what Kristen had experienced been a stress or fatigue-induced hallucination? Perhaps, but someone with a professional background such as herself surely would know how to differentiate, wouldn't you think? Finally knowing she's not crazy and totally convinced that the home was haunted, Kristen begins to try and make plans to get her family out of the Bel Air house and to safety elsewhere. As soon as she can, she puts the home up for sale and moves the family to a nearby rental home. Although she's relieved to no longer physically be in the house, no one is buying it. To try and cover expenses, she has no other choice other than to make the house a rental property. But almost as soon as the first family moves in, they move out. And this kick starts a revolving door of tenants. Seemingly stuck with the house, Kristen comes to the conclusion that no family will or should live there. So what should be done with a haunted property? Needing to make ends meet, she comes up with a unique idea. She turns the home into an afterlife research property. This would allow various groups to come in and conduct their own research on just what exactly was taking place within the Bel Air house. And the idea works. Soon, groups from all over the United States and Canada are traveling to temporarily live within the home to conduct research. And from here, we gain some more interesting stories to say the least. One group, who calls themselves the Armchair Researchers, from upstate New York, consists of two women, one being a birthing nurse, and the other a nurse who works with dying patients. They found paranormal and afterlife research to be a natural extension of their day jobs for the last 15 years. After hearing about the Bel Air House, they soon find themselves driving to Ohio to investigate the phenomena for themselves. 
First impressions tend to go a long way, and the first impression the women got upon their arrival was very creepy. The home by this point was in a moderate state of decay. The fence that had once surrounded the backyard was mostly blown down, and the exterior of the home, as well as the porch, was weathered and rotting. But despite the odd feelings initially, they make their way inside. And at first, they actually felt welcomed, almost invited in, greeted by the same cherry wood interior that has greeted everyone. But as soon as they set up their equipment and prepare for their stay, as day turns to night, there seems to be a shift in energy within the home. The shift went from warm and inviting to dark and ominous. Then began the noises. Banging, footsteps, and the moving of furniture. The ladies also noted the feeling of being watched everywhere they went. While asking probing questions as they wandered throughout the house, they would soon also witness strange lights in various parts of the home. And along with the lights, there soon also came full-blown apparitions, all of which seemed to be centered around the basement. And as the night progressed, so did their feelings of anxiety. While taking a short break and sitting down on one of the couches in the basement, the two heard what they described as a large crashing noise above them, as if someone or something had thrown a bookshelf across the house itself, shaking the entire home. Absolutely terrified and panicked, the women apprehensively made their way up the stairs and rushed out of the home as fast as they possibly could, leaving behind equipment and personal items. They were too frightened to go back. Upon learning of what had taken place, Kristen wasn't at all surprised. Over the years, there had been dozens of teams of people who couldn't seem to last the night for one experience or another. People have been scratched, pushed downstairs, punched, bitten, and even in one instance, thrown across the room by a violent and unseen force. Another noteworthy story comes from a team located locally there in Ohio. They have had the opportunity to visit the home and conduct investigations numerous times over the years, but their experience in particular one night truly makes me question just what exactly haunts the Bel Air house. There was three of them this time, and it was shortly after midnight when they made their way into the attic to continue their investigation. During their questioning, they seemed to be getting direct interaction with something through their spirit box. Then, towards the corner of the attic, a mist seemed to materialize, coming up from the attic floor slowly enveloping the group. Glancing down, they were now too stunned to speak. They saw what appeared to be thousands of black snake-like creatures slithering over their feet and onto their legs. The creatures then began to form a figure standing in front of one of the attic windows, a creature of pure darkness that seemed to stare at them with thousands of tiny, beady eyes. The crew, which consisted of two men and a woman, ran for their lives, descending the attic stairs as quickly as possible, leaving behind anything and everything that they had brought with them that wasn't located on their person and out of the home for good. All of these stories and experiences have led many to believe that the Bel Air house is some kind of magnet for paranormal activity. A magnet or a host to a portal for spirits. Whether that portal was opened by the tragedy that took place within the mind that once existed below its foundation, or one that was opened due to seances being conducted within the house on multiple occasions. But over the years, many different entities have been documented from what appear to be human ghosts to perhaps something more sinister. One such entity goes by the name of Emily Davis. It is believed that Emily Davis was a child that drowned in the Ohio River that flows right by the home. 
Her room is allegedly the same room that Kristen's son Nicholas once stayed in. And besides the basement, it also seems to be a hot spot for paranormal activity. Through various investigations, once contact has been made and trust seems to be gained, people are often attacked, which have led many to believe that Emily isn't a child at all, but a demon. Perhaps it could be the same demonic creature that frightened Nicholas so bad that he moved out of the home, as previously mentioned. Many investigators also have claimed to have some activity follow them home, and even haunt their dreams, as if the house or the beings within the house are calling out to them to come back for one reason or another. Although many questions may never be answered surrounding the Bel Air house, one thing is for certain. It continues to be considered one of the most haunted places in America, if not the world. It also continues to serve as a place of study for those wanting to investigate the supernatural forces that dwell within its walls. But if you find yourself being drawn to the old Victorian, just know that if you're not careful, you too could find yourself being made a part of its history, whether you like it or not. Over the years, I've covered a wide array of mysteries, from the Mothman to UFOs, conspiracies to cold cases. And one topic that seemed to resonate more with all of you, and one that I've always found fascinating, is hauntings. Whether that's haunted places, haunted people, or experiences that people have had that they would consider paranormal in nature. So today, I'm trying something new. And don't worry, this is adding content here on Mystery Archives, so there will still be episodes of the untold story for you to enjoy. Those just take a good chunk of time to produce. So, in between those episodes, I'd really like to share stories from you guys, the community, to bring awareness that these kinds of experiences really do happen. And having grown up in a haunted home myself, I know that oftentimes people are hesitant to share their stories for fear of ridicule or for fear of whatever they've experienced flaring up again and reigniting their personal nightmare. This platform will hopefully give their stories justice, have them heard, and give you a glimpse into what people like yourselves have experienced. These are your paranormal encounters. When a young family encounters the devil in the flesh, told from the perspective of a young girl, this terrifying tale will have you questioning just what could be happening across the street from you, next door, or even in your very own home. I was almost seven when these events took place and I'll be 40 later this year. I lived in the Glendale Apartments in Rock Hill, South Carolina. My baby brother at the time wasn't quite even a year old. Now, my mom was young when she had me at 17, and my stepdad Keith was exactly two months to the day older than her. My mom has been gone for 14 years now, but I still remember this day like it was yesterday. We had left to get dinner that night, and by the time we had gotten back, Keith was passed out in the front seat of his little hatchback Mustang in the parking lot. This was the first of two that would find themselves wrapped around trees in my town. Keith was suffering from what would later be diagnosed as schizophrenia with bipolar tendencies and had seemingly been self-medicating to alleviate his symptoms. Since he was asleep, my mom urged me not to wake him as I helped her get my infant brother at the time out of the car and into our apartment. As we began to wind down for the evening, our phone began to ring, shattering the calm peace that was our lives. It was Keith's mom, Mary. She lived on the other side of the complex, which mostly housed old people and people with disabilities. She sounded panicked screaming that something was happening in her apartment and that she needed help immediately. My mom rushed to go wake Keith up out in the parking lot, but upon running up to the car, 
he was nowhere to be found. She rushed back into our apartment, saying that she couldn't find Keith, when he suddenly appeared in the hallway, and neither of us had seen him come into the apartment. He seemed completely out of it and was terrified, saying that something was taking him over and that he couldn't control himself. I saw his eyes. They were black. My mother didn't have time to deal with or process his antics and gathered us to walk to his mother's apartment in the meantime. As we rushed over there as fast as we could, I remember getting a skin-crawling feeling every time Keith looked at me, like it was something completely foreign to this world, peering into my soul. We arrived and were quickly led into Mary's apartment. Her lights were flickering, and her pictures were swaying back and forth on the walls. A heavy presence could be felt by all of us. Mary was deeply religious and couldn't understand just what was taking place, but she believed it to be evil. Keith was now standing in the living room and began to sway back and forth as the activity seemed to intensify. As my mother approached him to ask what he was doing, he began to laugh. This was the deepest, most maniacal laugh I have ever heard, and I still get chills thinking about it. This voice was not his own. My mother quickly backed up, unsure of what to do, and he then began to point at me, saying, I'm going to sacrifice that child tonight. His eyes were now blood red. Mary, by this time, had grabbed some of her belongings from her room and happened to have some blessed oil along with her Bible. She threw the oil on Keith's face, and it began to boil. The sound of sizzling and screaming was horrific. My mother's love for Keith quickly overpowered her fear, and she pulled him into the bathroom to examine his face. She was freaking out, to say the least partially because of how unbelievable the circumstances were and just how badly he was burnt on his face. His eyes at this point were rolled into the back of his head. Then suddenly, without warning, he rushed my mom and pinned her against the wall. His younger sister Nikki and his mother quickly rushed in to help free her, with Mary dumping more oil on him. Each time, his skin literally sizzled where it landed. This fortunately worked. Keith now lay catatonic on the bathroom floor, so altogether, us girls moved him into a nearby bedroom and restrained him to the bed using anything we could find for our own safety. Shortly after we did this, his mother called the nearby oratory and asked for a priest to assist us immediately. Nikki, who was a teenager at the time, was trying to comfort me, telling me that Keith was just really sick and not to be scared. She encouraged me to try and get some sleep, and I, of course, couldn't and wouldn't. I didn't dare close my eyes for fear of that thing hurting my mom. In this room with Keith was a picture of Jesus kneeling on top of a mountain. I heard Keith laughing in that otherworldly voice. He called out to me. He said, You know, little girl, I used to be an angel with the most beautiful wings. Until that bastard was born. Then I was cast from atop that mountain and banished. I asked, Who are you? The devil? He perked up, looked me dead in my eyes, and said, I am Lucifer, the light bringer, here in the flesh. I'm not only taking Keith with me, but all of you as well. Now, untie me. I ran hysterically to my mother who was having a cigarette to calm her nerves. She ran into the room to comfort him when he said, do you want to see proof? And against her will, my mother then extinguished the cigarette into his arm with Keith exclaiming, it feels so good. You'll have to adjust to the searing flames but in due time, you too will call it home. She then rushed out of the room and closed the door. We waited with bated breath for the priest to arrive. 
when shortly after 3 a.m., there was a knock on the door. Thank God, it was him. For the next several hours, they attempted to cast this thing out of Keith. Probably for the best, they kept me in the living room, away from the demonic terror that was inhabiting his body. But my God, the smells that wafted throughout the complex. Like putrid meat and sulfur. I soon also heard moaning and growling from dogs that didn't exist. There was a strange fog that had enveloped the apartment itself, and a strange flickering light that now emanated from the room where the exorcism was taking place. I began to close my eyes and pray to God harder than I had ever prayed before, wanting and wishing for all of it to end, when suddenly it did. Keith had seemingly been freed of these spiritual shackles, and although I was terrified, I was more than wanting to finally get some sleep. So after the priest departed and all seemed fine, we slowly made our way back home through the damp, misty morning that was now upon us. Upon arriving home and heading inside, we all began to make our way to our bedrooms to try and sleep. I found myself in my bed, comfy, and finally about to rest, when I felt my bed shake. I quickly opened my eyes to find my bed off the floor, and my bedpost balls screwed off, each one in the corner of each post, floating there. I screamed harder than I've ever screamed before, alerting my mother who rushed to save me. Upon her running in, my bed suddenly slammed to the ground, and my bedpost balls all fell to the floor. The events of that night and the following morning can never be forgotten by me and my family. For the next year and a half, we dealt with similar smells wafting throughout our apartment, unseen snarls and growls, and a feeling of anxiety, as if our every move was being watched. But thank God, it all eventually faded. I had since asked Keith how he came to be in that state, but I could never really get a clear answer. He often drank moonshine and was in a bad state mentally and spiritually at the time. Perhaps this weakened him enough to let something in, somehow. I have since moved on from that place, but heard something very interesting that I'd also like to share in regards to it. This was the apartment we lived in, and a young boy mysteriously passed away within it not too long ago. The details of the case are hard to find, but I believe he was about as old as I was when everything had taken place to us. There has also been multiple shootings, stabbings, and murders that have taken place near and in the complex itself. It seems like whatever possessed Keith and stalked us maybe never truly left. I'm glad to share my story with all of you, and I just want you to know that these things are very real. The paranormal is real. And please, do not meddle with it, because you just don't know what you could be inviting in. This energy, this evil, wanted my soul, and it seems like it may have taken multiple lives in pursuit of whatever nefarious things it wanted. Leia. I would like to thank Leia for submitting this chilling story of an exorcism that took place to her stepfather when she was a child. The entire situation must have been terrifying to endure, to say the least, and I commend her for being willing to share this with us and warn others that these things are very real indeed. I also believe it's important to bring awareness to these kinds of topics for a number of reasons. I am curious just how Keith became possessed, however, and if it was truly by Lucifer himself, or something pretending to be him. All around, a terrifying tale from Leia. Upon laying her head down to sleep, a young woman is seemingly transported to another time or place, where she interacts with malevolent spirits, this one may just make you wonder if the very same has ever happened to you. 
One hot Saturday morning in 2001, my ex-husband Dean and I went to the grocery store. By the time we returned home and put everything away, it was almost noon. I prepared some lunch for us, and by 2 p.m., I announced that the heat had made me feel so very tired and that I would need to lie down. Dean would go on to watch TV with the volume on low, and I closed the bedroom door. As soon as my head hit the pillow, I went out like a light. Then in what seemed like only five minutes later, I was woken up by a lady speaking beside my bed. It was as if she was addressing another person, but yet in a crystal clear voice across the room. She said something along the lines of, don't disturb her, let her sleep. This startled me. I immediately sat up in my bed and I looked around, but saw nothing. I knew I wasn't dreaming as the voice was real, and yet spoke at an audible enough level even to wake me up. Regardless, whether a dream or real, I was too exhausted and quickly fell asleep again. Now this is where things took a stranger turn. I felt my soul leave my body. It rose up to where the wall met the ceiling. I crossed through the wall and into another place in time. I was no longer within my home, but found myself in a scene from the 18th century. It was similar to watching a black and white film, but in varying shades of gray. I saw a few people who were extravagantly dressed and wore coiffed and powdered wigs sitting on a plush divan and some armchairs. They sat almost motionless by a small low-lying table. Only the woman slowly looked about, but nobody seemed to notice me. I looked to my left and saw a couple standing still, arms held in an arch above in the air, hands touching, poised as if waiting for music to start for their dance. I looked past them and saw a few men, one at each small table just sitting quietly and motionless. Then I looked to my right, past the few people I initially saw, and looked in awe at the sight before me. I realized I was in a vast hall as far as the eye could see. I saw no other people, and the next thing I knew, I was back in my body, seemingly asleep, yet aware of my surroundings. I was made aware of the large crowd of people outside of my bedroom door. The sound was similar to what you would hear in a crowded bar, many people talking amongst themselves. However, there was one woman's voice that could be heard slightly above the rest of the crowd. I didn't pay it any special attention as I wasn't focusing on anyone in particular nor catch what she had said. And what was only a moment later, that same voice was louder and closer this time, just on the other side of my bedroom door. Although I paid a little more attention now, what she said was still indiscernible, and the voice was yet to be one that I recognized, a voice belonging to a stranger. In what seemed just another moment again, she opened the door, stepped into my room, and then shut the door behind her. I laid frozen in my bed, unable to move, yet I felt real terror at this point. Although I couldn't move at all, my eyes were fixed atop the wall. Somehow, with my mind's eye, I saw her. It was my mother who had passed away 21 years earlier. She wore a long white shroud, which I never got to see her in, but I knew that she had been buried in one. By now, I was totally terrified. I wanted to scream out for help. Better still to get out of there. But I wasn't able to move a muscle. I watched my mother pace to and fro, past the foot of my bed, in absolute rage. She was so angry with me. She was literally spitting mad while she was scolding me. Never had I seen her this angry. The one thing I did notice once my mother's spirit had entered the room, was that while my eyes were fixed near the ceiling, it was within my range of sight that I'd seen a soft, white, gaseous ball of light appear to my right at the corner of the ceiling. It was about the size of a basketball, though not quite as spherical. 
It was so very slow moving, like a swirl of white smoke within itself. Somehow I felt like it was protecting me from this evil, like a guardian angel. Once my mother was done raging at me, she faced the door and held the door slightly open. She paused and told me that I'd be dead by midnight tonight. She then shut the door behind her and left. As soon as she was out the door, the ball of light had dissipated too, and I felt instant relief. I looked at the clock, and it was now 3 p.m. All of this strangeness took place in the space of one terrifying hour. I still don't know if that was the spirit of my mother or something evil imitating her. All I know is that I jumped out of bed and rushed to the lounge room, telling Dean what I had seen, though I didn't mention my mother's parting words. Dean wasn't remotely interested. He only mumbled as I interrupted him watching his program. Well, that was the end of the nap I wasn't quite able to get. As evening approached, I constantly glanced at my watch. Although we retired for the day at about 10 p.m., that night I was fearful, yet resigned to my fate. I hadn't told a soul about my mother's message, in case it tempted fate. On waking the next morning, I couldn't have felt more relieved and thrilled to still be alive. Now that it felt safe to do so, I told Dean and later my neighbor about it all. They showed me the goosebumps on their arms and expressed fear as I recounted my experience. This was 22 years ago, and I still think of that day and the sheer terror that it brought me. It's a day that I can never forget. Johanna That story was chilling, Johanna. I too am curious if it was some kind of spirit impersonating your mother or if it was somehow her. The detail of what she was wearing also happened to be what she was buried in literally gave me goosebumps. So thank you so much for sharing your story and continuing to bring awareness to these topics. A young man seemingly interacts with his grandmother, who has long since passed away, but he isn't the only one that sees and feels her presence. This was in reference to watching one of my videos. Watching this video reminded me of something that's been going on in my house. My wife's grandmother died before we got together, and her son was the last person in the hospital room with her when she passed. Now, my work schedule varies, but generally, I'm up between 3 and 4 a.m. every day. Sometimes, I feel a presence, or I thought I saw what was a shadow and my peripheral vision. I finally told my wife about this a while back, and she proceeded to tell me that her autistic son regularly speaks to his deceased grandmother. We've both spoken to him multiple times, and apparently she visits him constantly. My wife admitted that she's seen her in our house a couple of times as well. I've offered to have the house cleansed, but my wife said no. Apparently his grandmother visits him all the time and watches over him, and he's admitted that he still sees her. He's autistic, so he's very honest with everything. I'd like your guys' input about this. Thank you. Caveman. Well, Caveman, especially since he's autistic, that really does convince me of his sincerity and honesty. The young man clearly doesn't have a motivation to gain anything by saying this. And when you have felt this presence, is it as she was in life? Is it more of a benevolent energy or something else? It's also very interesting that your wife has seen her on multiple occasions as well. Perhaps she is watching over her grandson. Children often have an extra sense, it seems like, to be able to interact with the spirit world. Reading your story reminded me of when my brother was younger and we had a very similar situation. My mom's father, Paul, had passed away in their family home in 2002 when my brother was just two years old. Prior to his passing, Paul seemed to be motioning for things to go away, things that we couldn't see, perhaps trying to state that he wasn't ready to go yet. Several months after his passing, with my grandmother Agnes still inhabiting the very same house, 
my brother Caden had started to interact with something that we couldn't see. He would often play around the living room, which was the same room my grandfather passed away in. One day, when he was in a full conversation with this person, my mother asked him who he was talking to, and he said, Grandpa Paul. It took the very breath out of her lungs. These interactions were fairly frequent until he was about four or five years old. Then they suddenly went away one day. It truly makes one beg the question, just how often do our loved ones truly watch over us? Thanks for sharing this one, Caveman. Thank you all for watching. If you'd like to hear more content like this, and if you enjoyed the video, please help me out in the algorithm by hitting the like button, leaving a comment, and subscribing with notifications if you're new here. As I mentioned in the beginning of this video, I think it's very important to bring awareness to the paranormal question. It in a sense is the ultimate question in my opinion. What truly happens when we pass through the veil of this reality and into the afterlife? I appreciate all of you as always. I hope all of you are doing well mentally, physically, and spiritually. And I hope your year is heading in a vibrant and positive direction. And I wish you all nothing but the best. Until next time, this has been Cody here at Mystery Archives. Stay safe out there, and take care. If the walls of certain homes could speak, some of the stories they would tell would more than likely shock and amaze us. Or perhaps repulse and terrify us instead. This is one such story that if a house could tell its own tale, it would certainly be one we would never forget. A family moves to the country in search of peace, but those dreams are soon shattered by supernatural terror. Something evil lurks within the woods outside of their home, and this evil begins to stalk and wreak havoc upon everyone that dwells within the home. Can they save themselves before it's too late? This is the untold story of the haunted Hinsdale House, also known as the Dandy House, and the entities that infested it. Hinsdale, New York, a small town with a rustic and rural charm. Tucked deep into the countryside and far away from the crime, concrete, and smog of New York City. Instead of gazing at skyscrapers, they would rather gaze at the surrounding mountains, covered in dense foliage. But these mountains and their surrounding woods harbor many secrets and have many stories to tell. This is just one of them. The year is 1970, and the Dandy family is in pursuit of their American dream. After years of vacationing to Hinsdale and the surrounding areas to catch a break from their fast-paced life in Buffalo, they've finally reached a point where they can turn their vacation into their daily life. Seeking their own rural paradise, they come across a listing for a home that seems idyllic for their family and its needs. Clara Dandy, the mother of the family, believed that they all got along so much better in the country like it had some form of redemption qualities about it that seemed to rejuvenate their spirits and their relationships. As they wind their way through the countryside, they lay eyes on the home for the first time. They are not only taken aback by the beauty and the sheer size of the house, but that it sat upon eight acres of land surrounded by dense and breathtaking woods. Clara would describe her feelings about first seeing the house as being overcome with a deep sense of peace. It was like I had finally come home after years of being elsewhere. And the air, the air was like breathing champagne. It was wonderful. The home is over a hundred years old and still had most of the original and ornate woodwork intact. It just seemed to emanate charm and elegance. As the children explored the nearby woods, Mr. and Mrs. Dandy, continued their tour, but when they were being shown the storage space underneath the stairs, 
The door was initially stuck, but after some elbow grease from Mr. Dandy, they were finally able to get it open. It revealed a dusty space of sorts, with a fireplace, and one that didn't seem to fit the feeling of the house at all. Clara would describe her feelings towards the space like this. I wasn't sure why, but I felt very uneasy when we opened up the storage space. I couldn't put my finger on it, but it was dark and desolate, not at all like the rest of the house. But she quickly would dismiss these feelings attributing the creepy factor to her city upbringing and the fact that they didn't have storage rooms like that where she was from. After closing the space and continuing to evaluate their opportunity, the feelings of peace would return and the dandies decide that they can't resist the charm of this rustic, hundred-year-old home, so they decide to purchase it. Once things are squared away several months later, they move in to start their new, rural existence. On move-in day, Clara's brother decided to lend a helping hand and had begun to move things in hours before the family was able to arrive. When loading in a box of belongings, as he opened the door, he was greeted by a flurry of insects. Both bees and flies pelted him in his face. Rushing past them and then unloading the box onto the floor in the main room, he was startled to see hundreds of dead bees scattered all over the floor, and even more startled to see hundreds still alive, encoding the windows. It was still cold during this time of year, and although he too wasn't from the country, he found it rather odd that there would be any kind of infestation at this time. When his sister and her family finally arrive, he greets her with the news and in order to continue with the move-in, they have to call an exterminator. Upon his arrival, he too confirms the oddity of the situation. He said that he had never seen so many bees and flies in one spot in a home, and given this time of year, it was not normal for them to swarm or infest anything during this time. It takes some time, but after he finishes clearing them out, the family is finally able to get moved in. As time progresses, things seem to fit the dreams they had for moving there in the first place. The family finally seems at peace. They were getting along better and enjoying each other's company, a far departure from their city life in Buffalo. But as the old adage goes, if it seems too good to be true, it is. A few weeks into living in what they believed was going to be their rural paradise, their son Mike has met and made friends with a nearby neighbor. Together they begin to explore the woods surrounding the dandy property. As the two navigate the forest, they're startled when they hear the crunching of leaves directly in front of them, stopping frozen in their tracks, and fearing that it could be a bear. They take refuge behind a large tree and sneak glimpses from around its sides to figure out just what it could be. To their shock, they spot a boy not much older than them, carrying a rifle and walking in the path ahead. Yelling at the boy that this is private property and wanting to know what he was doing there, they run towards him and try to catch up to him. They again freeze in their tracks when they notice that not only is the boy transparent the closer they get, but half of his head is missing. As the figure continues to walk and taking deep breaths, they slowly continue to follow him. The three approach a small lake and within the blink of an eye, the boy vanishes. Mike and his friend are at a loss for words and have no explanation for what they saw. They quickly rush back to the dandy house as fast as they can to tell anyone who will listen to them. They soon make contact with Clara and explain to her what took place, but she's quick to dismiss their experience as nothing more than overactive imaginations. Another several weeks pass by, and Clara has all but forgotten about what her son had told her. She's now walking the family dog Madison in the woods for some fresh air and exercise. As they get deeper into the forest, Clara starts to hear what can only be described 
as chanting. As she stops to listen, it sounds eerie and disembodied, as if the sound is all around her, but has no true origin. It's at this time that Madison begins growling and barking. The longer she seems to focus on the chanting, the louder it seems to become. Madison by this point is losing her mind and breaks free from a distracted Clara and bolts in the direction of their home. Clara chases her down and she finally stops running when she makes it to the front door of their estate. After taking a moment to collect herself, Clara then calls her husband, who, like she was to her son, is quick to dismiss her feelings, thinking that she just had to adjust to rural life and wasn't used to it being so different from their life in the city. Frustrated and worried now about what the chanting could have been, Clara talks with her son about her experience while she prepares dinner for the family. Mike thinks that it could have been some campers at a nearby campground, not too far from where their property line ends that could have been the cause of the strange sounds. To try and put his mother at ease, he and his friend Matt once again take to the woods to explore this possibility. As they venture further into the woods to a lookout point towards the campsite, they see nothing. There are no signs of any campers that could be nearby enough to have caused such a noise. Even more perplexed now that there was no explanation the boys start to make their way back to the house, when suddenly, they hear what sounds like an axe thudding into a tree right next to them. Unsure of what that noise could have been, before they could even begin to ponder or investigate, they hear a woman screaming to their left. This frightens them so bad that the two young men run as fast as they can all the way back to the dandy's home. When they arrive, Mike is truly scared this time. He has no way of explaining his mother's experience, or any of his own either. Upon relaying this information to Clara, both of them are left beside themselves, now with a chill up both of their spines. But these weird events thus far would only intensify as the sands of time continue to trickle into the hourglass. It has now been months since the initial experiences, and besides the oddities they were, the family's life continues to be great. This distance from the experiences only makes them ever easier to dismiss in the minds of Clara and Mike. One day, Phil, or Mr. Dandy, decides to take the children Mike and Tina into Buffalo for the day to get some errands done. Mostly being a homebody, Clara decides to forego the trip with her family and relax at home, reading her latest book instead. When her family departs, Clara finds herself curled up on the couch and immersed in her latest story as a warm breeze drifts through the open windows of the house. As she reads page to page, she is suddenly startled when the window closest to her slams shut. Upon investigating, it makes no sense to her because the breeze was light, not forceful at all, and their windows were fairly new, which made it all the stranger. But as she always does, she dismisses the happening as nothing more than a weird coincidence and heads back to her book. Several nights later, as Mike lay asleep in his bed, he is suddenly woken up when a nearby box of a chess game drops onto his chest. A storage shelf is directly above his head, so opening his eyes, he glances up to see if perhaps it could have been hanging too far off the edge, causing it to fall. And to his shock, he begins to see several more boxes slowly shifting towards the edge by themselves. The lowest one then suddenly flies out from the rest and smacks him in the chest. Terrified, he sits up trying to catch his breath. He has no way of explaining how the lowest box could be pulled and thrown with such force without bringing the rest of the boxes with it, as if someone or something had grabbed and thrown it by a will of its own. 
calling out to his mom in the darkness. She soon arrives in the doorway of his room. Being a very science and logic minded person, Mike has no way to explain what has happened. Examining the pile, Clara too is perplexed and becomes just as scared when another box from a different pile flies across the room, causing both of them to scream in terror and run out as fast as possible. Trying to make sense of what was taking place, Clara fears that whatever could be lurking in the woods has been stalking her family and has slowly but surely, like a malignant stain, invaded her home. As her fears turn into a revelation, Claire decides to reach out to a local priest for help, hoping her faith will help her come up with some answers, and better yet, some solutions. She speaks with a priest named Father Alphonsus at the University of St. Bonaventure. He believes that the activity could be a poltergeist, but given the intelligent nature of how it seemed to be behaving, Clara has her doubts, but nonetheless wants an expert's opinion and assistance. So arrangements are made for the father to come out and bless the home, and after several days, he arrives. On April 13th, 1975, the cleansing begins. As the family and the priest were all gathered together, and as he began to speak, a series of horrible wailing and moaning noises began to fill the home, as if the house itself was crying. The scent of burning matter also quickly enveloped the house. The activity reached a fever pitch when the priest opened and began to pray over the crawl space that was underneath the stairs. But after this, a blissful silence overtook them all. It was as if whatever entities that dwelled within the walls of the dandy's home had finally been evicted. Within time, the father gathered his things, exchanged pleasantries, and departed for the evening. The family now believed that their darkest days were behind them, and for all intents and purposes, that seemed to be the case. But as if to mock the Holy Trinity itself, three months later to the day, all hell would break loose once again. That night, while her husband is away on a business trip, Clara finds herself woken up out of a dead sleep by a series of knocks coming from inside the walls. The knocks themselves are soon accompanied with whispers from someone that she can't see. As she apprehensively makes her way from her room and slowly down the stairs, headed towards the main level, the apparition of a young girl begins to walk by the stairs. She slowly makes her way to the crawl space, opens the door, and closes it behind her. Clara is baffled at the sight. After gathering up her courage, she too makes her way fully down the stairs into the crawl space, and after a moment of bracing herself, she opens the door only to be met with nothing. Clara then makes her way to her daughter Tina's room to make sure it somehow wasn't her and perhaps her nerves were just on edge. But after opening her door, she finds her fast asleep in her bed with no signs that she had been awake for some time. The following morning, while the rest of her family is still asleep, Tina wakes up to begin her day. As she feeds her pet bird in its cage and begins to brush her hair in her oval mirror, she notices that her bird isn't doing its usual whistles. As she glances over at them, she finds it staring into the corner of the room. As Tina glances back up at the mirror, she's met with the apparition of a young girl her face is sunk in, and her eyes were gone. She screams in terror, and just as quickly as it appeared, the apparition disappears. The screams of her daughter startles and quickly summons Clara to her daughter's room. As she consoles Tina, she realizes that the priest's blessings were ineffective. 
She quickly calls Father Al back and explains what had taken place the previous night and that morning. And although he is busy, he promises to come back as soon as possible, and this time to bring a paranormal expert with him as well, to help him determine the cause and hopefully find a working solution. He's able to come back the following week. In the meantime, Clara is determined to keep her family calm. If she can control her own emotions, she knows that everything else will be okay. As they wait for the priest to return, Clara tries her best to keep her family calm and live some sort of a normal existence. That weekend, her and Phil are watching a movie while Mike and Tina are out with friends. As they enjoy their time together, their happiness is quickly shattered by a huge crashing noise coming from outside of their house. Quickly grabbing a flashlight and running outside to investigate together, they quietly step towards where they believed the noise to be originating from, when suddenly they hear it again. But this time, thankfully for them, the origin is not paranormal. This time, it's several raccoons who happen to be foraging through their metal trash cans for something to eat. Relieved for that moment, they start to make their way back to the house when they suddenly see the figure of a young girl in their living room window staring at them. As they rush inside, they run up into Tina's room where they find her incoherent and staring into her oval mirror. They try to get her attention, but she's entirely unresponsive. Her pale blue eyes are black. Panicking, they shake her and yell her name, not knowing what else to do, when she eventually comes back. In that moment and later, Tina will not recall how she got home or what exactly happened. As the family tries to gather themselves from the shock of what had just taken place, they hear movement coming from Mike's room. Phil tells his family not to leave Tina's room as he rushes to investigate. However, the home phone begins to ring. It's Mike. He's asking if he can stay the night at his friend Randy's house. However, when told what was going on, he quickly tells her that he's coming home to help in any way that he can. Rushing to his car, Randy offers to come with him, to which Mike agrees. Randy would later recount that Mike's hands were sweating and he was shaking, gripping the steering wheel. He was pale. I asked him what was wrong and he said that things were happening at the house that he couldn't explain. The boys quickly arrived to find the family in chaos. Phil is prepared to do battle with whatever force is within the house, and the girls are staying close to one another, attempting to comfort each other. As they try to determine a course of action, all the lights in the house go out. They then begin to hear banging and scratching coming from the crawl space. Flashlight still in hand, Phil with the backup of his family shines the light towards it and begins to make his way towards whatever this thing is. It seems like with each step he takes, the sounds become louder, and after a tense several seconds, he opens the door to the crawl space. Inside, they find that the fireplace that was once there has been completely disassembled. Its bricks have now been stacked in an elaborate pile directly in the middle of the small room. The amount of effort and strength required to perform such a task convinces all of them that whatever they're dealing with is strong, persistent, and perhaps uncleansable. Nonetheless, with their spirits waning, Clara makes a desperate call to Father Al, who agrees to come earlier than originally planned, and makes emergency arrangements for himself and his paranormal expert of a friend to come out that night. They arrive as soon as possible. The paranormal expert is a man by the name of Alex Tennis, a well-respected paranormal researcher and psychic whose abilities were studied at the American Society 
of psychic research. Together, they make their way to the door of the Dandy House, hoping to help rid this family of whatever seems to be stalking them. After being let in, the family quickly leads the pair to the crawl space to show them just what they were talking about. Although he was aware that some sort of activity was taking place, Alex had not been given any additional details or information in regards to the home, its history, or happenings. As he steps into the crawl space room, he begins to have a vision. In his vision, he sees multiple dead bodies stacked within the crawl space itself. After the vision subsides, Alex begins to explain to the family what he saw. He believed that many had passed away within the home itself, some of natural causes, and some of murder. It was his conviction that based on what he saw, that the house used to be a stopping point for a stagecoach, or perhaps some kind of inn where people would stay the night before departing the following morning. It was also his belief that there was a nearby criminal or gang of criminals that would often rob and kill nearby travelers, and that perhaps these souls somehow became trapped here. When someone passed or was found dead nearby, being the only stopping point in the area, their bodies would be placed in the crawl space until they could receive a proper burial. It was also his belief that there were seven different spirits that were trapped within the home altogether. With this revelation, the family, Alex, and the father pray that the trapped spirits within the home find peace and be released, so that they may go on to their final destination. Upon the pair's departure, Clara once again has renewed hope. The home as it did the first time around seemed to be cleansed to be more peaceful. Meanwhile, Mike and his friend Randy were skeptical of Alex's conclusions. After he left, they used an old map of the area to trace where he had said the old stagecoach route was. They did indeed find what they believed to be an old trail that could have been used for such a thing, and the trail passed right by the dandy home. But during their search, as they were following the trail out and headed back to the house, they experienced strangeness of their own. As they began to trace the trail, they began to see what they described as orbs of light in the nearby trees, and these orbs began to come at them. Randy, having never seen or experienced anything supernatural before, began to have a panic attack. Upon arriving at the house, they were fortunately able to get him calmed down. By this point, it was late in the night, and the entire family needed to try and get some form of sleep in order to function the following day. Randy ended up staying the night since he had rode with Mike. Once everyone else was settled down for the night and fast asleep, Clara sat by herself, weeping. She felt that her and her family were helpless in the situation, and that all efforts had been exhausted and that they needed to move. The only problem was that all their money, every last dime, had been sunk into the house, leaving them stranded. She would continue to contemplate the future and would cry herself to sleep that night. The following morning as the family began to wake up and start to try and resume some form of normalcy, Mike went ahead and departed with Randy to take him home. Several hours would go by and Mike hadn't returned. Finally, there was a knock on the door. It was a police officer. He informed the family that there had been an accident and that they needed to head to the hospital as soon as possible. Rushing into the car and to the hospital, the Dandy family wondered just what had happened. There had been no mention of Randy by the officer at the time. Upon arriving, they were briefed that Mike had lost control of his vehicle and crashed into a nearby ditch. He was now undergoing emergency surgery. He had extensive head injuries, a ruptured spleen that may have to be removed, and that he had lost a very significant amount of blood. As they waited for the outcome of their son's surgery, the dandies were once again greeted by the officer who had knocked on their door. He explained to them that Randy had indeed been dropped off and that Mike had wrecked on his way back to the dandy residence. 
but as he was being loaded into the ambulance, he kept saying that there was another person in the car with him, and although they believed him to be confused on account of his injuries, they went ahead and searched the area nonetheless, but another person was never found. After two weeks of being in a coma, Mike finally wakes up, but unfortunately has no recollection as to what exactly happened to him to cause the accident. Clara, however, believes that whatever presence that's been plugging their lives had to have been responsible for what happened to her son. After months of recovery for Mike and continued paranormal activity within the home, Father Alphonsus would return with Alex one last and final time at Clara's request to try and rid the home of the evil and persistent force that had drained the life out of all of them for years now. However, this time, just the father and Alex would perform the cleansing inside the home themselves. As they moved from room to room, Alex would once again experience multiple visions of the past. His visions would tell him that of the seven spirits who he believed to be within the house, one was that of a young man who had been in some kind of a war or battle near where the property sits now. Another was that of a young girl who had passed from some sort of very painful illness in what was now Tina's room. And there was another spirit that seemed to be keeping herself and others trapped within the house. It was the spirit of a woman who was incredibly angry and resentful. She continued to be possessive, depressive, and just as angry in death as she was in life, refusing to pass on. Believing what they had identified to be the source of the paranormal activity, Father Al decided to take a different approach to the cleansing itself. Although an exorcism cannot be performed on a place, but rather has to be performed on an individual, the rites themselves could in theory be performed or added to a series of prayers to try and use their strong cleansing powers to clear out a home such as this one. So that's exactly what the father did. He began to perform the rites of exorcism within the house itself. As the prayers began to exit his lips, varying with intensity as the rites often do, the home began to literally shake, and the horrific moaning and wailing that had made itself present in the very first cleansing seemed to return with a vengeance. Every horrible feeling, banging, knocking and scratching noise that the family had experienced thus far was present and seemed to be magnified. It takes hours, but eventually the rites are finished. As the dust settles, so to speak, the home seems peaceful and blissful like it did when the family had first visited and decided to buy the home. And again for three more months, the family lives in peace. But like the persistent force that has manifested itself to be, the haunting begins again. The Dandy family, despite their best efforts, simply cannot take it anymore, decide to cut their losses and move. Unable to find a buyer for their house, they eventually declare bankruptcy. Shortly after this, Phil and Clara would also divorce, bringing a sad, and bitter end to what was supposed to be a rural redemption for the Dandy family. However, this wouldn't be the end of the story of the Hensdale house. Eventually, the home would come into the possession of Daniel Klaus, who currently owns it. Daniel is a renowned paranormal investigator and has been involved with the likes of Nick Groff and has made appearances on tons of national TV programs centered around the paranormal over the years. Having been raised in a haunted house, this led to a lifelong fascination with the paranormal for him. After years of restoration, it is now available for both investigations and tours, and is still considered a very active paranormal portal, and is kept open as a paranormal research location. It's even staged in the 1970s period to maintain the integrity when the hauntings were initially known to have began. 
But now that we know the backstory of the 20th and into the 21st century of the Hensdale house, just who owned it, what happened to them, and who owns it now, I would like to shift your attention to some of the plausible theories as to what could have caused the haunting. Many theories of what could have caused the haunting have been formed over the years by the many people who have researched and have been interested in the case. One theory is that the home was built on top of an Indian burial mound. This of course could have disturbed the spirits of the natives that rested within the land. And although tribes who used this method of burial were present in the area back in history, there is little to no evidence to support this claim. But perhaps any evidence by this point could have long since been lost to the sands of time, or could have been removed when the home was initially built. Another theory is that the home was at one point used as a stagecoach inn, and passerbys were murdered either near or within the home itself, leading to their spirits being trapped within the home or on its land. Although there is evidence that a stagecoach route did run very close to the home, there isn't direct evidence that the house itself was used as an inn, but it is possible. Murders also did take place in or around the area in which the home is now located, which could lend credence to the theories of criminals robbing and murdering people along the stagecoach route. An old family from the area that used to own the home, with the last name of McMahon, also lends credence to the home being used as an inn at some point. The now past grandfather of the family used to tell stories of a road that passed by the house where stagecoaches traveled. Another theory is that one or several of the spirits were trapped as a result of hangings that took place there. The now famous hanging tree that sits near the residence was indeed used for executions for a time. Most famously, it seems, was the execution of a woman named Elizabeth and Elizabeth was pregnant. Could this perhaps be the spirit of the woman who was angry and refusing to leave? Other events such as a homicide that took place in the year 2000 near the house, as well as a buzzsaw incident that led to a boy's death, have led many to believe that whatever haunts the area could indeed still be there and influencing our world. It's important in my opinion to try and get the story and the facts as straight as possible, not only for the current owner's benefit, but for the dandies who have suffered greatly as a result of their story becoming public, especially towards the end of their time at the property, as word got out that something strange was taking place at the house. A local paper ended up reaching out to the dandies for a statement, thinking that they were accepting an opportunity for additional outside help. They gave their story only to be met with ridicule from the paper, which in turn led to ridicule from the public and nearby residents, which this combined with the paranormal torment they were experiencing, along with then having to file bankruptcy and then later divorce. In my opinion, they suffered greatly and did not benefit from the story, especially during that time. The only benefit I've seen could be from Clara Miller, formerly Clara Dandy, who would eventually write a book known as Echoes of a Haunting. But to be fair, if I experienced even a portion of what she did, I would eventually write a book to catalog what happened as well. Not only for some monetary benefit, of course, but for my own sanity, really. So as I've began to mention, and will continue to mention again in the future, if you ever encounter anyone mentioned in this video or any of my other videos, whether it be in person or online, please be respectful of them and their experiences and do not ever harass anyone. And if you find yourself seemingly handed an opportunity that seems too good to be true, the answer to your prayers, it's more than likely not the case. It could be a nightmare waiting to happen. It could be a haunted home infested with entities sitting and waiting for the perfect victim. Don't let it be you. There are many seemingly normal places in this world, but hidden behind the veil of normalcy can lie many, many secrets. 
This is the tale of one such place, and this tale intertwines history with myth and first-hand accounts of experiences and much more. From strange cryptid encounters to bizarre cult rituals and UFO sightings, there is much to uncover within, so join me as we decode the untold story of Black Star Canyon here on Mystery Archives. Black Star Canyon is known by many throughout the state of California as a wide open space full of family-friendly trails. However, it should be known for much more than just this. Unlike many of Southern California's trails, Black Star has been the site of a plethora of horrific events that have taken place throughout history, as well as a multitude of strange sightings, which we'll get into later. Located in Orange County, California, and the Santa Ana Mountains, the canyon was originally known as Canada de los Indios, under Spanish rule, and then later under Mexican rule as part of Alta California or Nueva California. The first known recorded negative event that took place there was in 1831. Local ranchers were being terrorized by horse thieves from the Shoshone tribe, a Native American tribe that was active in the area at the time. Unable to track the thieves down themselves, they banded together and were aided by a local mountain man named William Wolfskill. Over several weeks, Wolfskill and the ranchers tracked the thieves down until they came upon their encampment. Here, they discovered much more than they had bargained for. Not only had the tribesmen ate their horses, but they found several still cooking human limbs over the crackling campfire. Disturbed and angered, the ranchers overwhelmed the natives they encountered there and massacred them before then desecrating and leaving their remains. But this would be only one of many shocking events that would take place here and add to the darkness of the canyon. The land in which the massacre took place on would eventually fall into the hands of William Wolfskill and eventually a man named James Irving. After discovering coal deposits in the canyon, James Irving would co-found with a man named August Witt, the Black Star Coal Mining Company, in 1879, which gave the canyon its current name. The mine would pull an estimated six tons of coal each day, and was almost exclusively employed by the canyon's few residents. Many accidents would take place within the mine, including one incident where a man who was seemingly intoxicated fell to his death. This was later investigated by the law at the time, and the mining company was not found to be at fault. Many locals at this time of the operation believe the mine or the land could be haunted due to the frequent experiences of seeing apparitions and hearing disembodied voices throughout the mouth of the mine and the surrounding area. Many of the apparitions were described as natives adorned in tribal garb. The mining operation, like many during this era, soon became unprofitable, and the Black Star Mining Company was soon sold by Irving. It would later be replaced by the Santa Clara Mine, a much more successful and sustainable company that would lead to the sustainment of the town of Carbondale, located nearby. It would go on to operate until it closed for good in the early 20th century. Another unfortunate event that took place upon the land happened on June 9th, 1899, at a place called Hidden Ranch, located within the canyon. Hidden Ranch was owned by a man named Henry Hungerford of Norwalk and George Howard of Anaheim. On June 8th, 1899, James Gregg, his brother-in-law, and a teenage boy by the name of Clint Hunt arrived to drive out cattle that Greg owned 
and paid pasturage for on the land. That evening, a dispute broke out over unsettled debts between Greg and the property owners. Howard owed Greg $10 on a horse trade, and Greg had an outstanding pasturage bill of $17.50, a total sum that would equal approximately $98,000 in today's money. While Greg insisted that Hungerford and Howard accept a settlement of $7.50, or about $26,000 in today's money, a heated exchange broke out between the two, but they eventually would go their separate ways, and ultimately would go to bed for the night. However, the following morning, upon reconvening, the argument simply started back up. Amidst the resumed dispute, Henry Hungerford would ultimately fatally shoot and kill James Gregg. It wasn't long after this incident that Hungerford was arrested and brought to the trial for the murder before Judge J.W. Ballard. Initially convicted of the murder, the trial results were overturned due to the judge granting a motion for a new trial on the grounds that not enough evidence had been produced to convict beyond a reasonable doubt. Since no new evidence was available upon the start of the new trial, the district attorney, a man named R.Y. Williams, had no choice other than to dismiss the case. Henry Hungerford would get away with the murder of James Gregg. And since then, many have claimed to see Gregg near Hidden Ranch. And considering the circumstances in which he died, out of a lapse of judgment, heated emotions, and reaction, it wouldn't surprise me if his soul was still wandering the land, even to this day. Besides events of the distant past, there have been more modern tragedies to take place within the canyon as well. I will be focusing on the ones that took place directly in the geographical area of Black Star, and not the surrounding areas. It's been rumored but cannot be confirmed that in the 1970s, a bus driver lost control of the bus that transported local children to and from school. The bus then subsequently crashed into the Black Star Canyon, killing everyone who was on board. The corpse of the bus then sat within the canyon for more than 40 years until it was removed in 2013. Many people have reported being pushed by what felt like child's hands and hearing children whispering and laughing near the bus when it was still there, but there was never anyone around. In 2001, in a brazen act of evil, two men and three boys associated with a gang known as the LTK crew were arrested after the beating of two teenage boys and the violation of their teenage girlfriends within Black Star. The suspects confessed to being under the influence of alcohol prior to the attack and began also taking drugs while the attacks were in progress and after they had taken place as well. In 2002, a very sad and unfortunate event also took place. Nicholas Anderson and his brother Glenn Anderson entered the Blue Light Mine in hopes of exploring the abandoned mine and having an adventure, but the two brothers tragically would never make it out alive. Oxygen levels inside the mine were recorded at only 4%. The mine, which has a total of 11 entrances, only had three properly blocked off at the time of the Anderson brothers' deaths. There has since been a project in place to seal the additional entrances to prevent any further tragedies from taking place. Of just the several events that we've covered so far, as I've mentioned before in previous videos similar to this one as well, some believe that unspeakable events of evil, such as murder or massacre or even untimely death, can oftentimes leave a wound upon the land and a haunting as some believe, is similar to a scar upon the land, where the event has long since passed, but the energy of it, once having taken place there, still exists. One theory that's been discussed 
is that the majority of the canyon is comprised of limestone, which has long since been debated by the paranormal community since the 1970s to be a type of stone that captures and stores bursts of energy, like those that would have been discharged at the prior events mentioned. Could this possibly be contributing to the hauntings and other strange events taking place within Black Star Canyon today? Another theory is that many believe the canyon to be a kind of portal, whether that's to another dimension, the other side, or something else entirely, such as a different universe. It's hard to say, but the following stories may pique your interest as to why they feel this way. Satanic rituals and strange cult activity have long been associated with Black Star Canyon, with many visitors reporting hooded figures, unexplained fires, and chanting. Some have even reported witnessing the sacrifice of an animal. Hikers have discovered satanic imagery carved into various stones along trails, used black candles, animal skulls, and bloody objects. Many of these claims could be dismissed as legend or an overactive imagination according to most, but could there be more to these claims than mere speculation? Through some digging, I found a reference. As noted in the book, The Truth About Freemasons, the Illuminati, and the New World Order by SDS and CMW. An individual who used the alias Pendar claimed to be a member of the Illuminated Brotherhood, also known as the Illuminati to most. This individual claimed to be from the Alsace-Lorraine region of France and would attend major satanic ceremonies in Europe and parts of the United States regularly. One such ritual was said to have originally been hosted on a regular basis in the Trabuco Canyon in California. However, urban sprawl and development led the organizers to move the rites to Black Star Canyon instead. If this were true, it could possibly tie in or contribute to some of the legends that you're about to hear. Many strange things have been spotted within Black Star. One of those is a sighting of an ape-like creature within the canyon and throughout the surrounding area. Aside from dozens of reports by locals and tourists alike having claimed to have seen the creature, it has also been documented as being seen on four different occasions by four different rangers. This is a photo of one alleged encounter. Could the activity of one or several dark cults have brought forth something into our world that isn't supposed to be here? Or is it something that's lived here all along? Another strange creature that has been witnessed draws from an old Spanish folktale. The Spanish, of course, controlled the area prior to Mexico, and the folktale is that of La Llorona. There are many origin tales, but from my research, it seems that La Llorona, or the Weeping Woman, was a woman named Maria who married a wealthy man who she eventually bore two children to. As time went on, she began to see her husband less and less, and when he was home, he only ever paid attention to the children. Eventually, she would see her husband with another woman. Out of jealousy, and mania one night, she drowned her two children. Immediately regretting this horrid decision, she then drowned herself. She was denied entry through heaven's gates and now searches the world for her lost children, often being seen in a white bridal gown with a disfigured or animal-like face. She's typically seen floating in bodies of water and attacks children, as well as adults. There is a well that is rumored to exist within the canyon, where she lives, and she's been rumored to have manifested and come out of that well, only to drag whoever or whatever she preys upon deep into its depths. Blackstar Canyon also seems to be a hot spot for EVPs or electronic voice phenomena. Disembodied but audible voices 
have been heard and recorded by many individuals while visiting. The sounds of distant chanting, weeping, and even growling have been reported as well, all with no visible origin. Many people have also reported seeing things out of the corner of their eye, only when they turn, there's nothing there. This activity could tie into the limestone theory, or even the occult activity that's taken place there. Perhaps energy over the ages has been stored within the stone, or perhaps an otherworldly vortex exists within the canyon itself, whether it's always been there or was open due to evil practices is anyone's guess. This vortex that I've mentioned could be a spiritual one, but others have often speculated that it could be some kind of wormhole or interdimensional portal instead. Many people wanting to escape the urban lifestyle of Orange County have taken to places like Black Star Canyon due to its relatively quiet environment and unparalleled views of the sky a place where things aren't obstructed by city lights. Over the years, a plethora of UFO activity has been documented and reported over Black Star. And although there is occasionally planes overhead due to John Wayne Airport nearby, many have noted very strange craft with pulsing lights, unlike anything they've ever seen before within the night sky there. As previously mentioned, Many people have reported seeing things out of the corner of their eye, only for there to be nothing there, but people have also reported being stalked and even pursued by something aggressive and yet unseen. Could this perhaps be something that was dropped off by a UFO, a terrifying and abhorrent creature created in an alien lab somewhere, or is this a spirit or something else completely unknown? Those who have encountered such entities and have lived to tell the tale, I'm sure will not be going back anytime soon, and I can't blame them. Many creatures have been mentioned due to Black Star Canyon being a hot spot of many different types of supposed activity, but there is another type of creature or creatures that I'd like to mention as well, although these certainly seem less menacing. Originally spotted on January 23rd of 1995 by a group of friends hunting within the canyon, they were described as the Black Star Waddlers. These were small entities that were approximately two feet tall, dark in color, and had a notable waddle as they walked by. They typically would be seen in groups and were spotted several times by the first party prior to their hunt being over. The creatures would also be spotted by another group later that year, and again in 1998. And although not much is known about them, they don't appear to be hostile, but for those who witness them, it would certainly make for a very strange trip, and even a stranger story, indeed. While many of the trails and open spaces of Black Star Canyon are still regularly traveled during the day, Many refuse to traverse the space at night. There is said to be an uncomfortable and noticeable shift in energy from relative happiness and normalcy to that of malice and uncertainty. While the majority of known history, legends, and sightings have all been mentioned in this video, there are old details that we may possibly never know and others that will be kept from us about this place. There are also still stories and new experiences being written and told as those with an insatiable curiosity for the unexplained continue to hike Black Star Canyon. So if you find yourself in California and want to experience the weird, then Black Star Canyon might just be the place for you. But if I were you, I wouldn't recommend staying too long because you may never leave. After a flood destroys their home, a family is forced to relocate to a new home, which they believe is going to be a fresh start for them. However, it turns out to be a fresh new hell instead. From demonic attacks, nightmarish visuals, and terrifying manifestations, 
This is one haunting story you won't want to miss. This is the untold story of the Smurl haunting in Pennsylvania and the monstrous creature that stalked its walls. The timeline of events is rough at best, but I have done my best to make the most coherent retelling of the story, so please keep that in mind. Raging floods as a result of Hurricane Agnes have destroyed the homes of many families, and one such family was the Smurls. The Smurl family consisted of Janet and Jack Smurl and their four young children, Heather, Shannon, Karen, and Dawn. With their home destroyed in the Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania area, feeling as if they had been uprooted and tossed about like the rushing waters that took their house, the Smurls decide to temporarily relocate to West Pitson, where Jack's parents currently lived. After explaining the situation and staying with the couple for a short time, they were surprised and ultimately blessed when Jack's parents proposed an idea to them. They had found an old duplex, a bit of a fixer-upper, also in West Pitson. The two of them could live on one side, and Jack, Janet, and the kids on the other. That way, they could look out for one another and, of course, spend more time together. Not in a position to or wanting to say no, Jack and Janet humbly accepted their offer, but all too soon they would be confronted with the question, was this blessing truly a curse? With Jack's parents paying for them all to move into the new house, they soon find themselves rehomed and living in the newly purchased duplex. Located on Chase Street there in West Pitson, although the home would need some work, the neighborhood seemed friendly and inviting, a good place to raise a family. The family collectively puts their efforts into repainting, retooling, and other repairs, but in no time, the slightly run-down home was feeling fresh, vibrant, and modern, making the Smurls feel ever more at home and hopeful for the future. However, this would not last forever. For it seemed that each time they banged a hammer, each time they drove a nail into a wall, and with every drop of paint, they woke something up within the house itself, something that perhaps had been slumbering there for quite some time. During this time, small episodes of strangeness began to manifest. Seeming rather benign at first, tools began to disappear only to reappear hours later in different spots. Old stains that covered the walls began to seep through the fresh coats of paint, and several appliances in their kitchen had mysteriously caught fire even though they were unplugged. Along with these oddities, the family would also begin to smell awful odors that overwhelmed the entire house, like an omnipresent floating cloud of rotting meat that hung over them, only to disperse mere moments later after being detected. But despite these weird events, the family didn't really think much of it. They were just thankful to have a roof over their heads. Jack and Janet continued to rebuild their lives. Jack, fortunately, had since gotten a better job than the one he had had previously and was promoted during this time. He was also able to coach his daughter's softball team. The children had reacclimated to a new school and were getting good grades. And Janet had become pregnant with baby number five and also helped organize an anti-drunk driving group at the local high school. And Jack's parents were doing great as well. But all of this positivity, unfortunately, would not last. By 1974, things began to change for the Smurls. It began when Mary Smurl, Jack's mother, suffered a heart attack. This led to the entire family struggling to make ends meet. And whether it was a result of the renovations or something else, something paranormal had began to manifest and make itself known. It began when Janet began to hear the voice of her mother-in-law, who shortly after her heart attack was now at home and recovering. 
doing what she could to help her. She would hear her name being called out from Mary and would rush to her aid to help her with anything and everything that she could possibly need. But the strange thing was, Mary at times would either be unconscious, sleeping, or wouldn't have had called for her at all. Attributing this bizarre phenomena to stress at first, she writes it off. However, Mary soon starts experiencing her own strangeness. She too, as if the words had come from Janet's mouth herself, would hear her name being called. Only when confronted, Janet would have no idea what she was talking about. But that wasn't all, of course. The stains that had previously been painted over and were thought to be covered began to seep through yet again, and new stains began to appear as well, with several appearing on the hardwood floors of the home. As the days progressed, the oldest small child soon began to experience the presence as well. She would often be woken up in the dead of night, frozen with fear and unable to move. She would see translucent figures standing above her or at the edge of her bed, staring and watching her. And although it wasn't exclusive to the midnight hour, the activity seemed to pick up at night. Often, when Jack was at work or gone, Janet began to have violent and sickening encounters with a being that she couldn't see. She began to be molested by an unseen force. These interactions left her hysterical, feeling violated and unclean. Trying to come to terms with what was happening to them, the family's luck continued to worsen. Additional appliances, including a TV set, went up in flames, causing smoke and fire damage to the home on several occasions. And unlike the TV, the other appliances were not plugged in in order for the family to save money, which makes it all the more mysterious. On top of this, several water pipes which were fairly new after the family had initially renovated the home began to leak, not only causing water damage to the house, but adding to their financial woes as well. The string of bad luck would continue for the Smurls, and by 1977, the activity in the home became much more aggressive. The family's radio began to turn itself on and off, typically at strange hours, and almost always when the family was trying to sleep. The sinks in their bathrooms began to turn themselves on, pouring what little money they had left literally down the drain, and their toilets began to flush by themselves. Along with this activity, the sounds of footsteps began to be heard all throughout the house, and even on the insides of the walls. Drawers began to open and close by themselves. And coupled with these happenings was again the stench of rotting meat, what the family would begin to describe as the dead smell. Except instead of dissipating almost as soon as it was detected before, or in one particular area of the house, the smell would permeate all throughout the house and would linger for minutes, or sometimes even hours. Up until this point, besides seeing things being moved, dealing with the stains, pipes, and appliances, Jack hadn't been targeted, so to speak, by whatever paranormal force that was now fully awake within the Smurl residence. But one night, when he was trying to get some sleep after a long day's work, his side of the sheets were pulled from his body, and the sensation of dozens of hands touching and grabbing him ensured that not only was he not going to get the rest that night due to sheer terror, but that perhaps his wife had been telling the truth. Janet, shortly after moving into the house, had become pregnant, and this time had given birth to two baby girls, expanding the Smurl family to six children. Shortly after the twins were brought home, it seemed like whatever presence that had been woken up was making itself known. It became more aggressive, more vindictive, as if it was jealous or hated the living. One morning, while the majority of the children were at school and napping, and the rest of the adults were out, 
Janet was headed to the kitchen to pour herself a freshly brewed cup of coffee. As she turned around the corner, her blood ran cold. Standing in the middle of the kitchen, with a stain seeming to materialize directly underneath it, it was a translucent figure with hollow eyes. Frozen in place upon seeing it was if she blinked and whatever this creature was, was gone. Was this what was responsible for the multitude of paranormal happenings within their house? As time progressed, Janet again would continue to hear her name being called out when no one else was there, over and over and over again. Strangely, as it was before in the beginning, the voices would often sound like her mother-in-law, Mary, and even after double or triple checking sometimes to make sure she wasn't losing her mind, Mary would be nowhere to be found. Janet truly was alone. Other strange things that were heard during this time would be heard from the other side of the duplex. Couples do argue, and some fight. That just tends to happen to most, unfortunately. But these fights were something else. Jack's parents began to hear yelling and screaming, sometimes even items breaking, coming from the other side of the duplex where Jack and Janet lived. These fights became so violent that not only did they think their marriage was collapsing, but they began to become concerned for Janet and the children's safety. One night, Jack's father couldn't take it anymore. He walked from their front door to the other side, and with the fight still raging, he threw the door open, only to be greeted with silence. The entire family was asleep. Not knowing what to make of this discovery, he simply left, bewildered. But the supposed audio of the fights would continue. Shortly after the bizarre discovery, Mary would experience something that almost gave her another heart attack. One evening, while her husband was still at work and she was alone on their side of the duplex, she began to hear her name being whispered and it sounded like Janet, but it was right within earshot or several feet of where she had been. Weirded out as most of us would be, she began to make her way towards the voice that was calling out to her. And that's when she saw it, standing in her living room, with a stain seeping underneath its feet, was the same translucent being that Janet had claimed she had seen just a short while ago. And terrifyingly, its mouth was mimicking Janet's voice and calling out her name. Frozen in terror at first, with her heart racing, Mary ran to the door, exited, and immediately went into Jack and Janet's door, absolutely petrified with fear. The talks that followed this event in particular is what led to most of the individual experiences being laid out in the open for everyone to know. They would all come to the realization that whatever force that was in their house was not friendly. Shannon Smurl, who was only seven years old during this time, would be the next target. One day, as she casually walked through the kitchen and into the dining room, a large glass light fixture fell and crashed into her, cutting her and raising the alarm bells for the entire house. Again, it seemed like the paranormal being or force hated life and now was possibly trying to end it if the opportunity presented itself. Scared but strapped for cash, they were all seemingly stuck in what was supposed to be their fresh start, but instead at this point was becoming their fresh hell. Shannon would continue to experience strangeness of her own as well. In her diary and later, she would recount that oftentimes she would wake up and find herself floating above her bed, literally levitating several feet above her bed. Some nights, while floating, she would suddenly be thrown across the room and into a wall with so much force that she thought she would be crushed. The climax of these attacks on Shannon happened one night 
when she woke up to find herself floating once again, but instead of being let back down or smacked into a nearby wall, her door was flung open and she was thrown out of her room and down the stairs. Her parents heard this happen and rushed towards the screams of their little girl to find her absolutely hysterical and in pain. Fortunately, however, she would be okay physically after this event in particular. Another unfortunate soul that would be targeted in the Smurl duplex was the family's German shepherd, Simon. Simon would be found floating in the air, confused and concerned. And this new development and activity was not just exclusive to Shannon or their beloved dog. Alongside the intensified attacks on Janet, she too would begin finding herself woken up in the middle of the night, floating in the air, and sometimes, horrifically, without control of her body, she would then also be assaulted. However, Jack wasn't always gone at this time. Frequently at this point, he would be home and sleeping beside her, but could never seem to wake up as if he was being kept asleep or in a state of paralysis why the events took place. Coupled along these intense and abhorrent manifestations came activity that was plain creepy. Not a day would go by without the family hearing scratching noises coming from within the walls, or deep, drawn-out breaths coming from behind them, feeling the exhale upon their necks, making the hairs on their entire body stand on end. Jack at times after a hard day's work would like to unwind and decompress by watching some TV in the living room. And on occasion, he would fall asleep to whatever was on before eventually waking back up and making his way to bed. However, this night, he found himself awake and coherent but unable to move, as if he was paralyzed or stuck in some kind of a glue trap like an insect. Unable to break free, he glanced around the room trying to discover the source of his distress. It was here that he was met face to face with this being, this demon that seemed to be plaguing their lives. The creature grabbed him from the back and slammed him onto the floor, began repeatedly bashing his head into the hard wood below before disappearing. After this, Jack didn't watch TV to unwind anymore. As a matter of fact, no one could unwind. They were petrified at whatever was taking place in the house. Unable to afford to move between all the adults, and seemingly stuck between a rock and a hard place, scared and unable to figure out what to do, they began to seek help wherever they thought they could find it. It was now winter and the family, besides their daily duties, spent most of their time indoors. While watching TV one afternoon, they saw an interview with Ed and Lorraine Warren, world-renowned paranormal experts and demonologists. Not being particularly religious and unsure of where to turn, they decided to reach out to the couple and were surprised when they made contact. After speaking with them for some time, the Warrens agreed to come to their house to meet in person with the Smurls and to investigate. And within a week, that's exactly what they did. After an initial meeting with the family, hearing their testimonies in person, and after exploring the home, the Warrens decide it seems genuine and it's worth investigating. And they begin their usual process of bringing in their team for an extended period of time to document and mull over potential solutions for the family. After several months of the documenting team living with the family and experiencing strange activity themselves, such as furniture stacking on top of itself, along with several other previously mentioned happenings, such as the stains and attacks on individual members of the home, Lorraine finally comes to the conclusion, after having a vision within the house, that they were dealing with a total of four entities. One was that of an old woman who she believed was not a threat to the family, but was simply being held against her will within the home. 
One was a younger woman who was angry and resentful and could be violent. And the other was a man who took the life of his wife and his lover and had been hanged in the same spot a hundred years earlier by a vengeful crowd. The final entity was that of a demon. And this demon not only was strong in keeping the other three spirits under its heel of control, but would use them to strengthen itself and wreak havoc upon the family, to sow discord, anxiety, and fear, all things to which it could feed on and continue to grow stronger. After reaching this conclusion and having gathered sufficient information, the Warren spoke to Father McKenna, who was a Vatican-sanctioned exorcist and had worked with them over 50 times on separate cases in the past so he was no stranger to the demonic. But after his arrival and attempted exorcism, the activity only increased in aggression and hostility. And for whatever reason, it was not tied to the home anymore, but rather the family members themselves. Jack began to experience horrific visions of the creature at work, as did his father and alongside the continued paranormal activity taking place at their home, their daughter Karen fell seriously ill with a fever that the doctors couldn't diagnose at the time and almost died. Several of the other girls were also visited by the sickening presence at night, as Janet also was and continued to be. The demon also began to physically attack the family more often, causing stinging scratches and cuts on their bodies at random times, as well as deep and bruising bite marks. Still trying to help the family rid themselves of this creature and fearing for the family's continued torment, the Warrens convinced the Smurls to allow a second exorcism to take place, and McKenna again would visit and conduct a second exorcism months later in the early spring. During this exorcism ritual, EVPs were recorded, which when played back after the fact, would reveal multiple entities laughing at and berating them for their efforts. Ed Warren would also be choked during this visit and would be incapacitated for multiple days after. Unfortunately, the second exorcism also failed, leading to even more violent manifestations of evil. Trying to get away from it all for even just a few days, the family went on a camping trip to the Pocono Mountains, but the demon would follow them there as well, tormenting them wherever they went, allowing for no rest, no decompression, and no peace. Upon returning to their home following this trip and getting even more desperate, they decided to reach out to a local TV show called People Are Talking to see if anyone could possibly help them. They did, however, remain anonymous during their interview, and this call for help, however, went unanswered, but the demon seemed to retaliate against them for it. Janet would once again be hurled against a wall, and Jack would experience something truly terrifying and new. As he woke up in the early morning to get ready for work before the sun had come up, a light rain tapped the glass of the windows outside. As he dressed himself and began to gather his things for his workday departure, he came down the stairs and was greeted by a disgusting and horrid creature. Standing in front of the door was a monstrous being whose head almost touched the ceiling. It resembled a horrible amalgamation of a man and a pig standing upright on two legs. It screeched and rushed towards him, but as he fell backwards onto the stairs, hurting his back, the creature stood over him, face to face, snarling, before it disappeared. This manifestation disturbed and rattled Jack to his core. The same morning, shortly after Jack had left for work, because although terrified, he still had to provide for his family if they ever wanted to have a chance of escaping this hellscape of a home. Janet was woken up a short while later by a hand reaching up through her mattress and grabbing the back of her neck 
and pulling her towards it and choking her. After these events, horrific snarling noises like that of a pig could be heard coming from inside the walls. The time was now August of 1986, and the Smurls felt that the risk of ridicule did not outweigh the need for their story to reach a wider audience, so that somehow, somewhere, someone could possibly help them be freed from this torment. They would soon be granted an interview with the Wilkes Bar Sunday newspaper, but instead of someone reading and immediately coming to their aid, their home quickly became a tourist attraction instead. The press, skeptics, and curious onlookers alike began to visit the house and camp outside of it at all hours of the day and night, with some particularly weird people even coming up and staring into the home's windows themselves. Some of their neighbors who had seen and heard strange things coming from the small residence began to turn on them. They believed that the family was concocting some kind of a story to try and make money. Eventually, however, Despite the torment inside and outside of the home now that they were experiencing, the Smurls would be contacted by a medium by the name of Mary Alice Rinkman, who offered to meet with them. Upon meeting the family and walking through the home, it was also Mary's conviction that there were four entities within the house, three human spirits, and one who had never been human, thus corroborating the Warrens' beliefs about the situation as well. She would, however, take things a bit further. She identified the old woman by the name of Abigail, the murderous man as Patrick, and the violent and ill-tempered spirit as Patrick's wife. And the fourth entity, of course, could not be identified by name, but was indeed a very powerful demon. The press coverage, despite the ridicule and the positive acquaintance of Mary, also had pushed the Scranton Catholic Diocese into action as well. They offered to take over the investigation. In the meantime, the Warrens had not given up on the family, but rather had reached out to several more priests and had arranged for a mass exorcism to be conducted with four priests taking part, as well as multiple prayer groups. Alongside this, now Bishop McKenna came in for a third and final time and conducted an exorcism on the house for the family. And fortunately, the ritual, at least for a time, seemed to work, because following it, there were no disturbances for about three months. But as winter set in that year, just before Christmas of 1986, Jack would again see the creature that had tormented him for all of those years. This time, however, it beckoned him, to allow it to take over. But clutching a rosary in his pocket that had been gifted to him by the church, he prayed as hard as he could, and thankfully this time, the demon vanished, never to be seen again. However, the putrid smells and violent manifestations would return and continue day in and day out. Frustrated, hopeless, and exhausted, the Smurls by this point had finally saved enough to be able to leave this dreaded duplex on Chase Street and decided they needed the closest thing to a fresh start as they could get. So when they finally did move, they moved to a completely new town, one where the ridicule would not find them. But like the terrible pattern shown before, the demon did not seem to be tied to the property, but rather the family. The activity started back up almost as soon as they had moved in and laid their heads to rest in their new home. It would take some time, but in 1988, the church finally sanctioned a fourth exorcism, but this time at their new residence, and this finally seems to have given the family peace. A few things I would like to mention, however, are these. From my own personal experience and many other stories I've researched, it seems like renovations, particularly on older homes, can wake up dormant spirits or hauntings. Perhaps this is what happened to the Smurls. It's hard to tell if the assaults were one or multiple demonic entities, but if they did truly exist, how did they get in the home to begin with? And my guess 
is that the collection of negative energy attracts them, like moths to a flame. Perhaps they enjoy or feed off of human suffering. This would only make sense to me considering that they hate humans and refuse to bow to them in the beginning. Perhaps once they're embedded in one's life, they continue to sow said suffering, to exploit and grow stronger, ultimately trying to take the human's life and their soul back with them to hell. I would also like to mention that scratching on a person and inside the walls, as well as disembodied breathing, are all signs of demonic infestation and for one reason or another, having actually experienced this personally, seeing the manifestation of a pig-like demon, or a creature, as well as hearing pig snarling coming from within the walls, is considered to be a serious or incredibly strong sign of a very strong demonic infestation. As far as the initial activity, the seeping through of the stains, the sinks turning on, toilets flushing on their own, and leaky pipes. Those initially could be written off as poor skill when the work was initially done, but it seemed like with this story, all of these things were working perfectly fine for months before they all of a sudden, almost at the same time, began to go wrong while costing the family money that they didn't have. And money at the time seemed to be their main issue, as well as the paranormal. So perhaps the demon knew and exploited this to add to the misery it was feeding on. But truly, at the end of the day, the conclusion is yours to make. Was the Smurl haunting legitimate, or just another tale concocted for money, or inside the broken minds of individuals who claim to have experienced it? Let me know down in the comments below. They would eventually release a book about all they had experienced, called The Haunted, in 1988. But financials or how successful it was was never released, at least not from what I could find. But what I do know is this, it's extremely important to examine a situation from all angles just before diving into it. Although a place might seem like a fresh new start, it could indeed be your fresh new hell. And those renovations that you think are going to improve your quality of life could awaken something that has been watching and waiting for a new host to attach itself to and feed upon until it can wear it down rot, and eventually drag it back to the depths from where it came from. What once seemed like a miraculous place to its early settlers, slowly but surely collapsed under the weight of its own profits and debauchery. And it's now said that the land and all items within this abandoned town are now cursed. This is a strange tale that intertwines legend with history. This is the untold story of Bodie, California. The year was 1859, and mining had began to decline along the western slope of the Sierra Nevada. Prospectors in search of riches beyond their wildest dreams began to cross the eastern slope. One such man was named William S. Bodie. During his expedition, Bodie would find gold near a place now known as Bodie Bluff. He would make camp there and continue to take his chances in order to collect his riches. His supplies and food would grow scarce, but his stash of gold nuggets was growing ever larger. Powered by his insatiable love for a better life, Bodie continued on. However, as the year progressed and winter came over the area, he unfortunately would breathe his last breath. Bodie died in a snowstorm that very winter and would later be discovered by the future inhabitants of the town that would come to bear his name. His story in its own way would manifest within the settlement even down to its last days. As the search for gold continued, Bodhi's gold vein would be rediscovered, and slowly but surely, a mine was established, as well as a mill. The year was now 1861, and the town known as Bodhi was home to 20 miners. For the next 17 years to come, its population would grow steadily, 
but it would remain a rather insignificant mining camp. And that was until the mill was sold. Bunker Hill Mine, as it came to be known on the west slope of Bodie Bluff, would change hands several times within the 17 years, until it came into the possession of Standard Mining Company. It was originally sold because the owners of Bunker Hill Mine at the time believed that the well had run dry, so to speak, since their profits and gold discovery had been on a downward trajectory for many years. But after it was sold to Standard, it was as if a miracle had taken place. Just months after the sale, a significant vein of rich gold ore was discovered. Profits as a result rose dramatically. And by 1878, Bodie's population had soared to over 5,000 people. It's estimated that the mine would yield nearly $15 million worth of gold over the next 25 years. Profits that would be worth an estimated $400 million in today's money. Although all seemed to be going great in Bodie, there were many hardships yet in store for the fledgling town and its citizens. The winter of 1878 was particularly savage. It's estimated that over 200 people would lose their lives, either due to exposure, hypothermia, or disease. Others would be taken by fallen timber, and one of several explosions to take place within the mines, as the powder magazine mysteriously ignited. But despite the horror of the winter frost, Bodie continued to grow. People of almost every walk of life would end up there, from miners to gamblers, prostitutes, and businessmen. And by 1879, it had doubled in size to over 10,000 residents. It had added an additional 2,000 buildings, and before long it supported over 30 gold mines, 65 saloons, and untold amounts of brothels, gambling halls, and opium dens. Opposite the brothels, gambling, and opium smoking, the town also had several churches, banks, and schools. Three breweries within the town worked day and night brewing whiskey and 100 gallon barrels because Bodie seemed to have an insatiable thirst for alcohol. Like a perfect storm, Bodie would soon earn a reputation for violence, lawlessness, and debauchery of every kind. Killings at times were daily events. Robberies, stick-ups, and street fights all became frequent occurrences as well, as the town seemed to turn its back on God and worship its newfound idol, one of gold and profit. It seemed like the good times for those who indulged themselves would never end, but they would. Given Bodhi's reputation, it's perhaps not surprising that one little girl, whose family was moving to the mining town, reportedly prayed, Goodbye God, we are going to Bodhi. For all of its construction, Bodhi needed vast amounts of lumber, and the problem was that there were scarce trees in the area. Soon, several businessmen formed the Bodie and Benton Railroad Company in 1881 for the sole purpose of sustaining that appetite for much-needed lumber. However, for the citizens of Bodie, this was not a good decision. In order to maximize profits, the company hired an expensive Chinese labor, much to the outrage of the locally unemployed. So with a large influx of cheap foreign labor, it soon helped drive the competing labor costs into the ground, not just for the railroad, but for mining as well. This marked the beginning of the end of the town. The boom was over just one year later. In 1882, Bodie started to rapidly decline. Prior to 1882, there were no churches within the town, but there were two preachers one Methodist, and one Catholic, who held services in their private homes. And despite of the town's decline, two churches would be built in 1882, one for each of the two faiths. However, both would not end up surviving. 
After the merging of Bodie and the Standard Mining Companies in 1887, the town saw a brief revival in both wealth as well as population, but that too would be short-lived. A series of fires would soon extinguish Bodie for good. In 1892, a fire ravaged much of the business district, further depleting the population. And in 1898, a massive fire broke out and destroyed the once prosperous mill. And although it was a slow burn, metaphorically speaking, as far as the decline of the town, the final nail in the coffin was in 1932, when a two-year-old boy who had gotten a hold of his father's matches ended up lighting a fire that would destroy 95% of all buildings left within the town. In the years to come, Prohibition and the Great Depression would entomb Bodie, and although attempts were made to strike new gold, companies once record profits crashed. We are thus left with a tale of a city that flew too close to the sun and burned, showing that chasing profit and vanity, debauchery and lust yielded disastrous long-term consequences. After World War II, only six people lived in the old settlement, and five of these six would soon meet strange and untimely deaths. The first was a man who seemingly went mad. Out of the clear blue sky, he woke up one day, loaded his pistol, and shot his wife in broad daylight in the town center. Three men witnessed this take place and quickly took action, which would lead to the death of the man who had just killed his wife. And this is where things take a very weird turn indeed. According to each man, the ghost of the murdered man would visit them individually, tormenting them and forbidding their rest. Soon, all three would die of a mysterious and painful disease. Details on their condition are scarce, but thick and painful boils were said to envelop them, and within a matter of agonizing weeks, they would all perish. But the strange happenings didn't seem to stop with just those three men. After this, Bodie truly became a ghost town. By 1962, after years of neglect, it was designated a state historical park by the state of California, and legends about this place seemingly stuck in time. One such legend is known as the Bodie Curse. Supposedly, if visitors take anything from this town, even a pebble, they will forever be cursed with terrible misfortune. One such victim claimed to have been struck with horrible luck and tragedy until they returned an item that they had stolen from a previous visit. And this isn't entirely speculation or superstition, however. The park's own rangers claim it's a real phenomenon. Years ago, they began to keep a log of anyone who would offer to tell them that they were taking something from Bodhi and the logbook also contains pages upon pages of those same people returning those items and claiming the notorious curse. The curse is said to be perpetuated by the ghosts that live there, who guard their riches against thieves as they are still searching for new gold. And despite the park rangers vouching for the happenings, many believe it's nothing more than silly superstition, but I for one, wouldn't want to be the guy to test this out. There are many places I'd be willing to go to investigate, with Bodie being one of them. But why take the chance of destroying your life for something that wasn't yours to begin with? Another ghostly legend is that of the haunting of the J.S. Kane House at the corner of Green and Park Streets. James Stewart Kane, or J.S. Kane, had arrived in Bodie when he was just 25 years old. Soon after his arrival, he entered the lumber transporting business and soon became a mogul. He would go on to own the Bodie Bank, a leasing company, and became the primary property owner within the town. The home is said to be haunted by the restless spirit of a Chinese maid. The maid apparently loves children who visit, but hates adults. 
Adults sleeping in the old house have said to be awakened, frightened, and breathless, feeling the weight of another person sitting on their chest. Others have experienced doors opening and closing by themselves, and have even seen the apparition of the spirit herself, knitting in the chair in the main room. And this isn't the only place that's claimed to be haunted that still stands there. The Mendicini House is called home to several friendly ghosts. One who is thought to be Mrs. Mendicini herself. She loved cooking large Italian meals for her family. Guests and park rangers alike have reported smelling delicious aromas emanating from the house, although no one has cooked there for over a hundred years. Others have seen the spirit of a woman peering out of the top window of the Dockenbue house, almost as if the woman is still alive, but trapped in another time, still dressed as though it's the early 1900s. And yet another ghost is known as the Angel of Bodhi, and her home is the Bodhi Cemetery. There is an old angel statue that sits to guard her grave. The angel was a three-year-old little girl who was said to have been accidentally killed when she was hit in the head by a slipped miner's pickaxe. Visitors have heard giggling, feeling a small hand tugging on their pant legs, and others have seen a little girl run from tombstone to tombstone. But upon rushing to find her, there's never anyone there. Bodhi is now in a state of arrested decay. There are no permanent residents of the town except the park employees, and only about 10% of the original buildings still stand. In this ghost town, there are no maps, no restaurants, or recreations. Here you get the real ghost town experience. So if you find yourself in California and feel like taking a walk through time, Bodhi just might be the place for you. But just remember, don't take anything, or you just might become its newest resident ghost. Lying dormant within the streets of suburbia, there is an unseen evil. Like a mouse falling into a pit of snakes, an unsuspecting family disturbed a slumbering force and became enshrouded in a fog of darkness. This is the untold story of the Bel Air House and the terrifying malevolent entities that dwell within its walls. Bel Air, Ohio, an area rich in history, was once known as Glass City, having once been a major glass production hub in the late 1800s, is now known as the All-American Town, having been used in many Hollywood productions as a backdrop for lots of movies, some of which you've probably seen over the years. The town that epitomizes small America's daily life has long since moved past its industrial days and has become known for something else. On the outskirts of the town lies an old two-story Victorian home that has become famous over the recent years, both among locals as well as across the country with some saying it could be the most haunted place in the United States, if not the world. This is a bold statement to say the least, but the countless visitors to the house have reported strange, disturbing, and unexplainable encounters within its antique walls. But just how did the story begin? Where did the legend of the Belair House originate from? Let us first take a look at the home's dark history. Built in 1887 by a coal tycoon named Jacob Hetherington, the house sits adjacent from ancient Native American burial caves. It is also located where the scene of a massacre took place during the French and Indian War. It would sit on top of an active coal mine for years before. There was a major explosion that took place within the mine killing multiple men working deep within the earth, directly underneath the house. Could the culmination of these tragic deaths have opened up a portal within the Bel Air house? 
a portal that allowed something to come through that wasn't supposed to be here. Shortly after this explosion is when the strange activity began. Jacob's son Alex moved into the home with his daughter Lyd, but was soon stricken with seizures and hallucinations. He would ultimately be committed to an insane asylum for the rest of his life, claiming that demons were trying to kill him. As time progressed, Lyd would take charge of the family business, being helped by her younger brother, Edwin. Lyd would tragically and unexpectedly pass away one morning in the kitchen of the home. Edwin, now alone and grief-stricken, descended into mysticism and the occult in search of answers. He began to regularly host seances in the kitchen where his sister had passed away to attempt to make contact with her on the other side, and it is believed that contact was indeed made but with who or what is uncertain. In 2005, Kristen Lee and her family are desperate for a new home. Like a curse, for the second time in less than two years, a flash flood has destroyed their home and all of their possessions. Kristen, her two sons, Nicholas and Lane, along with their father, Hefe, have been fortunate enough to room with friends during this difficult time. Kristen has continued to try and get the family back on their feet and no longer wants to burden her friends with the boarding of her family. So she constantly checks the real estate listings, hoping to find a home that her and her family can finally settle down into. Given the circumstances, the family didn't have a big budget and would have to rebuild their lives from scratch. But soon, her determination seems to pay off. While at work, Kristen often browses real estate websites for new listings as well as foreclosures, and a new listing soon catches her eye. Recently foreclosed on, but now available for purchase, she lays eyes on the old Victorian home for the first time. Its four bedrooms and two bathrooms set up, along with plenty of room, would be perfect. For her family. The price seems almost too good to be true for her budget as well, and although the listing lacks more details, it's like her prayers had finally been answered. But by what? Not wanting to lose the property, Kristen arranges a showing of the home as soon as possible, and before too long finds herself on the front steps of the Belair house. She is immediately taken in by the beautiful craftsmanship of the woodwork. The wraparound porch facing the Ohio River soon has her imagining peaceful evenings, watching the water flow. Upon entering the home, she continues to be impressed. Old marble and cherry wood ordain the interior of the home, and it seems almost too perfect, like something straight out of her dreams. The family also has a dog named Bella, and the large fenced-in backyard is perfect for her to run in and the boys to play in. Dumbfounded by her luck, Kristen puts in an offer on the house that evening, and it's accepted the following morning. After two years of chaos and uncertainty, the Lee family can finally breathe again and start living a normal life. But just as all seems quiet and settled, the family begins to discover that the house is anything but normal. At first, upon hearing odd noises in the night, the family wrote off the sounds as nothing more than anxiety in an old house. Being slightly scared or anxious upon moving into a new place, particularly following a very uncertain time in one's life, is not out of the ordinary, but these sounds soon become too much to dismiss. They soon begin to hear footsteps at all hours of the day and night. Kristen would later describe the activity as so. I would hear footsteps above and sometimes below me, even when there was no one else home but me, and I always felt as if there were thousands of eyes staring at me, at all times, watching my every move. Along with the strange noises, items soon begin to go missing. 
from keys to towels to trinkets. One moment they would be there, and within seconds, they would vanish. And Kristen isn't the only one experiencing strange happenings within the Belair house. At the time, her 12-year-old son Nicholas begins to experience a malevolent force that seems to dwell within his bedroom. At first, he too begins to feel as if he's being watched at all times, and it seems to get exponentially worse at night. He begins to have night terrors, feeling someone or something covering his mouth and nose, forcing him to suffocate. One night, he wakes up in a cold sweat. It's storming outside. Flashes of lightning occasionally light up the room. What he sees disturbs him to his core. In the corner of his room, towards his closet, as a burst of light fills the room, he sees a blackened figure staring at him and shaking profusely. The young boy is utterly terrified. Rushing out of his room as fast as he possibly can, he wakes up his mother and refuses to sleep there any longer. The boy is so hysterical, the only solution was to send him to his grandmother's house, located 30 minutes away. What makes this case all the more compelling is that Kristen has a master's degree in psychology and works as a mental health physician. With this, her professional opinion of what Nicholas had experienced was initially contributed to stress and fatigue, both common factors that tend to make the human mind see and experience things that aren't really there. And these probably could explain many similar situations, and most would agree. However, Kristen's view would soon undergo a radical change after one terrifying experience of her own. After months of strange happenings within the home, it was now winter and the Lee family, still tied on finances, was sleeping in the basement near the fireplace to save money on the gas bill. Hefe was asleep in a recliner and Lane as well as Kristen were asleep on the wraparound couch located in the corner of the room. All seemed normal until Kristen was woken up by the feeling of the couch cushion being pressed down near her legs. She then found herself face to face with a terrifying figure of a man staring directly at her. She would later describe the encounter as so. I woke up being face to face with this gray figure of a man. He was translucent almost like a mist, but the mist had features, like a person. The face was completely emotionless and had dark sunken in eyes. Kristen asked, who are you? What are you doing here? What do you want? But to no response, just a blank, lifeless stare. Within seconds, the apparition disappears. But before she can ponder what had just taken place, the silence is once again shattered. But by this time, it was the family dog, Bella, who was barking and running around the room. Kristen, attempting to keep her family asleep through the ordeal, tries to quiet the dog down and notices that she can see her breath in the air. And although it's cold outside, it's not nearly that cold near the fireplace. She then sees the figure materialize once more and silently move from one side of the room and through the wall on the other side, vanishing completely. No longer wanting to face whatever this was alone, she woke up her husband and told him what had just taken place. His response, however, was that she was too tired and needed to go back to sleep. Could what Kristen had experienced been a stress or fatigue-induced hallucination? Perhaps, but someone with a professional background such as herself surely would know how to differentiate, wouldn't you think? Finally knowing she's not crazy and totally convinced that the home was haunted, Kristen begins to try and make plans to get her family out of the Bel Air house and to safety elsewhere. As soon as she can, she puts the home up for sale and moves the family to a nearby rental home. 
Although she's relieved to no longer physically be in the house, no one is buying it. To try and cover expenses, she has no other choice other than to make the house a rental property. But almost as soon as the first family moves in, they move out. And this kickstarts a revolving door of tenants. Seemingly stuck with the house, Kristen comes to the conclusion that no family will or should live there. So what should be done with the haunted property? Needing to make ends meet, she comes up with a unique idea. She turns the home into an afterlife research property. This would allow various groups to come in and conduct their own research on just what exactly was taking place within the Belair house. And the idea works. Soon, groups from all over the United States and Canada are traveling to temporarily live within the home to conduct research. And from here, we gain some more interesting stories, to say the least. One group, who calls themselves the Armchair Researchers, from upstate New York, consists of two women, one being a birthing nurse, and the other a nurse who works with dying patients. They've found paranormal and afterlife research to be a natural extension of their day jobs for the last 15 years. After hearing about the Bel Air house, they soon find themselves driving to Ohio to investigate the phenomena for themselves. First impressions tend to go a long way, and the first impression the women got upon their arrival was very creepy. The home by this point was in a moderate state of decay. The fence that had once surrounded the backyard was mostly blown down, and the exterior of the home, as well as the porch, was weathered and rotting. But despite the odd feelings initially, they make their way inside, and at first, they actually felt welcomed, almost invited in, greeted by the same cherry wood interior that has greeted everyone. But as soon as they set up their equipment and prepare for their stay, as day turns to night, there seems to be a shift in energy within the home. The shift went from warm and inviting to dark and ominous. Then began the noises, banging, footsteps, and the moving of furniture. The ladies also noted the feeling of being watched everywhere they went. While asking probing questions as they wandered throughout the house, they would soon also witness strange lights in various parts of the home. And along with the lights, there soon also came full-blown apparitions, all of which seemed to be centered around the basement. And as the night progressed, so did their feelings of anxiety. While taking a short break and sitting down on one of the couches in the basement, the two heard what they described as a large crashing noise above them, as if someone or something had thrown a bookshelf across the house itself, shaking the entire home. Absolutely terrified and panicked, the women apprehensively made their way up the stairs and rushed out of the home as fast as they possibly could, leaving behind equipment and personal items. They were too frightened to go back. Upon learning of what had taken place, Kristen wasn't at all surprised. Over the years, there had been dozens of teams of people who couldn't seem to last the night for one experience or another. People have been scratched, pushed downstairs, punched, bitten, and even in one instance, thrown across the room by a violent and unseen force. Another noteworthy story comes from a team located locally there in Ohio. They have had the opportunity to visit the home and conduct investigations numerous times over the years. But their experience in particular one night truly makes me question just what exactly haunts the Bel Air house. There was three of them this time, and it was shortly after midnight when they made their way into the attic to continue their investigation. During their questioning, they seemed to be getting direct interaction with something through their spirit box. Then, towards the corner of the attic, a mist seemed to materialize, coming up from the attic floor, slowly enveloping the group. Glancing down, 
they were now too stunned to speak. They saw what appeared to be thousands of black snake-like creatures slithering over their feet and onto their legs. The creatures then began to form a figure standing in front of one of the attic windows, a creature of pure darkness that seemed to stare at them with thousands of tiny, beady eyes. The crew, which consisted of two men and a woman, ran for their lives, descending the attic stairs as quickly as possible, leaving behind anything and everything that they had brought with them that wasn't located on their person and out of the home for good. All of these stories and experiences have led many to believe that the Bel Air house is some kind of magnet for paranormal activity, a magnet or a host to a portal for spirits. Whether that portal was opened by the tragedy that took place within the mind that once existed below its foundation, or one that was opened due to seances being conducted within the house on multiple occasions. But over the years, many different entities have been documented from what appear to be human ghosts to perhaps something more sinister. One such entity goes by the name of Emily Davis. It is believed that Emily Davis was a child that drowned in the Ohio River that flows right by the home. Her room is allegedly the same room that Kristen's son Nicholas once stayed in. And besides the basement, it also seems to be a hot spot for paranormal activity. Through various investigations, once contact has been made and trust seems to be gained, people are often attacked, which have led many to believe that Emily isn't a child at all, but a demon. Perhaps it could be the same demonic creature that frightened Nicholas so bad that he moved out of the home, as previously mentioned. Many investigators also have claimed to have some activity follow them home and even haunt their dreams, as if the house or the beings within the house are calling out to them to come back for one reason or another. Although many questions may never be answered surrounding the Bel Air house, one thing is for certain. It continues to be considered one of the most haunted places in America if not the world. It also continues to serve as a place of study for those wanting to investigate the supernatural forces that dwell within its walls. But if you find yourself being drawn to the old Victorian, just know that if you're not careful, you too could find yourself being made a part of its history, whether you like it or not. Demonic Possession A phenomenon that's mostly written off in the modern day by the average person. But what happens when respected professionals see and experience things that convince them otherwise? Could we consider the possibility that demonic possession could indeed be real? I want you to keep that question in mind throughout this video and let me know what you think down in the comments below. Today, we will be discussing one such man whose experiences altered his skeptical view, and it all began 25 years ago when he met a woman named Julia. Dr. Richard Gallagher, a Princeton and Yale educated psychiatrist who runs his own practice and teaches at Columbia and New York universities, started out skeptical. 25 years ago, due to his profession and skepticism, he began to be asked to provide medical oversight as a doctor of psychology to cases from different churches of different faiths, cases which the churches believed the individuals to be potentially genuinely possessed. Several cases in particular altered his views forever. A member of the local Catholic clergy approached Dr. Gallagher and asked him if he would provide his medical opinion on a case he was working on. Word had gotten out that Dr. Gallagher was both a great doctor as well as a skeptic, to which the priest commented, We understand that you're skeptical, and this is part of the reason as to why we want to use you. 
Gallagher accepted and made an arrangement to meet the woman and to begin her examination. The woman was claiming to be assaulted by forces she couldn't see, invisible monsters, if you will. This woman was known for being kind and rational, a devoutly religious Hispanic woman who had no history of mental illness. She described the episodes where she said she experienced an evil force that would overtake her and would subsequently beat her. The beatings, however, were not in her mind. Bruises would materialize on the woman's body, seemingly out of nowhere. And during the examination, Dr. Gallagher saw this happen for himself, and after several days, he came to the conclusion that not only was the woman completely sane, not even showing the slightest indication of mental illness, but that he believed what she was experiencing was genuine. From this strange case, the doctor continued to assist with providing psychiatric expertise and came to the conclusion that the vast majority of the cases turn out not to be true demonic possession, and only about 1 in 100 cases could even be considered anything of the sort. The doctor's examinations were very thorough. He not only physically and psychologically examined the persons, but would also interview any and all family and friends who were aware of the situation as to understand the story as a whole. And out of those 1 out of 100 cases that didn't fit into any known psychological pattern, supernatural characteristics would manifest. The persons who he believed were genuinely possessed would often display frightening behavior, such as the person speaking in languages that they couldn't have possibly known, exhibiting extreme strength with no known physical cause, claiming to move objects around the room without touching them, and displaying unknown knowledge about people, places, and things that no human being could possibly know. And we'll get into that more later in this video. The Catholic Church also has a strict deterministic criteria for possession as well. The case has to be confirmed via moral certainty, and under moral certainty, a person has to enter a trance-like state, and a demonic sounding voice must manifest. The person then attacks religion, and attacks the people conducting the exorcism, as well as displaying demonic manifestations of power, such as those that Dr. Gallagher mentioned. In these severe and extremely rare cases, Dr. Gallagher would give his go-ahead for the exorcisms to proceed. The second case that would change his outlook forever was that of a woman named Julia. He was approached by two of America's leading Catholic exorcists to consult on a case that they believed to be one of the most severe demonic possessions they had ever witnessed. Julia was a 39-year-old woman who was a self-professed high priestess of a satanic cult. The night before Dr. Gallagher was supposed to go and meet Julia for the first time to begin examining her, he was in his study with his wife at about 3 a.m. Accompanying the couple was their two cats, and quoting the doctor here, seemingly out of nowhere, the cats began to go completely berserk, berserk in a way which we had never seen before. We were mystified. The next morning upon his arrival, the priest introduced him to Julia for the first time, and the first words out of her mouth were, Hey Doc, how did you like those cats last night? Bewildered, the doctor continued his examination. As the day continued, she began to reveal other secrets that no human could possibly know such as how some of the doctor's patients had died, as well as their names, and dates and times of death. Another bizarre example of this secret knowledge, to quote him again, she told me when and how my mother had died, and that she had died from ovarian cancer, which was true. The following night, Dr. Gallagher was on the phone with one of the priests who was in charge of the exorcism, discussing the case. Julia was not on the line whatsoever, and as a matter of fact, they knew where she was. She was over a thousand miles away, and during their discussion, the same exact voice that had come out of Julia interrupted their phone call. 
the voice stated that she was theirs, and to cease their efforts at once. Both disturbed and amazed, Dr. Gallagher said to the priest, Did you hear that? And the priest replied, Oh yes, the evil spirit can even interrupt our phone conversation. What makes this all a little bit more weird is that this conversation was also taking place on a landline, and landlines aren't particularly known for picking up any interference, like a cell phone would. The doctor conducted further examinations as to not leave any medical possibility out of the equation. And during these examinations, Julia was witness speaking multiple languages she couldn't have possibly known, such as fluent Latin and Spanish. She was also witnessed levitating up and out of a chair she was placed in, and had to be brought back down and secured to the chair as to not hit the ceiling above. Running through all possibilities and witnessing the unexplained, the doctor drew only one sensible conclusion, that Julia was most definitely possessed. It's unfortunate that the fate of Julia and her exorcism are uncertain, or at least I couldn't find any more information about the case, although I'm definitely interested in what happened. After being a consultant for over 20 years, Dr. Richard Gallagher also had some interesting things to say in regards to the possessed themselves. He said that one does not simply wake up possessed. These people have turned to evil in a very explicit way. In the case of Julia, for example, she had blatantly turned to Satanism and had invited darkness into her life. The same can be said for all the rest. They had somehow, some way, invited evil into their lives. He also had something to say about skeptics as well. He said that people who are critical of possession often require a ridiculous amount of proof. They have to understand that these things cannot be reproduced in a lab environment, and most of them have never seen a genuine case, let alone spoken to an exorcist. And I don't think that's very scientific of them. They say that one man's trash is another man's treasure. While many people accidentally purchase a haunted home without knowing it was haunted, this story partially is about a man who did the opposite. But the home in which he purchased was way more than he bargained for, not for him, but for a family whose experiences made it infamous. With a one-of-a-kind strange past and a present-day nasty and demonic reputation, known as Pennsylvania's Amityville Horror, this is the untold story of the Wells House and why it's considered one of the most haunted places in the state, let alone the country. To properly tell this story, we must first start at the beginning. The notorious home on Wells Street was built by industrialist Augustus C. Laning, but despite his future success, Laning had not led such an easy life. After arriving in the Wilkes-Barre area to work for his grandfather at age 14, he would soon experience tragedy. His younger nephew shortly after his arrival would pass away when the barn he was playing in was struck by lightning and caught fire, trapping him inside. Shortly after this happening, one of his grandfather's factories would also mysteriously catch fire and burn to the ground as well. Despite a series of unfortunate events, the Laning's enterprises would eventually thrive, allowing Augustus to inherit land from his mother on what is today Wells Street. Eventually, he would build a home at 46 South Wells Street in 1861 and live there until 1865, when he eventually sold his home and business. He would take his last breath in 1875. The land in which Laning built the home on, as many locals would say, was soaked in turmoil and blood, having been the site of numerous wars and conflicts between Native American tribes, as well as European settlers and Native tribes. From the late 19th century to the mid 20th century, the house went through a series of sheriff sales which were a type of public auction. 
and would eventually sell for just one dollar at auction in May of 1939, a little over twenty dollars in today's money. Although tragedy befell the Laning family, especially early on in Augustus's life, any happenings within the home weren't documented if they did occur. As far as we know, no death had taken place up until this time, but it certainly starts to snowball as the years progress. In 1940, the person who had purchased the home so cheaply at auction would breathe their last breath by their own hand, as would the next person who purchased the home via auction in 1950, almost exactly 10 years apart to the day. After these mysterious deaths, there would be four more that would take place on the premises. The other three I was unable to dig up additional details on. However, the most notable was the fourth, a priest who was 54 years old and in relatively good health, had been walking past the home in passing. When he glanced at the home, we don't know exactly what he saw or experienced, but he fell to the ground and died almost instantly from a heart attack right in the front yard. The home would be a revolving door for quite some time, sometimes vacant, sometimes with occupants, but only for a short time. In March of 1975, a 27-year-old radio DJ by the name of Walker Bennett and his wife Mary Ann purchased the home and then moved into the house from New Haven with their two daughters. Almost as soon as they moved into the house, bizarre activity began to manifest. The family began to hear banging and scratching sounds coming from inside the walls. Thinking at first they had some kind of a rodent problem, Walker followed the noise and traced it back to a particular bedroom wall. He then knocked the wall down, but instead of being greeted by this supposed rodent problem, he instead saw a small, glimmering tin box instead. After removing the box, he felt a strange presence. Upon opening it, its contents were very weird to say the least. It contained a red ribbon, a cross made of tied together chicken bones, and a human molar. The first thing that struck him was that this looked like some kind of a hex or curse, but not wanting to alarm his family, he would dispose of the items, but the activity nonetheless would continue to persist. By 1976, the scratching and knocking had continued, but soon the family began to see otherworldly beings as well. On one particularly cold February morning, Bennett would hear a series of bangs and scratches on his front door. Upon slowly opening it to see just who was there, he would be shocked. Standing at the front door was the translucent figure of a man with a cane with a vicious and crooked smile. Freaked out with his heart racing, he quickly slammed the door and tried to make sense of the interaction. Within seconds, he reopened the door, only to find that there was nothing there. As the days ticked by, the activity intensified. The scratches and banging noises now seemed to be originating from the attic. They now were also joined by disembodied screams, some seeming to be male, others female, and some were a mix of both. In the months to come, the activity would be coupled with moaning and groaning sounds, whispering voices, and the sounds of weeping coming from inside the walls, all still tracing back to the attic. Coupled with these new developments were the sounds of heavy footsteps on the wooden floors. The entire family would also see several apparitions. Notably, they would experience the ghostly figure of a young woman in a nightdress drifting throughout the house. Her dress seemed to be old, like those of the Victorian era. Whenever she was seen, following her would be drips or spots of blood either on the floor or on the walls. Once she began to be seen, there was a putrid, rotting type of stench that became present in the house, traveling from room to room. 
It was, however, usually the worst in the kitchen and living room. Not wanting to further frighten the girls, the Bennets met with each other to discuss all of the bizarre happenings, and they finally had to admit that they had purchased a haunted house. Haunted by what exactly? They couldn't be sure. Shortly after this revelation, the family began to suffer from an unexplainable physical illness, one that left them drained at all times, exhausted and aching. The doctors couldn't diagnose it, leaving the family only to continue to suffer with the symptoms. Alongside this, whether it was a result of the illness on an individual basis or the haunting itself, the whole family seemed to be thrown into a deep, dark well of depression, submerged in its black waters, leaving them feeling hopeless. Things would begin to escalate further when in January of 1977, Walker and his wife would witness one of their daughters be pushed down the stairs, but to their amazement, she didn't fall and crumple on the various steps. Instead, she floated, almost in slow motion, until she landed on her feet at the bottom of them, unharmed. Not knowing what to make of this, the adults in the house weren't getting much sleep, and their condition continued to get worse. They would soon reach out to the church for help and guidance. Soon a Catholic priest would come out and bless the home, trying to quell whatever supernatural forces that were wreaking havoc upon the Bennets. But these efforts were to no avail. If anything, after he left, the activity seemed to get worse. Ultimately, in March of 1978, the family who had been sound asleep in the night was woken up by the sound of thunder crashing, except there wasn't a storm outside. What followed this massive sound was a deluge of paranormal manifestations. Footsteps were pounding across the floor and in the attic above them. The attic door was being pounded on from the other side. Their dishes in their kitchen were being removed from their cabinets as they opened and slammed by themselves and thrown onto the floor, shattering them. Amongst the chaos was the scratching and banging on the front door, coupled with the sounds of a child weeping, coming from inside of the walls. Following them, as they ran throughout the house, after enduring almost three years inside the home, the Bennets finally fled this night, leaving with just the clothes on their backs they left all of their belongings behind. After the family found temporary arrangements, they immediately tried to sell the home as it was, but had no luck finding a buyer. After several months, Walker Bennett reached out to a local newspaper in hopes of sharing the family's story anonymously to find help or a buyer to get them out of this haunted hell. In the interview under the pseudonym of Bucky Johnson, he claimed that he was now $40,000 in debt as a result of the family fleeing and being unable to live in the house and then being unable to sell the house and that he had developed a drinking problem and now chain smoked as a result of the trauma and stress that he had endured. He also stated that he and the rest of the family were in therapy in hopes of eventually putting the past behind them. Several neighbors near the home were also interviewed, with some saying that they had never seen or heard anything, and others saying that they always had an odd feeling whenever passing by the house. The article was then published on Halloween of 1979. Perfect timing for a local and terrifying story, no doubt. Following the initial publicity, word eventually made its way to Ed and Lorraine Warren, famed paranormal investigators and demonologists who had just covered another haunting known as the Amityville Horror just three years before. The couple made a visit to the Wells Street house in March of 1980, but by this time the bank had repossessed the home from the Bennets due to their inability to make further mortgage payments on the home. So the Warrens were unable to enter the house due to it being entirely locked up for this reason. 
Lorraine, however, would say that she sensed a terrible despair emanating from the house, and that the effect it must have had on those who lived there must have been very negative. Several years later, the house would be purchased by a woman named Catherine Watkins from the bank for $20,000 in August of 1982. Her purchase subsequently prompted another newspaper article to be written. When asked, she told reporters that she was unafraid of the rumors surrounding the house and didn't fear any ghosts that could be there. She moved in with her two children shortly after her purchase. And whether it was sheer determination, stubborn nature, or something else, she lived in the house for the next 30 years until her death on October 26th of 2012. Although shortly after moving in and over the decades to come, she and her family also experienced unexplained phenomena, such as objects moving by themselves, their beds shaking, lights and appliances turning on and off by themselves, and seeing those ghosts that Catherine insisted she wasn't afraid of, such as the woman in what looked like Victorian-style clothing. Her daughter would inherit the home after Catherine's passing and would place the home up for sale, where it was then purchased by a ghost hunter by the name of Tim Woods in December of 2013. Rather than repair, sell, or live in the property he had just purchased, Woods only wanted to investigate the paranormal activity that was taking place there. With his team of fellow investigators, they would record hours of content in the home and capture what they believed to be numerous supernatural manifestations. People who have joined him in the investigations have been known to have scratches manifest on their skin and have their clothing tugged on by unseen hands. Tim would later state that the Wells house is one of the scariest haunted locations that he had ever investigated due to the numerous ghost sightings that were caught on tape and demonic attacks that occurred while he was there. He said, It is our conclusion based upon our documented research that the house is haunted by a demonic presence that cannot be removed, nor is it safe for anyone to live in. The strangeness of the house on Wells Street doesn't end here. In the early hours of Wednesday, July 25th of 2018, police were called to the home to catch an intruder. Someone was outside of the house trying to get in. When authorities arrived, they apprehended a man in his 30s was caught in the act of prying the wooden boards off the back door of the property. He had a 24-inch sword tied to his back, had brass knuckles and a pocket knife in his pockets, and was carrying a Bible. The man seemed out of it to say the least, but claimed that he was trying to hunt for ghosts. Upon going through his rucksack, police also found a loaded shotgun with 10 shells alongside of it. He would be arrested and charged with numerous offenses as a result of the episode. Although we don't know who, it seems that the home was sold in 2020 to new owners and at half the price that Woods had paid for it. There also doesn't appear to be any sort of a mention of it being haunted. Its listing reads like this. A home full of historical intrigue. With some TLC, you can bring new life to this four-bedroom beauty. As soon as you step over the threshold, you'll realize there is truly something out of this world with this home and its craftsmanship. A very fitting spin, if you ask me. I hope the new occupants are living peacefully, although given the home's infamous story and past, seems highly unlikely. But the listing was right about one thing, though. The home certainly has lots of historical intrigue and you can bring new life into this four-bedroom beauty. Because as soon as you step over the threshold, you'll realize there's truly something out of this world with this home, or should we say, in this home, that's been watching and waiting for some new life to engorge itself on. There was once a place where the dead whispered. 
where buried secrets lie dormant for generations, only to unleash a horrific evil once they were unearthed. This is the story about a family who endured a living nightmare in what was supposed to be their dream home. This is the untold story of the Summerwind Mansion and the hell that dwelled within its walls. The home that would become known as Summerwind was originally built in northern Wisconsin in 1916 by then U.S. Secretary of Commerce, Robert Lamont. Originally called the Lamont Mansion after it was finished, it sat upon 80 acres of property. Alongside the large home, which contained three large chimneys, guest quarters, and a large basement, sat another smaller building, which is where the servants lived. And from the beginning, things just didn't seem quite right. The mansion was fairly isolated, especially given the time period, the road conditions were poor at best, and the area in which it was in receives heavy snowfall throughout various times of the year, which led to most of the winters being waited out among the estate. During the first long winter at the property, the servants were soon being tormented by what they described as a translucent woman, first seeing her staring at them from the main window of their quarters, from the courtyard, to her then beginning to materialize within the home itself. Mr. Lamont initially dismissed these claims as nothing more than paranoia, thinking his servants were either delusional or getting stir-crazy given the weather, and this was until one cold evening when he was made a true believer. While he and his wife were enjoying their dinner together on the first floor, they were interrupted by the basement door shaking violently. Terrified, knowing that there was no one who could be down there, Mr. Lamont, pistol in hand, went to investigate. The shaking door abruptly stopped as Lamont came within several feet of it. Fighting through nerves and anxiety, Mr. Lamont threw the door open, expecting there to be someone there. Instead, he was met with a bone-chilling silence. He was even more unnerved after sweeping the basement and further confirming that there was indeed no one there. Afterwards, he began to make his way back towards the door to head back upstairs, when suddenly, the ghostly form of a man appeared and stepped right in front of the exit. Scared out of his mind, Lamont then fired two shots from his pistol, and the apparition then disappeared. When others were sent to investigate to confirm that there indeed was no one there, all they found were fresh bullet holes, and after this incident, the Lamont family abandoned the property, never to return. It then sat vacant and rotting for decades. The mansion was still owned by the Lamont family until Mr. Lamont's death in 1948, when it was then sold. It exchanged hands several times until it came into the possession of Mr. and Mrs. Kiefer. The Kiefer family believed that they had found their forever home and were more than excited to move in. But this honeymoon feeling was all too short-lived. The Kiefer soon began to experience strange things within the house. Unexplained sounds like banging that traveled all throughout the home at random times of the day and night. Glimpses of shadows out of the corner of their eyes, and the feeling as if they were being watched at all times. These experiences soon led the family to their breaking point, and they too would abandon the mansion, leaving behind all of their belongings, food, clothes, and furniture. Mrs. Kiefer would later state that she believed if she took anything with her from that house, that something horrible would happen to them. And although it was still owned by the Kiefer family, the estate yet again sat rotting away for years to come. And not only that, but word of just why it had been abandoned had reached the local community as well, leading to it being called the Old Haunted House. The Kiefer family, despite their unfortunate experiences, would end up being the lucky ones. In 1969, 
Ginger Henshaw was visiting a friend and was told that she had to visit the old haunted house with her. Intrigued, she agreed and soon found herself approaching in a car, catching her first fleeting glimpses of summer wind through fingerprint speckled window glass. She would later say that upon seeing the home, she felt sorry for it. She felt that it was calling out to her soul, crying out to her soul, for her to save it. She almost immediately became obsessed with the idea of living there. Her husband, Arnold, owned a construction company, and shortly after her initial trip with her friend, would also take a trip there with his wife, to see just what all her excitement was about. Knowing what it would take, Arnold immediately saw the potential and agreed that it may just be the perfect investment for the family. Since they were used to moving due to the nature of Arnold's business, the couples also figured they could use the space for their six children, as well as themselves. They then were able to reach out to the Kiefers and make them an offer that they couldn't refuse for this massive fixer-upper. First impressions certainly go a long way for most people, and not everyone will get the same impression either. Contrary to her parents' impressions of Summerwind, nine-year-old April got a much different feeling altogether, one of unease and fear. She described Summerwind as a huge, dingy, and decrepit place, and that she was immediately overcame with a feeling of dread, like she didn't belong there. Children can often be scared by new experiences, but given what was about to unfold, I don't think that was the case for young April. Within weeks, the family moves in. Ginger immediately becomes obsessed with restoring the old home. So much so, it was like she was being compelled by an unseen force. Some of this work included trying 11 different paint colors to match the woodwork. It was as if she had been given an assignment to restore this relic back to its original glory. And as Ginger fixated on renovating, her husband Arnold began to lose interest in the house and grew ever more distant from his family. They began to wander aimlessly in a state of confusion, starting things and stopping them just as quickly. He seemed to hyper-focus on the old organ that had come with the home and began to play it at all hours of the night. Along with this, he began to be tormented by something that he couldn't see, and he believed that if he stopped playing, something horrible would happen to him. Meanwhile, Ginger continued her work. As the days continued to tick by, slowly but surely, the family began to experience very strange activity within the home. This began with small items often being misplaced when there was no one around to move them but this soon escalated to chairs being moved. One moment they'd be up against the dining table, and the next moment, up against the wall. And no matter what room you were in or what you were doing, you always felt as if you were being watched. Along with this omnipresent watcher, the family began to be awakened by disembodied crying at odd times during the night. The crying was described as something trying to mimic the crying of a baby but it just wasn't quite human, and there were no children that age residing within the home at the time. Footsteps also followed them wherever they went, and didn't stop when they reached them. They would often cascade onto the walls. They would also hear the walking above their heads, as if someone or something simply defied gravity and walked around and above them. Now several weeks into what was supposed to be their forever home, the Henshaw family was now experiencing activity not of this world. Arnold had also grown more distant, more reclusive, and was no longer acting like the sweet man that he had once been. His personality had completely shifted, and he was no longer himself. He had gone from a loving father to an insanely angry shell of his former self. His daughter April would later describe him like this. Any little thing would seem to set him off, and you would have to bear the brunt of his rage. These possession episodes only grew in intensity, and he became more and more evil. An example of this is that one day the family's pet raccoon escaped, sending Arnold into a frenzy. 
he attempted to force the children into the nearby woods to look for it. Amidst the altercation, thankfully their mother intervened and kept him from sending them there. As a punishment to the children, Arnold found and then killed the raccoon in front of them. Despite the radical changes that were taking place within her family and daily life, Ginger attempted to regain a sense of normalcy. Attempting to put the strange activity out of her mind, she hosted a dinner party with some friends who hadn't seen her or the family since they had moved into Summerwind. Things seemed to be going well, and that was until she made a quick trip to the kitchen to get some snacks for her guests who were sitting in the parlor. As she loaded a plate with food, the muted warmth of company was shattered by a scream. Ginger rushed to the room to find her guests screaming in terror as they witnessed the ghostly form of a man with a misshapen face appear directly in front of them. Within seconds, they rushed out of Summerwind and would never speak to Ginger ever again. Although what she had suspected all along, Ginger's worst fears were now confirmed. She was dealing with something not of this realm. And even though she knows she's not insane, it's of little consolation. Arnold has continued to spiral deeper into madness. His playing on the old organ has now become more frequent than ever and has grown more dissident and demonic in tonality. Within two months, Arnold has gone completely berserk and has lost all grip of reality. He's lost his construction business because he simply stopped working and all of the family's assets are depleted, having purchased and renovated the home. And now, he's on the verge of losing his family. His daughters, now ages 8 and 10, believe that the house is what is destroying their family. They have both contemplated suicide, a horrific absolute for anyone, but it's particularly disturbing because of their young ages. Ginger now often seeks refuge in the nearby woods, choosing to sleep on the forest floor rather than in her own home, because she's grown so terrified of what inhabits the property. But this time, winter is quickly approaching. Due to the lack of income, the gas and electricity to the home have now been shut off, and the family's daily life has devolved into basic survival needs. A broken water pump now forces them to also have to haul water from the nearby lake. Along with continuing to deal with Arnold's insanity and the paranormal activity, they are struggling just to stay warm. They've now moved all of their mattresses into the living room around the fireplace and have resorted to burning the furniture, no matter how expensive, just to live. While stripping part of the woodwork in her room to use as firewood, April was met with a horrific discovery. Upon pulling a board back, she was greeted face to face with a human skeleton. Its gnarled teeth and empty eye sockets staring back at her, with small strands of hair still attached to the scalp. Isolated and traumatized, the Henshaws continue to barely exist. As the icy winds howl outside of the mansion, and although it's taken nearly everything going wrong, Ginger finally reaches her breaking point. Pride has kept her from calling her father, but Pride is slowly giving way to her fear. Fear for herself and her children's lives. So she finally does the right thing. Walking through the frozen woods, she makes her way to the closest neighbor's house and makes the call. And like a knight in shining armor, the following morning, Ginger and the girls are rescued. Arnold stays behind, but would leave Summerwind the following day to be committed to a mental hospital. Whatever hope him and Ginger once had for their relationship has long since been shattered. He was never seen or heard from by the family again. The home would be foreclosed on and resold to a new owner. But just when they thought the war was over, a new chapter was just beginning. In later interviews, Ginger would state that she wasn't into haunted houses or the spiritual world. 
but after what she experienced at Summerwind, she felt that she had to discover and learn about it to make sense of what had happened to her. Upon being rescued by her father, Ray, Ginger told him everything, every last detail of what had taken place. However, her father didn't believe her. He didn't doubt that there had been dysfunction and breakdown within her marriage, but he did doubt that the paranormal had anything to do with it. The year is now 1972, and Ginger and the girls are now living with Ginger's father in Ontario, Canada. Ginger has become an avid student of the paranormal, reading every last book that she can get her hands on to try and decipher just what happened at Summerwind. Since her time there, she's vowed to never return under any circumstances. But to the contrary, her father cannot seem to get the place out of his mind. And without her knowledge, he arranges a meeting and a showing of the mansion with the new owner, a woman named Mrs. Murray. Since purchasing the home, she's been unable to sell it and refuses to go inside due to a personal experience she never spoke about. Upon the arrangement, Ray and his son, Ray Jr., go inside. Ray Jr. has just been discharged from the army after several tours in Vietnam during the war and needs something to help keep him busy and help him adjust back to civilian life. Upon seeing Summerwind, like his father, he is also immediately drawn to it, describing it as the most fascinating home he's ever seen, like a mix of all different styles of architecture and that the home looked like it needed someone to care for it, like a puppy in the rain. Both men make their way inside, and it isn't long until they feel like the home is watching them. But despite a mysterious chill in the air, Ray decides to make the purchase. But like his daughter before him, he too will soon discover that he's purchased more than what he could have ever bargained for. Ray Jr. quickly gets to work renovating the old home. He calls multiple contractors to try and get assistance with the work, but as soon as they would find out where the work was to be done, they would stop returning his calls. So Ray continued, alone. One day, shortly after his work had began, Ray was frightened by something. He was so frightened that he refused to return to the mansion and claimed that he broke all of his tools, but not yet telling his father about what had happened. Ray Sr. continued to be excited about his plans for Summerwind. As he was explaining his layout plan with his daughter and son, Ray Jr. seemed particularly nervous and kept biting his nails. Having also now studied hypnotism, Ginger offered to help her brother with his nail biting by placing him in a trance. However, things soon escalated. The lights began to flicker and the same mysterious icy wind began to chill the entire room. And Ray no longer sounded like himself. The voice of an old gruff man now answered Ginger, an old gruff voice that said, I am strong and my children are weak. You are weak and I am strong. I am very old and have seven children and I despise them all for they are weak and I am strong. Fearing that she had unleashed something she couldn't control, Ginger began to panic once the traditional methods weren't breaking Ray's trance. She commanded the spirit to leave his body and give her back her brother, and with those words, things returned to normal. Ray soon woke up, and besides a slight headache, had no memory of what had just occurred, much to everyone's shock. Ray Sr. was quick to dismiss the event as overactive imaginations. However, Ray Jr. had no children and none of the statements he had made made any sense. The man's son then proceeded to explain to him what took place to him at Summerwind and why he refused to go back. He was alone in one of the hallways, sweeping, and he began to hear voices. Calling out to them, he began to walk towards them where he believed where they were coming from. Then, he heard two distinct gunshots and smelled burning gunpowder. Having just come back from a tour in Vietnam, there was no mistaking that smell for the young veteran. He quickly ran into the kitchen 
where he continued to smell the scent. He then checked the perimeter. It had rained the night before, but there were no tracks besides his, which would have been impossible. As he continued to check, he saw the basement door where he had spotted two bullet holes, and although they looked extremely old, he continued to smell gunpowder and was rattled to his core. Upon turning around to face the room again, he was met by the apparition of an old man with a disfigured face. The spirit was racing towards him with hell in his eyes. Ray did the sensible thing and ran to the safety of his vehicle and left for good. Knowing his son was a staunch atheist and non-believer prior to this event, Ray Sr. was astonished. Given all the information and details both his daughter and son had now shared with him, along with his newfound obsession with the home, Ray now believed that there was some kind of force attempting to communicate with them. But about what exactly, he wasn't sure. Upon her father's request, and although it took much longer than anticipated, Ginger placed him in the same trance that she had placed her brother. During his hypnosis, Ray Sr. finds himself at summer when searching its halls. He then began to descend into the basement, where he discovered a box hidden behind some old stones in one of the walls. Upon opening the box, he sees a land grant, written in 1767, signed by someone named Jonathan Carver. As the trance is broken, as he re-enters conscious reality, Ray Sr., along with his family, are shocked that seemingly out of nowhere they have conjured a name connected to Summerwind, a name that could help them solve the elusive mysteries hiding within its walls. The family quickly gets to work. Heading to the local library, Ray Sr. finds that Jonathan Carver was an explorer in the late 1700s whose crowning achievement was negotiating a peace settlement between two warring native tribes. As a reward for this, he was gifted a large swath of land, the same land in which Summerwind now sits. But upon his death, his children were unable to find any documents to verify this, and thus they were unable to inherit it. Could a land grant truly be sitting in a box hidden deep within the basement of the mansion? Although both Ginger and her brother had vowed to never step foot in Summerwind again, given these new revelations, they both believed that perhaps the spirits were attempting to tell them where this grant was. Perhaps they wanted it found, for one reason or another, so they could be at peace. For this reason, they agreed to go back. Although all were fearful, they made their way back into the old mansion, and from here, they headed to the basement to search. They quickly came upon the spot Ray Sr. had seen during his trance, and after pulling several stones out, there was a space behind them, just as Ray had seen. But shock and happiness soon turned to an abyss of disappointment. There was no box there, and after confirming that there was no box anywhere in the basement, they decided to do a deep search of the entire house, but a box was never recovered. Realizing just how much of an impact the entire Summerwind experience had had upon them, and how much time they had spent searching for answers to its elusive enigmas, they collectively decided to preserve what was left of their sanity. Seemingly tormenting every single person who had ever lived there, perhaps its secrets could never be solved, so the family gets in their vehicle and leaves Summerwind, never to return. The property would later be sold again and again, it would sit vacant for years. Then on one stormy night in 1988, lightning strikes the old mansion multiple times, burning it to the ground, forever sealing its secrets within a tomb of ashes. Today all that remains are the runes of its two chimneys and some stones. Carver's descendants researchers, and others still to this day have not found the land deed. But the real question is, did it ever exist at all? Did the spirit of Carver pull any and all people he could to attempt to find it? Or was he ever there at all? Or could there have been something else? 
something that perhaps was never human stalking the grounds of Summerwind instead, causing the torment and madness to the many residents who dared to call the mansion their home. The truth for now will forever remain a mystery, it seems, but the reality of what happened to the Henshaw family will forever haunt them until the day that they die. Throughout history, it has been speculated that many have been plagued by an ancient demonic force. From Mesopotamia to more modern times, this evil and terrifying entity has said to enter our world and wreak havoc upon those who dwell within it. When a seemingly normal family disregards the warnings and partakes in multiple Ouija board sessions, what happened next nearly destroyed them. This is the untold story of the demonic Zozo House of Oklahoma and the abhorrent creature that stalks its walls. Oklahoma City a small but growing city in the heartland of America, known for blue collar work and brick and mortar shops, red dirt, and sports, would soon become known for something much darker. A teenager by the name of Darren Evans was growing up here, a normal boy by all accounts, doing things that any teenagers would enjoy hanging out with friends, shenanigans here and there, and dating girls. He began dating a girl named Brandy who attended school with him, and the two often found themselves visiting each other as often as they could, whether that was walking to and from school, in between classes, or visiting each other's homes. One day, while Brandy's home was having some plumbing work done on some pipes located underneath the house, the plumber doing the work would soon make a strange discovery. Located below the foundation of the home, covered in dirt, was an old Ouija board. The front letters were partially buried, and the back of the board was solid black in color. Off to the side of where the board was found was an aged planchette. What made this finding even more bizarre was that four old jars sat on the corners of the board, speckled with dirt as well. Thinking perhaps the kids had stashed the board away and forgot about it, the worker told the young couple after his work was done about what he had found and it's from here that things seemingly take a darker turn. Upon examining the discovery, they began to brush the dirt away from the jars. They were then shocked by what they found. Inside each one of the jars, sitting on the four corners of the board, were the decaying bodies of blackbirds, congealed blood and matter still present. Bewildered but intrigued, they sat the jars off to the side and picked up the board. As soon as his fingers made contact with the board, Darren seemed to have an instant connection with it. And with this soon came a burning curiosity to examine it, and this curiosity would manifest into obsession. With this, the couple took the board inside the home where they spoke with Brandy's mother. She actively practiced the Wiccan religion, but had no idea who could have put the board there. Several days later, curious as most teenagers are, Darren was an avid music fan, and one night, after building up the courage to do it, he decided he was going to contact the deceased singer of the popular band ACDC, a man named Ronald Belford Scott, using the board. Scott had passed away from alcohol poisoning in 1980. 
after lighting several candles, laying the board with letters facing towards him, and placing the planchette upon the board, he began his session. At first, nothing seemed to happen, but Darren was still feeling this otherworldly connection to something within the board itself. After trying for half an hour, to his shock and amazement, the planchette began to move. Slowly at first, it then frantically began to move by itself, moving from Z to O, Z to O, over and over and over again, spelling out the name Zozo. Shocked and unsure of what or who he had contacted, Darren said goodbye in an attempt to end the session. Before his eyes, he saw the planchette spell out, See you in hell. And then it threw itself across the room. A now terrified and bewildered Darren ran out of his room and tried to make sense of what had just taken place. But this was just the beginning of what was to come. It started with horrible night terrors. He would wake up unable to move or speak and would hear whispering in his ears. These episodes at night were soon followed by banging and knocking throughout his house during the daytime, as well as a constant feeling as if he was being watched by something he couldn't see. But despite the presence he was feeling, Darren now sought answers to his ever-growing list of questions, just what exactly he had uncovered. So, he continued to hold sessions with the board, for better or for worse. Darren would later quote this, The sessions now were as intense and paranormal as anything I have ever witnessed. A deep and terrible moaning could be heard emanating through the walls after these sessions. I developed sleep paralysis and became reclusive to society in general. I was once again messing with Zozo and Ouija boards, despite the terrors of my earlier sessions, in which I had promised myself I would never do it again. But again and again, I did. When not in use, the board was kept in a purple silk cloth and stored in his bedroom closet. It would also often go missing, sometimes for days on end. When checking back where he had placed it in order to set up and initiate a new session, the board would seemingly vanish, only to reappear at random times, as if it was the one calling the shots of when it could be seen and used. The years came and went, and the sessions on the mystical Ouija board continued. Darren, by this time, started inviting his friends to partake in the sessions, and although their sessions with him would prove he's not insane, it's of little consolation considering the tragedy they would seemingly manifest later on. Darren's best friend was a man by the name of Randy. The two had bonded over their love for the band ACDC in high school, and had been inseparable ever since. Randy's idol also being the late Bon Scott, whose lifestyle seemingly imprinted upon the youthful teens once upon a time, and perhaps would ultimately lead to the downfall of one of them. By now, Darren was living in his own apartment and working construction. At a job site he was on, he would make a strange but familiar discovery. As he was digging down into the earth, he found what appeared to be a jar. Upon picking it up to discard it, he wiped away the dirt and debris, only to be shocked by its familiar contents. Lo and behold, within the jar was a congealed and rotting blackbird, extremely similar, if not identical, to the ones initially found alongside the Ouija board underneath his high school girlfriend's home all those years ago. 
It was particularly weird, not just because of this, but the fact that he had found it, digging down deep into the earth. He wondered, what were the odds of this? And although he had no way of knowing for sure, his gut began to tell him that there was some kind of witchcraft or occult expertise at play here. Perhaps someone or a group of people were knowingly contacting this entity known as Zozo, but for what remained to be known. One evening in 1985, Darren and Randy were relaxing at Darren's apartment when they decided to host a session on the Ouija board. Randy, more than anything, wanted to try and make contact with his late idol, Bon Scott. While wearing a Highway to Hell ACDC shirt, Randy's intent was clear. The two dimmed the lights, lit a couple of candles, and began the session upon the board. They made contact within a few minutes. Once the planchette was moving, Randy exclaimed, We want to talk to Bon Scott of ACDC. With this sentence, the planchette seemingly obliged. It moved in circles, eventually spelling out A-Y-E-M-A-T-E. The two looked at each other in amazement. The entity was using Australian dialects. And for anyone who doesn't know, Bon Scott was Australian. After several more questions, both of the young men were convinced they were speaking with their idol. The spirit seemed to know every little detail to any question they asked. And during the session, the entity then made a strange request from the men. It asked them to light a cigarette and place it in the hole in the planchette. What proceeded to make both of them laugh also made them quite spooked as well. So they lit a couple cigarettes, one for each of them, and one for this entity. They took a few drags to keep it lit, and then placed it cherry side up in the planchette hole. The planchette then spelled out thanks, and they then watched in utter amazement as the cherry of the cigarette lit up, as if Bon himself was taking puffs off of it. But this amusement was short-lived. Once the cigarette had seemingly been smoked, the planchette began to spell something very different. It spelled, F you, Randy. I will have your soul, and I'll see you in hell. Z-O. Z-O. Terrified, the men quickly ended the session by saying goodbye and tossing the board outside the second-story apartment balcony door. Clearly scared and upset, Randy also didn't take kindly to threats. He began cussing out Zozo with complete and utter rage. The board would later be returned by his downstairs neighbor. And after this session, a series of lows for both of the men seemed to manifest in the years to come. Influenced by the lifestyle of his idol, Randy fell victim to alcoholism. He soon would lose his wife to divorce and have split custody with his son. And although many opportunities presented themselves for Randy to better his life, for one reason or another, he was always just too far away to be able to grasp them. He often said to Darren, I feel like I'm in a prison, and I can't escape. For old time's sake, the two did one last Ouija board session together in 2005 in which Randy asked the board how he would die. The board responded, in a car, at night, alone. In 2007, after spending the evening with Darren, the last words he would say to him were, Darren, I will see you in hell. The next morning, Darren received a phone call from Randy's girlfriend, Alicia, saying that Randy never made it home after he left. Instead, he had passed away in a violent head-on collision, ultimately passing away in a car at night and 
remained alone. This devastating passing along with the frequent contact with the entity known as Zozo over the years led to a fascination and borderline obsession with a search for answers for Darren Evans. During the time before and after Randy's death, he had been living in a home in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma that would become synonymous with the demon's name. It was here that the worst afflictions brought on by the entity would take place to him and his family. Darren's fascination with the occult led him to hanging on to and possessing multiple Ouija boards and other various occult objects. It was here that he began to study on a much more in-depth and organized basis, just trying to figure out who or what Zozo was. But this research would soon be interrupted. In this home lived himself, his wife Kathleen, and their young daughter at the time. During a session with his wife Kathleen one evening, while their daughter slept rooms away, Zozo would once again make itself present in their lives, but this time seemed to take possession of Darren. Kathleen trembled with fear and bated breath as something stared at her through Darren's eyes, something that clearly wasn't human. He then turned violent attempting to attack her. Fortunately for Kathleen, she was able to say goodbye and get away before any harm could be done to her. Several minutes later, Darren would come back to himself with no memory of what had taken place. After this session, things seemed to escalate in intensity. Sounds began to wrap throughout the entire home, from knocking to hissing, footsteps and banging, all seemingly with no explainable origin. The family got so terrified that they sectioned off a particular bedroom upstairs, calling it their safe room. One night, however, not everyone was within the safe room. Suddenly, an overwhelming sense of terror creeped upon Darren as he was trying to sleep. He rushed to the safe room to attempt to stop what he was feeling, but quickly realizing he couldn't leave his family behind, he rushed back out of the room in an attempt to gather them and bring them to safety as well. As he was heading towards the stairs, his daughter had heard his cries and was now at the foot of the stairs. It was here that Darren saw her being lifted by invisible hands into the air and carried away from him. Screaming for his child as she screamed for her father, Darren ran down the stairs as fast as he possibly could, but couldn't see her anywhere in sight. He then heard her muffled screams coming from the basement. At first, the door was locked and wouldn't open, but after adrenaline and brute force, Darren thankfully was able to open it. He then retrieved his hysterical child and brought her to the safety of the safe room. Once inside the room, the family huddled together in fear as they continued to hear movement and noises all throughout the house. After this abhorrent nightmare of a situation, the family knew they had to get out of the house. This situation and the many other paranormal experiences had led to a lifelong fascination for Darren Evans with the occult and finding out just exactly what Zozo is. But was it worth jeopardizing his family's safety? It took some time, but the family would soon relocate to another home. And once his family was safe, Darren was able to continue his deep dive into the unknown to try and track down and decipher just what this entity could be and where it came from. And although he knew the topic was vast, I think it went far deeper than he ever anticipated. 
Whilst trying to dig up more information, he posted his experiences to an old paranormal forum in 2009, and since then, many, many people have shared their experiences with the demonic force, many of which have been documented and compared by Darren himself on his website. But these experiences are not just a 21st or even 20th century phenomena. They date back far older than that. Not every fine detail will be mentioned here, but I will do my best to list the most important details that I could find in regards to the origin of Zozo, according to Darren and other online sources. Zozo, in the old Bosque language, means blackbird or crow. The Zo people of Haiti practiced a form of voodoo whose rituals involve horrific scarification, as well as the intake and passing around of bodily fluids and bizarre rituals. Their witch doctors are called Zozo and wear demonic looking masks. As part of their death ritual, when someone is passing away, they lift up the mask at the moment of death to take in the person's final breath. This is apparently done to absorb the soul of the person, to gain more spiritual power. Zozo, also in the Malay language, is the same as it is in English, but it translates to wandering spirit, which is a spirit they believe to steal people's souls while they sleep which is also bizarre because sleep is often considered the cousin of death. Zozo has been called the minister of deception. It is known to convince you that it is a deceased loved one or friend or even someone you've idolized, when in reality, it's not. Sessions typically start out friendly and inviting, but soon turn malevolent and dangerous. During his research over the years, Darren made contact with and spoke to famous demonologist John Zaffis, who shared with him that in his experience of over 40 years of studying the demonic and paranormal, the name Zozo and other pseudonyms of its name kept coming up in his investigations, which too led him to seek answers as to what it could be. And some of those investigations when questioned, the demon stated that it was the son of Satan himself. But Zaphis thinks, perhaps as with many deities that seem to be lurking in the shadows, Zozo could be an entity that's existed far before the founding of Christianity. Besides evidence showing up in Africa and Egypt, there's also evidence found linking Zozo to ancient Mesopotamia as well. Other names Zozo has gone by throughout the ages have been Zuzu, Zaza, and Mama, among many others. The name Zuzu could refer to Pazuzu, the famed demon from the film The Exorcist, which in reality was a demonic entity from ancient Mesopotamian religion. It's incredibly strange to note the following as well. Zozo was replaced in the story of the exorcism of Roland Doe when Peter Blatty was using it as inspiration to write The Exorcist. He changed Zozo to Pazuzu. Zozo is believed to be the demon that possessed Roland. It was described as a terrifying form that first appeared in the Neo-Assyrian period, roughly around 934 to 610 BC. It had a monstrous head resembling a fierce lion or a dog with horns and had an emaciated human body with clawed hands, a scorpion's tail, and two sets of wings. One translation reads, I am Pazuzu, the son of Hanbu, king of the Lilu demons. I have scaled the powerful mountains. They trembled. The contrary winds were headed west. One by one, I broke their wings. Pazuzu and other demons like it 
were held responsible for ailments like disease, fetal death, nightmares, and much more. Could it be that this ancient demonic force is what could be plaguing people all the way into modern times? The demon Zozo is also mentioned in the French demonic encyclopedia as one of the demons responsible for diabolical possession and corruption. The possession of a young girl in 1816 is noted as a documented case where Zozo, among several other demons, were present. Other noteworthy possession cases over the ages, ranging closer to modern times, that bear Zozo's name, other than the exorcism of Roland Doe in the 1950s, are the possession of Doris Blither in 1972 in Los Angeles, the Einfield poltergeist incident in 1977 in the UK, and as recent as 2012, where a possession incident led to an attempted murder. Other theories with how this entity could communicate with so many people so quickly and across the globe over the years, besides supernatural ability of its own, would be that its own reach is perhaps being strengthened by an egregor or a collective group of thought form created by occultists for a certain purpose. However, this seems unlikely considering the entity doesn't seem to serve any human interest other than to destroy the person or people's lives it makes contact with. Egregors are typically formed to bring control over a summoned deity for the person or group's bidding. But perhaps instead there is a cult worshipping Zozo. I mean, that would make more sense to me. People who have made contact with the entity via a spirit or Ouija board have also been asked to chant or spell out phrases in Hebrew or Latin which has convinced many of the intelligence of the being that they are speaking with. What is also interesting is that the letter Z was actually removed from the original Latin alphabet because it was considered too evil when pronouncing it. It was said that one's face would make a death's grimace like that of a corpse, and that it mimicked the letter S like an evil twin. Perhaps the entity uses this name as some sort of mocking, whether to God or something else. One may also ask, despite the origin theories and historical details that could be linked to this ancient demonic force, how would one know if they encountered such a thing? These are what's known as Zozo's calling cards when it's being summoned using a Ouija board. The obvious is there that the planchette will begin to move on its own, but some less obvious signs are there as well, and are as follows. The planchette will move in a rainbow pattern from side to side, spelling Z-O, Z-O, over and over again, also known as the rainbow effect. It can also move in repeating figure eight movements, like an infinity sign, the planchette will spell out various versions of the demon's name, like Zozo, Zoso, Zaza, Zuzu, or Mama. You may also begin to see shadows moving around the area where you are hosting the session, like you're seeing through the thinnest sheet into a dark world that exists just behind your vision. And you and whoever you may be with may start to feel scared, uneasy, or upset, seemingly for no other reason, before or after this takes place. When you tell this entity goodbye, typically the best way to close a session, it may not truly be goodbye, because oftentimes, depending on how long the session has been for, like an ever-widening door, the entity may have had just enough time to sneak in to begin to wreak havoc upon your life. And thus begins what many demonologists and religious leaders alike call demonic obsession, which is where the entity becomes aware of you, 
and begins to crave you, which then leads to oppression or begins to inflict various forms of torture upon you in an effort to break you down, whether that's physically, psychologically, or spiritually. It will also work to isolate you from others, especially those who care about you. And finally, if you're incredibly unlucky, possession, where the entity finally takes control of you as its vessel. All of which to me are absolutely terrifying in every imaginable way. Darren Evans to this day continues to research the Zozo phenomenon having been involved in a number of paranormal investigations, shows, and various other public and private events, as well as radio shows and podcasts, many of which he goes into various degrees of details regarding his encounters, other people's encounters, and other various historical details. He also in 2016 compiled his years worth of research and experiences into a book also titled The Zozo Phenomena, which you can read and learn more about the entity and the topic as a whole if you're interested. I'll link it below. I also pulled a lot of this information from various interviews, which I'll also be linking below, as well as an older website he runs that doesn't seem to have been updated in a while, but supplied me with much information to get the story as cohesive as I possibly could. I also sourced the photos of the apparitions from this site, some of which were taken by Evans himself over the years. So does this demon or ancient force truly exist? Is it some kind of elder god, a pre-Christian deity or being, or manifestation of occult or Luciferian practices? Did Darren Evans just make it up? And did thousands of people find it interesting enough to make up their own stories and partake in a mass charade that has lasted years? All of these answers may never truly be known, but my opinion is this. I think, not only given the wide array of strange coincidences and details throughout history, from the origins to the stories of this creature existing in distant past to the present, literally thousands of people, from casual interest in the occult to more hardcore fanatics, religious scholars, demonologists, and more, claiming to have had experiences with this thing. With all of these details in mind, I certainly think it very well could be real. I do think there are things that exist in the shadows, things we can't see or touch, but that are there watching and waiting to strike when and if the opportunity presents itself. So my advice to all of you to avoid any possibility of opening a door that you can't close and inviting evil into your life is this. Don't mess with Ouija boards. These things are not toys and whether you believe it or not, these entities do exist and they believe in you. So keep away from them, because you might just let something in that won't want to leave, even if you say goodbye. Winter of 1988 in California. A woman by the name of Jackie Hernandez had just left her husband. Her marriage was rocky to say the least. A domestic drama, a story which is all too common in this world. Working with a limited budget, she had a small amount of things, her two-year-old son Jamie, and was pregnant with her second child. What should have been a happy development that was now bittersweet due to being overshadowed by the problems presented by an unhappy marriage. She soon found a small house located in San Pedro that seemed like it could be just what she needed to get back on her feet. Although it would take some time, she was willing to do what she needed to do to get out of the marriage and take care of her children. 
before the family would move into the home and begin to inhabit its walls. What they didn't realize was that they already weren't alone. Jackie would later say that she always had a fear of someone breaking into her home, especially when she began to live alone, but that upon crossing the threshold of this new house, and although for a seasoned criminal, it would have been all too easy to break into if they had so wished, that fear was somehow gone. At first, she said that she felt a presence, something that was not of this world, but that she felt almost protected and at ease, which was something she wasn't used to. And this presence would begin to show itself in small but strange ways. The very first thing Jackie said she ever experienced was when she had friends over. One of her friends was sitting at a table near her in the kitchen and the other on a couch in the living room. As she passed by another desk that held a cup full of pins, although several feet away, her and her friend in the kitchen were awestruck when the cup glided by itself across the table it was sat on and towards Jackie. It then collapsed to the floor, shattering the cup. Stricken with curiosity as to how that could have happened, they were confused and surprised to say the least. But not having the answers, before too long, this seemingly innocent strangeness would become a distant memory. However, the presence that Jackie had been feeling would begin to show its true intentions. In February of 1989, the activity seemed to escalate. As she wakes up, Jackie heads to her children's room to see if they're still asleep. Upon walking into the room, she is stopped dead in her tracks. Sitting beside her sleeping son, on the lowest bunk bed is a man in a red flannel shirt and jeans. His skin is gray. His face looks angry. A living, rotting corpse is staring at her son. She is so scared, she can't even scream, even if she wanted to. The man glances at her menacingly and then vanishes. She panics and calls several friends to help her, but after they arrive, they find nothing, and this would only mark the beginning of the frightening specter revealing itself. Multiple of Jackie's friends and even her neighbor would witness things they couldn't explain in the months to come. The neighbor's name was Susan Castaneda, and in her words, she would later say, At first, when Jackie said that she felt something, I didn't really believe her. I thought it was her own confidence in herself, but that was until the manifestations began to show themselves to her, and then to me. I don't know what it is that I saw, but I saw it, I smelled it, I experienced it. It touched me and it talked to me, it even visited my house to let me know that it was real. One night, as it stormed outside and rain tapped the glass of the windows of her bedroom, Susan was sound asleep, but as she slept, something supernatural was churning, like the storm outside her house. She was suddenly startled awake when she heard a massive banging noise in her room. However, this wasn't thunder that she was hearing. Her large antique lamp on the other side of her bed had somehow been moved. It had been thrown into the middle of the room and now laid in pieces. As she made this discovery, a flash of lightning illuminated the room, and standing before her was a man. His face was like that of a dead person. His eyes were angry. And suddenly, as quickly as the room lit up, as the illumination dissipated, he was gone. But something peculiar was left in his wake, a putrid and rotting smell. After the experience Susan had, which would be one of many to come, Another friend by the name of Darlene, who would regularly babysit Jackie's children, Jamie and Samantha, while Jackie was at work, would have an experience of her own. One afternoon, as the children watched cartoons on TV in the living room, Darlene got up to use the restroom. As she stepped back into the hallway and headed towards the small home's bathroom, she was greeted by a voice that called out to her from inside the darkened room. It very intensely said, don't come back here. Later describing the voice as very creepy 
and spine chilling. She did as she was told, fearing that if she didn't, whatever this thing was would become violent. As the days passed, Jackie only became ever more restless, but the activity persisted, only becoming more aggressive and more visible. A strange liquid began to drip from the walls and various crevices throughout the house with no logical origin. Weirded out by this, but not knowing what it was, Jackie would clean it up and just try to go about her day. However, whatever had been causing all of these events was far from finished. One evening, when placing a storage bin inside of her attic to try and conserve what little space she had, she felt as if she was being watched. To her shock and amazement, she began to see what she would later describe as a floating head coming towards her. But upon seeing the specter, it picked up speed dramatically. It came at her so quickly that she panicked and fell off the chair that had been propping her up to gain access to the attic. Following this incident, she began to hear loud noises emanating from the attic above, coupled by whispers coming from the small access door above her laundry room. Getting no sleep and reaching her breaking point, Jackie began to get desperate for some kind of help. Her friend and neighbor Susan had recently seen a show on TV of a crew who investigated the haunting of the Queen Mary, and after some digging, she was able to find their phone number. So at Susan's recommendation, Jackie gave them a call. After discussing what she had experienced, her point of contact passed the information along to the group, where she was then contacted back, and together they set up a time for all of them to meet and to begin a potential investigation. The group consisted of a fairly well-known parapsychologist and other professionals in assistive fields. The parapsychologist was Barry Taft, who had been involved in over 3,000 cases, and at one point investigated the same case that would later become famous for a movie adaptation known as The Entity. A professional cameraman named Barry Conrad also joined them. He had previously worked for NBC and ABC and had won multiple awards in his field for his expert work behind the lens. And lastly, a photography expert by the name of Jeff Wheatcraft would complete the main crew. Having spent multiple years as a photography expert in New York, he was well versed in debunking photos. He was also a well-known and heavy skeptic an important piece when trying to remain scientific in a field such as this. All three would arrive for the first time at the San Pedro home on August 8, 1989. Upon their initial surveying of the home, they would unanimously agree that it felt as if there was a massive pressure around them and in their ears. This pressure felt as if they were deep underwater. Alongside this, the home had a very peculiar scent. A foul and rotting type of smell seemed to permeate the air within its walls. After an initial walkthrough, the crew would then interview Jackie and Susan in the living room, where they were introduced to many of the details of what they both said they had experienced. Upon hearing Jackie's account of a disembodied head flying towards her in the attic, Jeff, although not voicing it at the time, didn't believe her. But knowing what they were there to do, he suggested that the group at least take a look in the attic to see if they could feel anything. He then volunteered to be the first to go into the attic, thinking that it would simply be empty and this lady was spinning a fantasy. As he climbed above the laundry room and into the space, flashlight and camera in hand, he began to walk around and the first thing he noticed was that he felt as if he was being watched by something that he couldn't see. So much so, that the hair on his body began to stand on end, trying to shake the feeling that someone or something was practically breathing down his neck. Jeff began to take photos before he was going to descend back to the main level of the house. He snapped one photo, two photos, but upon snapping the third photo, something, an invisible force yanked his camera from his hands. Dumbstruck by what had just taken place, he screamed and ran descending the attic as quickly as he could. Upon seeing the rest of the crew, white as a ghost himself, 
He took a minute or two to collect himself before working up the nerve to go and retrieve his camera. As he climbed back into the attic, much more cautiously this time, he noticed that the camera wasn't anywhere near where he had been standing. Instead, the lens was standing up in one corner of the attic, and the body of the camera was in the complete opposite corner from where it had been pulled from his hands. He would retrieve it as quickly as he could, and descend yet again. He would later say that after his initial experience, that he knew, he just knew in his soul that there had to be something up there. The group would further discuss a plan of action and continue to speak with the ladies in the living room until it was decided that Jeff and Barry would reascend into the attic together to try and record some kind of video of the space. However, every time that Barry attempted to take the camera up into the attic, it would shut off. Thinking that this was some kind of battery issue, he would go back down only for the video camera to come back on. During this troubleshooting process, Jeff was again targeted. He was pushed by unseen hands. He was pushed with so much force that he had to grab a hold of a wooden beam in the attic to keep from falling through the entrance. Upon making his way back down as well, thoroughly shocked by everything that he had experienced so far, the entire group was then startled into silence when a loud banging noise began to come from the far reaches of the attic itself. They hushed each other to listen. The following audio was taken at that very moment. Quiet. Damn. There has been noises in this room that come from right in the center, right here. Once it finally stopped, the group knew they were experiencing something they couldn't explain, and they were convinced that this was the real deal. Attempting to photograph whatever could have been making the noise, Jeff would partially put himself up into the attic to snap additional photos. He would then see multiple flashes of light, followed by what he described as a massive black shadow or presence that was huge and moving from side to side. The crew would then leave for the night shortly after this interaction and would plan to return several weeks later. However, shaken by what he had experienced, Jeff did not want to further participate. On August 28th of 1989, the remaining crew would return, and things at first seemed relatively quiet this time, not nearly as active as the first experience, and that was until about 4 a.m. Sitting in the kitchen, they began to see a strange liquid pour from inside the cabinets. This was the very same liquid Jackie had described to them that she had cleaned up several times before. The crew, since the opportunity presented itself, decided to take samples of this mysterious liquid and would have it sent off to a lab for analysis. As they collected samples from all over the house throughout the course of the night, they would also try and determine if there was any sort of potential, logical source as to where this liquid could be coming from. However, they would discover no pipes, no trickery, they had no valid explanation as to what could be causing this strangeness. The results from the lab once they were in were bizarre to say the least. The liquid was actually human blood plasma with a high concentration of copper and iodine, and the plasma had come from a human male. This stunned everyone and further deepened the mystery of this very unusual haunting. After this night, the crew planned to return after a short time while they examined the things they had captured thus far to try and determine just what could be causing the haunting. In the meantime, Jackie was left alone, or on rare occasion, with a friend. She would very often leave voicemails of what she was experiencing on Barry Conrad's answering machine. Shortly after their departure, one night as she was trying to sleep, the banging in the attic began again. As she sat terrified, waiting for it to stop, it would, but something new and equally horrifying would take its place. The sound of a deep, almost monstrous breathing began to manifest instead, and this manifestation made Jackie not only scared for her life, but come to the conviction that she wouldn't sleep in the house any longer, and certainly could not live there anymore. 
Various members of the crew would stay with Jackie to further investigate when their schedules would permit and the days to come. However, there was one night in particular that wasn't just an ordinary episode. No, this night was a matter of life and death. September 4th of 1989, drained and exhausted, Jackie Hernandez was now alone in the home once again. Barry had just left the previous night after capturing additional footage. But upon his return, and after convening with his colleagues, he would soon have a frantic voicemail waiting for him. And this voicemail was from the woman who he had just left. It was from Jackie. Screaming as things broke in the background, she would describe what happened like this. Almost as soon as Barry left, things began to go crazy in the house. Items like dishes, knives, and other things were being thrown across the room. It was trying to hurt me. My kids' toys were being levitated and then being ripped apart before my very eyes. Even more frightening, as Jackie was leaving the frantic voicemail as the activity surrounded her, her phone line was cut mid-cry for help. The crew rushed down to San Pedro, but instead of picking her up and getting her as far away from the house as they possibly could, Jackie was surprised when the guys rushed inside the home with their equipment instead. At first glance, everything seemed to be calm, almost too calm. Jackie began telling the men that among the more chaotic activity she had been experiencing, she again had heard breathing and whispering coming from inside the attic. Jeff and a colleague named Gary of his decided that they would go up to investigate, with Jeff feeling not so great about being back in the home once again. It had been nearly a month since his initial visit and experiences. At 12.50 a.m., Jeff and Gary would crawl into the attic. Within minutes, Jackie and Barry would hear what sounded like three distinct snaps, like someone snapping their fingers. As Barry was holding his camera with both his hands, and Jackie was standing directly beside him, they would then yell to Jeff and Gary that the activity was on the surface level and to come back down from the attic. Gary, who was closer to the exit, began to make his way towards it, and Jeff, who had been in the center of the attic holding his flashlight, began to take his steps towards the exit as well. However, little did Jeff know that these steps would be ones that he would never forget. Before Gary's very eyes and a camera lens, Jeff was hoisted into the air and against the ceiling by a support beam of the attic. He was being strangled by something that neither of them could see. As his legs kicked several feet off the ground, he dropped the flashlight. Unable to see, Gary snapped a series of photos to be able to see Jeff. He then ran to his aid to try and free him, before whatever this was took his friend's life. He found that it was some kind of cord that had been tied around Jeff's neck and pulled to the ceiling. The cord had been secured by a bent nail that he actually had to bend straight to free him. Once Jeff was freed, he was then dragged as quickly as possible towards the exit as he came to. Jeff would later describe what his experience was like, like this. I remember feeling myself being strangled, and then everything went black. That dark space of time that I lost, I felt so out of control. Once Jeff was out of the attic, the cord that was noosed around his neck, which had never previously been seen by anyone that had gone into the attic, was found and taken off him. These are photos moments after his exit. As Jeff tried to come to terms with what had just happened, as everyone else was frightened, Barry, the man behind the camera, was attacked next. A surge of electricity from his over-the-shoulder camera shocked him to the point of unconsciousness. At this point, everyone was terrified and knew that they had to leave immediately. As Jackie gathered her son and four-month-old daughter, she and the rest of the crew began to depart the house as quickly as they could. Jackie's daughter was now crying due to a large red mark on her forehead that came out of nowhere. The activity then began to pick up in the house as they were making their way out. 
Banging noises could be heard coming from inside the house as they all exited. They would all leave shortly after 3 a.m. this very night. In later interviews, Jackie Hernandez would say, I was in a way forced out by a ghost, but if I would have stayed, I would have been harmed or have had a nervous breakdown. I couldn't see a future staying there. I just knew that I couldn't stay there. It wasn't very long after that Jackie made her departure from the house, a permanent one. It would also be the last time that the crew and anyone else involved would step foot within the San Pedro home. However, this would not be the end. October of 1989. Wanting to get as far away as she possibly could, Jackie used what little resources she had to move to a modest trailer home over 300 miles north of San Pedro to Weldon, California. And although she still feared the nights, she felt as if whatever presence that dwelled within the San Pedro house had been left there. But she would be very wrong. The following year in April of 1990, one moonlit night, Jackie was woken up by a series of strange scratching sounds coming from inside the small storage shed in her backyard. Thinking it was an animal, she grabbed a flashlight and approached it. As she got to the door and pulled it open, the scratching sound stopped, and an all-too-familiar sense of fear came flooding back. Although she didn't hear anything else going bump in the night, all the hair on her body stood on end, just like it had at the San Pedro house. Just weeks after this development, Jackie would see a large black mist float through the hallway and towards her daughter's room. Rushing to make sure her child was okay, she passed the threshold of the room and immediately panicked. The comforter in which her daughter was laying on was on fire. Bizarrely, it looked as though someone or something had touched or sat down exactly where the spot was burning. Thankfully, her children were okay after she very quickly extinguished the flames and then snapped a series of photos as evidence afterwards, believing the presence to be back in their lives. The black mist, however, was nowhere to be found. As a result of the past dealings at the San Pedro house, as well as the resurgence in her new home, Jackie began to suffer horrific panic attacks and almost constant anxiety as a result of the trauma that she had endured. She wouldn't be able to breathe when the knocks would begin at night, and they were always in threes. Having kept in touch with the guys who had been documenting the San Pedro phenomenon, Jackie had kept them up to date on the new incarnation. Never having seen this type of haunting before, the crew wanted to come up and see for themselves if this thing, this entity, had indeed followed her to her new home. It was midnight, Friday, April the 13th, when Barry and Jeff arrived. In later interviews, Jeff would say, Many people have asked me, after what you experienced, why on earth would you go following this woman and her ghosts? The only response I could give is that I was compelled to finish this case. I wanted to see it through to the end, to some kind of conclusion. By this time, Jackie's nearby neighbors had experienced some activity themselves, which only began to take place after her arrival. One incident that happened was that several of her neighbors were moving a new television into their home when the face of an old man with evil eyes materialized in the screen. It was seen by both husband and wife moving it. Word had slowly gotten around after this night. Some of the teenage neighbors in the area noticed that there was an unfamiliar van parked outside of Jackie's house. After knocking on the door and getting the info as to what was happening, the two teens left and quickly came back with a Ouija board, hoping to assist. Given the time spent coming up, the desire to make contact and to try and gain some sort of a resolution, and that it was a full moon on Friday the 13th, the crew thought that perhaps this was their best and only opportunity to contact whatever this thing was and to try and elicit a response, and a response they would get. As they placed the board upon a table that all of them could sit around, the atmosphere was icy cold. At first, nothing happened. The board sat there idle. But within minutes, 
the entire table began to violently shake. The planchette began to move around the board and answer questions so quickly that all they could do was write down letters to try and decipher what it said. The candles around them flickered as if there were people running in the room, creating some kind of vortex. They asked just who the entity was, and it told them. It said it was a man who had been murdered, held underwater, and drowned in San Francisco Bay in the year 1930. They asked how many spirits walk the earth. It replied with, Phantoms fill the skies around you. Jeff then asked it, Why are you targeting me? Why do you hate me? It replied with, You have the likeness of my killer. They then asked, Who in this room do you harbor hatred for? The board then spelled out, Jeff. Within seconds, Jeff himself was picked up multiple feet into the air and thrown into the wall behind his chair. This violence concluded the session. Jeff would come two minutes later with an injured back, and everyone would soon exit the trailer to try and make sense of the ordeal. When day broke, it was as if the presence was weakened or went back into hiding within the darkness. Days after the unearthly encounter, Bear decided to take the information that he had gained and visit the news pilot, the local newspaper there in San Pedro, to look through old articles to see if he could verify what the specter had told them. He soon found an article dating back to March 25th of 1930, where the body of a man named Herman Hendrickson had been discovered. His body had washed up in San Francisco Bay. Police believed he had been a victim of foul play due to a compound fracture in his skull, but due to a lack of evidence, his death would ultimately be ruled accidental. Herman Hendrickson was a seaman who worked upon a lumber company vessel known as the Astoria. Feeling compelled that he was onto something, Barry then took photos of the cord that had been tied around Jeff's neck in San Pedro to the local docks to ask around. Upon speaking to an elderly and career fisherman, he was told that the knot was a bowline knot, a very common knot that had been used on the seas for hundreds of years. It was as common now as it would have been in the 1930s and prior, and that whoever had tied it had been connected with the ocean in their profession. Given the resurgence of the supernatural in her new home, Jackie's patience was paper thin. She decided once again to move in June of 1990 in hopes of leaving the entity behind for good. She would relocate back to San Pedro and move into a small apartment home on 7th Street. Not wanting to take any chances, she had a local priest come in and bless her home before she and her family would live there. But again, horrifically, it had moved with her. From the very first night, the same phenomena began to rear its ugly head again. From lights flickering, objects moving on their own, and balls of light materializing and moving throughout the room, Jackie was once again plagued by an ethereal force but she wasn't the only one. Every time the guys would return from a separate investigation, a photography shoot, or anything in between, they too were met with odd happenings. The first and one of the more worrisome things to happen was that their gas burners in their apartment began to turn themselves on and ignite. Following this continuous show of power, it began to rearrange and move objects such as photographs. It then began to scale in intensity in the weeks to come, as an unseen force broke multiple windows and began to place furniture upside down. It would eventually reach a crescendo, a blitz of violent and vulgar displays. About 50 different items were moved with Gary from the previous investigation, also being present alongside Jeff and Barry as witnesses. In the middle of the action, in an effort to communicate once again, a letter and pen was placed in the middle of the stove at approximately 3.58 a.m., only to have the burners be turned on by themselves, and the letter moved and ignited within five minutes. Whatever the entity was wanted them to know that it was there and that no one's home was sacred. 
and whatever doubt that was once present had now been extinguished. When the case initially began in 1989, no one could have predicted the longevity and persistence of the paranormal phenomena that was to take place and just how many people it would affect. Today, Jackie Hernandez still experiences minor bouts of spirit activity, but things have long since calmed down from the days of 1989 and through the 1990s. Thankfully for her now, she's able to exhibit a relatively normal life, although her fear of what could be lurking in the darkness still sits in the back of her mind. But before we go, I do have some questions about the case, some that you may be asking yourself. But ultimately, although I will propose these questions, the conclusion is yours to make. Just what caused the spirit to haunt the home in which Jackie found herself in San Pedro? If it truly was a drowned and tormented soul who harbored hatred as it claimed to be, why would it find a residence over 400 miles away to haunt? And why would it pick Jackie of all people? Or could it have been anyone at that specific time? And in that specific place? Could it have been the fact that she was vulnerable or something else? She also claimed to have never opened any sort of doors or dabbled in any sort of occult activity, although most of the time that is the way these entities find their way into our world. But perhaps later on, when they asked and received their answers via Ouija board and the Weldon home, maybe they allowed the spirit to become more present. Although it bothered other people like the friends and neighbors of Jackie, and followed Jackie to multiple residences, perhaps it was strengthened through this process, considering for a time the manifestation seemed to become stronger. Although many people consult a religious leader, like a priest, to try and cleanse a home or rid themselves of these kinds of entities, why didn't that work when Jackie moved into the final apartment on 7th Street? Could the entity have perhaps attached itself to her? Or, and although there is no evidence to support this, could her husband or relative unhappy with the divorce have placed some kind of hex or curse upon her? Just some food for thought as to how she found herself in this position. One of the more uncommon traits of this haunting, and one that still baffles me and others alike, was how was human blood plasma able to seep from various areas within the house? And just whose plasma was it? I've yet to find another case where this has happened. To me, it's absolutely bizarre. But then again, these aren't normal things that we're dealing with. These events are supernatural. So therefore, what doesn't make sense to me, perhaps makes sense in the grand scheme of things. And lastly, was it even a human spirit at all, or could it have been something from the demonic realm? Considering the knocks, especially in the trailer home, came in threes, this is usually indicative of the demonic, not to mention the manifestations of power and the clear violent and malicious intent. Along with these many questions, we still find ourselves with even fewer answers than we'd like to when it comes to this now infamous case known as the San Pedro haunting. But a few things are for certain. These things do exist, and whether you believe based on what you've seen or learned, or you're a hardened skeptic, sometimes it takes the other world staring at you directly in the face to convince you otherwise. And your fear, your vulnerability, can attract and feed the things that go bump in the night. And perhaps fear of the unknown is a well-placed fear indeed. Can a soul or the essence of an entity become trapped inside of an object? Could one channeling enough energy, dedication, and care into something allow an otherworldly presence to possess it? attracting spirits, like moths, to a flame. We have covered haunted objects here before, such as Akiku the doll, among others. But this story is too infamous to not be given the time of day. And although it has been told many times, perhaps you will learn a detail or two that you've never heard before. 
This is the untold story of Robert the Doll and the malevolent monstrosity that stares at the world from behind its beady little eyes. At first glance, most people tend to agree that although dolls of all sorts can be creepy to say the least, there is something particularly unnerving about the doll that has become known to the world as Robert. But behind the initial feelings of unease at first glance lies many tales of accidents, tragedy, and misfortune, all supposedly at Robert's hands. Far too many within his presence to just be a string of awful coincidences. But if an evil force supposedly lives within the confines of this century-old child's toy, to come to recognize and understand just what it could be, we must first tell its story. And to tell Robert's story properly, we must first start at the very beginning. As with many legends, there are multiple versions of the origin story and how Robert the Doll came to be. Having read through most, if not all of them, I'll be sharing with you the most agreed upon origin for accuracy's sake in the beginning, and we will explore other theories and origin stories later in this video. The year is 1904, and a man named Thomas Otto is on a trip in Germany. Whether it was for business or leisure, we can't say, but during his trip, he decided to pick up a gift for his young grandson's birthday to take back home with him to the States. As he perused various shops throughout his time there, he stumbled across a toy that he believed would be the perfect fit for the young boy. Perched on display behind a pale glass window sat a doll. The doll was about the size of a young child and was accompanied by a small dog doll as well. Knowing that his grandson was lonely on the large family estate and was very fond of dogs as well, Thomas believed he had found what he had been searching for and quickly purchased the toy. In due time, he would find his way back to the United States once his trip was over, bringing his precious cargo with him. Making his way back to the family estate located in Key West, Florida, to greet his family after months abroad, Thomas, in an act of innocence and excitement, gifted the toy to his grandson Eugene for his eighth birthday. As soon as Eugene laid eyes on the gift he had received, he became ecstatic. With no other children his own age in the home or nearby, he now for once had his very own friend, his own best friend, and one that could accompany him wherever he went. Sitting at around three feet tall with his little dog, Eugene named his new friend, Robert. But Robert of course needed clothes to fit for years of adventures to come. So Eugene's mother, Maria, quickly found just what he was missing. A small sailor's outfit that had once belonged to her son, but had long since been outgrown. After placing Robert in his new clothes, the two were off to play and soon became inseparable. Wherever Eugene went, Robert accompanied him. From hours of play inside and outside of the house, to the dinner table, in bedtime, his new best friend was everything the young man wanted, and much more. Besides constant companionship, Eugene began to confide in the doll, often speaking to him as if he was a person in his own right. His parents, who were first just as elated as their young son was at his excitement over his new toy, began to grow concerned over how close their son was to the doll, but they would initially write off the behavior, as most would, since lonely children with their imaginations still very much active will typically invent imaginary friends or adventurous stories to fill the void or lack of friends and real adventures within their daily lives. But over the months since Robert had arrived, they noticed a bizarre shift in Eugene's personality. He began to grow extremely possessive and obsessive over Robert and would lash out at his parents, sometimes violently, if the doll was not in his sight at all times. It would soon appear that Eugene's obsession with his cloth companion and shift in behavior wasn't the only strange activity that was taking place. One night, as she tucked her son into bed, Maria overheard Eugene whispering to Robert, 
something that at this point had become a daily occurrence. But as she closed the door to his room and began to walk away, she heard a deep, guttural voice respond to her son. Shocked and terrified, she rushed back into her son's room, only to find him laying with the doll, as per usual. When she asked him just who was speaking, he simply answered, Robert. This scary happening wouldn't be the last. About a year into Robert the doll inhabiting their Key West estate, the Autos noticed yet another shift in their son's behavior. But this time, it was almost the exact opposite of what the initial shift had been. Eugene had gone from a quiet and shy but charming young man to a belligerent, angry, and possessive boy. But now, he had become one that was meek, full of anxiety, and constantly seemed like he was walking on eggshells. He had now also taken to violent fits on occasion, as if something was trying to overtake his body and soul. The guttural voice that Maria had heard a year ago could be heard much more frequently now, and just as frequently, almost nightly, it became commonplace to hear what sounded like glass breaking and constant commotion coming from Eugene's room. Upon hearing the turmoil, his parents would rush to discover the source. Upon opening their son's door, they would find his furniture dumped upside down. Other toys of his would be smashed or in pieces. And Eugene would almost always be in the corner of the room in his bed petrified, while Robert the doll would be in his usual space, nearby. Upon asking just what had happened, they would be met with an all-too-familiar answer at this point. They would ask, just who did this, Eugene? And his answer would always be, Robert. Noticing the activity becoming more and more intense, and being a God-fearing woman herself, Maria was deeply disturbed by what was taking place in her home and what was taking place to her family, particularly her son. Besides the nightly terror that now plagued them, she was very much disturbed by this guttural voice that she kept hearing. Knowing that her son had not yet matured, she knew that there was no way his voice could reach that deep level of tonality and malice that she often heard. At times, the voice would even shout and speak over Eugene, and unless he was exceptionally good at ventriloquism, something was horrifically wrong. It was as if the devil himself now occupied the walls of their home. Like a stain or a liquid, the presence had slowly seeped in and permeated throughout their lives. One night, as per usual, the family settles down to sleep, as the clouds spiral and the moon now haunts the sky above them, gleaming down overhead. The family's peace is shattered by the horrific screams of their son and the echoes of the sounds of things being broken. Wide-eyed and terrified, Eugene's parents rush to their son's aid. Lantern in hand, the closer they get to his room, the louder the low and horrible voice becomes and the louder the screams of Eugene become as well. The deep voice that had been growing louder suddenly was silent like the winter snow as hands touched the doorknob. Quickly overcoming their fear for the sake of their boy, the couple throw the door open to find their son huddled underneath his sheets. His room was almost completely destroyed. Most of his belongings were in pieces or tatters from what was left of his toys, to his furniture, to even his clothes. Poor Eugene was shaking in the corner of his room, opposite his bed, and Robert, along with his beady-eyed companion, were in his bed, staring at them all, silently. By this point, Maria knew that whatever Robert was, or whatever inhabited him, was truly evil. But unsure of how to handle the situation, or what exactly they were dealing with. In a fit of rage, she grabbed the doll and rushed to the attic, casting Robert and his canine companion 
into the darkness above. This would remain his home until a better idea presented itself as to what to do with him. The low groans and screams and breaking ceased in Eugene's room, but would frequently be heard in the attic. With having such a large estate to care for, the family did have a team of servants to care for the property, but their loyal crew, having experienced the strangeness themselves, up and quit. The servants soon became a revolving door, with new faces almost always coming and going just as quickly as they started. Despite his banishment to the attic, alongside the occasional crashing sounds and yelling, the family said that they would also hear Robert walking around, the pitter-patter of his small feet often being heard, echoing all throughout the house, especially at night, when he seemed to truly come alive, so to speak. As the years passed, and despite all of the childhood trauma and fear inflicted on him by the demonic doll, unbeknownst to any rational mind, after his parents' passing, Eugene would choose to take Robert back into his possession as an adult. Perhaps he did this to ensure that Robert wouldn't inflict terror upon anyone else. Maybe he felt like he had the most experience dealing with him, and therefore he was the most equipped to handle anything that could possibly happen as a result of his presence. Eugene in his adult years became an artist and would later marry and have a family of his own. He kept Robert propped up in the window of his art studio, known as the turret room, which overlooked his front yard. Annette, Eugene's wife, was said to disapprove of Robert's presence in the house and demanded that he be gotten rid of or banished into the attic or basement. For a short time this took place, but naturally, Robert didn't take kindly to this and apparently began to make threats towards her by visiting her in her dreams and verbally telling Eugene that if he was not moved back, horrible things would happen to his family. So eventually, Robert was placed back in the turret room. Aside from this, I couldn't find any additional information on the happenings that took place during those years inside the home. I would hope and imagine that perhaps Robert had gone dormant during this time, especially since Eugene did eventually have children of his own and hopefully didn't allow them to be compromised by having such a thing in the house. There were, however, reports of passerbys, school children and neighbors, feeling a strange presence when passing by the house on a daily basis. Others would say that they could see Robert move, but in the blink of an eye, he would be back to where he was sitting. Eugene Otto would continue to spend the rest of his life painting in the turret room with Robert the Doll until his death in 1974. However, this bizarre legend does not stop with his death. Upon Eugene's passing, his family sold the house to a woman named Myrtle Reuter. Upon moving into the home, she noticed, sitting in the window of the turret room, was a small doll with a sailor's uniform. She thought this to be strange, since the Otto family had not left any other belongings behind when they had moved. But regardless, she decided to keep it. Myrtle soon began to realize that there was something different about this doll. Upon house cleaning, she would typically notice that he moved around the room, seemingly by himself. At night, she would hear what she described as small footsteps all throughout the house. Guests who would visit her claimed too that Robert would move of his own volition and that his blank expression would change to one of rage if anyone discussed him in a negative way. Myrtle would eventually reach out and speak with the widowed Annette Otto, who would confirm her worst fears, that something otherworldly inhabited Robert the doll. After dealing with his antics for years, she finally decided to reach out to a local museum and would donate Robert in 1994 to the Fort East Martello Museum in Key West, Florida, where he remains today. But as with each previous relocation, his story does not end here either. Placed inside his own glass display for the public to see him each and every day, 
one would think that perhaps Robert's antics would cease. He was of course a natural source of curiosity and would be seen and admired by many people daily, but you would be very wrong. Staff at the museum have claimed to find Robert in various positions within his case, as if he was attempting to break out of it or had been out of it prior and had just re-entered it. The phantom footsteps as previously claimed by all three families has also been reported, as well as the doll's expression changing from neutral to nasty in an instant. The afflictions first started with the staff themselves, from horrible bouts of rare diseases to relationship breakdowns and marriage failures, as well as unique instances of psychosis. Over the years, the curse of Robert the Doll began to take shape and become a well-known phenomena, but it would soon spread to many others besides the staff themselves. Many people, upon visiting Robert's exhibit, finding him strange to say the least, would often mock him, berate him, or just laugh at his appearance. Little did they know that they would be inviting the wrath of something otherworldly. Shortly after their visit, droves of people began to experience shockingly similar happenings to that of the staff, varying in intensity, almost as if their punishment was being tapered to fit their crimes. From less serious experiences, like paranormal activity beginning in their home, horrible luck, and job loss to name a few, to much more serious experiences, like exotic disease diagnosis, rare cancers, relationship disintegration, and others, car accidents, falls, and even untimely death. Eventually, a warning would be added to Robert's exhibit, explaining the alleged curse and the proper etiquette to approach him with, whether that's to observe or take a photo, as to not offend whoever or whatever inhabits the doll itself. Over the decades, an entire wall has been dedicated to the letters people have dropped off or sent the museum if they weren't able to come in person, begging for Robert's forgiveness, hoping to end whatever horrible situation they found themselves in after their visit. To this day, there are over a thousand letters, with more continuing to be added each and every year. But could there be more to this legend? As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, there is another origin story that could explain just what inhabits the doll and how it got there. I will also add several elements that I found interesting relating to the case itself. The alternative origin story says that a young woman of Bahamian descent gave Thomas Otto the doll as a retaliation for a misdeed. As to why this would have taken place is not known, but speculation has led many to believe that the girl, or perhaps a relative, had been a member of staff at some point or another at the family's Key West estate. The retaliation was that the doll had been imbued with a spirit that had been conjured using voodoo, and by trapping the entity within the doll, making it its vessel, it became aware of its surroundings and knew what it was sent there to do. Although with many details in this case, lots of details can't be corroborated due to the age of the story itself, but there are a few details that I managed to dig up that are interesting. The doll itself appears to have been manufactured by the Steiff Company, a German family company that was headed by German designer Richard Steiff, the original designer of the beloved teddy bear, and the original design of the doll in particular and others that were similar to it were not designed as toys, but rather stage props for the time. So it's hard to say if Robert was ever intended as a toy in the first place. The family tree of the Autos also has conflicting information in regards to birth and death dates, as well as names. But I did my best to corroborate this information, and I'll be linking the info in the description below. Today, Robert continues to be on display and his antics continue to persist. He seems to be just as powerful as he was all those years ago. 
the museum keeps a cataloged record of all ailments that have been reported as a result of offending him for future reference. His reach also continues to expand as his legend grows and becomes more and more well known across the world. Robert the Doll has been the inspiration behind many books, movies, and podcasts, as well as a local legend in Florida. And this lesson truly applies to anyone and everyone. Have respect when you meet someone, because you never truly know who or what you could be dealing with. And please, if you find yourself at the East Martello Museum in Key West, Florida, and you happen to come into contact with the entity known as Robert the Doll, be respectful, because if you're not, you may just pay the ultimate price. They say that one man's trash is another man's treasure. While many people accidentally purchase a haunted home without knowing it was haunted, this story partially is about a man who did the opposite. But the home in which he purchased was way more than he bargained for. Not for him, but for a family whose experiences made it infamous. With a one-of-a-kind strange past and a present-day nasty and demonic reputation. Known as Pennsylvania's Amityville Horror, this is the untold story of the Wells House and why it's considered one of the most haunted places in the state, let alone the country. To properly tell this story, we must first start at the beginning. The notorious home on Wells Street was built by industrialist Augustus C. Laning. But despite his future success, Laning had not led such an easy life. After arriving in the Wilkes-Barre area to work for his grandfather at age 14, he would soon experience tragedy. His younger nephew shortly after his arrival would pass away when the barn he was playing in was struck by lightning and caught fire, trapping him inside. Shortly after this happening, one of his grandfather's factories would also mysteriously catch fire and burn to the ground as well. Despite a series of unfortunate events, the Laning's enterprises would eventually thrive, allowing Augustus to inherit land from his mother on what is today Wells Street. Eventually, he would build a home at 46 South Wells Street in 1861 and live there until 1865 when he eventually sold his home and business. He would take his last breath in 1875. The land in which Laning built the home on, as many locals would say, was soaked in turmoil and blood, having been the site of numerous wars and conflicts between Native American tribes, as well as European settlers and Native tribes. From the late 19th century to the mid 20th century, the house went through a series of sheriff sales, which were a type of public auction, and would eventually sell for just one dollar at auction in May of 1939, a little over twenty dollars in today's money. Although tragedy befell the Laning family, especially early on in Augustus's life, any happenings within the home weren't documented if they did occur. As far as we know, no death had taken place up until this time, but it certainly starts to snowball as the years progress. In 1940, the person who had purchased the home so cheaply at auction would breathe their last breath by their own hand, as would the next person who purchased the home via auction in 1950, almost exactly 10 years apart to the day. After these mysterious deaths, there would be four more that would take place on the premises. The other three I was unable to dig up additional details on. However, the most notable was the fourth, a priest who was 54 years old and in relatively good health, had been walking past the home in passing. When he glanced at the home, we don't know exactly what he saw or experienced, but he fell to the ground and died almost instantly from a heart attack right in the front yard. The home would be a revolving door for quite some time, 
sometimes vacant, sometimes with occupants, but only for a short time. In March of 1975, a 27-year-old radio DJ by the name of Walker Bennett and his wife Mary Ann purchased the home and then moved into the house from New Haven with their two daughters. Almost as soon as they moved into the house, bizarre activity began to manifest. The family began to hear banging and scratching sounds coming from inside the walls. Thinking at first they had some kind of a rodent problem, Walker followed the noise and traced it back to a particular bedroom wall. He then knocked the wall down, but instead of being greeted by this supposed rodent problem, he instead saw a small, glimmering tin box instead. After removing the box, he felt a strange presence. Upon opening it, its contents were very weird to say the least. It contained a red ribbon, a cross made of tied together chicken bones, and a human molar. The first thing that struck him was that this looked like some kind of a hex or curse, but not wanting to alarm his family, he would dispose of the items, but the activity nonetheless would continue to persist. By 1976, the scratching and knocking had continued, but soon the family began to see otherworldly beings as well. On one particularly cold February morning, Bennett would hear a series of bangs and scratches on his front door. Upon slowly opening it to see just who was there, he would be shocked. Standing at the front door was the translucent figure of a man with a cane with a vicious and crooked smile. Freaked out with his heart racing, he quickly slammed the door and tried to make sense of the interaction. Within seconds, he reopened the door, only to find that there was nothing there. As the days ticked by, the activity intensified. The scratches and banging noises now seemed to be originating from the attic. They now were also joined by disembodied screams, some seeming to be male, others female, and some were a mix of both. In the months to come, the activity would be coupled with moaning and groaning sounds, whispering voices, and the sounds of weeping coming from inside the walls, all still tracing back to the attic. Coupled with these new developments were the sounds of heavy footsteps on the wooden floors. The entire family would also see several apparitions. Notably, they would experience the ghostly figure of a young woman in a nightdress drifting throughout the house. Her dress seemed to be old, like those of the Victorian era. Whenever she was seen, following her would be drips or spots of blood, either on the floor or on the walls. Once she began to be seen, there was a putrid, rotting type of stench that became present in the house, traveling from room to room. It was, however, usually the worst in the kitchen and living room. Not wanting to further frighten the girls, the Bennets met with each other to discuss all of the bizarre happenings, and they finally had to admit that they had purchased a haunted house. Haunted by what exactly? They couldn't be sure. Shortly after this revelation, the family began to suffer from an unexplainable physical illness, one that left them drained at all times, exhausted and aching. The doctors couldn't diagnose it, leaving the family only to continue to suffer with the symptoms. Alongside this, whether it was a result of the illness on an individual basis or the haunting itself, the whole family seemed to be thrown into a deep, dark well of depression, submerged in its black waters, leaving them feeling hopeless. Things would begin to escalate further when in January of 1977, Walker and his wife would witness one of their daughters be pushed down the stairs, but to their amazement, she didn't fall and crumple on the various steps. Instead, she floated almost in slow motion, until she landed on her feet at the bottom of them, unharmed. 
Not knowing what to make of this, the adults in the house weren't getting much sleep, and their condition continued to get worse. They would soon reach out to the church for help and guidance. Soon a Catholic priest would come out and bless the home, trying to quell whatever supernatural forces that were wreaking havoc upon the Bennets. But these efforts were to no avail. If anything, after he left, the activity seemed to get worse. Ultimately, in March of 1978, the family who had been sound asleep in the night was woken up by the sound of thunder crashing, except there wasn't a storm outside. What followed this massive sound was a deluge of paranormal manifestations. Footsteps were pounding across the floor and in the attic above them. The attic door was being pounded on from the other side. Their dishes in their kitchen were being removed from their cabinets as they opened and slammed by themselves and thrown onto the floor, shattering them. Amongst the chaos was the scratching and banging on the front door, coupled with the sounds of a child weeping coming from inside of the walls, following them as they ran throughout the house. After enduring almost three years inside the home, the Bennets finally fled this night, leaving with just the clothes on their backs. They left all of their belongings behind. After the family found temporary arrangements, they immediately tried to sell the home as it was, but had no luck finding a buyer. After several months, Walker Bennett reached out to a local newspaper in hopes of sharing the family's story anonymously to find help or a buyer to get them out of this haunted hell. In the interview under the pseudonym of Bucky Johnson, he claimed that he was now $40,000 in debt as a result of the family fleeing and being unable to live in the house and then being unable to sell the house, and that he had developed a drinking problem and now chain-smoked as a result of the trauma and stress that he had endured. He also stated that he and the rest of the family were in therapy in hopes of eventually putting the past behind them. Several neighbors near the home were also interviewed, with some saying that they had never seen or heard anything, and others saying that they always had an odd feeling whenever passing by the house. The article was then published on Halloween of 1979. Perfect timing for a local and terrifying story, no doubt. Following the initial publicity, word eventually made its way to Ed and Lorraine Warren, famed paranormal investigators and demonologists who had just covered another haunting known as the Amityville Horror just three years before. The couple made a visit to the Wells Street house in March of 1980 but by this time, the bank had repossessed the home from the Bennets due to their inability to make further mortgage payments on the home. So the Warrens were unable to enter the house due to it being entirely locked up for this reason. Lorraine, however, would say that she sensed a terrible despair emanating from the house and that the effect it must have had on those who lived there must have been very negative. Several years later, the house would be purchased by a woman named Catherine Watkins from the bank for $20,000 in August of 1982. Her purchase subsequently prompted another newspaper article to be written. When asked, she told reporters that she was unafraid of the rumors surrounding the house and didn't fear any ghosts that could be there. She moved in with her two children shortly after her purchase. And whether it was sheer determination, stubborn nature, or something else, she lived in the house for the next 30 years until her death on October 26th of 2012. Although shortly after moving in and over the decades to come, she and her family also experienced unexplained phenomena, such as objects moving by themselves, their beds shaking, lights and appliances turning on and off by themselves, and seeing those ghosts that Catherine insisted she wasn't afraid of, such as the woman in what looked like Victorian-style clothing. Her daughter would inherit the home after Catherine's passing, 
and would place the home up for sale, where it was then purchased by a ghost hunter by the name of Tim Woods in December of 2013. Rather than repair, sell, or live in the property he had just purchased, Woods only wanted to investigate the paranormal activity that was taking place there. With his team of fellow investigators, they would record hours of content in the home and capture what they believed to be numerous supernatural manifestations. People who have joined him in the investigations have been known to have scratches manifest on their skin and have their clothing tugged on by unseen hands. Tim would later state that the Wells house is one of the scariest haunted locations that he had ever investigated due to the numerous ghost sightings that were caught on tape and demonic attacks that occurred while he was there. He said, It is our conclusion based upon our documented research that the house is haunted by a demonic presence that cannot be removed, nor is it safe for anyone to live in. The strangeness of the house on Wells Street doesn't end here. In the early hours of Wednesday, July 25th of 2018, police were called to the home to catch an intruder. Someone was outside of the house trying to get in. When authorities arrived, they apprehended a man in his 30s who was caught in the act of prying the wooden boards off the back door of the property. He had a 24-inch sword tied to his back, had brass knuckles and a pocket knife in his pockets, and was carrying a Bible. The man seemed out of it to say the least, but claimed that he was trying to hunt for ghosts. Upon going through his rucksack, police also found a loaded shotgun with 10 shells alongside of it. He would be arrested and charged with numerous offenses as a result of the episode. Although we don't know who, it seems that the home was sold in 2020 to new owners and at half the price that Woods had paid for it. There also doesn't appear to be any sort of a mention of it being haunted. Its listing reads like this. A home full of historical intrigue. With some TLC, you can bring new life to this four-bedroom beauty. As soon as you step over the threshold, you'll realize there is truly something out of this world with this home and its craftsmanship. A very fitting spin, if you ask me. I hope the new occupants are living peacefully, although given the home's infamous story and past, seems highly unlikely. But the listing was right about one thing, though. The home certainly has lots of historical intrigue. And you can bring new life into this four-bedroom beauty. Because as soon as you step over the threshold, you'll realize there's truly something out of this world with this home. Or should we say, in this home, that's been watching and waiting for some new life to engorge itself on. Could an item, if given enough energy, devotion, and focus, begin to take on a life of its own? Could it begin to exhibit human-like characteristics, as if it has been imbued with or contains some kind of soul or entity inside of it? This act of magic has been practiced by multiple religions and cults throughout the ages. This is just one very strange example that it could indeed be possible. After a gracious gift was placed into the arms of a little girl, tragedy would strike, and what follows would continue to haunt the family, the citizens of the village, and would soon cross far beyond the barriers of land and sea. This is the untold story of Akiku, the haunted Japanese doll, and the bizarre paranormal force that possessed it. Japan is a very mystical and spiritual place, a place where the souls of the past seem to interact with the living. Such places where this spiritual energy seems to be most visible is throughout many of Japan's spiritual temples. Home to many religions, the two main ones being Buddhism and Shintoism, thousands of temples exist all over the country. 
but one in particular houses a spiritual artifact that has a tragic backstory and an even more terrifying story that continues to be written to this day. Located in Hokkaido, Japan, at the Meninji Buddhist Temple, is a doll with a bizarre and tragic backstory indeed. Although there are several origin stories of how the doll came to be and how the temple became its final living space, so to speak, all of them have most of the main details in common. Therefore, I'll be telling the most agreed upon origin story to try and be as true to the legend as I can. The year is 1918 in Hokkaido, Japan, and a 17-year-old boy by the name of Ikigi Suzuki is in search of a gift for his little sister's birthday. As he pursues the different vendors and small shops, something soon catches his attention. In one of the store windows, he spots a small, childlike doll wearing a traditional Japanese kimono. Knowing that he had finally found something his sister will love, Ikiki quickly purchases the doll and makes his way back home through the countryside. As the family celebrates their little girl's birthday, Okiku is presented with the doll, and almost immediately, as soon as her eyes meet hers, she falls in love with him. The two from this point become inseparable. Wherever Okiku is, her doll is right by her side. She combs her hair, bathes her, dresses her, and treats her as if she was her little sister. The two even share meals and sleep side by side. The joy that the doll brought Okiku must have filled Ekiki's heart with such happiness, but soon that happiness would change to tragedy. One hot day, as the little girl played outside with her doll, she was bitten by a mosquito. This benign insect bite would soon manifest itself into a horrible case of malaria. Although the family did everything they could possibly do, Okiku would pass away, scared and gasping for air as she clutched her special doll all the way until the moment she took her last breath. Devastated, the Suzukis planned to have their little girl buried with the doll since she loved it so much, but unfortunately, due to either governmental or religious oversight at the time, this wasn't an option. Instead, after they had laid Okiku to rest, the doll would be placed on a small family shrine located within the living quarters of their home as a tribute of sorts to their late daughter and their love for her. But shortly after the doll was placed on the shrine, very strange things began to happen. Ikiki, upon walking past the shrine one day, noticed that the doll's hair seemed significantly longer than what it had been when it was placed there. The hair, which was originally shoulder's length on the doll itself, and black, was now overgrown, with differing shades of brown hair also coming through and splitting at the ends. Finding this bizarre to say the least, he brought the discovery to his parents' attention, and unsure of what else to do, they trimmed the doll's hair. As the days came and went, the family began to have distressing dreams at night of their departed Okiku. Sometimes she would be scared and alone in the darkness, calling out to them, only being recognized by her voice. Other times, she would blame them for what happened to her. Each member of the family at differing times had these dreams, and they would soon lead all of them to believe that Akiku's soul wasn't peacefully resting. These disturbing dreams soon became all the stranger when the doll, which they began to refer to as a Kiku in their daughter's honor, would appear by their bedsides following these nightmares. One such incident involved the father of the family waking up in a cold sweat, only to be met face to face with the blank and lifeless stare of the doll. Unsure of what was taking place, the Suzukis turned to their faith after contacting a local Buddhist priest and having a cleansing ritual be performed on their home and the doll, the activity seemed to grow and become stronger. Accompanying their ever-frequent nightmares and random movements of the doll, 
the chilling events grew into full-blown spiritual manifestations. During their waking life, they soon began to hear banging noises all throughout the house and the whispers of a little girl. Strange disembodied voices, varying from high-pitched, like those of a child, to the low groans of something unexplainable, began to be heard. Their lights began to flicker on and off, and the paranormal activity seemed to happen more frequently as the calendar ticked closer to the birth and death dates of Akiku. These strange and terrifying happenings would continue over the course of the next 20 years, with multiple religious priests and shamans being contacted, and all coming to the same conclusion that after the cleansings failed time and time again, that the restless spirit of Akiku now inhabited the doll she once loved so much. Finally, needing a major change and unable to deal with the ever-intensifying spiritual presence that seemed to haunt their home, the Suzukis relocated to a different district. Believing the doll to be the source of their various ailments and emotional torture that they had endured over the last two decades, they had no desire to take it with them. The family had reached the conclusion that if their daughter's soul wasn't at peace, what could perhaps be helping to fuel Okiku's power or magic was the close proximity of her grave to their home where the doll resided. So in order to distance the doll from the grave, the family approached the Meninji Buddhist temple in Hokkaido, and over the years, the doll's reputation for being haunted had spread throughout the community and indeed the majority of the country. This was more than likely due to the various interactions between the spiritual community and the Suzuki family. Finding the doll to be mesmerizing and possibly a unique opportunity to commute and interact with the dead if the stories were true, the leaders and priests of the Meninji Temple agreed to home Okiku permanently. As with many legends, we find lots of details to be exaggerated over time and perhaps some of the details to not be true at all. And this is what the priests were originally thinking, that perhaps due to grief, the family was dealing with other spiritual ailments, perhaps unrelated to the doll, or causing the doll to be a vessel of sorts for restless spirits. However, as the years came and went, as Akiku now called the temple her home, they began to slowly but surely experienced the same strangeness the Suzuki's had for all of those years. Okiku's hair continued to grow, and this baffled the priests. They would eventually have the hair trimmed and tested, and the hair was said to belong to a little girl. They found that the entity seemed to be appeased when her hair was trimmed and combed, and this led to less activity for a time, but the same activity, the knocking, banging, and disembodied voices would soon plague the temple as well, and Okiku's power only seemed to grow. Any priest who seemed skeptical of the doll or attempted to cleanse it themselves soon had their dreams haunted as well, turning their sleep into restless fits. Their homes and rooms soon also began to manifest the very same activity that the temple was now exhibiting with no remedy seeming to work, the leaders turned to appeasement instead, hoping that gestures of goodwill would keep the entity at bay. As years turned to decades, and as we've come into the 21st century, the priests of multiple generations now have overseen and cared for the doll known as Akiku. And though some of the more violent activity has faded, the general consensus is that she is now just as powerful as she was, or is perhaps more powerful, as she's continued to age. It seems like as the more her fame and notoriety grows, the more visitors she has, the stronger she becomes. She continues to invade the dreams of those who come to visit her, and her hair is growing faster and more frayed. She is said to drive tourists mad who doubt her, with many people even reporting that besides seeing her strange hair and feeling a malevolent presence when visiting her, they've also had her stalk and appear in their dreams. 
Some more disturbing and recent reports have even suggested that her mouth is slowly opening and that if you dare to peer inside of it, you may just catch a glimpse of baby-like teeth sprouting from her porcelain gums, as if whoever or whatever she is is slowly turning to flesh and bone. The paranormal displays of her power continue to occur as well. Her permanent home located within the Menijin Temple is her own private shrine where she sits in a small wooden box on display. It is here that she watches and waits for anyone and everyone who dares to play with fire and invoke the power of the entity known as Okiku. But what are your thoughts? Was Akiku the girl trapped inside of the doll? In my opinion, although her spirit would be much older now, at the time of her death, she was either close to or was three years old, and no person at that age is capable of true malice, to the point to where she would become aware enough to begin to blame her parents and then torment them for decades to come. As children, our parents or our family are our entire world. So I find it incredibly difficult to think that these bizarre happenings were the result of her soul being restless and imbuing the doll. What I find more likely, and all the more interesting really, is the thought of invocation or the imbuing of the doll, like a conduit or a vessel of sorts. Akiku the girl was, as they said, inseparable from this doll. She fed it, bathed it, took naps with it, and everything else a small child would do with that wonderful imagination that they have. But could all of this dedication and focus, accompanied with the tragedy that took place, allow for a portal to open for an entity, whether non-human or restless human spirit, to inhabit the doll? And by non-human, I mean a demon. This would make sense to me. Something that enjoys and grows more powerful off of pain and misfortune, or the emotional torment of others. As it causes the pain, it feeds off of it and grows ever stronger. This would not only explain the malevolent manifestations of whatever entity is present, but would also explain the still present force and the alleged ever growing power of it. And depending on the entity's strength, it could also explain why the cleansings thus far have failed. However, if you find yourself taking a trip to Japan anytime soon, or you happen to call Japan home, if you find yourself in Hokkaido, you may want to steer clear of the Menijin Temple, because if you don't, the entity that inhabits the doll known as Okiku may just use you as its next feeding source, where it'll begin to plague your dreams, making you twist and turn, sweat and fear as it grows ever stronger and attempts to cross from its world into ours, making our plane of existence its permanent residence. After a flood destroys their home, a family is forced to relocate to a new home, which they believe is going to be a fresh start for them. However, it turns out to be a fresh new hell instead. From demonic attacks, nightmarish visuals, and terrifying manifestations. This is one haunting story you won't want to miss. This is the untold story of the Smurl haunting in Pennsylvania and the monstrous creature that stalked its walls. The timeline of events is rough at best, but I have done my best to make the most coherent retelling of the story. So please, keep that in mind. Raging floods as a result of Hurricane Agnes have destroyed the homes of many families, and one such family was the Smurls. The Smurl family consisted of Janet and Jack Smurl and their four young children, Heather, Shannon, Karen, and Dawn. With their home destroyed in the Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania area, feeling as if they had been uprooted and tossed about like the rushing waters that took their house. The Smurls decide to temporarily relocate to West Pitson, where Jack's parents currently lived. 
After explaining the situation and staying with the couple for a short time, they were surprised and ultimately blessed when Jack's parents proposed an idea to them. They had found an old duplex, a bit of a fixer-upper, also in West Pitson. The two of them could live on one side, and Jack, Janet, and the kids on the other. That way, they could look out for one another and, of course, spend more time together. Not in a position to or wanting to say no, Jack and Janet humbly accepted their offer. But all too soon, they would be confronted with the question, was this blessing truly a curse? With Jack's parents paying for them all to move into the new house, they soon find themselves rehomed and living in the newly purchased duplex. Located on Chase Street there in West Pitson, although the home would need some work, the neighborhood seemed friendly and inviting, a good place to raise a family. The family collectively puts their efforts into repainting, retooling, and other repairs, but in no time, the slightly run-down home was feeling fresh, vibrant, and modern, making the Smurls feel ever more at home and hopeful for the future. However, this would not last forever. For it seemed that each time they banged a hammer, each time they drove a nail into a wall, and with every drop of paint, they woke something up within the house itself, something that perhaps had been slumbering there for quite some time. During this time, small episodes of strangeness began to manifest. Seeming rather benign at first, tools began to disappear only to reappear hours later in different spots. Old stains that covered the walls began to seep through the fresh coats of paint, and several appliances in their kitchen had mysteriously caught fire even though they were unplugged. Along with these oddities, the family would also begin to smell awful odors that overwhelmed the entire house, like an omnipresent floating cloud of rotting meat that hung over them, only to disperse mere moments later after being detected. But despite these weird events, the family didn't really think much of it. They were just thankful to have a roof over their heads. Jack and Janet continued to rebuild their lives. Jack, fortunately, had since gotten a better job than the one he had had previously and was promoted during this time. He was also able to coach his daughter's softball team. The children had reacclimated to a new school and were getting good grades. And Janet had become pregnant with baby number five and also helped organize an anti-drunk driving group at the local high school. And Jack's parents were doing great as well. But all of this positivity, unfortunately, would not last. By 1974, things began to change for the Smurls. It began when Mary Smurl, Jack's mother, suffered a heart attack. This led to the entire family struggling to make ends meet. And whether it was a result of the renovations or something else, something paranormal had began to manifest and make itself known. It began when Janet began to hear the voice of her mother-in-law, who shortly after her heart attack was now at home and recovering. Doing what she could to help her, she would hear her name being called out from Mary and would rush to her aid to help her with anything and everything that she could possibly need. But the strange thing was, Mary at times would either be unconscious, sleeping, or wouldn't have had called for her at all. Attributing this bizarre phenomena to stress at first, she writes it off. However, Mary soon starts experiencing her own strangeness. She too, as if the words had come from Janet's mouth herself, would hear her name being called. Only when confronted, Janet would have no idea what she was talking about. But that wasn't all, of course. The stains that had previously been painted over and were thought to be covered began to seep through yet again, and new stains began to appear as well, with several appearing on the hardwood floors of the home. As the days progressed, the oldest small child soon began to experience the presence as well. She would often be woken up in the dead of night, 
frozen with fear and unable to move. She would see translucent figures standing above her or at the edge of her bed, staring and watching her. And although it wasn't exclusive to the midnight hour, the activity seemed to pick up at night. Often, when Jack was at work or gone, Janet began to have violent and sickening encounters with a being that she couldn't see. She began to be molested by an unseen force. These interactions left her hysterical, feeling violated and unclean. Trying to come to terms with what was happening to them, the family's luck continued to worsen. Additional appliances, including a TV set, went up in flames, causing smoke and fire damage to the home on several occasions. And unlike the TV, the other appliances were not plugged in in order for the family to save money, which makes it all the more mysterious. On top of this, Several water pipes, which were fairly new after the family had initially renovated the home, began to leak, not only causing water damage to the house, but adding to their financial woes as well. The string of bad luck would continue for the Smurls, and by 1977, the activity in the home became much more aggressive. The family's radio began to turn itself on and off, typically at strange hours and almost always when the family was trying to sleep. The sinks in their bathrooms began to turn themselves on, pouring what little money they had left literally down the drain, and their toilets began to flush by themselves. Along with this activity, the sounds of footsteps began to be heard all throughout the house, and even on the insides of the walls. Drawers began to open and close by themselves. And coupled with these happenings was again the stench of rotting meat, what the family would begin to describe as the dead smell, except instead of dissipating almost as soon as it was detected before or in one particular area of the house. The smell would permeate all throughout the house and would linger for minutes or sometimes even hours. Up until this point, besides seeing things being moved, dealing with the stains, pipes, and appliances. Jack hadn't been targeted, so to speak, by whatever paranormal force that was now fully awake within the Smurl residence. But one night, when he was trying to get some sleep after a long day's work, his side of the sheets were pulled from his body, and the sensation of dozens of hands touching and grabbing him ensured that not only was he not going to get the rest that night due to sheer terror, but that perhaps his wife had been telling the truth. Janet, shortly after moving into the house, had become pregnant, and this time had given birth to two baby girls, expanding the Smurl family to six children. Shortly after the twins were brought home, it seemed like whatever presence that had been woken up was making itself known. It became more aggressive, more vindictive, as if it was jealous or hated the living. One morning, while the majority of the children were at school and napping, and the rest of the adults were out, Janet was headed to the kitchen to pour herself a freshly brewed cup of coffee. As she turned around the corner, her blood ran cold. Standing in the middle of the kitchen, with a stain seeming to materialize directly underneath it. It was a translucent figure with hollow eyes. Frozen in place upon seeing it, it was as if she blinked and whatever this creature was, was gone. Was this what was responsible for the multitude of paranormal happenings within their house? As time progressed, Janet again would continue to hear her name being called out no one else was there, over and over and over again. Strangely, as it was before in the beginning, the voices would often sound like her mother-in-law Mary, and even after double or triple checking sometimes to make sure she wasn't losing her mind, Mary would be nowhere to be found. Janet truly was alone. 
Other strange things that were heard during this time would be heard from the other side of the duplex. Couples do argue, and some fight. That just tends to happen to most, unfortunately. But these fights were something else. Jack's parents began to hear yelling and screaming, sometimes even items breaking, coming from the other side of the duplex where Jack and Janet lived. These fights became so violent that not only did they think their marriage was collapsing, but they began to become concerned for Janet and the children's safety. One night, Jack's father couldn't take it anymore. He walked from their front door to the other side, and with the fight still raging, he threw the door open, only to be greeted with silence. The entire family was asleep. Not knowing what to make of this discovery, he simply left, bewildered. But the supposed audio of the fights would continue. Shortly after the bizarre discovery, Mary would experience something that almost gave her another heart attack. One evening, while her husband was still at work and she was alone on their side of the duplex, she began to hear her name being whispered and it sounded like Janet, but it was right within earshot or several feet of where she had been. Weirded out as most of us would be, she began to make her way towards the voice that was calling out to her. And that's when she saw it, standing in her living room with a stain seeping underneath its feet was the same translucent being that Janet had claimed she had seen just a short while ago. And terrifyingly, its mouth was mimicking Janet's voice and calling out her name. Frozen in terror at first, with her heart racing, Mary ran to the door, exited, and immediately went into Jack and Janet's door, absolutely petrified with fear. The talks that followed this event in particular is what led to most of the individual experiences being laid out in the open for everyone to know. They would all come to the realization that whatever force that was in their house was not friendly. Shannon Smurl, who was only seven years old during this time, would be the next target. One day, as she casually walked through the kitchen and into the dining room, a large glass light fixture fell and crashed into her cutting her and raising the alarm bells for the entire house. Again, it seemed like the paranormal being or force hated life and now was possibly trying to end it if the opportunity presented itself. Scared but strapped for cash, they were all seemingly stuck in what was supposed to be their fresh start, but instead at this point was becoming their fresh hell. Shannon would continue to experience strangeness of her own as well. In her diary, and later, she would recount that oftentimes she would wake up and find herself floating above her bed, literally levitating several feet above her bed. Some nights, while floating, she would suddenly be thrown across the room and into a wall with so much force that she thought she would be crushed. The climax of these attacks on Shannon happened one night when she woke up to find herself floating once again, but instead of being let back down or smacked into a nearby wall, her door was flung open and she was thrown out of her room and down the stairs. Her parents heard this happen and rushed towards the screams of their little girl to find her absolutely hysterical and in pain. Fortunately, however, she would be okay, physically, after this event in particular. Another unfortunate soul that would be targeted in the Smurl duplex was the family's German shepherd, Simon. Simon would be found floating in the air, confused and concerned. And this new development and activity was not just exclusive to Shannon or their beloved dog. Alongside the intensified attacks on Janet, she too would begin finding herself woken up in the middle of the night, floating in the air, and sometimes, horrifically, without control of her body. 
she would then also be assaulted. However, Jack wasn't always gone at this time. Frequently at this point, he would be home and sleeping beside her, but could never seem to wake up as if he was being kept asleep or in a state of paralysis while the events took place. Coupled along these intense and abhorrent manifestations came activity that was plain creepy. Not a day would go by without the family hearing scratching noises coming from within the walls, or deep, drawn-out breaths coming from behind them, feeling the exhale upon their necks, making the hairs on their entire body stand on end. Jack at times after a hard day's work would like to unwind and decompress by watching some TV in the living room. On occasion, he would fall asleep to whatever was on before eventually waking back up and making his way to bed. However, this night, he found himself awake and coherent, but unable to move, as if he was paralyzed or stuck in some kind of a glue trap like an insect. Unable to break free, he glanced around the room trying to discover the source of his distress. It was here that he was met face to face with this being, this demon that seemed to be plaguing their lives. The creature grabbed him from the back and slammed him onto the floor, began repeatedly bashing his head into the hard wood below before disappearing. After this, Jack didn't watch TV to unwind anymore. As a matter of fact, no one could unwind. They were petrified at whatever was taking place in the house. Unable to afford to move between all the adults, and seemingly stuck between a rock and a hard place, scared and unable to figure out what to do, they began to seek help wherever they thought they could find it. It was now winter, and the family, besides their daily duties, spent most of their time indoors. While watching TV one afternoon, they saw an interview with Ed and Lorraine Warren, world-renowned paranormal experts and demonologists. Not being particularly religious and unsure of where to turn, they decided to reach out to the couple and were surprised when they made contact. After speaking with them for some time, the Warrens agreed to come to their house to meet in person with the Smurls and to investigate. And within a week, that's exactly what they did. After an initial meeting with the family, hearing their testimonies in person, and after exploring the home, the Warrens decide it seems genuine and it's worth investigating. And they begin their usual process of bringing in their team for an extended period of time to document and mull over potential solutions for the family. After several months of the documenting team living with the family, and experiencing strange activity themselves, such as furniture stacking on top of itself, along with several other previously mentioned happenings, such as the stains and attacks on individual members of the home. Lorraine finally comes to the conclusion, after having a vision within the house, that they were dealing with a total of four entities. One was that of an old woman, who she believed was not a threat to the family, but was simply being held against her will within the home. One was a younger woman who was angry and resentful and could be violent. And the other was a man who took the life of his wife and his lover and had been hanged in the same spot a hundred years earlier by a vengeful crowd. The final entity was that of a demon. And this demon not only was strong in keeping the other three spirits under its heel of control, but would use them to strengthen itself and wreak havoc upon the family to sow discord, anxiety, and fear, all things to which it could feed on and continue to grow stronger. After reaching this conclusion and having gathered sufficient information, the Warren spoke to Father McKenna, who was a Vatican-sanctioned exorcist and had worked with them over 50 times on separate cases in the past, so he was no stranger to the demonic. But after his arrival and attempted exorcism, 
the activity only increased in aggression and hostility, and for whatever reason, it was not tied to the home anymore, but rather the family members themselves. Jack began to experience horrific visions of the creature at work, as did his father, and alongside the continued paranormal activity taking place at their home, their daughter Karen fell seriously ill with a fever that the doctors couldn't diagnose at the time, and almost died. Several of the other girls were also visited by the sickening presence at night, as Janet also was and continued to be. The demon also began to physically attack the family more often, causing stinging scratches and cuts on their bodies at random times, as well as deep and bruising bite marks. Still trying to help the family rid themselves of this creature, and fearing for the family's continued torment, the Warrens convinced the Smurls to allow a second exorcism to take place, and McKenna again would visit and conduct a second exorcism months later, in the early spring. During this exorcism ritual, EVPs were recorded, which when played back after the fact, would reveal multiple entities laughing at and berating them for their efforts. Ed Warren would also be choked during this visit and would be incapacitated for multiple days after. Unfortunately, the second exorcism also failed, leading to even more violent manifestations of evil. Trying to get away from it all for even just a few days, the family went on a camping trip to the Pocono Mountains, but the demon would follow them there as well, tormenting them wherever they went, allowing for no rest, no decompression, and no peace. Upon returning to their home following this trip, and getting even more desperate, they decided to reach out to a local TV show called People Are Talking to see if anyone could possibly help them. They did, however, remain anonymous during their interview, and this call for help, however, went unanswered, but the demon seemed to retaliate against them for it. Janet would once again be hurled against a wall, and Jack would experience something truly terrifying and new. As he woke up in the early morning to get ready for work before the sun had come up, a light rain tapped the glass of the windows outside. As he dressed himself and began to gather his things for his workday departure, he came down the stairs and was greeted by a disgusting and horrid creature. Standing in front of the door was a monstrous being whose head almost touched the ceiling. It resembled a horrible amalgamation of a man and a pig, standing upright on two legs. It screeched and rushed towards him, but as he fell backwards onto the stairs, hurting his back, the creature stood over him, face to face, snarling, before it disappeared. This manifestation disturbed and rattled Jack to his core. The same morning, shortly after Jack had left for work, because although terrified, he still had to provide for his family if they ever wanted to have a chance of escaping this hellscape of a home. Janet was woken up a short while later by a hand reaching up through her mattress and grabbing the back of her neck and pulling her towards it and choking her. After these events, horrific snarling noises, like that of a pig, could be heard coming from inside the walls. The time was now August of 1986, and the Smurls felt that the risk of ridicule did not outweigh the need for their story to reach a wider audience, so that somehow, somewhere, someone could possibly help them be freed from this torment. They would soon be granted an interview with the Wilkes Bar Sunday newspaper, but instead of someone reading and immediately coming to their aid, their home quickly became a tourist attraction instead. The press, skeptics, and curious onlookers alike began to visit the house and camp outside of it at all hours of the day and night, with some particularly weird people even coming up and staring into the home's windows themselves. Some of their neighbors who had seen and heard strange things coming from the small residence 
began to turn on them. They believed that the family was concocting some kind of a story to try and make money. Eventually, however, despite the torment inside and outside of the home now that they were experiencing, the Smurls would be contacted by a medium by the name of Mary Alice Rinkman, who offered to meet with them. Upon meeting the family and walking through the home, it was also Mary's conviction that there were four entities within the house, three human spirits, and one who had never been human, thus corroborating the Warren's beliefs about the situation as well. She would, however, take things a bit further. She identified the old woman by the name of Abigail, the murderous man as Patrick, and the violent and ill-tempered spirit as Patrick's wife, and the fourth entity, of course, could not be identified by name, but was indeed a very powerful demon. The press coverage, despite the ridicule and the positive acquaintance of Mary, also had pushed the Scranton Catholic Diocese into action as well. They offered to take over the investigation. In the meantime, the Warrens had not given up on the family, but rather had reached out to several more priests and had arranged for a mass exorcism to be conducted with four priests taking part, as well as multiple prayer groups. Alongside this, now Bishop McKenna came in for a third and final time and conducted an exorcism on the house for the family. And fortunately, the ritual, at least for a time, seemed to work, because following it, there were no disturbances for about three months. But as winter set in that year, just before Christmas of 1986, Jack would again see the creature that had tormented him for all of those years. This time, however, it beckoned him to allow it to take over. But clutching a rosary in his pocket that had been gifted to him by the church, he prayed as hard as he could. And thankfully this time, the demon vanished, never to be seen again. However, the putrid smells and violent manifestations would return and continue day in and day out. Frustrated, hopeless, and exhausted, the Smurls by this point had finally saved enough to be able to leave this dreaded duplex on Chase Street and decided they needed the closest thing to a fresh start as they could get. So when they finally did move, they moved to a completely new town one where the ridicule would not find them. But like the terrible pattern shown before, the demon did not seem to be tied to the property, but rather the family. The activity started back up almost as soon as they had moved in and laid their heads to rest in their new home. It would take some time, but in 1988, the church finally sanctioned a fourth exorcism, but this time at their new residence and this finally seems to have given the family peace. A few things I would like to mention, however, are these. From my own personal experience and many other stories I've researched, it seems like renovations, particularly on older homes, can wake up dormant spirits or hauntings. Perhaps this is what happened to the Smurls. It's hard to tell if the assaults were one or multiple demonic entities, but if they did truly exist, how did they get in the home to begin with? And my guess is that the collection of negative energy attracts them, like moths to a flame. Perhaps they enjoy or feed off of human suffering. This would only make sense to me considering that they hate humans and refuse to bow to them in the beginning. Perhaps once they're embedded in one's life, they continue to sow said suffering, to exploit and grow stronger, ultimately trying to take the human's life and their soul back with them to hell. I would also like to mention that scratching on a person and inside the walls, as well as disembodied breathing, are all signs of demonic infestation. And for one reason or another, having actually experienced this personally, seeing the manifestation of a pig-like demon or a creature, as well as hearing pig snarling coming from within the walls, is considered to be a serious, or incredibly strong sign of a very strong demonic infestation. As far as the initial activity, the seeping through of the stains, the sinks turning on, toilets flushing on their own, 
and leaky pipes. Those initially could be written off as poor skill when the work was initially done. But it seemed like with this story, all of these things were working perfectly fine for months before they all of a sudden, almost at the same time, began to go wrong while costing the family money that they didn't have. And money at the time seemed to be their main issue, as well as the paranormal. So perhaps the demon knew and exploited this to add to the misery it was feeding on. But truly, at the end of the day, the conclusion is yours to make. Was the Smurl haunting legitimate, or just another tale concocted for money, or inside the broken minds of individuals who claim to have experienced it? Let me know down in the comments below. They would eventually release a book about all they had experienced, called The Haunted, in 1988. But financials or how successful it was was never released, at least not from what I could find. But what I do know is this. It's extremely important to examine a situation from all angles just before diving into it. Although a place might seem like a fresh new start, it could indeed be your fresh new hell. And those renovations that you think are going to improve your quality of life could awaken something that has been watching and waiting. For a new host to attach itself to and feed upon until it can wear it down, rot, and eventually drag it back to the depths from where it came from. When you think of the paranormal realm, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Is it a haunted place, a person who's being tormented by unseen forces, or an object like a doll? that has seemingly taken on a life of its own, or perhaps a little of all three, and more. But have you considered that a vehicle could be haunted? Considering if objects could be haunted, it seems possible to me that this story may just convince you that something inhabits this vehicle in particular, something malevolent. This strange tale over the decades has seemed to take on a life of its own, and not only has it been requested, but deserves its very own rendition here on Mystery Archives. This is the haunting story of James Dean's cursed car and whether or not it continues to plague the lives of those who possess its parts. James Dean, both in the 50s at the height of his fame and even today, is widely considered a Hollywood icon. Born James Byron Dean in 1931, he was born into a humble background in Marion, Indiana, the only child of Mildred Wilson and Winton Dean. Growing up, he excelled in school both academically and athletically, playing varsity baseball and basketball, as well as becoming an avid student of drama. His efforts would eventually land him at UCLA in 1949 after his high school graduation, where he began to truly pursue his passion for acting. He had first started out as a pre-law major, but would soon switch his major to drama. His first role in college that truly made him consider becoming an actor was when he was selected out of a group of 350 other actors to portray Malcolm in the play Macbeth. Shortly after this, he also began acting in James Whitmore's workshop. Although he loved acting, his father didn't, and his choice of major would soon alienate the two from each other. But refusing to give up on his dreams, James would drop out of UCLA in January of 1951 to pursue a full-time career as an actor. It was during this time that he began to pay his dues, so to speak. First starring in a Pepsi commercial, then landing a series of walk-on roles in various movies, such as Fixed Bayonets, Sailor Beware, and Has Anybody Seen My Gal? While struggling to pay the bills whilst chasing his dreams, James also worked as a parking lot attendant at CBS Studios, where he would eventually meet Rogers Brackett, a radio director and agent who offered him professional advice and guidance to assist him in furthering his career. Brackett would open a major door for James, a starring role in the Broadway play See the Jaguar, which would indeed continue to open many other opportunities for the aspiring actor. Moving from walk-on roles in movies to several television appearances and soon a major role in a major film, 
he would finally receive his big break in 1953, where he starred in the movie East of Eden. It was here that his complexity as an actor and improv skills were finally able to shine. Almost immediately after East of Eden premiered, Dean would quickly pick up another and an even bigger role in Rebel Without a Cause, as well as another film called Giant following soon after. Rebel Without a Cause is what seemed to make Dean a cultural icon, becoming not only an admired actor to many, but a heartthrob as well to thousands. In 1954, shortly after East of Eden had concluded being filmed, James began to take an interest in auto racing. He purchased several vehicles for the hobby, including a Triumph Tiger T110 and a Porsche 356. James competed in his first professional event at Palm Springs Road Races, held in Palm Springs, California, where he achieved first place in the novice class and second place for the main event. He continued to race and would race at Bakersfield a month later, where he would take first in his class and third overall. Really taking to the motorsport, he hoped to compete in the Indianapolis 500, but his busy filming schedule unfortunately made this impossible. His final race would occur in Santa Barbara on May 30th, 1955. During this race, he was unfortunately unable to finish due to a blown piston. His racing career was then placed on hold by Warner Brothers, the studio in charge of the film Giant, until filming was finished. Dean would finish his scenes and while Giant was in post-production, with the ban lifted, he decided that he would race again. However, this time, he wanted something stronger and faster. On September 23, 1955, James purchased a new 1955 Porsche 550 Spider and brought it to the legendary flim flammer George Barris to have it personalized before his next race. During the customization process, he chose Tartan Seats, the number 130 emblazoned upon the hood, and the name Little Bastard painted on the back just underneath the Porsche emblem on the engine cover. Almost as soon as his car was done being customized and James began to drive it around, there was a series of omens that should have alerted him that something wasn't quite normal with Little Bastard. Later that day, on September 23rd, James was driving his new car around Los Angeles, where he met up with British actor Alec Guinness to show him his new toy. Almost immediately, Alec became very wary of the car. In his personal diary, he said this in regards to seeing it for the first time, and this is also a summary of what he told James himself in person that day. The sports car looked sinister to me, exhausted, hungry, feeling a little ill-tempered in spite of Dean's kindness. I heard myself saying in a voice that I could hardly recognize as my own, please never get in it. If you get in that car, you'll be found dead in it by this time next week. After being told that his car seemed sinister and that he would be found dead in it by this time next week, all James did was laugh. Exactly one week later, on September the 30th, James Dean and Rolf Wutereich, a former Luftwaffe pilot and factory trained Porsche mechanic, were at Competition Motors in Hollywood, preparing Little Bastard for racing that week at the Salinas Road Races in Salinas, California. The intent was for Dean to transport the car via a trailer to Salinas behind his 1955 Ford Country Squire with his photographer, Bill Hickman. But before it could be raced, the car needed some break-in miles on it to make sure everything was in working order. Rolf suggested driving the car to Salinas to break in the engine and familiarize himself with his new vehicle. He would also ride with him. After having a cup of coffee across the street from Competition Motors at 1.15 p.m., the group departed for Salinas. At 3.30 p.m., patrolman O.V. Hunter said he stopped and wrote Dean a ticket just south of Bakersfield, California for driving 65 miles per hour in a 55. Hickman, who was towing the trailer, would receive a ticket for 20 miles over the speed limit 
because he was towing a trailer in which the maximum speed allowed would have only been 45 miles per hour. The crew would then stop at Blackwell's Corner on Route 466 for drinks. Here they also met up with Lance Ravendlow and Bruce Kessler, two other racers who would also be competing in the Salinas Road Races. Once they had departed at about 5.15 p.m., Dean and Hickman drove west towards Paso Robles. A half an hour later, a black and white 1950 Ford Tudor Coupe was headed east on 466. The vehicle was being driven by a 23-year-old California Polytechnical student, a man with the strange name of Donald Turnipseed. Donald made a left on Route 41, and as he crossed the center line, Dean, who was traveling around 85 miles per hour, tried to avoid him. However, despite his best efforts, the two vehicles collided head on. The Ford Coupe upon the collision slid 39 feet down Route 466 in the westbound lane. Dean bore the brunt of the collision, but stayed within the car. Vuterreich, however, was thrown from the spider and was laying on the shoulder multiple feet away from the scene. Upon the arrival of emergency personnel, with Little Bastard completely totaled. They would have to pry James from the mangled vehicle using a crowbar. An unconscious and dying James Dean was then placed into the ambulance along with a heavily injured Rolf. The closest hospital was 30 miles away, and as the ambulance rushed towards Paso Robles War Memorial Hospital, they too, as if they had been stricken with the worst luck imaginable, would also be involved in a car accident. Despite the horrible circumstances surrounding the initial accident, the ambulance did eventually make its way to the hospital roughly 45 minutes later, and although it would take months of recovery, Rolf would live. But despite the emergency crew's best efforts, Dean, however, would be pronounced dead on arrival at 6.20 p.m. His final cause of death upon autopsy would be determined to be a broken neck and internal hemorrhaging as a result of the crash. He also had sustained multiple broken bones, including his legs, arms, and jaw, as well as multiple severe external lacerations. Donald Turnipseed, however, despite his vehicle also being totaled, walked away with barely a scratch. After his death, James Dean would be nominated for two Academy Awards in 1956 and 1957 for his roles in East of Eden and Giant. He would also become the first actor to posthumously win an Academy Award for one in 1956. Seemingly being cut down in his prime at the young age of 24, Dean's death was an unprecedented tragedy. But the story of Little Bastard, despite being crumpled in the crash, would be far from over. A man by the name of George Barris purchased the wrecked Porsche remnants for $2,500 later that year, likely with the intent to host some sort of an exhibit with it and to sell tickets. But after he purchased it, while transporting the remains, upon arriving at his shop, the car slipped off the trailer and broke the leg of his mechanic. Once it was secured in one of the shop's garages, in approximately one month's time, while Barris was arranging for the first exhibit to open, the garage housing the car mysteriously caught fire and burned to the ground. Even more mysterious, upon surveying the damage, the Porsche had sustained no damage from the fire itself. Barris would eventually arrange for a second exhibit, which was held at a local high school in conjunction with the California Highway Patrol, but this showing too was unexpectedly cut short. When the car was surrounded by onlookers and students, it suddenly fell off of its display and broke a young student's hip. Getting an eerie sense that something was off with this car, Barris then began to sell its parts. He would sell the engine to a man named Troy McHenry and the drivetrain to William Eskrid. The two used parts to build cars of their own and had even once raced one another, and both would experience horrendous accidents. During a street race, Troy would lose control of his vehicle, veer off the street, 
and slammed directly into a tree. The impact would kill him instantly. And shortly after Troy's tragedy, William, who was casually driving his vehicle containing the drivetrain of Little Bastard, suddenly had his wheels lock up for no reason. And upon turning while experiencing this, the car began to roll, leaving him critically injured in the crash. He, however, despite his injuries, would live. While parting out what was left of the car, Barris would also sell two of the Porsche's tires, which had been untouched since the accident that claimed Dean's life. After selling the tires, he also installed them on the customer's vehicle at his shop. However, upon driving home, both of them, not one or the other, but both simultaneously exploded, causing the driver to lose control and drive off the road. They would fortunately regain control of their vehicle and despite being shaken up, were unharmed. George Barris, after selling what parts he could, would continue trying to arrange exhibits for the remnants of the car to be shown. The third and final exhibit that was set to happen was going to be held by the Los Angeles chapter of the National Safety Council as a traveling display. However, the truck driver who was hired to transport Little Bastard to the exhibit on a flatbed truck, a man named George Barkas, would be involved in an accident while heading there. He would be ejected from his vehicle and would land to the side of the flatbed. And whether it was a failure of securing the remnants or something more sinister, he would be crushed and killed when the Porsche rolled off the flatbed and onto him. There would be other mishaps as the twisted Porsche would be loaned out to various exhibits across the country in the years to come. But when it was on loan to a safety exhibit in Miami, Florida in 1960, following the conclusion of the exhibit, as it was being hauled back to Los Angeles, the truck that was carrying what was left of the vehicle would once again be involved in a fatal crash, killing the driver. What remained of the Porsche known as Little Bastard vanished from the scene that day, and to this day, all these years later, it has never been seen again nor has any of its parts. Despite collectors and enthusiasts alike willing to put up big money for even a genuine scrap of its remains. But before we speculate on what could have happened to it, I would first like to give my take on the bizarre activity that surrounds this now infamous legend. To me, if there was ever something that could be considered cursed, this once prized Porsche of James Dean very much fits the bill given all that we've learned. But just why would it have been cursed? And how? These are questions that I've pondered while researching this topic. There of course doesn't seem to be a proper answer, or even a real speculated one that would genuinely make sense that I could find. There doesn't seem to be any crazy occult ties to anyone he was involved with, but one theory that I did come across could possibly explain why. But of course this is just a theory, I don't want people getting mad at me. James Dean, besides being an acclaimed actor by the young age of 24, was most definitely a heartthrob with the ladies. It's been rumored that among his various affairs with rich and powerful women, he also had multiple escapades per week. The theory I came across was this. Could it have been possible that some star-crossed lover or fling of Dean's could have placed a curse on him? Curses, of course, like anything paranormal in nature, are subject to a sense of belief in these kinds of things, or so most think. Perhaps Dean broke the heart of the wrong person. With Dean hitting the big time and also taking up car racing in between films or the filming of those films, perhaps one of his girlfriends, rather jealous or heartbroken, or both, placed a curse of sorts on him, either on him or something to do with his newfound love for motorsports. How this would have exactly imprinted specifically upon the newly purchased Porsche of 1955 goes far beyond my expertise, but it is the only explanation I could find that would remotely make sense, aside from a horrible string of unfortunate coincidences. And strangely enough, the man who hit Dean, having the name of Donald Turnipseed, 
Turnip seed, in my opinion, is all too close to turnip speed. It's kind of weird, don't you think? With all of the darkness surrounding this car, Rolf had a very tragic ending as well. Upon his post-rec recovery, he began to receive horrible letters from James Dean's fans, blaming him for the actor's death. This eventually led to a terrible drinking problem as he felt responsible for what had happened. He would eventually move back to Germany where he experienced many lows, including multiple divorces, and his final marriage, however, seemed to be at the lowest point in his life. Having been depressed for years, coupled with other psychological problems stemming from the guilt of the accident, with too much alcohol in his system, in 1969, Rolf attempted to end his fourth wife. He stabbed her 14 times with a kitchen knife while she slept. Afterwards, he attempted to take his own, but failed. He was, however, arrested and would spend a lengthy term in a mental institution instead of prison. This would also be his last and final divorce. He would for a short time bounce back as both a Porsche mechanic and would also be a racer himself once again. But again as well, he succumbed to psychological issues, falling back on hard times. In July of 1981, he signed a contract for 20,000 Deutschmarks for a feature in a TV show discussing the accident and the death of James Dean. As he contemplated what he was going to discuss, he would become heavily intoxicated, and later that night, he would crash his Honda Civic into the wall of a residence in Kupferzell. Ironically, like James, he too had to be cut from the wreck, and would be pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. Now where exactly could the remains of the Porsche have gone? The most likely explanation in my opinion had to have been bystanders who witnessed the crash. And my guess is that perhaps they didn't know exactly what they had, but rather saw dollar signs. This could perhaps explain why it didn't show back up. Perhaps people who owned the parts and or the vehicles with the parts didn't know what they indeed possessed. But what also makes this strange is that they've never shown back up at all. There is one transaxle that was rumored to be from James Dean's car that was found in a wooden box in rural Massachusetts, but from what I could find, it has yet to be confirmed as genuine. It was either that people didn't know what they had, or something terrible happened to them as well, and what remains they did possess, or parts that they had put in their cars, could have ended up scrapped somewhere, never to be seen again. Although I don't want to persuade you one way or another, with all the strange, dark, and terrible events that surround the Porsche 550 Spider, known as James Dean's Little Bastard, one certainly has to consider that there is something otherworldly or cursed surrounding this case. But is it a curse? Is it something evil? Or is it just a horrible string of coincidences? Let me know down in the comments below. Either way, this is one car I have absolutely no desire to see let alone ride in one that contains any piece of it. When a family moves into a new house, they discover its gruesome past and are met face to face with a grotesque horror. They must choose to fight or let their ever-growing fear consume them. Will they make it out alive or will evil triumph? This is the untold story of the terrifying Snydecker family haunting, better known as a haunting in Connecticut. Evil entities, specters of another world that create misery and sow discord to engorge and strengthen themselves. Are they simply figments of the human imagination, a byproduct of the human condition, if you will? This story, as well as many others that have been covered here on this channel, beg the question Do evil beings from another world truly exist? I'm not here to convince you either way. All that I ask is that you draw your own conclusions, because this story, like others, will make you truly wonder just what could be lurking in the shadows. The day is a cold one. Snow drifts down from the sky and covers everything in a layer of frozen powder. But colder still 
is the life-altering news the Snydecker family has just received. Their son Philip has been diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma at the age of 14. And unless something short of a miracle takes place to put the disease into remission, he will die in less than six months. He has already deteriorated from a strong and healthy boy to a ghost of his former self. For Philip to undergo experimental treatments, he has to see a specialist located over 300 miles away from the family home and a hospital located in Connecticut. As his treatments begin, the family soon realizes that the eight-hour daily round trips are unsustainable, not just for the family members taking Philip, but more importantly to Philip himself, who is becoming weaker as a result of the cancer and the radiation. Wanting to do anything they can to lessen the burden and get their son closer to his doctors to give him a fighting chance, Alan and Carmen liquidate what is left of their assets as Alan puts in a transfer to move to another site with his company and into the state of Connecticut. As Alan handles the children at home, Carmen heads to Connecticut to attempt to find a suitable place to live for her family, but with two adults and four children altogether, this isn't the easiest of tasks to accomplish, given their budget. After dozens of appointments and dozens of refusals, the situation was becoming bleak. That was until she happened to drive by another house. As she contemplated what the future held, Carmen happened to drive by a large house with a for rent sign hanging in the front yard. Upon inquiring, she made her way inside to speak with the owner of the property. And although renovations were still taking place, and it would be a short while before the home was ready to live in, she was allowed to take a tour. Almost immediately, she fell in love with the home. Its freshly laid hardwood flooring and inviting interior seemed to call out to her, and with four bedrooms, two upstairs, and two downstairs, and plenty of room for everyone, it seemed like the perfect fit, and more importantly, it was just minutes away from the hospital, which was the primary factor, of course. Fearing that the large size of the house would be far outside of their budget, Carmen decided to cut to the chase and asked the property owner just how much the rent would be, and as if a gift from the universe itself, it just happened to fit their budget perfectly. After a handshake the first day, before too long, the terms are inked, and the family begins to move in. Finally, after all of these months of struggle and worry, they have now secured a fighting chance for some kind of normalcy for the entire family, and an even better chance for their son Philip to beat his cancer. Several weeks later, as the children are staying with relatives, Carmen and Alan begin to move things into the house. Just seeing the home for the first time, Alan agrees that his wife did a great job given the situation and that the house would be a good fit for the family. That was until the couple looked into the basement. A small room was now present that Carmen hadn't seen on her initial walkthrough, perhaps one that was being renovated at the time. As her and Alan opened the door and walked into it, they began to notice strange tools that they had never seen before laid out on several tables as well as a sink located in the back of the room. As the snow falls outside, and the whispers of the winter wind make themselves heard, the Snydeckers unveil a hideous revelation. Tucked in the basement of their new rental home, a home that they've moved in in order to give their son a fighting chance against cancer, appears to have previously been a funeral home, one where the dead have been prepared for burial in. And unbeknownst to anyone, some of the old tools and saws were still present now in the room as they come to this realization. Shocked and angry with herself, Carmen initially refuses to bring the children there, especially Philip. But after being talked down by Alan, who told her to consider their situation, the fact that they had already signed an agreement, that they had spent every last penny on Philip's treatments, the move, and the rent, that even if it was a funeral home, no one likely died there, and Carmen finally relents and agrees to continue with the move-in process. 
the two vow to hide the morbid past of the home and its contents from their children. They contact the landlord who removes the embalming and preparation equipment, but leaves several tables and a deep freeze that might be useful to the family. And several weeks later, the rest of the family moves in. As Philip and the other children wander from room to room, examining their new house, Carmen begins to mop the floors to prepare to bring in the furniture to complete their move. But as she fills the bucket with soap and hot water and begins to mop where the items will go, she experiences an omen of sorts. As she mops from side to side, the steamy and soapy water began to congeal and turn into a thick and dark red substance like that of dead blood. As the liquid smears all over the hardwood floor, within an instant, as she blinks, things seem to be back to normal. Attributing the bizarre vision to intense stress and exhaustion, she tries to write the experience off and continues mopping. Meanwhile, Philip has wandered into the basement stairwell and begins to descend the stairs. Feeling an icy and cold presence overtake him, the lower he gets into the basement. As his eyes scan the room, he feels an ominous presence staring at him, when suddenly, he hears a voice call out to him from a specific room, and this voice knew his name. Scared and unnerved, he makes his way back upstairs and greets his mother in the kitchen. He tells her that they need to leave immediately because he doesn't feel like any of them are safe. Carmen initially wrote off the feelings of her son due to him having his illness, adjusting to a new environment and believing that it was an inner voice, not a physical one that he was hearing. She would realize that she indeed was very, very wrong. As the days grow more difficult and long, the family began to turn to their faith for guidance. Reaching out to the priest who had married the couple, Alan and Carmen have him pray a prayer of healing over Philip, hoping to assist in his treatment. But despite their best efforts, he is only continuing to get worse. By this time, the entire family has moved into the former funeral home, including the other children, but no one has told the children that it was indeed a funeral home. Philip, unbeknownst to the rest of the family, had figured this out on his own. Carmen would eventually attribute his discovery to him being so close to death at the time. She believed that the veil between life and death had become so thin for her boy that he could see what no one else could and know perhaps what others didn't. Working to provide as best as he could, Alan had long since gone back to work, leaving Carmen to run the strange and new house with their family and sick son on her own. He would be home on the weekends until his transfer was finalized, because despite the horrors of having a cancer-ridden child, the bills unfortunately never stop. As the days progress, the strangeness within the home begins to reveal itself from the shadows. The youngest daughter of the Snydeckers is playing with her toys in her room. As the wind whistles outside, as she talks with the dolls and places them within their doll house, a figure grazes the background of her room. When the little girl looks up above her doll house, she sees the figure of a woman with pale skin and sunk in eyes. Screaming, she races to her mother as fast as possible. Carmen comforts the poor girl, who is shaking as she grips her mother. Wanting to comfort her, Carmen goes upstairs to try and dismiss her daughter's fears. And despite her searching, nothing seems out of the ordinary. Believing that Philip and his brother were playing tricks on the poor child, Carmen angrily rushes to find and confront them. But despite her rage, the boys swear that they never told her the secret that Philip had discovered and that neither of them had played any tricks on her whatsoever. Bewildered, Carmen sets them straight and heads back to the kitchen to cook the family dinner. The only peace for her seems to come at night when the children are fast asleep in their beds, with the crisp air holding an ever-present moon above their home. Despite believing that all of her children were fast asleep and with the house being so calm, 
Our boys in the basement room were not getting much sleep at all. The boys are often woken up by the sounds and then visuals of someone or something moving behind the closed door. At first they thought it was simply shadows or their minds playing tricks on them when one or the other would be the only ones awake. But now that it was both of them, they were seeing the exact same thing and experiencing the same exact chill creeping up their spines. The two would then continue to confide in one another, as brothers often do, about all the things they had experienced individually once the bizarre specter had dematerialized. The days grew longer and more stressful as time wore on. Philip was knocking on death's door, and his lack of sleep was not helping his treatment, for the frigid nights brought the icy touch of death and the wandering apparitions of another world into theirs. Soon the boys can no longer take it. They approach Carmen to explain what they've been seeing and that there's been a man in what they now call the lab room in their room in the basement. Carmen, as per usual, whether it was to cope with the mounting pressures and responsibilities of their daily lives or to try and convince them to negate their fear or both, wrote off the boys as having nothing more than overactive imaginations, reminding Philip that he was very sick and this could play a role on him seeing something that perhaps wasn't there. However, that would still not explain his brother experiencing the exact same thing at the exact same time. Another typical day in their new lives, Carmen begins cooking dinner for the family, and up until this point, she hasn't had an experience that she's recognized as anything truly paranormal that wasn't stress-related or something else that she could write off entirely. She had just set all the dishes out on the table for her family, and as she starts to make her way to the deep freeze to grab the protein she'd be cooking for the family's meal, she hears slight movement coming from the dining room. As she grabs and then sets the meat down in the kitchen, she goes to examine what the sound was. All of the dishes are gone, without a trace as if she never placed them down at all. Feeling as if she was losing her mind, Carmen can't so easily dismiss this experience because she knows she set that table. Meanwhile, Philip's younger brother, Bobby, was down in their room. He knows something strange is happening in the house that they can't explain, given the apparitions and the noises the two of them have heard and experienced together, along with whatever their younger sister had seen. But this experience seems more personal. He begins to hear what first sounds like whispers coming from the lab room and sees the apparition of a man behind the closed window door. He can't make out any features other than a general outline and his size. But the closer he gets, the more audible the whispering becomes. And this man, this thing, is slowly muttering the name. Philip. Feeling that sense of terror overtake him, fight or flight takes over the boy, and he quickly runs upstairs where he bumps into his mother. Having just had her own experience, she's not sure what to say to him. So taking his hand, the two make their way to the basement and towards the lab room where the whispers had been coming from. After a tense couple seconds, Carmen opens the door, only to be met with silence. Although she believed in the spirit world, she up until this point did not believe that it could interact with the world of the living. But given what her kids have been telling her and what she's just experienced that very night, she wasn't so sure anymore. She had to consider the prospect that her house may just be haunted. Alan would arrive the following morning to spend the weekend with his family. At the same time, a winter storm began to set in he arrived. After speaking with his wife and knowing that Philip has made the other children aware of the macabre past of the home, he finds it important to address the issue as a family, believing that the information could perhaps just be adding fuel to overactive imaginations. At the breakfast table, he does just that, finally addressing the family that they indeed were living in an old funeral home but that there was no reason for the children to be scared, 
that there were no monsters lurking in the shadows and no specters of otherworldly beings watching them. Although Philip and his brother argue that they've seen and experienced the same things and they have indeed been very real, they are once again dismissed. Alan would then pull Philip aside to ask him that despite the entire situation, with him being the oldest, if he could please set an example for the rest of the children and not scare them with ghost stories. Philip's cancer treatments continue day after day, slowly draining the remaining funds the family has left. Meanwhile, he continues to see and experience even more paranormal happenings within the home. His mother attributes this to his illness and the interactions between his body and medications he's been placed on, despite knowing that her other children, and even herself, have had their own experiences. Another bizarre development recently has been that most, if not all of the family's crucifixes that have been placed all throughout their home have started to go missing, with no indication as to where they could have gone. The nightly disturbances have also become regular by this point, with Philip and his brother seeing the man in the lab room ever more frequently, as well as hearing and seeing other apparitions circling them as they lay in their beds. This night is no different. The boys wake up their parents screaming in terror that the man is back. But after sweeping the house and ensuring that everything is locked, that there was no way anyone could have possibly gotten in, Alan, being very wary of being woken up almost every night, forces the boys to go back to bed, again dismissing their experiences. Tired of not being believed, the boys began to leave the lights on in their room and talk amongst themselves to comfort one another as they would slowly but surely begin to fall asleep. Convinced that Philip was seeing things due to his medication and then influencing the younger children, his parents requested that he be examined for any possible interactions by his doctor. And after a series of tests, the doctor would conclude that nothing Philip was on could be causing such things. The only other possible answer was a psychological problem alongside his cancer. Alan was now picking up every hour he possibly could, as well as any side work that presented itself to try and keep up with the mounting debt the family was being buried in. On any given day, a two-inch stack of bills, either late or termination notices, could be found on the kitchen counter. While sorting through them, he was shocked to find an electric bill, almost twice its average. To him, the children sleeping with the lights on because of ghost stories was not only causing them to lose sleep, but now was costing the family money they simply didn't have. So to counteract this, and of course feeling as if he was justified in doing so, he goes to each one of their rooms and removes all of their light bulbs, except for one. At night, however, the lights that used to make them feel protected and bring them relief would soon contribute to a new supernatural horror. Sleeping in their room in the basement, the Snydecker boys are suddenly woken up by the flashing of their overhead lights. Glancing to find the source, they see their little sister flicking the lights on and off, and despite there being no light bulbs in their sockets, they are still flashing on and off. Running towards her, the youngest brother chases her up the stairs, but she's just too quick for him to catch her. Instead, he runs into his parents when he exits the basement door. But strangely, his mother explains to him that she's been asleep in her room for hours now, and she would know because she had tucked her in and had been near the basement ever since. Not believing her at first, he rushes upstairs to soon find her fast asleep in her bed. He is now even more freaked out because whatever this thing was could take the form of a family member. Meanwhile, as his brother comes to terms with this hideous revelation, a voice begins to call to Philip once again from the lab room, waking him up. Getting sick of living in fear, Philip finally decides to confront whoever or whatever has been calling out to him and approaches the room. 
Upon opening the door and stepping inside, he is met face to face with the entity that has been calling his name. The apparition appeared to him as a man with dark red, almost blood-filled eyes began to whisper to him things about the home's past. After this freezing winter's night, Philip began to undergo a radical change in personality. He began to pull away and isolate himself from the rest of the family, insisting that he be left alone in the basement and that his brother Bobby move upstairs, making Bobby feel alienated from their once close and confiding relationship. Despite these personality changes, a miracle seemed to take place, one that the family had been praying for since the very beginning of their struggle. After months of daily treatments, Philip's blood labs finally came back normal. His cancer was in remission, but surprisingly, he almost doesn't seem to care at all. Later that evening, as the family prepares to celebrate the good news, they also welcome a guest for the first time since they had moved. Their niece Teresa would be temporarily living with them and had just arrived from New York. Her parents had been separated and undergoing a messy divorce, so to help her make the best of the situation, they've allowed her to stay with them. Not having seen the family in quite some time, Teresa begins to get reacclimated with them, but soon notices that Philip, who she had previously been very close to, was missing from the party. She would eventually find him in the basement and also notice that something was very different about him. He seemed darker, more angry, and not at all like the boy that she used to know. He would eventually confide in her all the paranormal activity he and the others had experienced in the house, its past, and that his parents did not believe them. This made him feel extremely isolated and alone and that the activity had not simply gone away, but had continued to get worse each and every night. His experiences as he explained them to Teresa ranged from scratching on his door and inside his walls, to his name being called, to seeing the apparitions of figures surrounding him, hearing whispering, and also seeing and hearing a man in a suit with blood-red eyes call out to him that this man would also visit his bedside every single night and tell him things that his parents had said about him, negative and terrible things. He would then encourage Philip to take action and to hurt his own family. Shortly into her stay, Teresa began to observe that the hatred and malice that was dwelling within Philip had seemed to make itself a part of the family's daily routine. Fights and screaming matches soon became a daily occurrence, especially between Philip and Alan, with Alan seeming to resent Philip for the family's financial situation and for Philip feeling isolated and not being believed about what he was experiencing. According to Philip's diary, every night when he was trying to sleep, this creature, this demon, would visit him and push him harder and harder to commit unspeakable things. It got to the point to where Philip wouldn't even leave his room. He wouldn't argue back against this entity. And day after day, night after night, it pushed for him to hurt his family. Philip would continue to confide in Teresa that alongside this, he began to see other people within the basement who were dead and buried, as if they were trapped there by the man in the suit with the blood red eyes. And this entity would continue to threaten to do things to Philip if he did not listen and do as he was told. While explaining these newer developments to her, without warning, he suddenly attacked her, grabbing her arm, trying to harm her. Breaking free and rushing up the stairs and into the arms of her uncle Alan, she watched Philip essentially be exiled back into the basement, and with that, their relationship began to disintegrate. Upset at not only what had happened between her and Philip, but at the strange behavior and dysfunction that was taking place within the house, Teresa wept in her bed. She would eventually be gifted a rosary by Carmen, who believed that it would help comfort her, and she wore this to bed that night, 
as a necklace of sorts. However, she would quickly discover that instead of comfort, this holy object made her a target instead. Fast asleep, Teresa was suddenly woken up by the sensation of her blankets being pulled from her body. She opened her eyes to find Philip staring at her with a crooked smile just before he attacked her, striking her several times in the face. Her screams thankfully quickly warranted Carmen and Alan, who subdued Philip immediately. Philip, after this unpredictable series of incidents, was then removed from the house due to his violence. Upon the arrival of law enforcement and medical personnel, he seemed to have no recollection of what had taken place and was screaming and crying as he was being forcibly removed from the home and sent away for a mental evaluation. Alan and Carmen, after securing the rest of the children in the house, followed the ambulance to the hospital to sign the necessary paperwork to have Philip committed for the evaluation. But just before he was led into the hospital, he issued an ominous warning to the both of them. He said, Mark my words, now that I'm out of the house, it'll be after you, and it will get worse. Shattered by what had taken place, the Snydecker's somber drive home turned into a long one, given the distance and the weather that they were braving. By the time they arrived back home, it's time for Alan to head to work. After dropping off Carmen, he departs for the day. Wanting to sleep, but too stressed to, Carmen sits on the edge of her bed, crying and contemplating what her son had said. What if this all truly was real? What would they even do? Where does one begin to fight something they can't see? She decides to head down into the basement, to Philip's room, to see if she can experience anything whatsoever. After several minutes, despite not seeing anything, she does begin to feel a massive drop in temperature, so low to the point to where she can see her breath. She also soon begins to shake with fear she can't describe. Fighting these feelings, she issues a challenge to whatever could be lurking there, to show itself, to prove that it was indeed real, that it truly did exist. But despite her challenge, and waiting half an hour, she sees nothing. So she heads back upstairs to her room to take a shower, to try and relax herself enough to sleep. Meanwhile, Alan had been driving in the dark heading to work for the day. During his drive, he was worried about his son, his family, and leaving them behind for the day in such a raw and emotional state. But he would have no way of knowing that these weren't the only problems he had to worry about. After his long drive, he finally arrives at work for the day and begins. He hopes to be distracted from his lack of sleep and family problems. As Carmen runs her shower and the rest of the children sleep, a horrific presence begins to manifest within the house. As she's washing herself, the shower curtain suddenly covers Carmen's face, catching her off guard, out of breath, and begins to smother her. At the same time, Teresa is startled awake. She's being strangled by the rosary she's wearing. She screams, pulling at her neck, and eventually frees herself from its stranglehold. She then runs towards the muffled screams of her aunt coming from her bedroom. Seemingly having no other choice, after seeing her being strangled by the shower curtain, she pulls it off of her as fast and as hard as she possibly can. The two then share a moment of sheer terror and trauma, both having experienced things that they can't explain. However, unbeknownst to the two of them at home, Alan is about to experience an attack of his own. While working at his job site, he begins to hear his truck turn over, despite his keys being in his pocket. Glancing out to figure out just what this could be, he watches his truck begin to move towards his small work building. And then, as if someone had their foot on the gas, it began to accelerate to a high rate of speed. And before he could run out of the way, the truck smashes directly into the building and straight towards where he was standing. Back at the house, Carmen and Teresa are still in shock when suddenly the phone rings. However, 
there is nothing but a muffled laugh coming through from the other side. Feeling a burning sensation on her ear, Carmen immediately drops the phone to find that it's partially melted. Starting to scream, she finds herself frozen as she glances towards the ceiling after she sees something out of the corner of her eye. Teresa then sees it as well and begins to scream. A black cloud of some kind now floated above them. The two are absolutely mortified by these sudden and horrendous manifestations of supernatural evil that are taking place and realize that Philip was right. This force, this demon, has taken over the entire house. Running out of the room and frantically into another, they rush to gather the rest of the children, but with a snowstorm raging outside and a demonic storm raging inside, they seemingly have no escape. Carmen is unsure of what to do. She then receives another phone call, this time picking up another landline in the home. It's Alan on the other end. He explains just what had taken place and that he was waiting for the authorities to arrive. Even more shocked and scared now that this entity has now attacked all members of the family and has left the home and attacked Alan as well, since all the events seem to take place roughly during the same time frame. She's convinced that the demon will follow them wherever they go to try and escape it. So although it is the middle of the morning during a winter storm, she makes a phone call to the only person who she thinks can help her in this desperate situation. She calls the priest who had married her and Alan and had blessed Philip before his cancer was in remission. Thankfully, for their sake, the father picked up on the other end and promised to head to the home as soon as possible. Given the road conditions, it takes him several hours to arrive, but thankfully, he does. First things first, the father wanted to speak with Carmen and figure out just what exactly was taking place. And after discussing anything and everything they can think with him, hoping for an answer to fix their situation, albeit it's never that easy, the father's response leaves them stunned. He tells them that he does believe them, but if that they simply ignore the presence and what it's been doing, it'll go away. This is the first time her faith has failed Carmen. She's bewildered by his answer. How can you just ignore something that's tried to take your life, your family members' lives, this very day, alongside everything else that has been building up to this point? In her opinion, she couldn't. So once he left, she rushed to seek other, less conventional options to find the answers that she desperately needed. While digging through a phone book and multiple newspapers to try and find anything she could, she stumbled across an article about a husband and wife team of so-called demonologists who were set to give a lecture at a nearby university. After several additional phone calls, she makes contact with Lorraine Warren, which after discussing the prospect of the visit with her husband Ed, agreed to come and visit Carmen that day to evaluate her situation. After their arrival and a brief interview, Lorraine starts to survey the house using her gift of discernment, a supposed extra sense that allows a person to discover the true nature of a situation, a person's character, or in this case, a spirit or haunting, whether it was something good and godly or something grotesque and not of God. She is almost immediately drawn to the basement with no knowledge of the home prior. She makes her way towards the notorious lab room and soon begins to sense a plethora of beings. A sense of horrible depression and doom began to fill her entire soul. Among the many human spirits she felt, she felt something else, something sinister and sickening. There was a demonic force dwelling within the basement. She would later describe the feeling as if there was a doorway to hell itself located in that room. To remove any such spirits within the house, the Warrens informed Carmen that the Catholic Church would have to authorize an exorcism and send the appropriate personnel to make this happen, a process that could take weeks or even months. To try and expedite the process, the Warrens contact their lead researcher, 
a man named John Zaphis to come in and document anything and everything that could be found so that a proper report could be submitted to the church. John, along with his crew, temporarily move into the home to try and document anything that they can find that will help prove beyond a reasonable doubt that an exorcism is indeed needed to be performed to help this family. During their time there, they relied on video, audio, and photographic evidence to document their findings. At the Warren's advice, so that the demon could not isolate any one person in the family, the entire family moves their beds into the living room to sleep together at night and protect one another. Thankfully, with the researchers also temporarily living there, at any one given point in time, there was always an additional person with the member of the family. However, with Philip gone, the entity begins to pursue the next most vulnerable person. Having suffered intense stress from the entire situation, given that her son was in the psych ward, her family dynamic was in tatters, and the bills were forever continuing to pile up. That person was Carmen. Carmen was also stricken with an overwhelming sense of guilt for not believing any of her children, especially Philip, about what they had experienced during the entire ordeal, and it seems like perhaps the entity exploited this within her for all that it was worth. As the family discussed potential findings with the Warrens, as well as their researchers, around their fireplace in the living room, Carmen was suddenly flung backwards. As everyone gathered around her, their faces switched from those of concern to horror, as her throat began to bulge and swell, and her face began to contort and twist. She would later describe what she felt while experiencing this. She said, I felt as if I was in a dark hole, like a well, surrounded by black figures who I couldn't make out their features. I felt pure despair and hopelessness to the point where if I stopped breathing, I knew I deserved to. Rushing to her aid, but not being qualified to perform an exorcism themselves, the demonologists and their crew asked for the rest of the family to bring anything sacred to her to be placed upon her. Teresa rushes to find the rosary that she was gifted by her aunt, the same one Carmen believed would protect her. This was placed upon her in an effort to combat whatever was attacking her. After hours of praying and pleading, the group's prayers, along with the rosary placement, seemed to work, at least temporarily breaking whatever spell Carmen was under. As she came back to waking life, she had no idea how long she had been out of it, and the rain warn told her that she had been under attack for the last eight hours as they had prayed over her. The experience seemed to last mere minutes to Carmen, yet they were the longest minutes she had ever experienced. It took several more weeks, but eventually the researchers, alongside the Warrens, were able to attain enough evidence and their view to provide the church. But they too, just as the family by this point, were beyond worn down. At night, they slept on mattresses alongside the family, all together in the living room, around the fireplace. Their mattresses would breathe an alternating breath to their own, not only waking and scaring them, but behaving as if they themselves were living, breathing creatures being laid on. Although they had researched and dealt with dozens, if not hundreds, of paranormal cases, they believed what they experienced in the Snydecker home in Connecticut was by far the strongest demonic presence they had ever come into contact with. Close to what was supposed to be the final night, head researcher John Zaffis made the mistake of leaving the safety of the living room when he was suddenly woke up out of a sound sleep. He went and sat in the kitchen, unable to go back to sleep. Within minutes, he felt as if he had been placed in a freezer. All the warmth quickly left his body, and he began to see his own breath hang in the air. Having experienced this before, he knew he was being targeted. As fear began to overtake him, he began to call out to anyone and everyone that was sleeping just feet away in the living room, but was met with no response. He rushed to the living room where he began to see the mattresses breathing, but everyone who laid upon them was completely unresponsive. He then hears the basement door creak open. 
as he slowly walks to where he can see the entrance to the basement. He sees a man wearing a suit with a contorted face and blood red eyes. The experience terrifies John so much to the point where he runs into the living room, shaking his crew awake and telling them that he has to get out. Having only spoken about the situation a handful of times since then, he would go on to say, I have never, in the decades upon decades of investigating the paranormal, experienced something to that degree of evil since that night, and I pray I never do again. Days after John vacates the home, the Warrens finally manage to convince the Connecticut Diocese to grant the family a priest to determine if an exorcism would be granted. Exorcism in the Catholic faith, especially these days, and even so in the 20th century, are only conducted in absolute secrecy and are extremely rare to be granted. Evil must be proven to be present beyond a reasonable doubt through a variety of methods. And rarer still is performing an exorcism on a building or place rather than a person. A priest by the name of Father Frank soon arrives to execute the church's orders and conduct an investigation on their behalf. Having viewed the evidence given to the church by the Warrens, he also listens to the Snydeckers about their experiences and tours the home. By the end of the interview, the family cannot tell if the father will be for or against advising the church to grant them what they so desperately believed they needed. Several agonizing weeks would go by until word was received from the church, and to the family's relief, they decided to grant them an exorcism. Another priest, by the name of Father Richard, was sent to conduct the ritual. Upon arriving during an exceptionally bad snowstorm, Father Richard is almost immediately drawn to the basement. As he descends the steps with Carmen behind him, he turns to her. His stone face, which has been relatively void of emotion, turns into a grimace, almost as if he sensed that there was something truly evil lurking within the shadows. Within seconds, he asks to step into the lab room and to close the doors behind him so that he may begin. As he starts to flick droplets of holy water into the space, the energy in the house seems to become darker and the air heavier. Despite feeling a malevolent presence surrounding him, Father Richard continued with the ritual. He went from room to room conducting the exorcism and exalting God's blessings until finally he was in the living room in the presence of the Snydecker family as well as Ed and Lorraine Warren. Now several hours in as he was making his way towards the ritual's conclusion, the demonic presence that had plagued the family all of these days since they had first arrived at the beginning of this harsh winter in Connecticut refused to be ignored and was ready for a fight. Seen by everyone present, all objects in the room that weren't nailed down or being sat in began to shake and be thrown. Books, knickknacks, statues, and ornaments shattered as the snow and ice slapped the windows outside of the house. The more they prayed, the more they seemed to provoke the entity, and the more intense the activity became. Amidst the turmoil, and again witnessed by everyone. Teresa is lifted into the air by what she would later describe as massive, unseen hands, and is choked. It seems as if the entity is attempting to shock and break the prayers of those present, but Father Richard refuses to give in. Then, within the blink of an eye, it was as if whatever had been stalking the walls inside of the Snydecker home was gone. And despite the mess that now surrounded them, they could not be more relieved or thankful for their newfound freedom. Several days after the exorcism, they started the process of selling the house, not only to try and put their past experiences behind them to move forward, but to also not take a chance of the door that they believed they had closed with the help of their faith being reopened and reigniting their own personal paranormal hell. 
Philip would be released from the mental hospital about a month later after the exorcism had transpired. He not only seemed to be in stable condition, but appeared much healthier and was truly happy to see his family again. His cancer, thankfully, would never return. What happened in the Snydecker home is open to interpretation. Those who believe them believe the exorcism to be a resounding success, while those who don't believe see it as some kind of attention-grabbing hoax. The Warrens themselves back then, and even now long after their own deaths, continue to be polarizing figures, with some believing them to be legitimate demonologists and paranormal experts, with others believing that they were charlatans, nothing more than profiteers of people's fears. As stated in the beginning, I'm not here to convince you one way or the other. My job is to provide as many details as I can of what happened with the particular case, and the rest is up for you to decide. Some additional details I would like to add, however, are these. After investigating the home, the Warrens did launch a large media campaign promoting the home as majorly possessed. Whether this was for good or bad intentions, I can't say, because I simply don't know. Philip, unfortunately, would later develop a drug habit and would also later be diagnosed with schizophrenia. Whether this was a result of drug use or something that was there all along, We'll never know. But it did not appear to be his condition prior or even after his stint in the mental hospital. The story would go on to inspire a dramatized documentary with altered names of the family and with hidden interviews of the family in 2002, known as A Haunting in Connecticut. It would then again be popularized in 2009 when the horror film The Haunting in Connecticut was released. Upon moving out in 1987, the Snydeckers did not experience any other paranormal activity in their lives, and subsequent owners of the home say they haven't experienced any activity either. This is perhaps due to the successful exorcism of the home, or the demons simply existing within the minds of those involved. Again, the interpretation is up to you. But part of me still wonders, could hell still be locked away within the basement of that house, watching lurking, and waiting for the right person to stumble upon its locked door, and to pry it open again, could the blood-red eyes of the demonic man in the suit still be lusting for more souls? If so, this is one door I pray stays locked for good. Art is defined by the expression or application of human creative skill and imagination typically in a visual form, such as a painting or sculpture, producing works to be appreciated primarily for their beauty or emotional power. Art takes time and effort, sometimes sweat, tears, and blood, literally. But as art reflects emotional power in whatever branch it decides to express itself, could it capture with it a piece of the human soul? When a man inherits a strange painting from his grandmother, bizarre happenings begin to manifest within his home. Can he decipher the paranormal mystery surrounding it before it's too late? This is the untold story of the Anguished Man painting of Cumbria, England. And this particular story, like the painting itself, is an unsettling one. Cumbria, England, a beautiful place known for breathtaking scenery, has over the years become known as a creative hub for the arts, culture, and literature, also being home to many of the artists themselves. But underneath this natural beauty lies something dark and foreboding. As art reflects beauty, it must also reflect the abhorrent. The information of some of the experiences are vague. However, I will try to tell the story as complete as I can, given what I could find. Our story begins in Cumbria, approximately around 2010. A man named Sean Robinson has just inherited a painting from his grandmother. 
but unlike lots of other works of art, this one is grotesque, almost terrifying, and certainly makes one ponder the sanity of the person who made it. Although no one knows for certain how it came into Robinson's grandmother's possession originally, the painting had apparently been within the family for 30 years by this point, but had been in the attic of his grandmother's house for 25 of those years. She had said she had put it there because there was something evil about it. Within the five years the painting was visibly present within her home, numerous bizarre things began to occur. The legend, as it goes, is that the man who painted it had used his own blood within the painting itself, mixing it with the oils, drip by drip, allowing his essence to become infused with the canvas. Although the time frame of its production is unknown, the artist behind it apparently would end by his own hand after finishing his masterpiece. Upon possessing this painting known as The Anguished Man, Robinson's grandmother would soon begin to have experiences that she couldn't explain. She began to see the dark and ominous figure of a man throughout her house, sometimes out of the corner of her eye, and other times directly in front of her. This had to have been absolutely terrifying. I'm not entirely sure of her living arrangement, if her husband was still alive or not, but for speculation's sake, imagine being older and living alone and then starting to see this spectral man wandering throughout your home, seemingly stalking you from the shadows. It's certainly more than enough to fuel your nightmares. This would prompt her to eventually move the painting into the attic, possibly out of fear as to what would happen if she got rid of it. As far as we know, given the information that is available, these apparitions ceased to be once the painting was stowed away from the rest of the house, isolated to its own devices within the confines of the attic above. Years later, although he had been forewarned by his grandmother, Robinson wasn't convinced of the supposed evil that inhabited this strange work of art. He himself, being a lifelong horror fan, upon receiving it, was intrigued and decided to take it home. After placing it within the walls of his house, he too would soon begin to experience terrifying events that he couldn't explain. The painting would be sat on display in an upstairs bedroom, and upon finding its new home, the painting known as the Anguished Man began to invoke something evil. As it often does, the activity started small. The day the painting was placed in the house, creaking and footsteps began to be heard and would only continue from there on out. These creaks and footsteps grew ever louder and more aggressive and were soon coupled with tormented, almost muffled screams that would echo all throughout the house. The Robinson family soon began to see a pitch black figure wandering throughout their home, a murky, dark presence, an ever-present set of eyes burning a hole through their very souls. These episodes disturbed Robinson, who had recalled that his grandmother had said that she experienced the very same phenomenon. In the coming months, the family would also begin to experience other hair-raising activity as well. Soon, banging could be heard all throughout the house at odd hours of the day and night with the activity seeming to peak between 3 and 4 a.m. And with the previously mentioned phenomena, a new and mysterious deep crying noise could also be heard ever more frequently and with no rational origin. As time would pass, the haunting force would continue to only grow stronger. The manifestation of the Shadow Man would continue to be seen, and along with being seen, would also be observed crying and whispering. Although despite hearing the whispers, the family could never decipher what he or it was trying to say. Alongside these bizarre and creepy happenings, 
a horrific visual would soon be seen by Sean Robinson's very own eyes. He would find himself suddenly awake between the hours of 3 and 4 a.m., when activity would typically reach a fever pitch. Only this night was different. As his eyes adjusted, he sees standing at the foot of his bed a dark figure whose face appears to be red, and upon a closer look, Sean is frozen with fear. What he was seeing before his very eyes, totally lucid, was the very same figure from the painting. But before Sean could allow himself to scream, the figure simply vanished. Not only would this have been absolutely bone-chilling to experience, but with the activity continuing to escalate, Sean wondered what could be next, and was the apparition perhaps an omen of things to come? Whether it was the paranormal force or entity that inhabited the painting, or something else within the Robinson home, although the home was not reported to have been haunted whatsoever prior to Sean receiving the anguished man, the entity persisted. One night, as the moon hung overhead, Sean Robinson found himself awake early in the morning. As he went down the stairs and into the kitchen, presumably to get himself a drink or a snack to wake up, as most people often do, he would be suddenly startled by a blood-curdling scream coming from his upstairs master bedroom. He recognized the scream. It was his wife. Robinson's wife would be woken up out of a sound sleep by having her hair played with and tugged on. Upon feeling for the origin in the darkness and rolling over, she was met face to face with a man that she described as being massive, having a sunken in mouth and eyes, and his breathing was absolutely horrific. This experience must have shocked and terrified the poor woman. Perhaps she was thinking it was her husband laying next to her, except instead of experiencing a reassuring face staring back at hers, when looking over after regaining consciousness, she sees something straight out of a horror movie looking at her instead. This morning certainly must have been a hectic one, because how does one console their wife after an experience like that? How does one fight something that shouldn't exist? Coexisting with the paranormal force that now inhabited their home, the Robinson family did their best to try and live normal lives, but the activity only ever seemed to get worse. However, one day, when Robinson's son Keenan was pushed down the stairs by something that he couldn't see, Sean had had enough. Unsure of what would happen if he did away with the painting by discarding it, he remembered how his grandmother had dealt with it with her own unique situation surrounding the painting, and decided to, at least for the time being, place it in the cellar of his home, away from his family. The activity itself, although still somewhat present, certainly seemed to calm down quite a bit following this move. In the years to come, Sean Robinson would begin to document the haunting surrounding the anguished man. This documentation began within several months of receiving the painting, after he and his family went from skeptics to believers, after experiencing a plethora of strangeness ever since the anguished man arrived in their lives. As of right now, there are about 16 videos documenting various supernatural occurrences within the Robinson home surrounding the object. These manifestations include apparitions, flashing lights, and eerie fogs enveloping the room the painting sits in doors opening and closing by themselves, and various objects, including the painting itself, moving on their own. More recently, it seems like a UK-based paranormal group has assisted Robinson with investigating what could be taking place at his home. Seems like they have also captured several EVPs, or electronic voice phenomena, as part of those investigation sessions. I will be linking Sean Robinson's YouTube channel below, so you can go see for yourself if you wish to do so. And before we conclude this odd story, first, let us speculate as to what could be happening. Starting from the beginning, 
Sean's grandmother came into possession of the painting, but how did she receive it? Did she purchase it, or was it a gift? And if so, from who? With these questions, we are only left with more. Just how could she or anyone have become aware of the supposed backstory of how the painting came to be if the artist is unknown? Perhaps the person who sold it or gifted it to her knew them but kept them unnamed. Perhaps they painted it under a pen name and upon their death, their true identity was lost. It's hard to say. Upon her initial experiences of seeing the apparition of a large man wandering throughout her home, and crying out. I'm curious if she saw any sort of religious or paranormal help. I'm also curious if she lived alone at the time or with her husband. But regardless of her living situation, those would be terrifying things to see and deal with. But in my opinion, they would be made so much worse if you were alone, let alone by yourself and elderly. And it seems like paranormal forces such as these, the ones that are perceived to be evil, tend to feed off of human fear, like an energy source. These manifestations would lead her to vanquish the painting into her attic after having it on display for five years, for the next 25 years. I wonder why she didn't get rid of it though. Did she fear it would come back or that the activity would somehow be worse? And with the painting being in the attic, I wonder if anyone went up there and experienced anything, or if she ever heard any noises coming from the attic itself. Because as far as we know, the activity ceased once it was placed there, but that's only a conclusion drawn with very limited information. Once Sean had received the anguished man and placed it on display within his home, he too began to experience the same exact things that his grandmother had and more. But from the sounds of it, at a minimum, he and his wife and children experienced the bizarre phenomena. But I'm also curious if any guests who visited, if they experienced anything that perhaps we just haven't had the chance to hear about. And yet another question, just why would someone want to display something so hideous in their house? I mean, the mere sight of this painting gives me an eerie vibe. Its dark, soulless eyes and muted screams of terror upon its red face are more than enough for me. I can almost imagine this thing stalking me from the shadows and sneaking up on me with a horrific sound emanating from its face as it smothers me or something. But besides provoking the imagination in a positive or negative manner, if I woke up and saw the anguished man in the flesh from the painting, that would be it for me. I would absolutely seek some kind of assistance and or burn the thing. It's hard to say exactly what one should or would do given the situation until they find themselves experiencing it. But I have to say the Robinson family's experiences sound absolutely terror inducing. There are many theories as to what the entity could be or what the activity could be caused by. It seems like the majority of researchers of this case myself now included, believe the haunting to be an intelligent one, meaning that an entity can communicate with the living and even physically attack. But others seem to think that the entity isn't stowed away within the painting, but rather that the painting is a conduit itself, something that opens a portal between our realm or dimension to another one that allows in this strange and menacing presence. Could perhaps the insanity, blood infusion, and ultimate sacrifice of the artist that allegedly painted it, upon achieving its final form, have something to do with this? Was it an intentional decision or goal on behalf of the artist? It's hard to say. And as many people have, I do also have to ask, is the case genuine? Although Sean Robinson seems like he enjoys a good horror movie, as most of us do, I would say. He doesn't give me vibes of a charlatan or anything of the sort personally. Some people have accused him of making the entire thing up, but I'd have to follow up with the question of why. I highly doubt he's profited very much from the story anyways, especially judging from his YouTube numbers, and that is in no way shape or form a dig of any kind. 
If anything, to me, it just backs up the validity of his intentions. He seems more pressed on sharing he and his family's experiences in order to seek other people's opinions as to what could be taking place surrounding the painting. More recently, as previously mentioned, it seems like he's perhaps now had some paranormal assistance from a professional group who can maybe give him some more insight as to what could be happening. But what do you think? Answer one of my many posed questions below in the comments, or feel free to share your own thoughts. I'd love to read them. As for the Robinson family as a whole, I hope that they eventually find answers surrounding the mysterious oddity known as the Anguished Man. And the rest of us better pray that we don't come into possession of such an item, because if we did, perhaps the sunken in face of the creature on the canvas will be stalking you in flesh and bone, a manifestation of your fear, watching and waiting to take you back home with it, wherever that home may be in the darkness. Once a rich and powerful juggernaut of a family would slowly be turned into ghosts, as their once blessed lives seemingly became infected by some sort of curse. Do their spirits still wander the halls of this historic mansion, and can we decipher the paranormal force that seemingly destroyed their lives before it affects anyone else? This is the untold story of the haunted Limp Mansion located in St. Louis, Missouri, and this tale intertwines the spirits of the past with the mysteries of the present. To tell this story properly, I must first introduce to you just who the Limp family was, what they were about, and just what happened to them. So let us start at the beginning. The Limp family began with Johann Adam Limp, who arrived in St. Louis, Missouri from Eichweig, Germany in 1838. Shortly after his arrival, he would build a small grocery store at what is now Delmar and Sixth Streets, where he sold common household items, groceries, and homemade beer. The light golden lager was a welcome change from the darker beers that were sold at the time. The recipe, handed down by his father, became so popular that just two years later, he gave up the grocery store venture and decided to build a small brewery instead in 1840. The brewery was close to where the Golden Arch stands today. Limp first sold his beer in a pub attached to the brewery, introducing St. Louis to its first lager. Before long, Limp found that the brewery was too small to handle both production and storage and found a limestone cave south of the city limits. The cave, which was located at the present-day corner of Cherokee and Demonil Place, could be kept cool by chopping ice from the nearby Mississippi River and depositing it inside, providing the perfect conditions for the lagering process to run its course. Thus, the Limp's Western Brewing Company continued to prosper, and by the 1850s, had become one of the largest in the city. A millionaire by the time of his death, Adam Limp died on August 25th of 1862, and his son, William, would take over and begin a major expansion of the brewery. He purchased a five-block area around the storage house on Cherokee, above the lagering caves. And in 1864, a new plant was completed there on Cherokee Street, continually expanding to meet the product demand. The Limp family would soon come to symbolize both wealth and power, as the Limp Brewery controlled the St. Louis beer market, a position it would maintain until Prohibition. In 1868, Jacob Feckhart, William Limp's father-in-law, built a mammoth of a house a short distance from the Limp Brewery, and in 1876, William Limp decided to purchase it for his family, utilizing it as both a residence and an auxiliary office. While the home was already impressive, Limp immediately began renovating and expanding the 33-room house into a Victorian showplace a true showcase of luxury. 
As part of this renovation, a tunnel was built from the basement of the mansion and through the caves to the brewery, and when mechanical refrigeration became available, parts of the caves were converted for other purposes, including a natural auditorium and a theater. In due time, the system would also become host to a large concrete swimming pool with hot water piped in from the brewery boiling house, and later, a bowling alley and then a private movie theater would also be integrated. And what would eventually become the Limp Western Brewery, this ever-growing venture would be the first beer company to establish coast-to-coast -coast distribution and would also go on to assist in the launching of Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer and Anheuser-Busch. However, underneath this fairy tale existence of a life, tucked away in the darkness, was something most unfortunate. The Limp family, although highly successful, would begin to experience the first of many tragedies to come. In 1901, William Sr.'s favorite son and the heir to the company would pass at the young age of just 28 years old. Frederick Limp, who had never been the pinnacle of good health, had died from heart failure. His son's death would absolutely devastate William, and following his funeral, he began to withdraw from public life, and he was never the same. On January the 1st of 1904, William's closest friend, Frederick Pabst, also passed, leaving an ever-withdrawn William to struggle running his brewery. Though he still arrived at the office each day, he became very nervous and unsettled. Shortly after these two events, his physical and mental health would start to decline, and on February 13th, 1904, William would leave this world by his own hand. In November of 1904, William Limp Jr. took over as the new president of the William J. Limp Brewing Company, inheriting the family business and vast fortune. He and his wife, Lillian, began to spend the inheritance at a furious pace. They filled the mansion with servants, spent huge amounts on carriages, clothing, and art, among many other things. Lillian was a beautiful woman who came from a wealthy family herself. She and William Limp Jr. had married in 1899, and William J. Limp III was born on September 26th of 1900. Before long, Lillian became known as the Lavender Lady because of her fondness for the color. In addition to her lavender attire and accessories, she went so far as to have her carriage horse's harnesses dyed lavender as well. In the beginning, Will enjoyed showing off his trophy wife, but Will, born with a silver spoon in his mouth, was used to doing and acting as he pleased. When he began to tire of Lillian, he demanded that she spend her time shopping Allotting her $1,000 a day, he gave her an ultimatum that if she didn't spend it, she wouldn't get any more. In the meantime, Will was busy running the brewery during the day and pursuing all manner of decadent activities during the night, holding lavish parties in the cave below the mansion. He would bring in numerous prostitutes for entertainment for him and his friends. Enjoying the swimming pool, the bowling alley, and the free-flowing beer. His friends who attended these lavish events were known to enjoy a high time deep below the surface. However, all that debauchery came with consequences. Will's shenanigans caught up with him when he sired a son with another woman other than his wife. Strangely, however, today there is no official documentation that this boy ever existed but rumors that this boy was hidden in the mansion attic for his entire life became prevalent over the years. According to St. Louis historian Joe Gibbons, when he interviewed a former nanny and a chauffeur who worked at the mansion long ago, both of them verified that the boy did exist and was housed in the attic quarters that also housed the servants' rooms. Spawned from Will's philandering with either one of the many prostitutes or a mansion servant, the boy was born with Down syndrome and was considered a total embarrassment to the family. 
Thus, he was hidden away from the world in order to cloak the limp's shame. Finally, William Jr. tired of his trophy wife and her nagging from his point of view and filed for divorce in 1908. Why she didn't take this step with all of his goings on could be nothing more than a sign of the times. But the court proceedings surrounding the divorce became a major St. Louis scandal with all four St. Louis newspapers devoting extensive front page coverage to the messy affair. The trial opened in February of 1909 to crowds that flocked to the courthouse each day to witness the drama of tales of violence, drunkenness, ego, and excess. Virtually ignoring William's decadent activities, Lillian almost lost custody of William Limp III because of a photograph that was presented at the trial of her smoking a cigarette. Again, perhaps this was another sign of the times. But in the end, she retained custody of their son, but soon retired from the public eye. The only time that she was ever seen wearing anything other than lavender was on the final day of her divorce proceedings, when she appeared entirely in black before the judge. With the divorce, Will's troubles had only just begun. In 1906, nine of the large breweries in the St. Louis area had combined to form the Independent Breweries Company, creating fierce competition that the Lemp Brewery had never faced before. In that very same year, Will's mother would pass of cancer. The lavish spending on both personal luxuries and ridiculous parties has certainly taken their toll on the family fortune, but now the company's profits were continually shrinking. Despite this, however, the Limp Mansion would be entirely remodeled in 1911 and partially converted into offices for the brewery. At the same time, William allowed the company's equipment to deteriorate, perhaps in order to fund these renovations. When World War I broke out in 1914, the brewery was just a shell of its former self. William would also build a country home on the Merrimack River to which he increasingly retreated to amidst the ongoing troubles. And during this time, he would also in 1915 remarry. The downturn in profits due to competition would pale in comparison to what was coming, and it arrived in 1919, and it was prohibition. The individual family members were already wealthy, so there was little incentive to keep the brewery afloat. For a time, though, Will hoped that Congress would repeal Prohibition, but finally gave up when it simply wasn't happening. Just months after it went into effect, the limp plant would close down without notice. The workers learned of the closing when they came to work one day and found the door shut and the gates locked, and the family misfortune from here would only continue. On March 20th, 1920, Elsa Limpride, William's sister, the wealthiest heiress in St. Louis, would too breathe her last breath, just like her father had years before. Elsa was said to have been despondent over her rocky marriage, among many other personal and monetary issues arising. After the end of the Limp's brewing dynasty, William Jr. slipped into an all-too-familiar depression, acting almost exactly like his father. He too became increasingly nervous and erratic, shunning public life and often complaining of ill health. On December 29, 1922, William too would exit this world in the very same way and in the very same building his father had 18 years previously. William's brothers Charles and Edwin had long left the family business seeing as their prospects to run the empire were limited at best. If at all, it seemed like the Limp Dynasty had finally come to a bleak end. In 1943, yet another tragedy occurred when William Limp III suddenly passed of a heart attack at the age of 42, the only legitimate son of Williams. Shortly after this took place, his brother Charles would eventually remodel the mansion back into a residence and live in the house along with two servants and the illegitimate child of his brother. 
Charles, too, became an odd figure as he grew older. He developed a morbid fear of germs, and his obsessive-compulsive behavior included wearing gloves at all times to avoid bacteria and constantly washing his hands. It was during this time, shortly following the renovation, that William's illegitimate son, now in his 30s, would too have his name added to death's roll count. Shortly after his nephew's passing, Charles would become the fourth member of the Lemp family to breathe his final breath on his own accord. First, he took his beloved Doberman into the basement of the mansion. Then, climbing the staircase to his room on the second floor, he would go the way of his brother and father. Charles was discovered on May 10th of 1949 by one of his staff, still holding a revolver. It also seems that his passing was not so quick either. He appeared to have tried to descend the stairs, or had fallen following what had taken place. Of the Limp family, only Edwin, who had long avoided the life that had turned so tragic for the rest of his family, remained. He was known as a quiet, reclusive man who had walked away from the Limp Brewing Company in 1913 to live a peaceful life on a secluded estate in Kirkwood, Missouri. Edwin passed away quietly of natural causes at the age of 90 in 1970. According to Edwin's last wishes, his butler burned all the paintings that the Limps had collected throughout his life, as well as a priceless Limp family document and their artifacts. These irreplaceable pieces of history vanished in the smoke and embers that very day. The Limp family line ended with Edwin, and their final resting place can now be found at the Bellefontaine Cemetery in a mausoleum bearing their namesake. And although physically, their remains sit within its concrete walls, do their ghosts still inhabit their once prosperous estate? After the death of Charles Limp, the mansion was sold and turned into a boarding house, along with the nearby neighborhood. And this is where we begin to hear the first haunting tales of the old Limp Mansion. New residents, upon moving in, quickly began complaining of ghostly knocks and phantom footsteps being heard all throughout the house. Coupling these frightening manifestations, those same residents also began to see spectral apparitions throughout the rooms and halls. People became so frightened that they would typically move out almost as quickly as they had moved in, ultimately leading to the decline and closing of the boarding home. Now in a state of decay, it seemed like the mansion might finally be demolished. However, it would again be purchased in 1975, and the new owner, a man named Richard Pointer, immediately began to renovate, eventually turning the once incredible estate somewhat back to its former glory. It would now become a restaurant, an inn. They say that spirits that inhabit particularly older buildings and homes really don't like renovations. And whether this stirred up the energy of the place, or they simply sensed a new presence within the mansion itself, those very same ghosts would now make themselves very well known, even more so than before. Workers within the house often told stories of apparitions, strange sounds, like a thousand whispers in their ears, among other things. Their tools too began to vanish, and they all had a bone-chilling feeling of being watched by eyes that they couldn't see. Frightened by the haunting, many would abandon the job site, never to return. Eventually, though, the renovations would be completed, and the eatery and inn would open. Since the restaurant opened, staff members have reported several strange experiences. Again, apparitions appear and then quickly vanish. Voices and sounds come from nowhere, and glasses will often lift off the bar, flying through the air by themselves. On other occasions, doors have said to lock and unlock by themselves, 
lights have inexplicably turned on and off of their own free will, and the piano bar often plays when there's no one near it. Could this be the tragically departed souls of the Limp family? There are three areas of the old mansion that have had the most activity. The stairway, the attic, and what the staff refers to as the gates of hell in the basement. It is this area of the basement that used to be the entrance to the caves running below the mansion and the brewery. The attic is said to be haunted by William Jr.'s illegitimate son, referred to only as the Monkey Face Boy. This poor soul who was born with Down Syndrome had spent his entire life locked in the attic of the mansion. Strange occurrences are often witnessed on the third level of the mansion as well. The face of the boy has regularly been seen from the street, peeking from small windows of the mansion. Investigators have often left toys in the middle of his room, drawing a circle around them to see if the objects have been moved. And consistently, when they return the next day, the toys are found in another location. In the downstairs women's bathroom, which was once William Jr.'s personal domain, and held the first freestanding shower in St. Louis. Many women have reported a man peeking over their stall. One such occasion, a woman emerged from the bathroom. Returning to the bar, she yelled at the two men that she was there with that she hoped they got an eyeful. However, the two men quickly denied ever having left the bar, which the bartender verified. The confusion and disbelief must have been palpable, and this ghost is said to be that of the womanizing William Jr. In William Limp Sr.'s room, guests have often reported hearing someone running up the stairs and kicking at the door. When William ended himself, William Jr. was known to have run up the stairs to his father's room, and finding it locked, began to kick the door in order to get to his father. Perhaps this is some sort of residual haunting taking place. Experiences have also taken place outside of the home as well. A tour guide reported hearing the sounds of horses outside the room where William Limp Sr. had kept his office. However, when the tour guide looked through the window, nothing was there. This area, north of the mansion, was now used as a parking lot and was once utilized as a tethering lot for horses. There have also been many paranormal stories told by those who have visited the old Limp Mansion over the years, and this is just one of many stories. On Saturday, October 9th of 2004, two women, who we'll call Katie and Amy, visited the Limp Mansion along with St. Louis historian Joe Gibbons. Joe had spent many years researching the Limp Mansion, and often gave tours of the inn with the permission and cooperation of the owners. This is told from Katie's perspective. Meeting up with Joe at the bar, we settled in for a bit, drinking on a couple of lagers and chatting it up. Afterwards, he began to show Amy and I around the mansion, as Joe described in intricate detail the history of the Limp Mansion and the land in which the mansion stands on, as well as the many strange occurrences and this now haunted building. While we were on tour, several strange events occurred. The first was when we were standing in the darkened attic. As Joe described the monkey-faced boy, I began snapping pictures. And during our time within the attic, I began to hear a faint whisper, like that of a small child from behind me. The whispers happened so fast and alternated from ear to ear, it was like someone was speaking into them simultaneously at close range. I couldn't really make out the voice at first, but it sounded like it was saying help me over and over again. Later in our tour, we ran into another group who was on a different tour, and after a brief discussion, Several members of their group would describe having passed a man in the hallway and asked us if we had seen him as well. He was holding a key in his hand, 
and was acting irritated with the large group moving through the hallway. He was said to be pale and older, wearing a white shirt and black pants. No one thought anything of it at the time, believing him to be a member of staff. However, we would find out that there was no such gentleman working or staying at the mansion that night that met that description. Though no harm was done and nothing was disturbed in the guest room, the whole experience was very bizarre to say the least, and it's certainly not an experience I will soon forget. Was this the ghost of one of the limp patriarchy, seemingly angry that their space was being intruded upon? This particular case, those involved, and their demise certainly prompt more questions than answers. Just what drove so many of them to bring about their own ruination? Could it have been circumstantial, stress-induced, a genetic predisposition that affected their mental chemistry, or was it something else, something darker that we simply can't explain? Did the victims of their product, those seemingly caught in the throes of addiction, result in some kind of curse for the family? Did they cut some sort of deal with the devil in order to gain such profound wealth and admiration? only to have the house of cards fall and the bloodline extinguish? Or could it have been something that dwelled within those caves underneath the mansion, perhaps an old evil that got disturbed once their remodeling efforts began to take place? It's truly hard to say because those that could know such things are no longer walking this earth in human form, but perhaps are still walking the earth nonetheless. The Limp Mansion has been featured in a number of magazine articles and newspapers, and now attracts ghost hunters and historians from around the country. Today, it still features a bed and breakfast with rooms restored in periodic style, a restaurant featuring fine dining, and a mystery dinner theater. Tours are also still available at the mansion, if you so dare. As previously mentioned, the Limp Family Mausoleum still stands today, housing the remains of the family tree. Known today as the Monkey Face Boy, the unfortunate soul who was born out of wedlock, and the very same one that continued